open this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee. Today, the committee will begin its examination of the additional estimates for 2021-2022 for the parliamentary departments, the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio, the Finance portfolio and cross-portfolio Indigenous matters. The committee may also examine the annual reports of the departments and agencies appearing before it. Senators, departments and agencies have been provided with advice on the arrangements in place to ensure the additional estimates 2021-2022 hearings are conducted in a COVID-safe environment. This guidance is also available from the Secretariat. The committee appreciates the cooperation of all attendees in adhering to these arrangements. The committee has before it a program listing agencies and outcomes relating to matters for which senators have given notice. The committee's proceedings today will begin with the parliamentary departments, followed by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and its agencies, as listed on today's program. Tomorrow, the committee will examine the Department of Finance and its agencies. Finally, the committee will examine the National Indigenous Australians Agency, other Indigenous agencies and the Department of Health on Friday at the Cross Portfolio Indigenous Matters hearing. Understanding Order 26, the committee must take all evidence in public session. This includes answers to questions on notice. The committee would appreciate if senators could please provide any written questions on notice to the Secretariat by Friday the 4th of March 2022. However, reminds all senators, as well as departments and agencies, that written questions on notice can be provided at any time. The committee has fixed Friday the 25th of March 2022 as the date for the return of answers to questions taken on notice. I remind all witnesses that in giving evidence to the committee, they are protected by parliamentary privilege. It is unlawful for anyone to threaten or disadvantage a witness on account of evidence given to a committee, and such action may be treated by the Senate as a contempt. It is also a contempt to give false or misleading evidence to a committee. The Senate, by resolution in 1999, endorsed the following test of relevance of questions at estimates hearings. Any questions going to the operations or financial positions of the departments and agencies which are seeking funds in the estimates are relevant questions for the purpose of estimates hearings. I remind officers that the Senate has resolved that there are no areas in connection with the expenditure of public funds where any person has a discretion to withhold details or explanations from the parliament or its committees unless the parliament has expressly provided otherwise. I particularly draw the attention of witnesses to an order of the Senate of the 13th of May 2009, specifying the process by which a claim of public interest immunity should be raised. Witnesses are specifically reminded that a statement that information or a document is confidential or consists of advice to government is not a statement that meets the requirements of the 2009 order. Instead, witnesses are required to provide some specific indication of the harm to the public interest that could result from the disclosure of the information or the document. The Senate has also resolved that an officer of a department of the Commonwealth shall not be asked to give opinions on matters of policy and shall be given reasonable opportunity to refer questions asked of the officer to superior officers or to a minister. This resolution prohibits only questions asking for opinions on matters of policy and does not preclude questions asking for explanations of policies or factual questions about when and how policies were adopted. An officer called to answer a question for the first time should state their full name and the capacity in which they appear, and witnesses should speak clearly and into the microphones to assist Hansard to record proceedings. I remind everyone in the hearing room to switch off your mobile phone and other devices or turn them to silent. I also remind those senators and witnesses appearing via video conference who are not speaking to mute your microphones. Officers are requested to keep opening statements brief or seek to incorporate longer statements into the Hansard. Finally, the committee has agreed to allow media into the hearing room. In doing so, the committee reminds the media that they must follow the directions of the committee and the secretariat and remain within those areas clearly marked for the media. In addition, recording must not occur from behind the committee or between the committee and the witnesses, and computer screens and documents belonging to senators must not be filmed, photographed or recorded. Witnesses are reminded that they can object to being recorded at any time. The committee thanks the media in advance for maintaining a COVID-safe approach while in the hearing room. It being after 9am, I welcome the President of the Senate, Senator the Honourable Slade Brockman, Mr Rob Stefanik, Secretary of the Department of Parliamentary Services, Dr Diane Herriot, Parliamentary Librarian and Officers of the Department. I thank DPS for providing information pursuant to the Committee's recommendations in the 2015 DPS inquiry, which has been circulated to the Committee. Uh, Mr President, do you wish to make an opening statement? I will make a very brief opening statement, Chair. Thank you. First, I'll thank you, Chair, Deputy Chair, and all committee members for being here today. I would like to briefly address the significant protest activity that has occurred since the last estimates hearing in October 2021. 
I will commence by thanking the Department's parliamentary security staff and the Australian Federal Police, including ACT policing, for their coordinated and diligent work to facilitate peaceful assembly whilst keeping this building secure. One of the virtues of Western democracies is that our citizens can exercise their right to communicate their opinions and ideas through peaceful assembly. This includes gatherings within the parliamentary precincts. The authorised assembly area, known as the AAA, is a designated space where large groups can meet safely and collectively articulate their concerns. Groups are permitted to use this space following consideration for the protection of public safety and fair and equal access. We were all, however, shocked by the lawless acts which led to significant acts of vandalism and graffiti on our building and, most recently, a significant fire that damaged Old Parliament House. As a direct result, it has been necessary to maintain the security of the precincts by implementing tighter security controls, including change traffic conditions, which I'm sure all senators have noticed this week, and all staff in the building as well, for that matter. Uh, I appreciate the inconvenience this causes to the operations of Parliament and those who work in APH and thank all building occupants for their patience. I'd also like to briefly touch on the uh, Jenkins review. At the previous estimates hearing, I reported that the department had been proactive in assisting Sex Discrimination Commissioner Ms Kate Jenkins with her independent review of parliamentary workplaces. Since the report was received by Executive Government on 30th of November 2021, the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet has rightfully been leading the work to respond to the report's recommendations and findings. Last week saw presiding officers deliver a statement of acknowledgement on behalf of the Parliamentary Cross-Party Leadership Task Force. DPS is engaged with the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet by attending working groups along with other parliamentary departments and the Department of Finance to action recommendations regarding access and inclusion and also workplace health and safety. DPS has also undertaken preliminary work to identify options to implement the proposed Parliamentary Health and Wellbeing Service, noting the reliance on completion of a feasibility study and guidance from the Leadership Task Force. Work implementing the recommendations of the Foster Review continues with the involvement of relevant parliamentary committees. Uh, just a quick update on a couple of more technical matters in the building. In late 2021, the department commenced the rollout of the Wi-Fi upgrade project to resolve persistent issues with the general standard of Wi-Fi connectivity. The project will replace 654 wireless access points that have reached end of life and will improve co coverage while increasing data throughput. Upgrades have been completed in the public areas of the building. Incremental improvements to Wi-Fi have been realised since December 2021, and the project is currently scheduled for completion by May 2022. I'm also pleased to report that the systems testing for the Auxiliary Power Upgrade project was successfully completed over two consecutive weekends in January, finalising the installation of the new Auxiliary Power infrastructure. Senators may recall the project replaced and upgraded the original independent backup power system from 1988. The project is an important business continuity measure to provide an additional layer of redundancy if the grid backup power sources are unavailable. Testing involved a controlled shutdown of the main power supply and a restoration of the building's essential services. The successful testing process was one of the last remaining deliverables for the project. I'd like to thank all those involved who supported this project reaching this important milestone. Uh, and just finally, Chair, on cyber security. At the last estimates hearing, I advised that the department was in the process of implementing domain-based message authentication, reporting and conformance, also known as DMARC, into our parliamentary email system. Uh, you may recall DMARC is part of the Australian Cyber Security Centre strategy to mitigate cyber security incidents and aims to protect the aph.gov.au domain from being used for email spoofing, phishing and cyber crimes by blocking emails generated by third-party distribution services. I am pleased to report, since its implementation on the 6th of December 2021, DPS has observed an 82 per cent reduction in email traffic attempting to impersonate the aph.gov.au domain. Through standard reporting, DPS identified that DMARC blocked 31,255 emails, down from 181,000 in one week alone between 7th of December and the 14th of December last year. The subset of impersonation emails classified as threats has reduced from over 240 per day to less than 40 per day. 
I'd like to thank all parliamentarians and their staff for adapting to this essential change. It does highlight, however, the ongoing need to guard against cyber intrusion to, to protect the essential work of all parliamentarians. This is a race that will never end, and ongoing enhancements to cybersecurity arrangement remains a high priority. That's it from me, Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Stefanik, do you wish to make an opening statement? Uh, no, thank you, Chair. Dr. Harriet, do you wish to make an opening statement? Very good. I'm looking to Senator Gallagher to have the call. Thanks very much, Chair. I'm wondering, um, Mr. President, if you could make available your opening statement. Certainly. Yeah, if, if they there are. are. A couple of little additions, but subject to those, I'm no happy problem. to make it available. Thank you. I just have a, a couple of um, questions following from that. Um, the traffic conditions or the traffic restrictions that have been put in around Parliament House, um, how long are they going to remain in place? What is the intention there? I'll, I'll let Ms Saunders deal with this or, or uh, Mr Stefanik more directly, but um, my view is that once we get advice from the AFP that um, they can be removed, then we will revert to normal. But uh, Kate Saunders, Deputy Secretary, that's correct. We work really closely with the AFP and take their advice in relation to that. Okay, and so it was based on their advice that there's really only one access point into the into the building. Into that's the correct, precinct. Senator. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, on the Jenkins review, you mentioned uh, that DPS, I think, is a member of a number of working groups. Can you explain or elaborate on that? What are the working groups that you're a member of? Rob Stefanik, Secretary, Department of Parliamentary Services. Uh, there's, there's two particular um, working groups already uh, underway. Senator one's on accessibility and inclusion. Uh, the other is on workplace health and safety. Um, there will also be a high level implementation um, group that will be formed um, and one of uh, my senior um, staff, um, the first assistant secretary for corporate services will be a representative on that. Okay, and so they're all, are they, did I take it from um, the president's opening statement that they are chaired by or led by PM&C? Oh, that's correct. Senator. Okay, and you are just a member of those groups? you know, a member agency? That's right. And there are other member agencies? Uh, yes, so I believe uh, the departments of the Senate, House of Reps and the Parliamentary Budget Office uh, will also have, have representatives on those. Okay, we'll go, I'll ask some more questions to um, PMC uh, when we get there. So, sorry, um, Senator, if I might add, um, Department of Finance um, is, is one of the other bodies that I also missed. Yeah, okay, great. And have they all started and met? Those working groups? Uh, the accessibility and inclusion, the workplace health and safety have met, yes. The implementation one? Uh, I believe that is still being assembled at the moment, um, based on my conversation with Ms Hartland um, late last week. Okay. Okay, and um, how often are they meeting? Um, I, they have met at least once. Um, I'm not sure if Ms Saunders has any... Ms Lucchetti has the details of um, how often they've met. It, it's been very frequent, I yep. will add. Yes. Ms Lucchetti, First Assistant Secretary of the Corporate Services Division. With the um, working groups I've been involved in, they've been so far quite active. There's been quite a few meetings, as well as a few different email exchanges as well. I am not involved in all of the working groups, but um, the, the few that DPS has been involved in, we've had at least one meeting. Okay, and when did they start meeting? Do you recall that? Yes, I've got the, the dates here. I think I can assist with this, Senator. Sure. Um, so on... Um, the 16th of December 2021, DPS met with PM&C to discuss the implementation of the Jenkins Review. That was the first meeting that mm -hmm. the Secretary and I were both involved in. Um, then following that, um, 
there was another meeting um, that was attended by DPS with um, PMC. That was on the 22nd of December. Someone from the Department of the House of Reps and the Department of the Senate. And that was in relation to the WHS Working Group. On the 6th of January 2022, DPS attended a meeting to discuss the health and wellbeing service and um, a feasibility study. Um, that was attended by two members of the executive DPS, uh, someone from the PMNC and another official from the PWSS. On the 7th of January 2021, DPS provided information to um, PMNC on the health services that are currently provided at DPS. On the 12th of January 2021, DPS attended an access and inclusion working group meeting. Um, that was attended by an official from PMNC, Department of Finance, three officials from DPS, uh, an official from the Department of the House of Reps, Department of the Senate, in fact, two officials from the Department of the Senate and an official from um, the PBO. Um, on the 12th of January 2022, DPS followed up on a request from that meeting for further information on childcare services. On the 12th of January 2022, DPS provided its internal drug and alcohol policy to Department of Finance via email. Um, so I was it, just, it continues. Yeah, there's, there's so the more. meetings, it was um, really the meetings of those groups. I don't need necessarily all the email <laughs> okay. pro, but. All right, so then there was a further meeting on the 20th of January that I attended, um, and that was as, with... As what? As on the accessibility and inclusion or the workplace safety? Uh, that was that was to discuss with PM&C um, all of the recommendations, actually, and um, how DPS could assist in okay. implementing those recommendations. So is that part of the implementation working group or is that a no, separate process? No, it's not. No, it's a it's separate, separate process. To that. Yep. Yep. So outside of those three working groups, yep. there's another process where you're meeting with PMNC essentially to talk about the recommendations as well? In, yes, we're doing that, not through an informal working group, but yes, there's frequent meetings. Okay, so, the inf so these groups are informal working groups what does that mean, informal? So they just come together as needed, or that was that was a discussion, Senator, on that date. Um, really, from my perspective, to make sure that we were doing everything that we could to enable implementation of the Jenkins Review recommendations. Okay, but are the working groups informal? You just said informal working no, groups. No, sorry, I was clarifying. Um, the other groups are formal. Right. Okay. That was a meeting. That was a meeting me which and an official is like an informal yes. working group. Okay, yes. got it. And Senator, on the eighth of February, there was an additional one, the parliamentary induction working group meeting, which was the first meeting of that working group DPS attended. Parliamentary. So there's an another working group, is it? Parliamentary. That was the parliamentary induction working group. So there's four working groups. That's correct, Senator. Right. And are there terms of reference for each of those working groups? And if so, could you provide them to the committee? Um, I'll take that on yeah. later, Senator, but All we'll right. provide you uh, whatever we have. All right. Uh, thank you. That would be useful because we do want to follow this pretty closely. Now, the Health and Wellbeing Service, what's happening there? Senator, I can address that. Yep. So we've had a, a meeting just to talk about different options to be able to build and develop that health and wellbeing service. So a feasibility study is going to be um, conducted just to be able to look at those options that have been made and to make some recommendations on the, the way forward. Okay, so the feasibility study, that is to... Uh, look at different options, is it, around how you deploy a health and wellbeing yes, service? Yes, that's right. A GP, um, psychologists, how we can um, utilise our nurses' centre, the health and rec centre, as well, all into a, a nice little health and wellbeing hub. Okay. I mean, obviously, jump in here, but there'd also be implications for the building and, and yes. how we utilise the building most effectively. Yeah. As in? As in, do we need to reconfigure spaces? to make whatever the best way of implementing this work. Okay. So there could be physical changes that are required as well. All right. 
So um, the, the so Sorry, Senator. The feasibility study will be guided by the leadership uh, task force. So, um, the, how that feasibility study is framed and, and what um, services will be sought as part of that health and wellbeing service will be determined by that by the task force. Okay. Um, and who's how, where are you getting the funding for this? Who's paying? At, at this point, it's not resourced. Um, so, again, as a result of the feasibility study, um, we'll have um, we'll be able to make an assessment at that time about what the additional resourcing requirements uh, will be. Um, th there are, um, I guess, one of the options is to provide the services wholly in house. Uh, another potential option is to look at a, a market sort of wraparound service that provides all those services, each of those will have different cost implications. And and so there isn't, you're, you're just taking someone offline, are you, to do the feasibility? How is it going to be done? Uh, I understand the feasibility study has been led by um, PM&C. Uh, okay, so you're just providing re-staffing essentially to support it, are you? Uh, we're, we're providing all the, um, all the data and information that would be required to establish um, that service, taking into account that we already provide elements of that service. Um, for example, our um, health and recreation centre uh, and we also have the nurses centre, so how those components would fit into the health and wellbeing service more broadly are, are things we need to look at as well, but they would certainly be folded in. Okay. All right, well, we might learn more about that uh, through the task force, I think. <laughs> And is there a time frame on that, just before I finish that? I understand the feasibility study has to be submitted by the 30th, or completed by the 30th of May. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, the, does the health, so the, the discussion we've had in the past also about access to the building out of hours and all that kind of stuff. You were looking for, I think, extra resourcing around that. Has that been landed yet? Uh, I probably should jump in there because that is still a um, question in front of the Appropriations Committee. Okay, so, so it hasn't progressed further? So, no, it has not. Okay. All right. Um, thank you for that. Last time we met at estimates, we had a discussion about the the um, video that you've done for staff training for, um, you know, responding to serious incidents in the building. And I think it was the 13 minute video, but you corrected your evidence. It was 11 minutes and 18 seconds, um, that video. Um, we're now in, what, February. Have Has every member of the DPS staff viewed that video? Um, so the, that um, procedural, um, instructional procedural training video as targeted specifically to the parliamentary security officers. Yeah. Um, specifically because um, it is a, um, the video is a spoken version of the procedures. Um, so which facilitate how the security officers will respond in the mm. event of a serious incident. Um, so that video is specifically targeted to that cohort um, of approximately 180 um, staff. Um, it's not intended for general consumption um, because it is, uh, it is an instruction delivered by one of our senior security training officers um, to the security officers themselves. So, um, but since that time, Ms Saunders and I have um, um, observed on a number of occasions, um, and we've been able to confirm that the video is actually um, a read through of the procedure as um, we had developed and approved. Okay, so my question was have, okay, perhaps we go take a step back, who has watched the video? Who has um, seen the video since we last met? I think it was 80 out of 180 when um, we last um, discussed it. 
Where yes, is so, it today? Yes, so all security officers, apart from a few on long-term leave, um, had viewed the video within two weeks uh, of the procedure being approved. Okay, so do you have, so it's 180 out of 180? Or 175 uh, it would be out of 180? That. That. Everyone who is um, not on long-term leave has viewed that instructional video. New recruits will watch it uh, within the first two weeks of commencing their recruit training as well. Okay. So do you know, I mean, I, I, is it impossible to give me a number of who, how many people have seen the video? Uh, Ms Tunningley may have that number with her, um, but it is everybody who is not on long-term leave. Okay. She, she's just getting that please. All right. We'll and come back to you with that number, Senator right. Gallo. Okay. Um, so all security staff who are not on long-term leave have watched the video. All security officers, mm -hmm. yes, Senator. And what about your executive? Last time we spoke, I think one member of the executive have viewed the video. Um, that's great, and that was Ms Tunningley, because uh, Ms Tunningley, who is the branch head, um, uh, was responsible for approving the video. Um, subsequent to that, both Ms Saunders and I um, have viewed the video. Um, I don't believe there's a requirement for the other members of the executive to have viewed the video, um, because that's not relevant to their work. Okay. And having viewed the video myself, Senator Gallagher, I can absolutely assure you this was clearly something designed for the PSS staff, for the security officers. Um, it was an instructional video on a very narrow issue uh, as described by the officials. Okay. Ms Tunningley, did you have something? Leanne Tunningley, Tunningley Assistant Secretary, Security Branch. Uh, as at the 6th of January 2022, we had 189 um, security services service officers, mm -hmm. five, of, five of which are on long-term leave and haven't watched the video, but all other officers have. Okay. And how many people in your executive, Mr Stepnick? Um, 17 in total. 17? Out of how many staff in DPS? Um, at the last count, um, 1,163. 1,163. And then the security, a much smaller subset of that, 189. Um, so the security branch, um, so the security, parliamentary security service is a um, section within the security branch itself, yeah, uh, which is approximately 250 staff. So those, so 189 security, are they called SSOs or? Um, PSS, parliamentary security okay. staff. Okay, Par parliamentary security staff. And then you've got another 60 odd that work in the security branch but are not directly security officers? Uh, correct, so that includes people that um, do the monitoring of our um, CCTV, our um, uh, IT, so the security network is a separate IT network, um, so it's the staff that manage that. Uh, our policy staff, um, training staff, uh, and other administrative people. Okay, and they're not required to watch the video or, or receive training about how to respond to serious incidents? Uh, no. Because not part of their work or? Uh, that's correct, because it is a very specific uh, procedural, um, it, it is entirely about a procedural response to um, what a security officer on the floor uh, might find or might be called to attend. Okay. So it, it, it is very, very specific to um, 
once a security officer has arrived on the scene, um, what actions they should take um, to manage that scene and the decision points that they would make, for example, um, if, if they in their if in their, in their preliminary assessment, it would be a serious incident, um, their first step would be to contact the AFP uh, and the AFP would make a decision about contacting the PWSS. So that's in addition to their normal first responder duties, uh, which would be to, for example, render first aid um, if they found someone in a distressed state. Okay. So what, um, for the rest of DPS, and how are they, what, what training have you post, post the Higgins um, uh, alleged rape and all of the reviews that have followed? What, if any, training has been done for the rest of your staff who work in this building? I might um, ask Ms Saunders to address that for you, Senator. Senator, we've um, focused a lot, um, not just since the Foster review or the Jenkins review, but um, we've had a program operating since 2018 to promote cultural reform within the department and also as part of that focus on bullying, harassment and discrimination. Um, we have done things like reminded all of our staff and refreshed our harassment contact officer network. Um, that's expanded um, from 13 to currently 17 harassment contact officers. Um, and we have a new volunteer who's about to join that group. They have extensive training as well. Um, so uh, they all complete mental health first aid training. Um, in March 2021, bullying, harassment and discrimination training was mandated. Um, in June 2021, all of our content on our intranet was that's related to bullying, harassment and discrimination. It was reviewed um, and it was rearranged to enhance accessibility and discoverability. Um, and in fact, we've got a link on our carousel, which is on the homepage of our intranet. Um, in August of 2021, Ms Lucchetti, the First Assistant Secretary of Corporate Services Division, has progressively attended branch meetings where the entire branch is invited to attend. Um, she's discussing DPS's zero tolerance to bullying. Um, the secretary um, and SES also promote that um, extensively. Um, and the session also covers off on mandatory training, the process for managing bullying, harassment and discrimination complaints, the harassment officer network, support available to employees experiencing bullying, harassment and discrimination, our suite of updated policies and gu guidance is um, explained to staff. And then there's also as much time as people would like dedicated to questions and answers. Um, those presentations have been really well received and they'll be repeated on an annual basis. Um, so they commenced in August and they concluded February this year. Um, the consultative forum, so we've spoken a number of times about culture, positive culture, what we're doing in that space. Um, and Ms Lucchetti again spoke at that forum at length on bullying and harassment and discrimination. Um, post the Jenkins review um, being published, we have again reviewed our bullying and harassment and discrimination policy. We've expanded the procedures, we've provided more guidance. I have reviewed and approved that um, and the Secretary is in the process of reviewing that at the moment. So um, we're hoping to be able to publish that on our intranet and provide that to all of our staff um, shortly. The Jenkins review also um, includes a recommendation for mandatory respectful workplaces training. So at DPS, we have had that in place for um, a couple of years now, and we have just recently made that mandatory for all staff as well. Um, we have a series of um, mandatory 
training courses for staff, not just bullying and harassment and respectful workplaces, but also uh, um, developing a positive culture, um, mandatory training course and also an integrity training course that's mandatory for all staff. Um, Sorry. When you say mandatory, you've used that a, a, a bit. How do you monitor that? Like, uh, so um, those courses are allocated to people in our, um, oh, I forget the name of the module, but essentially there's a learning profile that's established for every single staff member and our HR um, section will allocate those courses to each staff member and then it's um, monitored to ensure that people have completed it. They're sent reminders. The okay. supervisors are sent reminders. It's followed up on. Okay, so maybe can we get um, a report on where you're at? You know how many people have done all of that training that you've just outlined. I guess, and I'm I'm pleased to hear all that. I guess the question I was um, coming in at was really what has changed. I'm trying to understand what has changed since what we've learned about Brittany Higgins' experience in this building. We know that you've got, you've changed your, you know, the video that, or the training that's required for security staff responding to serious incidents. But there was a whole range of other things that happened around that, uh, particularly that weekend, um, around, you know, how you, how senior staff were contacted what decisions were made there, how the Department of Finance got involved and who had, you know, knowledge of that. So has there been any improvements in that area to kind of understand everybody's role and responsibility and have it clearly mapped out in relation to a serious incident? Not, and I'm not asking what, what existed beforehand, it's post uh, February, or post the, the allegation of rape occurring in this building. Um, so that serious incident procedure also um, um, uh, deals as well as with the security officers and how they respond. Um, the procedure also has um, beyond um, the parliamentary security service, um, it incorporates the responses of other entities. So for example, um, the role that Department of Finance may have and the PWSS uh, may have uh, in that process. So the, the parts of the procedure that relate to our security staff are quite specific, um, but there is also um, other parts of that procedure that deal with um, how communication um, how the communication process works after a serious incident has been identified. And escalation? Yes. Okay, so that has changed since since Ms Higgins alleged rape in this building? Uh, yes, because the, the formation of the PWSS has provided a formal body um, that that communication flows through and then the PWSS um, takes the relevant action. Okay. Um, so, there is a new sort of standard operating procedure around serious incidents? Um, well, that, that is the procedure. And that is new? Yes. Yes. And it's been updated to reflect what you learnt out of that, out of Ms Higgins' experience? Um, so the, the procedure was informed um, through not only DPS, but um, we had in developing it, we had consulted with PM&C, uh, Department of Finance, uh, the AFP, uh, and then when the PWSS was formed, they had input into the development of that procedure. So um, the procedure wasn't simply, wasn't developed by DPS in a vacuum. Um, it was consulted more broadly to ensure that it would um, cover um, the entire range of actions required once a serious incident um, is identified. And, and Senator, it was approved by the Security Management Board, of which the AFP is also a member. Okay. So, uh, outside of um, what thinking's been done, I don't know whether it's this, what is it, the WS? P PWSS. PWSS group around 
providing training and advice to other people that work in this building about dealing with serious incidents and how to go about um, reporting or responding to them. Has DPS looked at any of that? Um, no, that, so that is the area that is the remit of the PWSS, so which is the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service. And who's on that? Sorry. Um, so that is a, um, a, an entity that was established under the Parliamentary Service Act. Um, I understand it was created by an instrument um, that was tabled in the houses. And that, that's, specifically that's recommended. Memory, yes. Yes. Sorry. Oh, and specifically recommended in the foster review. Yeah. Uh, and that's so been who's active in undertaking training. I mean, I'm sure, uh, Senator Gallagher, you have you've done the training that PWSS provides to parliamentarians and staff. The safe and respectful workplace training. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, that, I've done that, that. that is ongoing. Um, I don't know that it told PWSS. me what to do in the event that there's a serious incident in the workplace, though. Like it, we well, did I go through it, general. I oh, think. I think it did. I, I mean, it, it covered pathways of referral that you could take in terms of going to the PWSS or other actions you could take. So the PWSS includes um, um, psychologists, um, trauma-informed um, experts in managing a, a serious incident. And they've been extensively promoting the service that they provide. Um, Mr Stefanik, last in, in October, I asked a similar question, but I asked if, if others who work in the building come across something that meets the criteria of a serious incident that they're not necessarily trained in and is something that's unusual, um, you know, what, how would they know what to do? And you said, we haven't had an opportunity yet to get full communication out about it, but I'll anticipate that we'll be doing more to that. We just haven't got to the point of communicating broadly on that yet. Um, and I think that was in relation to a, the procedure that was signed off, because it was new then, mm -hmm. um, I think. So have you been, have people been, a, been trained on the procedure? So I, um, so shortly after the last estimates hearing, I communicated with all DPS staff. Okay. Um, uh, and I articulated exactly what the video um, does so that there was a, an understanding um, of, of what is required um, and also articulating that um, the Parliamentary Security Service should be contacted in the event that um, someone is found in a distressed situation. Okay. So that was to all DPS employees? Correct. What about contractors and and others that work in this building, like, you know, mop staff, things like that. Is there any advice? Presumably that goes out through finance, would it? But what about contractors? You'd have a fair few contractors, wouldn't you? Um, we do have contractors, um, not a great proportion. Um, I would have to take that on notice, Senator. About whether they're given information about responding to serious incidents? Uh, that's correct. Okay. Um, Ms Stephanie, I guess the, the final question I have in this area is like, in the past, well, since the alleged rape and then since the sort of the public um, becoming aware of what happened in this place, do you think like, do you think the situation has changed to the point that, you know, what what it allegedly occurred to Ms Higgins in this building would be l unlikely or not happen again with the changes that have been put in place? Um, certainly as, um, as concerns my department and the, the control um, that we have or, or where we intersect uh, with the situation, um, uh, it, it's not only the procedures themselves and the the actions we've taken. Um, um, obviously, the um, the articulation of Ms Higgins' experience um, is almost daily uh, in the news, and it, it, it's um, impossible 
um, to me. So um, I certainly think it is at the forefront of the mind um, of all our staff, um, whether, whether they're security um, staff or not. So, um, I mean, I, I guess the point I'm trying to make here is have we, made, have we done enough to make Parliament House as safe as it can be for for people in this building. Well, Senator Gallagher, I mean, I'll, I'll, sorry, I'll just jump no, in. I mean, there is an ongoing body of work, and everyone acknowledges that. I mean, we we heard part of it in Parliament last week. Um, obviously, the Jenkins report is a significant body of work. I'm, I'm sure you've read it. Um, it, it. It's a very significant amount of activity that needs needs to happen. And you know the reality is it's not going to be done overnight. Um, this is this is a long process we're undertaking. It's it's going to take you know many months, if not you know longer than that in some cases, to implement and activate those recommendations. Uh, I think that's just the reality of the situation. When you're undertaking such a significant uh, body of work, it can never happen instantly. Um, so I, I think is there more to be done, or there is more being done. Yeah, like I understand there's an ongoing piece of work, but I think there's also a sense of urgency that, you know, we'd like to be able to provide confidence that what happened to Ms Higgins and the circumstances around it, you know, one year on from that becoming public and, you know, three years on from that incident occurring in this building, that we can offer some sense of confidence that that situation would not happen again. I mean, that's the, surely that's, you know, not an unreasonable thing to be uh, seeking at this point in time. I understand cultural change will take longer. Um, and I understand that there is a lot of work going on, but I guess I need to know, and, and women like Ms Higgins needs to know, that if they were in that situation again, that we have already affected change, that, you know, it wouldn't happen again. I think there's been significant change affected in the building um, through the implementation of things like the PWSS, through the, secure, uh, the serious incident procedure. Uh, I, th I think that does amount to significant and real change. Mm. So do you think if, if people, like if we start at the beginning, if people present to the building, um, you know, in the early hours of the morning, do you think at that point that there's been enough change that the security staff may set off a series of decisions that would, you know, change that outcome, i.e. they wouldn't be let into the building? Well, or um, they would be offered some um, alternative or some, you know, people would make a f ask a few questions, things like that? Um, as the President indicated earlier, there are two, two of the outstanding recommendations of the Foster Review are currently with the approach committees of both houses. Um, one of those specifically relates to um, patrolling. Uh, uh, the other relates to recording of access after hours. Um, they're two, uh, I guess, two critical uh, procedural uh, elements that would inform the way a security staff respond to somebody entering the building. Um, so once once that's resolved, that will, um, I guess, complete the um, complete the actions we need uh, to undertake. And I, I understand those those pieces of work, and I don't think we couldn't have a probes on on Thursday when we were due to have it. <coughs> um, but I guess the question I'm asking is, would security staff feel empowered in that situation? to act differently than what happened in Miss Higgins' situation? Like, surely they're not dependent on a register to note who's coming in out of hours. I mean, that, that data's collected on, on the swipe pass system anyway. It's more, a, you know, are security staff in a position where they would perhaps ask some questions, they would say, well, I'm not sure, you know, or one of us will come with you as you go to the bill, to the, uh, sweet and remain outside. I mean, are those practical things on offer now, knowing what you know? G given there are um, 
given there is a broad range of building occupants that enter Parliament House, um, the rules that you would need to apply would have to be consistent across all. Um, the, the question, I guess, would be what um, responsibility are we going to impose on security staff for making judgments about the state of someone's sobriety um, and whether they should be allowed um, access? Um, I, I think their decisions that the parliament needs to make um, about what it's prepared obviously it will impact on the ability of parliamentarians to do their work. Um, if, for example, um, staff of theirs are attempting to enter the building uh, in a in a similar circumstance. Yeah, I'm not sure I follow you there. I, I guess I'm trying to understand whether so. I, <clears throat> take the situation where you have an MP coming in to the building with their bag or whatever, off to do some work at 1am. They are quite different, aren't they, to, say, you know, a couple of staff arriving at a similar time under the weather after they've been at the pub or whatever. I mean, are security staff able to make those sort of judgments? Because the parliament isn't there. You know, the parliament isn't there to make the judgments. The security staff are. And it might be an unfair request of them, but I'm trying to understand if the situation arose that occurred with Miss Higgins, has anything changed? Or would, a, in her situation, they just be waved through again because there isn't a register for after hours access and patrols? That's the question. Yeah. Their role is primarily to vet people and to conduct security screening. It's not the role of security officers to be making judgments about people's state. Um, it, it's why it's important for the parliament to decide what the entry requirements or what the um, what restrictions would be imposed on someone presenting to the building uh, in a state that might not be acceptable in the workplace. Uh, Ms Saunders. So, Senator, I was, I was going to add that the security staff are trained in applying the definition of a serious incident to a situation that they see as a first responder. In that event, they will contact the AFP. That, that is contained in the serious incident yeah. procedure. It's consistent with the foster review and they've been trained in that. But sort of preventative steps are not, are not part of the role of the security staff. So they're, they're I guess respond. what I'm struggling with is if using a hypothetical situation, a young man, a young woman entered the building at 1.30 or 2.30 a.m noticeably um, drunk or, or um, you know, had, have had a big night out. At, as it stands at the moment, security staff, if they were pass holders, security staff would let them into the building. Senator, it's probably helpful if Ms Tunningley reads out the definition. I can see she has it right there. So that, that's what we've, mm. we are following because it is contained in the foster review. So it's word for word from that review. It's been consulted on with all the parties that the secretary discussed uh, just earlier. Um, and it, it's on the record from the last hearing as well. Do you want to read it? So, a serious incident is interpreted as an incident or pattern of behaviour that causes serious harm to someone. One or more of these factors suggest a serious incident may have occurred where a person appears impaired by, drug, by alcohol or drugs and is behaving in a way that departs from what one would expect at a workplace, is visibly distressed, is in a state of undress, is engaging in sexual behaviour, is engaging in or has been the victim of physical or verbal abuse, is engaging in illicit behaviour, e.g. drug use, or any other behaviour of concern that is inconsistent with expected workplace behaviour. So yeah, I think no, in, I understand. In conjunction with I the outstanding that. issues that appropriations is, has to deal with, I think that we are 
getting to a point where you know, clearly things have changed. Yeah, and I don't want to go before matters before the committee. I understand, you know, it's patrols largely and after hours access. But I think the thing that can, that worries me is that it doesn't sound like the serious incident training is all good and excellent, <laughs> but the vulnerability that was created in terms of accessing the building is still a problem. Like if, if, that, ha if that scenario happened again today, your staff, you're saying to me that your staff have no ability to say, look guys, this isn't a good idea, you're drunk, you're not coming into the building. They would, if you're a pass holder, you just swept, you're just allowed in and there's nothing to stop that. Um, that that's not strictly true, Senator. So okay. the, given the scenario that you've painted and yep. with the procedure, um, the next step for our security staff would be to contact the AFP. So based on the procedure, their assessment with that scenario would be to contact the AFP and then they would attend and then make an assessment based on um, uh, their presence at the scene. Okay, so that is at entry to the building. They could apply at entry to the building okay, as so well. Okay, so yes. the presentation is seen as a serious officer. incident, hey? Or if a serious officer, uh, if a security officer encountered something of that nature in the building, yeah, they sure. could involve the AFP yeah. as well. So it's not just at the point of entry. Yeah, no, no, no. I understand that. I, I'm, I, my question was whether they would be waived into the building if they. But you're saying to me that if they present as, as being inebriated, it's in the early hours of the morning, it's unclear what they're there for, not that anyone's passing judgment, that is enough for your security staff to say this is a serious incident and I'm calling the cops? Correct. Okay. Um, it's quite broadly, the serious incident um, definition is quite broadly drawn. Um, obviously, um, security officers make judgments in real time based on um, what they see, um, but certainly there's enough in that procedure that would allow them to make that judgment. Okay. Thank you. That's all from you, Senator Gallo. Yeah. Senator Ayres, do you have some questions? Yeah, I, I do, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Senator Gallagher asked some questions about um, protest activity uh, and the arrangements that are in place. So I just want to take those questions a little bit further, uh, Mr. Stefanik. Um, wh when did the first protest activity occur? Um, you're talking about the current, mm. the, the most recent. No, not not the first protest activity ever. The the it's, the protest activity. It's been that's ongoing for yeah. It's I mean the um, there was the activity at the, at the old Parliament House, um, yeah. but the, which we, um, where. where um, demonstrators uh, set fire to the entrance of the building. Um, in terms of this building, what, what's... Um, I'll, I'll take on notice when exactly it first started. Um, what I can say, Senator, is that the current protest action, if I could call it that, commenced mm. before Christmas. Uh, I guess then it has um, ebbed and flowed. Um, sometimes it has... Um, focused more around the foreshore um, in front yeah. of Old Parliament House. Um, at times there has been smaller groups um, coming up to um, Parliament House. So the road closures, um, I think staff were notified when about the road closures? My notes say 2nd of February. Uh, that would probably... I'll, I'll need to confirm that, Senator, but that sounds correct to me. Um, it would have been late in the evening. Um, uh, I recall we sent a message out um, uh, because a decision had been ba based on an assessment that the AFP had done uh, about the risk to the precinct. Um, uh, they had made the decision to place barriers on um, Commonwealth and King's Avenues. And when did those barriers go up? Uh, it would have been. I believe it was the evening of the 1st of February, Senator, but we will take that on notice. and Take that on notice for me. Um, 
So that uh, notification that we all saw on the 2nd of February, were, were government and ministerial staff notified prior to that? Uh, the information circular would have gone uh, to the entire parliament. Um, I, there wouldn't have been any specific communication from DPS to those, to those Pri other areas beyond to, that. What, but my, my question is, were government and ministerial staff notified prior to the email on the 2nd Not of February? Not specifically by DPS. They would have relied on our information circular, which we had sent out to all, um, all building occupants. What about contractors and other staff? Uh, if they had email access, they would have... Um, if they were contractors or other staff that have access to our network, they would have received the same message uh, as other users. And, and if they didn't? Um, there, there certainly would have... There certainly were cases where would, they... Would have? Or to, so I just want you to be precise about the... Um, there are certainly instances where they would not have been aware Mr. Um, was there any was there any additional advice sought by DPS um, in relation to the protesters other than other than that that was provided to MPs by the AFP? Did you seek other advice about the protest activity? Um, we do work, as Ms. Um, Saunders pointed out, we do work. Um, quite closely with the AFP mm. um, and certainly when there is protest activity there's close communication with Ms Tunningley um, and her counterpart in the AFP. Um, we obviously rely on their intelligence to make um, and we work with them to make judgments about what restrictions are imposed um, on the precincts. There was a group of uh, protesters that Mr Kelly escorted into the building last week. Um, were there any precautions taken in relation to that group? Uh, there certainly was. Um, there was a detail of both AFP and parliamentary security staff um, that monitored that group at all times while they were in the building. So how, what, what, how did that work? They were admitted. Um, were, they, um, <clears throat> were they made aware of the sort of building protocols Put, put, put a mask on, keep it on, all that sort of stuff? Uh, yes, they were. Um, as I recall, they were and, and, initially... And how was that managed? Um, so, as I recall, they were initially... Some members were turned away because they were... Um, had protest paraphernalia yes. on them. Uh, and then when they returned um, without that paraphernalia... Um, T-shirts on, inside out, that sort of thing. Correct. Yeah. Um, then they were... Um, uh, they were advised of the building requirements. Um, I understand Ms Tunningley can correct me if I'm wrong, they complied uh, with the mask wearing, um, undertaken security screening, uh, and then were signed in by uh, Mr Kelly, uh, which he was entitled to do. Um, but given the, the nature of the protest and the group, um, we already had um, staff deployed um, to ensure once they'd enter the building um, that they would not be um, lost. Would, would not be what, sorry? Would not be lost. Oh, that they would not be lost. That they would not be lost. Yes. And why, can, can you tell me the, the ban on the public attending in the galleries or attending the parliament still in place? Um, how, how long is that going to continue for? Um, I probably should take that one. Um, so basically the presiding officers jointly make a decision on the, the arrangements for Parliament House. Mm. Uh, we obviously take a medical advice uh, on the situation at the time. Uh, the advice we had before this sitting period was that because particularly of the wave of Omicron uh, in the ACT, um, and obviously throughout Australia, that um, the settings that we currently have were um, advisable. Um, but obviously we will take further advice on the settings going forward. And further advice from whom? Uh, so there's a range of health officials. The deputy CMO is probably the principal um, source of advice.
I can get you. I can get you a more complete list if you would like it on notice. And the rest. Well, yeah, I just want to understand. Is it AC, so? It's not just ACT Health. It's Deputy CMO and ACT Health. ACT Health is is involved. Yes. So has the ban, has the public health ban been consistent with ACT Health's advice, or you're saying you're getting other advice? Uh, it, it has been consistent with ACT Health advice at, at, at all times. I, I, I don't think we've ever varied remarkably from that. Sometimes our settings have reflected um, uh, the difficulty we have, Senator Ayers, is that there have been times during this pandemic when one jurisdiction has been COVID free mm. and others haven't. Uh, and so uh, there's also been times when uh, jurisdictions outside the ACT have had COVID when the ACT hasn't. So obviously we've had a, a two-way concern in that regard. We uh, wanted to avoid um, uh, bringing COVID into the ACT when it was COVID free and obviously for senators from my home state, for example, Western Australia, but this also applied to Tasmania at various points, uh, South Australia at various points, where there was no COVID in those jurisdictions, we obviously also uh, took into account the desire to not spread the virus out from the eastern states to other states. Yeah, and, and it's a very significant departure from you know, one of the aspects of this building that's important for it as an institution is the capacity for the public to be able to visit, to yes, attend in the galleries. absolutely agree, Senator Rez. Um, has there been any consideration, for example, last week, the presiding officers uh, and a number of the party leaders uh, gave speeches in relation to the apology that, that um, flowed from the Jenkins report? Um, was there consideration given to, um, you know, allowing attend uh, people to attend in a sort of socially distanced and safe? Yes, and, and my way? understanding is in the House of Representatives, people did attend in that way. Some specific. I mean, they yeah. had they had to be signed in by an individual member of Parliament. Um, uh, there, there was, it, so we, we, did, last we were never that, going to yes. make the building open to the public. Mm. Um, because it just would simply become impossible to police uh, galleries and um, uh, social distancing in that kind of environment. I mean, if we had five or six hundred people turn up, for example, you know, it would be very difficult to then manage that. So it, it was done effectively. Um, we've, we've had... Uh, uh, there was one person in the Senate galleries for a condolence motion, for example, uh, a small number for a first speech this week, as you would have seen. Um, so there has been an availability, uh, but it needed to be done in a controllable manner. So but, it's not, but specific, it's not so public access. That's right. It's not public access. It, it's, uh, there, there was belatedly some arrangements made last week for, for um, some people, but it wasn't a... Um, it wasn't public access no. provided on a, so as you say, condolence motions. No, the, the, the very clear health advice we had is resignations. The building, um, the you know, should, family have attended. The building should not be open. And are you comfortable with access. with that continuing? Uh, after this week, yeah, I expect those arrangements to be reviewed. I'm not going to preempt a decision. Uh, it's a joint decision made with the speaker, so I can't preempt his decision. But um, we are certainly have that under active review, Senator Ayers. Are you are you comfortable with the public being excluded from the building? I beg your pardon. Are you comfortable with the public? Being As a excluded? general principle, absolutely not. This is a public building. This is a building of the Australian people. Mr. Stephanie, can you tell me how many um, visitor passes have been issued at the ministerial wing entrance in the past sitting fortnight? Uh, I'd have have to take that on notice, Senator. Um, um, Senator, could I um, just to loop back to the road closures? Yes, thank you. Um, sure. I just got some further information for you. Um, so the um, road closure um, initially occurred on the 31st of January. Yes. Uh, and the first information circular was um, sent uh, on the 31st of January at 10.30pm. And who was that sent to? 
Um, so that was an information circular that went to all of Parliament House, so the entire network. And did that, that tell people, um, perhaps you could provide that um, on notice or later in the day, but did that tell people about the road closures? Uh, it, so I have it in front of me. Um, so it, it's titled Protest Activity Around Parliament House uh, Road Barriers. Due to the protest activity near Parliament House, the Australian Federal Police has closed access roads to the building. Building occupants wanting to enter the car parks or drop off points may need to show identification uh, to police who are at the barricades. Uh, please exercise care and allow extra time to complete your journey. Uh, then, um, then there was a follow up message that, um, so I can table that um, for you. If yeah, you like. thank you. That'd be helpful. If, yeah. Um, yeah. And then there was a follow up um, message, which I don't have in front of me, but I'm happy to table that as well. Uh, on the 2nd of February, uh, which was a reminder about the road closures um, and provided specific advice about uh, access through Melbourne Avenue. Thank you. I, I, just to assist um, the chair and the committee, I, I reckon I've got about five minutes worth of questions to go. Um, so if you can just maybe we break early I, for... I was about to say I propose that we just go to morning yeah, a little sure, earlier. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, Senator um, Well, just one final bracket of questions then, Mr Stefanik, is that the issue of casual staff access to, um, to the um, parliamentary computer network, is there somebody here who can assist with that? Uh, yes, I could ask the acting CIO um, to come up. Um, Thanks very much. The, the, hmm. I think this was raised during the last session of estimates. So, so staff employed on casual contracts um, should automatically have their access to emails and the IT systems terminated at the end of their contract, which means they have to renew their arrangements every 28 days. Yes. Um, so there's a lot of sort of time wasting and mucking around that's involved in that. Um, can, can you just tell me, um, has, this been, has this issue been resolved? Um, no, so I might um, start off with a non... And, and I'll very ones. quickly be out of my depth if we start yeah. going too far into sort of... No, no, that's all right. I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep um, it Has on. it been fixed and how has it been fixed is what I really want to know. Uh, all right, I'll let you... Did you... That's right. Um, so the... Uh, it has not been resolved yet. Okay. Um, so the... Um, it's a matter of process between Department of Finance and ourselves. Um, because the um, so for casual st casual staff that work for parliamentarians, um, we receive notification from Department of Finance before we put them on our network, and then we rely on notification from Department of Finance to remove them from the network, and with so that is an automated process where we are advised. So we simply follow advice that we we receive from Department of Finance. What we are explore. Um, what we are exploring now is how we could potentially leave casual staff um, with an active um, email account. Um, that is an easier process to switch on once they return. The problem for us is that some casual staff work for multiple members of parliament. Um, and so having an identity that gives people network access to one area um, becomes problematic because you would need multiple identities for that person across the network. So that is one of the sort of broader security issues we need to work through. Um, I don't know if Mr. Spheris can. It, no, uh, it seems to me it's. Oh, sorry, Mr. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. Con Spheris, Acting Chief Information Officer. Um, what Rob's, uh, what Mr. Stefanik has indicated is correct. We're currently working through the issue with the Department of Finance. Um, from one of the things that we are working through with them is that uh, we have the obligation to follow the guidance that's provided by finance to us as the employing agency. So at the last last time we spoke about this, uh, finance, um, DPS, special minister of state all engaged in this process. If the question is, has anything changed? The answer really is no. Correct. Okay. I think you can appreciate those, Senator Ayres. I mean, the difficulty here, if, if, if a casual, if, if you and your two colleagues employ the same person on a casual basis, then, you know, but 
then drops off employment for one or two or three of you and then comes back on for one of you, what emails they have access to and what parts of the network they have access to. I mean, you do have some quite complex moving parts there that need to be dealt with. Well, I, I, look, I start to lose the will to live when I think about the problem <laughs> too hard, but, but that's the job of the department and, and the Department of Finance to resolve it. I'm not, I just have to say I'm not quite sure why um, that's been too difficult to resolve. Sorry, yeah. Staff or casual staff are working across multiple offices versus casual staff which you know are repeatedly employed within the same office. I actually I don't have those numbers, Senator, on me. I need to take that on notice and get those numbers. Well, is that something you can find? Because if that's the issue which is making this problem insurmountable to solve, it would be good to know actually how many staff it affects if you can separate those staff out under another rule and if you have visibility over which staff in the building are just repeatedly working for the same Member of Parliament under these contracts? Um, it's certainly a matter we'll look into, Senator. Um. And can I just clarify as well further to Senator Ayer's questions? What are, the, what, what are your plans for the next steps to resolve this? Because I understand there's a lot of issues and complexity, but what, where to next? Um, Senator, we are still working with uh, Department of Finance to, uh, to look at the, as the Secretary indicated, that around the synchronisation, looking at whether or not we'll continue to use the synchronisation of um, accounts from uh, cessations from DPS, uh, from finance, sorry, um, and then looking potentially at options whereby we, or other options where alternatives where we may use that information plus information directly from parliamentarians. Okay. So do you expect when we're back here in a month's time for the next estimates you'll have a fix or at least a An plan approach. for a fix? Yeah. Is that something you can yeah. commit to? Yeah. I think one of the things, Senator, that I just need to highlight is that the obligation, so under the PS, the Protective Security Policy Framework, um, it does actually specifically spe uh, specifies that finance retains re responsibility for initiating um, the clearance process and managing the separation process and not DPS, so we, we are bound under that, that component to take the advice specifically from finance. What we're working through is what we can do within, the, within that guideline, also what would be acceptable to ensure that we both are, um, I guess, maintaining compliance with that, with that requirement of the PSPF. Okay. Can I just two more questions, Chair. Can I just ask on computer outages, ICT outages, have, have any of those this year been the result of um, hacks or cyber security breaches? No, there has not. None this year? Okay. Um, and Mr Stephanie, there's been, I think, some anticipation that there will be some changes to air filtration and ventilation in the parliament as a response to the pandemic. Is there any, are there any plans? Are there any plans to do any of that work? Um, I'm not aware of any senator. Um, I know that we had upgraded our filtration, um, our air filtration during the fires, which mm. introduced a, a higher standard of um, filtration because of the partic uh, particulates uh, in the air. Um, I'm not aware of any. So no, no plans in the building or childcare centre. Uh, no, the, the building air conditioning meets um, all building requirements. And the air quality is frequently checked, Senator. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Senator Thanks, Ayres. Chair. If Senators have no other questions, um, we will dismiss DPS with our thanks for appearing here today. That concludes our examination of the parliamentary departments. The committee will now suspend for a short break and return to commence its examination of the Prime Minister and Cabinet portfolio at 10.35am. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The meeting of the committee. Um, and I welcome the Minister for Finance, Senator the Honourable Simon Birmingham, representing the Prime Minister, Ms Stephanie Foster, Deputy Secretary of Governance and APS for Reform, and other officers of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? Hey, good morning, Chair. Good morning, Senators. Uh, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, aside from wishing you all a very happy Valentine's Day, I have no particular thank opening you. statement.
Happy Valentine's Day to you too, Minister. Um, Ms Foster, do you wish to make an opening statement? Uh, yes, please, Chair. Thank you. I'm Stephanie Foster, Deputy Secretary Governance, Head of APS Reform in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. The members of PMNC's executive in attendance at Parliament House for this session to answer your questions are Ms Alison Frame, Deputy Secretary, Social Policy, Mr Simon Duggan, Deputy Secretary, Economy, Industry and G20 Sherpa, Mr Tom Gilmartin, Chief Operating Officer, and Mr Rod Brazier, Acting Deputy Secretary, National Security and International Policy. Mr Scott Dewar, Deputy Secretary, Quad, AUKUS and Naval Shipbuilding, is overseas and is available online. In recognition of his location and the time difference with the UK, we would be appreciative if Mr Dewar would be able to receive questions earlier in the hearings if that could be accommodated. Mm -hmm. The Department has ensured key senior officials are physically present here at APH to assist the committee. There are also a number of senior officials attending virtually, available to answer questions. There may be a slight delay for those witnesses uh, attending virtually as they join the session, and a detailed list has been provided to the committee secretariat. Since the last estimates, the changes to the executive um, are Mr Scott Dewar, commencing as Deputy Secretary National Security and International Policy on 29 November 2021, and on 7 February 2022, a new Deputy Secretary position, Deputy Secretary Quad, AUKUS and Naval Shipbuilding was established within the National Security and International Policy Group. Mr Scott Dewar has taken on this new Deputy Secretary position. Mr Rod Brazier will be acting Deputy Secretary of National Security and International Policy in the interim. And I have PMNC's current organisational chart here for the committee. Thank you very much, Ms Foster. Senator Gallagher, you have the call. Thank you very much, Chair. And um, is the organisational chart being circulated, Ms Foster? Uh, it should be being tabled okay. as we speak. Thank you. I have a copy here if no one else Thank does. Thank you. Thanks, I'll start with some questions for um, Mr Dewar, who I understand is time limited uh, sure, today. Sure, thank you very much. Will he, will he be able to answer some questions I have on Ukraine? Uh, yes, Senator, the yeah. extent that we, we can do that. Though Mr Brazier, um, I think, may well be able to assist and he is here with us. Okay. Good morning, Senator Rod Brazier, Acting Deputy Secretary, National Security and International Policy. Good morning. Um, can you please provide the committee with an update on the current situation in the Ukraine? Uh, thanks, Senator. Yes, I can. Uh, as has been reported in the media, um, Russia is um, amassing uh, considerable uh, military a strength on the on its borders and Belarus's borders uh, with with Ukraine. Uh, the international community has urged Russia not to uh, take steps that could uh, endanger peace uh, in in the region. Uh, the Australian government is of course very concerned about Ukraine not being intimidated uh, in this way. Uh, there's an inherent concern in that respect, but there's also a concern about the effect on global norms that uh, tolerance of this sort of behaviour uh, could have. Uh, as of uh, yesterday morning, as a result of the uh, threat to peace and, and stability in the region. Uh, the Australian Embassy in Kiev was uh, temporarily closed. Uh, the Australian-based DFAT staff and AFP staff uh, left Kiev by road and at 6.30 Ukraine time yesterday, uh, those staff arrived 
in the city of Lviv in the west of Ukraine, where uh, the embassy has set up a facility for operations. This is a temporary move that will be kept under review, uh, considering the uh, security uh, situation. Posts are in contact with colleagues from like-minded embassies that have also relocated to uh, Lviv. Uh, locally engaged staff uh, who are employed uh, via an arrangement with the uh, Canadian Embassy uh, will be placed on paid miscellaneous leave for a period of two weeks. I think I... if my memory is correct, that relocation was of the final three embassy officials that... Yep. Uh, this uh, is the that, one that happened yesterday? Yes, yes. that's right. That, uh, that uh, there had been steps over a period of time that saw uh, partners and children um, of, uh, of Australian um, officials uh, relocated or, uh, or come home. Um, then a reduced number of, uh, of officials overall as a relocation took place with, uh, with three individuals um, staying to continue to provide consular assistance to Australians uh, who were still in the Ukraine. Um, and, uh, and as the Prime Minister did yesterday, I'd echo that you know, particular thanks, of course, to our officials who, uh, who find themselves in the world's hotspots um, mm. on occasions like this and, uh, and continue to serve Australia's interests and to help Australians in those circumstances. Yeah, agreed. Does, um, does the Australian government have an understanding of how many Russian troops are currently mobilised on Ukraine's eastern border? Um, there would be, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Department of Defence, there would be a, a detailed understanding of that, but it's in the, it's in the many uh, tens of thousands, Senator. So you don't have that information with you, or it's just we don't get to that until later in the week? You know? um, um, I could find an estimate for you and, uh, and share it with you during the course of the hearing, Senator. OK. I do have a number of questions on Ukraine, so I'll just work through them. There have been reports that Russia has mobilised logistical support, including hospital units, to support its troop deployments. Has this been verified, these reports, by the Australian government? Uh, that would be part of, of the normal kind of uh, mobilisation uh, that, that Russia is, is conducting, and I've seen uh, those media reports. But you, you're not sure if we've confirmed that independently? Well, so, so, Senator, I don't, um, I don't believe that, um, for a little bit of context there, that Australia would be confirming independently on those types of reports. We are working very closely with partners and allies um, in engagement about the situation along the Ukrainian border. Um, uh, the, uh, the information we have is part of that cooperative uh, effort in terms of the surveillance and analysis undertaken by many nations. Um, uh, but, uh, but I think, um, I think uh, uh, to say, to give a generalisation, and, uh, and Mr Brazy has indicated he can get further information perhaps during the course of this morning from Foreign Affairs and Defence to supplement um, what he has to hand. But uh, as a general observation, the, um, the media reports about the scale of the build-up uh, and the nature of that build-up, including the types of resourcing that Russia has put into that, are um, reports that, uh, that I think have been well informed in, uh, in terms of the analysis of, uh, of our partners and allies uh, working together about what Russia is doing. Okay. Um, all right, so I'll I might come back to some, but when, when was the decision made to close the embassy in Kiev? I understand that decision was made over the weekend, Senator. Okay, so sometime over the weekend. The, uh, the, it was announced, I think, yesterday morning, wasn't it? If, um, so it has to have been Saturday then? I, I think that's right, yes. Right. On Saturday. Do you know how many um, Australians remain in Ukraine registered with DFAT? There are uh, 147 Australian 
citizens, permanent residents and, and dependents uh, presently uh, registered with uh, DFAT. Okay. Who are current, who remain in, in Ukraine at, as yes. at now? That's okay. my understanding, Senator. Yes. Okay. And what advice and assistance is the government able to offer them at this time? Uh, Senator Australia's travel advice for Ukraine was updated to uh, do not travel on the 24th of January. And this was supplemented by further advice to leave immediately on the 8th of February. The uh, embassy in Kiev uh, would have been in a direct contact with all those Australians, permanent residents and dependents that uh, were appropriately uh, registered uh, to convey the uh, advice that they need to uh, leave uh, immediately. As the, as the Prime Minister has said, uh, there are still commercial means for uh, Australians to uh, take heed of, of this advice and uh, they should do so as soon as possible. Okay, so the government has reached out to those people that remain? To those who are registered with Who are registered and remain, the 147. That's right, Senator. So they've been individually spoken to, or, or well, is there I, another way I, they are? I, I, I certainly understand that DFAT uh, has been in touch over a period of time from the um, warnings and notification and advice changes that Mr Brazier went through, particularly the 8 February um, indication that people should leave the Ukraine and uh, that DFAT has been um, in contact via email, text message type means uh, with, uh, with those Australians re registered um, as being in the Ukraine and to provide information about the different avenues for leaving. Um, that includes means for, of assistance with uh, commercial bookings of flights. Uh, of course, there are also um, uh, avenues for departing uh, by land, uh, by road, uh, through uh, through um, Western Ukraine uh, into uh, into different safe havens as well that uh, that individuals have um, taken uh, passage of. Um, I can't recall the exact figure, but the figure Mr. Brazier now gives of the number of registered Australians in the Ukraine is certainly significantly lower. Yeah. Than the one I recall being briefed on several weeks ago. That, that, that's right. And uh, just to. So, to do you know, clarify, sorry, just to, before you go to there, do you know how many people have, have left, registered with DFAT who have left in the, since those advisories were provided? The, the, the figure of, of around last week was around 170 or 180. Mm -hmm. So, that number has, has fallen. And if I can ju just circle back to uh, your question regarding whether all of those uh, individuals have been contacted, yeah. uh, there may be, uh, that number may uh, be comprised of family units, for example, where there is a single uh, point of contact. Ah, right, okay. So it's not 147 individuals. It, it could, I think it is, it is 147 oh. individuals, oh, but, but uh, for but example, if there was a, a, a family, a family form, unit, yeah. there would okay. pr probably be a single point of contact for that. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the embassy closed yesterday after a decision taken on Saturday. And then you said, I think, in your opening comments that at 6.30 p.m., I presume, Ukrainian time... That's right. Um, ..the temporary arrangements were put in place in Lviv. Is that right? That's correct, Senator. OK. And so that's the three people, or is it more than three people? Um, three uh, diplomats and yeah. two AFP officers. OK. So there was five people that left Kiev? There, there were five that left yeah. Kiev. Okay, yes. so three, three DFAT employees and two, two AFP. AFP radio. And by, by late that same day, they were able to, to get temporary arrangements up and running? Uh, well, those arrangements had been put in place in advance of that okay. move, movement. But they were able and to staff them? That's right, and they travel overland to Lviv. 
Okay. Can you just... Yeah, uh, and oh, just uh, and again, for a little context, the AFP presence uh, in the Ukraine is, uh, is, partic is in particular still related to ongoing cooperation as, uh, as part of the response to MH17. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and the ongoing work that, uh, that we have uh, had with the Netherlands, the Ukraine, and, uh, and of course Australian officials around the prosecution of, uh, okay. of individuals. In so they're on a specific job, uh, task, essentially. So they, they're that's not right. there providing protection. No. So our, so our Ukrainian embassy has had what would appear uh, to sort of on a normalised basis to be an elevated presence of, uh, of AFP officials as, uh, as a result of, uh, of that cooperation around, uh, around those ongoing investigations yep. and prosecutions. Okay. Um, can you just briefly summarise for the committee how the international community, particularly the US and, and European states, have responded to the situation in Ukraine? The... Um Several uh, NATO members led by the United States uh, and have provided uh, technical assistance, uh, advice uh, for the Ukrainian government, including its defence forces, uh, in the uh, recent weeks as the Russian uh, build-up has occurred. Uh, they have uh, foreshadowed uh, other forms of uh, response. Uh, including uh, sanctions uh, against uh, those who uh, w would be involved in um, an, any illegal um, encroachment onto Ukraine uh, territory. And they've also, as you uh, would have seen in the media, um, Senator, several leaders have in recent days uh, engaged in what might be called shuttle diplomacy uh, to uh, have face-to-face -face meetings, including with uh, President Putin and uh, President Zelensky, uh, to encourage peaceful resolution of the uh, present uh, tensions. And our, um, the Prime Minister here has said Australia supports Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. What steps has Australia taken to demonstrate that support and how are we responding to the situation in Ukraine? Um, Senator, I, I, I've got an answer to the question earlier. Before I answer that question, oh, sure. I've got yep, um, yep. An, an estimate of 130,000 Russian troops. On Sorry, how many was that? 130,000 right. uh, troops on the border, and, and that's in Russian territory, but also uh, to the immediate um, north of Ukraine in uh, Belarus. Um, the support Australia is providing to um, Ukraine. Um, over the past 12 months, Defence has funded capacity building training in cyber security uh, to Ukraine officials in, uh, the, in, in recognition of the fact that uh, cyber attacks uh, increasing in volume and, and frequency would be uh, expected uh, in this situation. So Australia has provided um, training in that area. Australia's ambassador for cyber affairs and critical technology has discussed assistance directly uh, with the government of, of Ukraine. And uh, the, the government is, is currently uh, considering uh, what other options it uh, can uh, provide to support um, Ukraine. The Australian government is currently considering. Yep, yeah, it's been kept under review. So, um, okay. So when you said cyber security training, sorry, I think you did mention a date. You said over the last. Over the last twelve months. Twelve months. Okay. So this predates that. That. That training. So, you've been, actually, the Australian government's been providing training to the Ukrainian government officials in cyber security. That's right, sir. Since um, February last year, is that right? Correct. Okay. So that predates the announcement, I think, uh, where I saw the foreign minister recently say we are. Oh, that's on the 25th of January, the Foreign Minister said uh, we are asking 
our cyber affairs and critical technology to discuss possible avenues of assistance so that the training was already happening prior to that? There was, um, there was ongoing um, contact on this, um, on this area and uh, cooperation, uh, but as I understand it, the um, offer being made via Australia's Ambassador for Cyber Affairs and Critical Technology, uh, Dr Feakin, has been to increase and intensify that, uh, okay. that cooperation. And as yet, though, that remains unclear what, what actually, what concrete assistance. So that was 25th of January, so what's three weeks, three or so weeks ago. We I don't know what that is yet. Um, but I, I know that Dr Feakin has been in direct contact with the, with the government of, of Ukraine uh, in, recent, uh, in recent weeks. Uh, and in, in the course of this hearing or directly with uh, DFAT, you may be able to uh, get further specifics on that, uh, Senator. But there hasn't been an announce, a further announcement. I, I haven't been able to see anything from the Foreign Minister post her comments on the 25th of January that any decision has been taken in regard to that, that foreshadowed assistance. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of a further announcement by the foreign minister. Standing. Not aware. Okay. So it doesn't, minister. It doesn't appear that there is any any um, decision or or assistance that follows on from that commitment by the foreign minister as of yet. Um, well, Senator, I think to to the initial question you asked on uh, on this stream with uh, with Mr. Brazier, I want to just make clear again at the outset that the government has been unequivocal in terms of our public, uh, private and diplomatic support for uh, the Ukraine's uh, sovereignty uh, and, uh, and the need to respect um, its territorial borders uh, and, uh, and in urging uh, Russia uh, to uh, de-escalate tensions uh, by engaging in all diplomatic discussions uh, and by, uh, by withdrawing uh, the build-up of troops that have amassed upon uh, the Ukrainian border. Um, as, as Mr. Brazier has indicated, um, there's been um, some longer term, at least you know, from at least last year, aspects of it probably go back further in terms of different elements of cooperation, but some longer term cooperation with Ukraine, some of it over that last year, specific to, uh, to those areas of countering um, cyber interference and strengthening, uh, strengthening um, training or the like in those areas, which is a type of practical thing that, uh, that Australia can do. Um, in terms of how that has scaled or changed um, following that particular statement of the Foreign Minister, um, if we have some extra information that we can bring to, to light, and we will. Um, you know, they would be operational elements of, um, of those different agencies that, um, that it doesn't look like they're in the briefings PMC have at the table right now, but we can try to get that mm. operational information. Um, uh, obviously, the Foreign Minister and the Prime Minister continue to be engaged in, uh, in a number of different global discussions about um, the potential scenarios around the Ukraine. Um, we have been clear that, uh, that Australia would not be committing you know, troops to action uh, in, uh, in the Ukraine in that type of uh, response, uh, but uh, that, uh, that our responses would be um, uh, strong and, uh, and that we are uh, obviously looking at uh, questions of um, further sanctions or other activity. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Australia already has um, a range of sanctions in place uh, with Russia um, and, uh, and we would be uh, working with counterparts to make sure that the type of action they have made clear uh, Russia would face uh, were it to breach uh, the Ukrainian border, uh, that, uh, that Australia would be acting in concert uh, with those international partners around any of that. Um, I can um, advise that uh, um, the Foreign Minister uh, spoke with her Ukrainian counterpart on the 19th of January. That may be the statement you were referring to. 19th? Uh, um, yes. Um, uh, that uh, the Foreign Minister discussed Ukraine with Quad partners on the 11th of February um, uh, with, uh, with um, many counterparts uh, across Europe 
um, uh, during a visit to Europe in December of last year, um, uh, and, uh, and of course uh, during the AUKMIN discussions that took place in Australia during January. They're just a exa few examples of some of those ministerial level engagements, which obviously DFAT could go into more detail about, uh, about some of those. Okay. So just to track back a bit, um, I think, um, Mr Brazier, how, how is it that um, PMNC wouldn't be aware or not aware of either what the Foreign Minister said or if indeed commitments had been made for further assistance? Like, so, so, I think so, so, that, so, so. that was sort of both of your... No, your responses Senator, there. No, no, Senator, in fairness, I mean, there's, there's an operational level question there that if we already have um, work around training and support uh, in response to um, uh, um, cyber attacks or the like that's, uh, that's in place, um, if there's a scaling up, uh, a change, a pivot, a development in addition to that, I mean, there, uh, there's a degree of operational activity there. Um, we can get those, uh, those briefings around exactly how that has scaled or, uh, or developed further. It's just not something that either of us have in the briefing packs at the table. But, I mean, the issues facing Ukraine are extremely topical at the moment. And I note the Prime Minister has talked about a coalition of autocracies that are destabilising the world. And yet the evidence that we're hearing is there isn't a priority to provide any practical assistance over the, what was being provided for the last 12 months. And we know, and the Australian government knows, there's 130,000 troops on the Ukrainian border. So I'm just a bit surprised that PMNC isn't aware of any practical assistance that's being provided to Ukraine, well, that's, considering... That's where we are right now. That, that, that's, that's not fair, Senator, because Mr. Well, that's Brazier, my question. Because Mr. Brazier has, in fact, talked through uh, practical assistance that hasn't just materialised in the last few weeks, but indeed uh, dates back over the last year. Well, he, he, he advised the committee that there's been some cyber security training that's been in place for the last 12 months. And then I've asked the question that since the 25th of January, when the foreign minister told publicly on, on, in the media that, um, that there were discussions underway between the Ambassador for Cyber Affairs and the Ukrainian government. And I've asked what has happened since then. And the answer from both you and Mr Brazier is you don't know. And I'm asking, well, how can that possibly be the case when you are representing the Prime Minister? Is because the exact detail, Senator, of um, how many officials engaging in what training or what specific um, cyber security matters you know, would be held by the relevant agencies. But uh, I'm happy for us to go and get that. Uh, over and above that level of practical support for Ukrainian officials, uh, the principal element of, uh, of uh, Australia's diplomatic response um, is about trying to ensure there is as united a front for deterrence uh, by Russia uh, in regards to taking further action um, uh, in terms of incursions into Ukraine. Um, that united front in terms of deterrence is, uh, is about making sure that um, we, together uh, with uh, other partners and allies, particularly across the democratic world, particularly those, uh, of course, throughout uh, Western Europe um, with, uh, with proximity uh, to the Ukraine, uh, are clear that we are all speaking with one voice about uh, the type of um, response uh, that would occur if Russia uh, were to breach the Ukrainian border, uh, that, uh, that the uh, sanctions and actions that, uh, that would be pursued um, in support of the Ukraine and, uh, and against Russia uh, would be as comprehensive uh, as possible. Um, uh, there are no doubt practical um, um, steps, as I say, that many nations are taking with the, with the Ukraine at present. Um, Australia is seeking to play our part through that type of cyber training, um, but the, the most important deterrence elements there are, uh, are about the 
uh, building as united a global coalition as possible uh, to, uh, to deter Russia from, uh, from taking those types of, uh, uh, of acts uh, against the Ukraine. Okay, but in terms of the, I find it, I just, you know, I find it a little unbelievable that the International Division of PM&C isn't able, well, one says that they're not aware of what the Foreign Minister is saying on foreign policy, particularly on a matter as sensitive as Ukraine, and secondly, that's, that, that's can't... That's not what officials said. So. And, and secondly, can't provide an update to the committee on what the practical assistance that I've heard the Foreign Minister and the Prime Minister refer to are, what they are, or if indeed there has been anything. I mean, putting aside the training that, that predates this current crisis in Ukraine, what actions or what assistance has the Australian government provided to the Ukraine? And, well, I don't think you can put aside uh, the training that, uh, that uh, has been provided. That's an important demonstration of practical assistance um, sitting alongside but it the wide diplomatic the foreign minister's effort commitments. that is being undertaken. Um, well, it carries through, I, uh, I would expect, Senator, the foreign minister's commitments, and it, uh, it uh, I'm sure, is a pillar upon which um, they're being built. So you can't put aside any aspect of support there. The key pillar of support um, um, beyond those practical elements is that diplomatic support as a united deterrence factor uh, that I spoke about before, Senator. Um, we will seek to get whatever additional detail around practical assistance uh, that we can to provide you with, noting, Senator, that there may be restraints upon what we can share in, uh, in that regard, in that, uh, in that obviously, um, uh, uh, cyber defences um, are things that, uh, that are um, important and sensitive uh, and so um, you know, the granularity of what information might be able to be provided might be limited but, uh, but happy for us to, uh, to seek to get that from departments and to provide that during the day. Um, I mean, as uh, all of the other agencies and departments are available this week, um, to provide that sort of granularity, but we'll get what we can for you. So does the International Division of PM&C brief the Prime Minister on Ukraine? Yes, it does, Senator. Okay. And in those briefings, are you drawing from other agencies about information that they have? Yes, we do. Okay. So presumably, if Australia was providing avenues of assistance, as foreshadowed by the Foreign Minister on the 25th of January, that would come through the briefing process to the Prime Minister? Yes. Okay. So, in, as part of that, you would need to know if we were, if we, as part of briefing the Prime Minister, you would then know from your collection of information whether additional assistance had been provided. Yes, Senator, you would have and, to tell him. And that's, that's right. And he has been uh, briefed uh, that uh, Dr Fekin has been in touch uh, with uh, the Ukrainian uh, government uh, with uh, proposals to intensify uh, that cooperation around, um, around cyber security. Um, Australia has a very strong reputation uh, in that field and it's, uh, it's a capability that Ukraine is seeking to develop uh, to, to defend okay. itself okay. and through that uh, period of uh, earlier contact on the subject uh, I understand uh, the, the government of Ukraine um, held a high regard uh, for what Australia was able to offer and uh, wanted to uh, intensify that. And uh, we will uh, be able today to provide you with uh, the operational details of uh, that cooperation. Okay, so you haven't, you haven't as yet briefed the Prime Minister on the operational details of what that intensification might look like? Well, at, I, I won't go to the contents, uh, the exact contents of uh, briefing by the department but, for, for yeah, the Prime sure. Minister. But it seems like you don't know. That, that's the point I'm making. You don't know what the operational 
proposals around the intensification are, because you would know them. If you knew them, you'd be able to tell us today. So presumably well, you haven't got to that point. Well, well Senator, I, I think as has been clear, following... The, yeah. Firstly, you know, let's, let's be pretty clear that tensions around the Ukraine don't just relate to the period since the recent build-up of troops uh, along the border with Russia. Um, you know, the Ukraine has been subject to various threats um, from uh, Russia in particular over a long period of time, and cyber security threats have been very significant uh, amongst, uh, amongst those activities. And so um, Australia's support for the Ukraine is manifested in the broader diplomatic effort and also, I guess, is given um, practical effect by virtue of that cooperation from last year around cyber security and training demonstrating very clearly that you know, we are willing um, to act uh, as well as provide um, the, uh, the diplomatic support in, uh, in terms of the Ukraine. As, uh, as Mr Brazy has indicated, since the Foreign Minister's uh, engagement and statements that you've asked about, there have been um, uh, discussions with the Ukraine about what other support can, uh, can be undertaken, what, uh, what Mr Brazier doesn't have to hand at present and, uh, and what may be sensitive in terms of what can be, uh, be provided um, is what the Ukraine has accepted in that regard and what actions are underway. But, uh, but as we've indicated, if there is more we can provide, we will. Can I just um, jump in there quickly? Senator Gallagher, um, you've had the call for over half an hour now and I'll just flag that we, I do have some government senators for questions to International Division on AUKUS that we will need to get to before okay. lunch. All right. Before what? Lunch. Lunch. Because okay. we, we lose one of our witnesses. Okay. Again. I have a few. I have a few more. Okay. Um, okay. So just to finish that line of questioning off, from the date that the foreign minister made the comments publicly that there was you were engaging with the Ukrainian government around possible avenues of assistance to today. There hasn't been any public comment around what that additional assistance might be over the past three weeks. Not, um, not to my knowledge, Senator, but that would not be unusual either. Um, you know, we wouldn't ordinarily go through publicly the detail of sensitive defence or security assistance being provided to, um, between okay. nations, particularly at a time of such sensitivity as, uh, as is the case along the Ukrainian border. Okay. So, um, Senator Birmingham, how many times has the National Security Committee of Cabinet discussed the situation in Ukraine? Um, well, uh, Senator, I don't, I don't think it would be practice for us to go through chapter and verse um, discussions um, I'm uh, not asking of cabinet a discussion. committees. Uh, or indeed not. the different agenda items of cabinet committees, but I can assure you uh, that NSC has been briefed uh, and briefed on multiple occasions. And it's meeting regularly, is it? NSC always meets regularly, has been my experience. And yes, it is, Senator. To... Um, has the Prime Minister had any direct discussions with the President of Ukraine? Not to my knowledge, Senator. Not to not to your knowledge, and you would know? Yeah, uh, well, Mr. Uh, Brazier? we've not provided any uh, briefing to support a, a discussion between the Prime Minister and President uh, Zelensky. Uh, as um, Minister Birmingham noted earlier, the Foreign Minister met her Ukrainian counterpart, Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba, uh, in Europe on 19th of January. So the Foreign Minister's met um, the Ukrainian Foreign Minister on the 19th of January. Why has the Prime Minister not picked up the phone to the President of the Ukraine, considering the, the situation Ukraine's in at the moment? Well, I, I, I think, Senator, um, you should perhaps just contemplate that question from um, the position of President Zelensky and the Ukraine government uh, as well there, that uh, there are no shortage of, uh, of pressures in their system at present. Uh, Australia, through our foreign minister, through our ambassador and through our public statements and through our engagement with partners and allies has continued to make our position very clear uh, and our support for Ukraine's sovereignty and independence very clear and our opposition uh, to 
autocracies like Russia engaging in, uh, in the way they are through, uh, through the troop build-up. Um, uh, I am sure uh, that if, uh, if President Zelensky uh, wished to, uh, to engage with leaders in our part of the world, um, that, uh, that Prime Minister Morrison would be very happy uh, to, uh, to have that engagement. Um, uh, but, uh, but of course, you know, what we are doing is seeking to make sure we provide the maximum support uh, to the efforts of partners and allies uh, and those efforts are being led uh, by those who have um, closer ties and particularly closer geographical proximity um, to this issue. So, um, so your evidence then is that President Zelensky hasn't requested a phone call from the Australian Prime Minister or he's busy? I'm, I'm, I'm sure President Zelensky is very busy, Senator. Yeah, but the build-up has been happening for months and your evidence today is that the Australian Prime Minister, who's made it, certainly made it clear in media interviews that uh, his, his desire to stand with Ukraine and support Ukraine hasn't actually picked up the phone and offered Australia's assistance. Uh, Australia's communications to the Ukraine have been very, very clear uh, in terms of our support for them. Uh, the Prime Minister has been continuously engaged in this matter through, uh, through uh, the briefings either of his department, through NSC briefings, as I acknowledged before, involving defence and DFAT uh, officials, uh, and of course through his direct dialogue with the Foreign Minister uh, in particular, who has uh, been engaged directly with uh, Ukraine's Foreign Minister, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and of course the work of uh, agencies and ambassador on the ground. But uh, uh, I think, um, as I said before, Senator, um, uh, we are making sure we play our role um, as a very close partner and ally of many nations who are working closely with the Ukraine, whose uh, leaders are routinely uh, in touch with the Ukrainian leadership. Um, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if, heaven forbid, Senator, this situation were occurring in our part of the world um, and, uh, and, uh, and involving an autocracy uh, and a challenged border in our part of the world, uh, then I would expect that, uh, um, that our Prime Minister would be speaking with uh, other allies on a daily or more frequent basis, um, but maybe that, uh, that wouldn't include the Ukrainian President who might simply send their support by other means. So, I'll just finish up here. Thank you, Senator so, Can you advise the committee on whether Mr Morrison has um, spoken directly, made calls to foreign leaders to discuss the situation in Ukraine, specifically? Um, sorry. Well, the, the, the Prime Minister has discussed uh, the situation in the Ukraine uh, with um, uh, other leaders, um, including most recently when he met with the Quad Foreign Ministers just last week. Um, but uh, we can get further yeah. details. He's had those okay. discussions with uh, leaders uh, um, uh, in the EU and uh, happy to get some of that detail. Leaders in the EU, but you're not sure? Um, so I understand the Quad meeting went on last week, but has, has there been calls to President Biden President Macron, Chancellor Schultz, any others? You would know, wouldn't you, Mr Brazier, if there had been calls, that's your area, you would provide advice um, um, that, and a brief right. for the Prime Minister? Yep, that's right. In, in terms of recent, um, recent telephone uh, calls um, with international leaders. Uh, there have been uh, numerous with, uh, with European uh, leaders uh, as to uh, whether they all featured discussion of, of the Ukraine. I'd, um, I, I couldn't speak to the detail because we don't typically uh, release uh, the contents of um, the Prime Minister's discussions with uh, foreign leaders. Uh, but um, I can um, 
Okay. Have a list for you. That would be useful. But you're not aware of any calls on the Ukraine to President Biden, Macron, or Chancellor Scholz. You would know that, wouldn't you? I uh, well, generally that's true. We have not provided briefing to support uh, phone calls uh, with uh, with um, those leaders uh, in in recent weeks. Um, but as I said, I can take on, on notice um, the, the full uh, list of okay. uh, possibly relevant calls. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brazen. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Patterson, you have the call. Thanks, Chair. I have some questions about the AUKUS agreement. Are the right officials at the table for AUKUS? Um, Mr. Jewell is online. Senator. Oh, great. Excellent, thank you. Um, what was the rationale for Australia to acquire nuclear propelled submarines with the assistance of the United States and United Kingdom? I think you might be on mute, Ms. Stewart. We can see you, but we can't hear you. Sorry, excuse me. That's better. We can now hear you, Mr. Dewar. Thank you. You can hear me? Sorry. Yes, thank Apologies. You. Uh, 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 Scott Dewar, Deputy Secretary, Quad AUKUS and Naval Shipbuilding. Uh, the rationale behind the uh, decision to uh, acquire nuclear powered submarines was that uh, uh, government uh, had uh, assessed that uh, conventionally powered submarines wouldn't be able to meet Australia's uh, operational needs going forward. And uh, a nuclear powered submarine with its greater uh, range and stealth and other capabilities would be uh, better able to do that. What are the strategic advantages of modern nuclear powered submarine technology? Uh, Senator, it's the, uh, it goes to that uh, uh, range and uh, stealth maneuverability, uh, which are the, the key uh, characteristics uh, that uh, nuclear powered submarines have. And so that was the decision that was behind the decision to pursue that, and in of course cooperation with uh, the United States and the United Kingdom. Can you unpack that with a little bit more detail, please, about the advantages of range and stealth of a nuclear-powered submarine compared to a conventional diesel or electric submarine? Uh, sure, of course, Senator. Um, uh, uh, I, I will note that uh, details about submarine capability, I would I would defer to colleagues at Defence who are uh, submariners, of course, uh, but. Uh, the, the key difference is that conventionally powered submarines uh, need to surface uh, from time to time to recharge batteries by running diesel engines, uh, whereas nuclear powered submarines can continue operating underwater uh, for a longer period of time, uh, therefore maintaining their, uh, their key, uh, the key attribute of, of stealth. And I think that is really the key driver uh, in the capability uh, that made uh, the, behind the assessment about the preference for nuclear powered submarines. And in terms of range, am I right in understanding that a, a nuclear powered submarine has virtually unlimited uh, range, uh, particularly the uh, newer uh, nuclear powered submarines that use a highly enriched uranium? Uh, Senator, uh, yes, my, uh, my understanding is that, uh, uh, you know, range limits are not about the boat, it's about, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, feeding crews and those sorts of things that become, uh, become the challenges uh, the longer you remain underwater, but they are basically uh, unlimited in terms of a physical range for all intents and purposes. Hmm. Um, some of Australia's uh, strategic adversaries have disingenuously ra raised nuclear non-proliferation as an issue in relation to Australia acquiring this capability. Um, what are the Australian government's intentions to continue to comply with our international obligations of, of non-proliferation? Uh, Senator, the government's been absolutely crystal clear, uh, as have our US and UK partners. Uh, that Australia rain, uh, remains absolutely committed uh, to nuclear non-proliferation and uh, the international nuclear non-proliferation regime. Uh, so as we move forward uh, with the, uh, with the uh, acquisition of nuclear powered submarines, we will be making sure that we are uh, complying with all of the requirements and indeed seeking to strengthen that regime uh, moving forward. Everyone is absolutely crystal clear that Australia has uh, no intention to acquire nuclear weapons or allow the diversion of any nuclear material that might risk that. Mm. How will Australia's decision to acquire nuclear powered submarines impact the Australian shipbuilding industry? Uh, uh, Senator, the um, nuclear powered submarines uh, will be a 
a massive uh, industrial undertaking moving forward. And uh, uh, so that will provide um, uh, uh, that will uh, Australian industry's role in the uh, submarines will be incredibly important going forward. This will be a, these are uh, likely to be uh, bigger, uh, bigger submarines and it'll be a, a long term project. So there will uh, be uh, plenty of opportunity going forward for Australian industry. Um, can you talk a little bit about the non-submarine aspects of the AUKUS agreement? For example, uh, precision guided munitions, uh, cyber uh, security, uh, quantum, artificial intelligence, some of the other elements of the agreement. Uh, Senator, when uh, the leaders announced AUKUS on, uh, AUKUS on 16 September, uh, in addition to the nuclear powered submarines, uh, cooperation on advanced capabilities was also uh, was also noted and there was four key areas that are going to be pursued uh, initially and that's uh, artificial intelligence, uh, quantum um, uh, cyber and uh, underwater uh, uh, underwater uh, capabilities. And the idea is that the three partners working together rather than working uh, in parallel can, uh, can get a, a greater capability and maintain our technology edge uh, by working together in those sorts of areas. Uh, so, so that's the intent uh, of that uh, of that stream of work. I'm also right in understanding that Australia intends to acquire the capability to produce domestically our own um, precision guided missiles uh, as a, as part of this agreement. Uh, uh, Senator, the um, the work on uh, precision guided missiles, I'd uh, refer you to uh, defence on the details of that. Um, AUKUS at this stage is focused on those key areas, on the advanced capability side, those key areas that I mentioned. However, any of those areas, for example, AI or quantum, could uh, be uh, of direct relevance uh, to any one of a number of uh, capabilities moving forward. And you talked about undersea uh, capabilities. Um, does that include potentially autonomous uh, undersea capabilities in the future? Uh, Senator, we're still uh, working through that, and by undersea capabilities, that could mean uh, that covers a wide range of uh, wide range of things. It could be uh, underwater sensors, it could be uh, autonomous uh, vehicles, uh, it could be um, it could be a range of other things. So it's really about uh, working out where in that scope that the three partners can best work together uh, to get the best capability and technology outcome and something that would take us forward uh, more quickly than otherwise we might do with individual efforts. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dewar. Thank you, Chair. I'll look forward to pursuing this further with Defence. I, I have thank a few you. questions that might follow. Yeah. On from this, if that that's okay, Chair. Great, thanks, Senator Ress. I will remind committee members we only have Mr. Dubois on the line until 12:30. Yep. So if we can try and deal that's with questions for him now, I'm finish yep. our international. Okay, yep. to proceed with this now to allow Mr. Dewar to do Great. his uh, work. Mr. Dewar, can you tell me when the Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise Governance Committee was established? Uh, Senator, I'll just get the date for you. Uh, Senator, I don't have that uh, date immediately in front of me. I don't want to uh, uh, take perhaps, up too much perhaps time. Perhaps Mr Brazier or, or, or another official might come back to me a, a little bit later with that date then. The, the title and the announcement seem to suggest that that committee was going to be concerned with submarines and frigates at the very least. Is that is that right? Uh, so the mechanisms uh, such as the Secretary's Committee on Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise and the Naval Shipbuilding Coordination Group to look at the breadth of... So, sorry, let me uh, just get these down. Issues. There's the Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise Governance sorry. Committee. Um, what, was the, what were the other there's two a, groups? There's a Secretary's Committee on Australia's National Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise. And what was the other one? Uh, there's a Naval Shipbuilding Coordination Group. And specifically the Naval Ship... So the Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise Governance Committee, is it, is it concerned with both submarines and frigates? Um, uh, Senator, the, the Governance Committee that you're talking about, I, I've, 
I've got the Naval Shipbuilding Coordination Group and that Secretary's Committee. Uh, the Governance Committee, is uh, is that the defence one you're talking about, I'm wondering? Well, th this, is, this is the group, th this is the committee that the Prime Minister chairs. This is this is a, a cabinet subcommittee, uh, Senator Ayers. Sorry, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, um, so uh, we're, so apologies, so, Senator. Sorry, um, I was thinking of. Uh, so um, yes, uh, we, there's the obviously the National Security Committee. Um, uh, there is uh, the Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise Governance Committee, and yes, Senator Ayers, that uh, it um, is engaged on those uh, large naval shipbuilding projects, as uh, as per its title, um, and particularly. Um, brings together ministers uh, uh, with responsibility in, in areas such as skills and training and so on, so that it is able to take a, um, a broader perspective around some of the delivery issues there. It, uh, NSC obviously retains the strategic aspects of consideration. Um, and, uh, and then there is also uh, the National Security Investment Committee, uh, which, uh, which I chair, Senator Ayres, um, uh, which, uh, which assesses um, certain defence procurement and uh, uh, related decisions um, at a, um, we'll say, slightly less strategic level, given the Prime Minister is chairing those other ones. So, so submarines and frigates at the very least, and perhaps other naval projects as, as necessary. Um, Mr Green, I think, in the ABC said that it was established because the government was concerned that major defence projects were going off the rails. Is that right? Um, look, I wouldn't characterise it uh, that way. It wouldn't be the only time that I would, would not necessarily characterise it the same way as, uh, as the ABC, yeah, much as I have, um, I have uh, respect for Mr Green as a, as a reporter. Um, uh, um, but uh, it was established, as, as I indicated, and I don't have the full membership in front of me, but uh, I think it, it brings, as I say, the, your, your, uh, the, your training, the training minister. Yes, I am. It yes. brings the training minister... Um, the industry minister and so on to the table. So whilst NSC is, uh, is responsible for strategic decisions such as AUKUS and such as, of course, the decision uh, to, uh, to uh, engage in the procurement of nuclear-powered submarines, and when it comes, Senator Ayres, to, uh, to the ultimate decision um, uh, of uh, what model of nuclear-powered submarine Australia is procuring and the arrangements around that, they again will be NSC and cabinet level discussions and decisions, um, but the Enterprise Governance Committee uh, goes more to um, uh, the, uh, the um, delivery of those yes. contracts that have already been entered into and making sure that the skills and Australian industry content procurement partnerships and all of those uh, different elements that are necessary to make that delivery a success uh, have a reporting mechanism into into government and that in particular those departments and ministers who don't sit on NSC uh, but are then important in terms of the industrial delivery of um, uh, and skills delivery of, uh, of those projects are uh, are at the table for those discussions. And, and the Prime Minister chairs it. Does this mean the Prime Minister's actually going to take responsibility for the delivery of these projects on time and on budget? The Prime Minister made uh, the decision to establish the Enterprise Governance Committee and to, uh, and to bring uh, those additional ministers to the table of those elements of the defence procurement conversation um, and, uh, and did so because he's uh, demonstrating uh, the leadership in terms of making sure that, uh, that those projects, which are massive and complicated uh, in, uh, in their delivery, um, have the type of dedicated focus that's, uh, that's necessary. Um, and so it's not the only place where updates on those uh, uh, on those projects occur. Um, yes, uh, that uh, that is they are also uh, featured at other cabinet uh, committees and uh, and as Mr. Dewar was talking about, then of course there's a range of uh, more uh, operational um, uh, and uh, and departmental level briefings that and uh, and structures that exist. Is, um, is Professor Winter still contracted as the Prime Minister's Special Advisor on Naval Shipbuilding? Um, I, I, can't, I can't recall the exact title, no. but yes, uh, Professor Winter uh, is still engaged. So the department... I think the department's previously told us that it's a $1.5 million contract. Can you, prov 
can, can you tell me what Professor Winter does? Um, uh, Senator, oh, sorry. No, I, I was, I was going to make the high level observation before throwing to you, Mr. Dewar, that uh, I mean, Professor uh, Winter uh, participates in, uh, in um, some of those uh, cabinet committee processes that, uh, that you were just asking about. Um, uh, in terms of NSEGC, does so on a um, routine basis, but is also engaged in a range of, uh, of other ways uh, in terms of the advice that, uh, uh, that is provided to uh, defence and government uh, more generally, but Mr Dewar can probably add to uh, that with greater specificity than I've got to hand. Uh, Senator, uh, yes, uh, Professor Winter um, uh, we use him to draw on his full breadth of expertise to feed into, uh, to provide advice uh, that we can feed into uh, government uh, consideration of the broader naval shipbuilding enterprise. It covers uh, the whole breadth of the uh, of the enterprise, including those issues that Senator Birmingham was talking about in terms of workforce and training and other issues as well. And is is uh, Professor Winter contracted exclusively to the Australian government? Does he do work for other uh, governments? He, uh, Senator, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not aware of whether he does other work for other governments, but I know that he, he is contracted, of course, to the Australian government. Yeah. Anybody else in a position to answer that question? What, what's, so, what's the process Senator, for managing so, 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 Senator um, Ayres, um, um, uh, um, Professor Winter, uh, does not work exclusively for the Australian government. I can't speak for his other contractual arrangements, uh, be they with um, commercial enterprises or otherwise. Um, but uh, but I'm sure we can uh, get some uh, details if uh, if you wish uh, around um, the type of conflict of interest uh, requirements that are part of the contractual arrangements with uh, with Professor Winter, which I suspect is where your question is leading to. Yeah, shouldn't shouldn't you know though if he works for other foreign governments? Um, well, uh, Senator, is a, your question was is he exclusive to the Australian government? So my I answer was answer my, my, no. my answer there was yeah. no. That doesn't mean he's working for other foreign governments. Uh, but, but I know but, he has you, other you would, contractual. They may be academic. They may be commercial. Yes. Or other would uh, you know if he was contracted to other? Foreign governments, and what's the process for managing I'm, well, I'm, I'm confident, that, that kind of conflict? Yeah, I, I'm confident, Senator, that there are con, um, conflict, um, um, conflict of interest uh, um, conditions within his uh, his contract or terms of engagement. But uh, well, well um, can anybody tell me? Uh, I, I understand you're confident that, that they're there. Well, mm. Can anybody tell me if they're there and and, and what the regime is for managing? potential uh, conflicts of interest Senator, that, may, uh, that may arise. Yes, uh, Senator, so uh, Professor Winter is required to uh, to declare potential or perceived conflicts of interest, and then we would manage that uh, uh, through the, uh, the conflict of interest policy and procedures that apply for any uh, contracts in PM&C. All right, well, I, I, on notice, can you, can you set out for me ex precisely what the conflict of interest requirements are that apply to this contract. I have a couple of questions about submarines. Um, how much, uh, Minister Birmingham, has the Turnbull and Morrison government spent on the um, abandoned French submarine contract to date? Um, uh, Senator... Uh, uh, I only ask you because you're in the position of being the Finance Minister as well, so I assume you sure. can tell us how much has been spent thus far. Um, Senator, the, uh, uh, the government announced at the time of the AUKUS decision uh, that, uh, that around uh, $2 billion um, had, been, uh, had been committed uh, to the uh, diesel-powered uh, submarine procurement process. Um, we obviously went through as... Uh, as when you, wait, well, sorry, when you, sorry to interrupt, but when you say committed, you mean expended? Yes, Senator. Yes. Um, uh, we, I think it was two point... It was a bit more than two, but wasn't it? Um, I thought, around, I thought uh, at the time the uh, the figure detailed was around two billion dollars. Um, contractual negotiations for finalisation with the uh, naval group Lockheed Martin and uh, and Lango Rourke through Australian Naval Infrastructure 
um, uh, have been progressing. I'm not sure that all of those um, uh, sign-offs, in fact I'm confident that not all of those sign-offs have been completed in terms of uh, uh, the negotiations with each of those parties to the diesel-powered submarine program. So I don't think there is a final figure uh, what's, there. What's the likely final figure? Uh, look, I wouldn't want to speculate in terms of the likely final figure there, uh, uh, Senator, because if there are, so, so, uh, if so there are still to... commercial negotiations yes. with the contracting parties, it would not be helpful to those commercial negotiations for me to give um, a, a speculative assessment in that so, regard. So $2 billion out the door already on zero submarines. Uh, the additional expenditure in the hundreds of millions, the billions, how much money has, will the Australian government at the end of this process have spent acquiring no submarines? Senator, uh, uh, it's an invitation by another means for me to speculate. I'm not going to, uh, to entertain the speculation so you, you, you process. Can't tell us. Um, uh, Defence uh, and A and I have uh, have put on record where they can further iterative information uh, around some of those negotiations. The point I'd make, there, Senator, is that uh, it would have been uh, reckless, uh, given the advice we had received about the capability uh, challenges the diesel-powered submarines would have faced in the future. Uh, for us uh, to proceed uh, further down that path. Uh, it would equally have been negligent uh, for us uh, not to take the decision, given the changed opportunity that existed for the procurement of nuclear-powered submarines, for us to make that change. Uh, so, uh, Senator, yes, we can, yes all, we, we, can all, we can all wish that the potential for technology sharing on nuclear-powered submarines had existed several years ago, um, but uh, it wasn't there several years ago. It was there now. There was a gateway clause in, uh, in the contract with Naval Group that enabled us to make this decision now, um, and, uh, and so it was uh, certainly the right and proper thing to make that decision and to ensure that, notwithstanding the pain and those costs, we are able to, uh, to uh, get the best possible capability for the future, uh, which has now become available. Yep. I'd also note, just, just lastly, Senator, not all aspects of expenditure incurred to date uh, will be sunk costs. Um, there will be some areas of, uh, of infrastructure, some areas of skills development uh, that, uh, that will continue to contribute uh, to, uh, to now the nuclear submarine program uh, and or to other naval shipbuilding programs. But, but Mr Morrison can't be entirely reckless about public accountability here either. Billions of dollars out the door, you can't tell me and the Prime Minister can't say or won't say how much money has been expended on this project thus far for no submarines? I, I hear what you say, not all of this money has been wasted, um, but many billions of dollars have been. Um, I understand the policy rationale that's been set out at the time of the announcement, but, but that doesn't mean that the government can be reckless about accountability on this question. We're almost but, at an election and you, you can't tell us how much money has been expended or, or or will or is likely to be expended in total? Well, Senator, uh, from the very moment we made the announcement, we've acknowledged uh, that, uh, that the uh, incurred expenditure on attack class uh, was going to be more than $2 billion. Uh, that, in anyone's terms, is a very significant sum of money. Uh, we don't shy away from that one iota. Uh, we got on with, uh, with pursuing the attack class program, uh, having inherited no decisions around submarine procurement as a government. Uh, so despite some years of talking about getting the next generation of submarines, we inherited a situation where no decisions had been taken. We went through uh, the best possible process in terms of determining what type of capability would be right for Australia uh, for the future in terms of what was available to us and what Australia could manage, and that yielded the result of the attack class submarine uh, being procured through Naval Group. What so, changed? What changed subsequent to that uh, was, of course, the regional environment has changed. Um, the analysis around where those submarines would be able to safely operate, uh, and perhaps most significantly, what changed uh, was um, the willingness uh, of the US and UK to share uh, technology around nuclear-powered submarines that they had not previously been willing to share 
and the evolution of technology around those nuclear-powered submarines that enables us uh, to have confidence that we don't need to build a civil nuclear industry in Australia uh, Minister, to operate I'm not, them. I'm not asking so, you about the policy so, 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 no, 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 but I'm, I'm asking but, you about but what, Senator is, what, 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 why, why isn't the government being clear with this committee uh, uh, with the Australian people about what the likely cost is. We, we all understand the policy Senator, rationale. Senator, I, I don't think we've been about three or four times. I don't think we've been remotely is, evasive Senators, there, Senator. Let's not shout over it's, each other. I don't think we have been remotely evasive there, Senator. Uh, um, that uh, that as at there we go as at 30 November, um, the figure was 2.4 billion dollars. Yes, I thought so. Yes. Now, but you can't tell me what, what the government is going to agree I to. I can't tell you the final rounding out of that um, in relation to those last aspect of negotiations with Naval Group, Lockheed Martin or, uh, uh, or Langer okay. or Auckland contractors. Um, but we don't shy away from the fact it's a significant sum of money. We acknowledged that on day one when we said it would be more than $2 billion. Um, uh, but uh, we think it would have been uh, reckless and negligent not to make the change that was made uh, in the national interest. So 18 month timeline to, to identify what's described as the optimal pathway. Um, is, is Professor Winter engaged in, in the optimal pathway process? Um, I'll let uh, Mr Dewar speak in terms of how that intersection with the, uh, with the task force uh, that's, uh, that's been established is, uh, is occurring with Thanks, uh, external Dewar. advisors. Uh, Senator, the, um, the task force uh, in uh, defence, uh, led by Vice Admiral Mead, is leading the work uh, uh, to define that optimal pathway, working with the United States and the United Kingdom, of course. Um, uh, Professor Winter, uh, in his role as, uh, in his advisory role, uh, is engaging uh, from time to time with the breadth of the uh, naval shipbuilding work in defence. Uh, and from time to time, that includes uh, discussions uh, on the nuclear powered submarine uh, with the nuclear powered submarine task force. And, and, and you can't tell me which other foreign governments he contracts to. Can you can you tell us? You can't tell me now. What which... I can tell you, Senator, is that he's required to declare any perceived or potential conflicts of interest to us, and then we manage that through the normal policy. Well, I'd like to know a bit later in the day whether this is an actual issue or a potential issue, um, and, and if you can tell us whether or not Professor Winter is engaged in contract work for other governments around the world. Um, I, I understand you're going at 12.30. Perhaps Mr Brazier might be able to uh, furnish us with those details later on. We're five, Senator, we're, we're, Senator we're, Weekend, sorry. Sorry, you go. Sorry. Uh, no, no, I was just going to say, um, uh, we may not be able to uh, get that in the course of the next uh, hour or two. I just don't know. Uh, if but the government can, must know. We get it in that time frame. We, uh, will, we will, that's what I'm saying, Senator, we will get his, we can uh, look at uh, the, the uh, conflict of interest. I would point out that uh, uh, Professor Winter holds, of course, um, uh, uh, high level security clearances and therefore is um, completely able to have access uh, to the information. And of course, uh, uh, as, a, as a senior professional for the US Secretary of Navy, uh, we uh, rely on his, um, not only his uh, clients with our conflict of interest policy, uh, but uh, we, we rely on his input and skill and contribution to uh, the oversight of naval shipbuilding in Australia. Okay, we're five months into the 18 months um, that were identified to demonstrate the optimal pathway. Um, is everything on track, Minister? Can you tell us, can you tell the Parliament when w will this be delivered within the 18 month timetable? Um, Senator, the government's confident that it will be, uh, as Vice Admiral Mead uh, has indicated to, uh, to parliamentary committees that he's appeared before. He is uh, working uh, to the government's mandate and time frame, and, uh, and that time frame includes the ambition of trying to uh, proceed and progress matters as quickly as possible. Um, on the uh, on well, the 9th well, of yes, on the 9th of February, uh, the uh, the exchange of naval nuclear propulsion information uh, agreement uh, entered into force, which is uh, is a uh, critical um, 
building block in terms of the work of the task force and, uh, and enabling uh, the different uh, different parties to be able to um, share all of the necessary information uh, for the task force to uh, to make its recommendations. There, there are two dangers here, aren't there? So, so the 18 month timetable, you say you're confident will be delivered. We won't know until thir for 13 months, 10 months after the election. Um, this process could run over time or could be, how can, how can we be confident that it won't be rushed? Um, well, Sen Senator Ayres, you've, you, you, your question, you, you, your, your question the almost frames the answer there. Um, how can we be confident it won't run too late? How can we be confident it won't be rushed was your question. Um, Senator, uh, you know, we, through discussions with uh, the parties, um, framed 18 months with a degree of confidence that, uh, that the work uh, could be undertaken in that time frame. Um, all of the parties to the AUKUS agreement, the US, the UK uh, and ourselves, uh, recognise the importance of uh, speed uh, in terms of uh, making decisions uh, and, uh, and proceeding into the next steps uh, so that we can achieve uh, the earliest possible delivery of capability in terms of those nuclear-powered submarines, um, but uh, but equally uh, there is uh, the need against that speed paradigm to uh, to make sure that um, relevant issues are considered, which is why the task force has been established, looking at the different streams, be they nuclear stewardship streams, be they capability streams of uh, of the different uh, um, boats that are options, uh, or uh, or of course be they questions around infrastructure on, uh, on site for building of them, uh, sustainment of them elsewhere and the like. Okay, uh, another project that um, this Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise Governance Committee of Cabinet that the Prime Minister chairs is overseeing, future frigates. The truth is, The start of construction delayed from 2020 to 2024. The first frigate was supposed to enter into service in the late 2020s, but now it's not even going to be ready. It's going to achieve initial operational capability that is not fully commissioned in 2031. Um, the last of these frigates will arrive six years late um, this this project is hopelessly behind schedule, isn't it? Uh, Senator, as uh, the government has uh, has made decisions around um, the commencement of, uh, of construction there uh, to uh, to um, have greater confidence that all design aspects will be finalised uh, in a timely way for uh, for optimal delivery. Um, it's a project that has been impacted. Uh, the uh, Hunter class is uh, is. Um, built off of the platform of the Type 26 uh, in the UK. Um, uh, it's acknowledged that through the UK there have been uh, uh, um, COVID-related delays to, uh, to finalisation of that project there. Uh, we've had to take You're those... You're not blaming uh, COVID for a six-year delay in this... We, um... Well, I don't, I don't, I don't accept um, that um, characterisation, Senator Ayers, in, uh, in terms of uh, that sort of timeline you're talking about. Um, well, what, but, well, what, did I, what, 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 what have I said that's wrong? Uh, the, project, the, the commencement date, according to the last announcement, and we'll come to what's actually going to happen, the gap between what the government says in defence and what it actually delivers, the commencement date is going to move back from 2020 to 2024. The first frigate won't be in the water until 2031, and the delivery of the final frigate is six years over schedule. I don't know where you're getting that six-year figure from, Senator Ayres. Well, it was supposed to be delivered in 2038 and now won't enter service until 2044. My crude maths uh, gets oh, me I've, six I'm, years. I'm, I'm, I'm not accepting uh, the premise of, uh, of the dates and timelines you're talking about there without, uh, without going back and checking them, Senator Ayres, uh, because uh, uh, they don't sound like an accurate reflection of, uh, of statements to me, um, but, uh, but I don't have um, chapter and verse those timelines in front of me. 
Um, I'd, uh, uh, I'd note again, Senator, um, your party was a government that, uh, that um, didn't manage to uh, uh, start and finish oh, any on. ship Look, builds. Um, we have now seen the offshore Chair, patrol vessels Chair, start Senator to roll off, Chair, and we are this going is through this process. just an extended rhetorical hot air. What, 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 we've got a limited amount of time with Mr. Dewar. Is that a point Dewar. of order, Senator Ayres? Yeah, it is. We've got a limited amount of time with Mr. Dewar. I, I would like the minister to answer the questions um, rather than drift off into what turns into a sort of extended monologue uh, on, on some of these questions. Senator Ayres, It's minister. the case, Minister, isn't it, that the, the commencement and the conclusion of, the, of this project have significantly blown out in terms of their time? Well, I, there have absolutely been delays in relation to, uh, to uh, the commencement, um, as, okay. uh, as there have been from the Type 26 well, program in the UK, uh, uh, and that has impacts in terms of delivery schedules. I don't accept the uh, But the Prime uh, Minister's of chair of this subcommittee, when, when will construction of the Hunter-class frigates actually begin? Um, uh, so, uh, so Mr. Dewar may have that precise date. Uh, prototyping Dewar. is uh, is underway and continuing. And in terms of the uh, expected construction of the first, uh, yes, uh, Senator, the uh, construction uh, of uh, Ship One will uh, commence in June 2024, and prototyping is already underway. So, June 24, and when will the first of this class of nine frigates enter service? Uh, Senator, I don't uh, have that uh, figure in front of me at the moment. I'll ask if a colleague uh, uh, might be able to uh, might be able to assist there. Seems like the kind of thing that the Prime Minister should know. Smart ass comments won't get you anywhere, Senator Ayres. Um, well, a story, well, let's so go I, to. I just have a few more questions on this issue. Uh, I do Mr. want to pass the call around as Mr. well, Mr. Packham Ayres. in the Australian. To, I understand these questions about schedule, but Mr Packham set out a defence engineering assessment in The Australian a few weeks ago that said that the frigates will be slower and have a shorter range than intended, be more vulnerable to detection by enemy vessels, uh, and could be less safe for crews. I think he said, Australia's new $45 billion hunter-class frigates will be substantially slower have a shorter range than originally intended and could be vulnerable to detection by enemy vessels. The defence assessment warns that ships could also be less safe for crews with the potential for sailors to become trapped below deck by floodwaters in credible damage conditions. Mr. Mr Morrison's chair of the committee of cabinet that oversees these projects, what, what's gone wrong? Well, Senator, the Hunter class frigates are, uh, are built off of the Type 26 platform from the UK. They have uh, a number of similarities to, uh, to um, uh, that UK procurement uh, and the Canadian procurement. Um, uh, there have been delays related to COVID. There are uh, other design issues that uh, the government continues to work through in terms of the elements of modification uh, that are required in Australia. Uh, Defence uh, undertakes, as, uh, as is prudent, a range of different scenario plans about, uh, about these um, projects uh, to ascertain um, where government needs to focus to minimise risks to programs. Uh, they're complicated um, uh, programs, Senator Ayres. Uh, um, nobody should uh, expect that they don't come with significant risks. Of course they do. But the risks that, uh, that we are seeking to address, um, uh, we do so with the UK, uh, with BAE Systems, um, the, uh, uh, the type of quotes that, uh, that um, were in Mr Packham's story were of the nature of that sort of defence internal assessment about various risk management um, areas uh, and the response of government in terms of design um, responses and planning responses to all of that is uh, well underway. You shouldn't, uh, there would be uh, no doubt other scenarios that present much lower risk than, uh, than what some of those statements um, uh, suggest, Senator, but Mr. Tewer might want to add to uh, yeah, Mr. how Mr. not wrong about that. those uh, about those risks, is he? There are lots of different risks in uh, in major procurement contracts and major shipbuilding exercises. Um, and uh, your the, your, the, your... Ta the ta and and any such project would come 
uh, with significant risks. Um, the test is how you respond to those risks. Uh, in terms of the delayed commencement to construction that you were asking about before, that is one of the responses to those risks, Senator Ayres, that, uh, that um, government took a decision uh, that it was prudent uh, in making sure the design and the confidence in design uh, was as well developed as possible, uh, that, uh, that it was better to uh, delay commencement of construction and have a longer period of prototyping uh, so that we would minimise uh, those sorts of uh, those risks uh, and have them addressed before you got to the final construction. But this government chose the design. This government's had responsibility for stewardship of the procurement program all the way through. Mr Morrison's now chairing this committee that seems to indicate that he, at least when the announcement was made, was taking responsibility for getting on top of these projects. Now, some months later, it's everybody else's fault but Mr Morrison's. No. Senator, let me make a, um, a slightly broader point around this. I mean, I can well, remember... My, the, the, I, no, the point I, is I, about I, taking I, responsibility. I can, I can remember... Please you're please making a political point. Your, your, your question wasn't response. a question of detail. It was a politically charged question. So please allow me to respond, Senator Ayres. Okay. I can remember you know, the years of build around the Collins class. Um, Senator Patrick uh, uh, knows all of that chapter and verse. I can remember the years of debate around delays in the Collins class, the difficulties around how many boats were in the water at any one period of time, around the challenges about, uh, about sustainment and so on. Much of that was politically charged commentary and much of it was an unfair reflection on what was a supreme technical and engineering undertaking by Australian governments at the time. Credit to the Labor governments that commenced that program and established it in Australia. Just as I give credit to uh, the work around the air warfare destroyers and so on that the Howard government established. Much work had to be done to address some of those issues. But anybody who comes in and pretends that any one of these procurement activities is simply a smooth, seamless, risk-free exercise uh, is just operating in a false environment uh, and showing a great degree of pretense in their commentary. Each one of these major undertakings come with significant risks and significant challenges. We've faced them before uh, and we've overcome them before in terms of what has been built in Australia. Uh, and rather than trying to talk down Australia's capability uh, to be able to deliver these sorts of projects, I'd rather see us talk up Australia's capability. The fact that despite the difficulties and delays that previous shipbuilding uh, or submarine construction exercises have, been, have undertaken, we've overcome those and we have highly capable naval equipment uh, built in Australia as a result of that. Uh, and we will work through the risks on the projects that are underway, uh, and those risks will be there whoever is in government, uh, and we ought to be big enough to acknowledge that. Thank you. You're Thanks, Chair. Yes, on the call. Thank you very much, Senator S. Sorry, just nodding madly. Um, Senator Patrick, I understand you have some questions for International as well. Thank you. I would point out that the review um, did, and the Kinnaird review did suggest lessons from Collins and other programs. We ought to embark on programs that are um, generally off the shelf, and we haven't done that, uh, uh, Minister. But uh, and that leads to the sorts of problems that Senator Ayres is talking about. I just want to go back to um, the questions that Senator Gallagher was asking about the Ukraine. I, I, I've got a reasonable brief on what was asked, so I'll avoid some of the questions. Um, I just want to know what the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet's um, uh, role is in terms of planning um, and coordinating an Australian government response to the Ukraine crisis. Um, Senator, I'll ask uh, Mr Brazier to pick up those questions again. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Patrick. As, as is always the case, the role of the uh, department is to ensure uh, coordination uh, across uh, the, the public service uh, and to ensure that uh, the advice, um, there, there is a flow of advice uh, to the Prime Minister directly uh, from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and from other parts of the system to uh, support uh, decision making um, in relation to uh, Ukraine. Has a whole of government task force been established? 
Uh, DFAT it has convened an interdepartmental uh, committee that has uh, met on numerous occasions. So they're taking the lead in this particular instance? DFAT is uh, chairing that committee. Uh, the, the Department of uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet is uh, attending that. Um, has PMNC looked at uh, or participated in, in the whole of government an analysis of uh, the effect of energy of this conflict on our energy costs and in particular things like LNG. Uh, my understanding was conversations about um, our LNG being diverted to Europe. Um, obviously we have a very tight market um, and we are affected by international prices. We want to give Australian companies advantages, making sure they've got stable energy prices. What's the uh, go government's position in relation to um, energy costs or LNG costs in circumstances where a conflict does go ahead? Senator, um, there have certainly um, been some uh, discussions and briefings and Treasury uh, and, uh, and resources and energy in particular looking at some of the potential consequential impacts of different uh, different scenarios that could occur uh, out of uh, out of the environment in the Ukraine. Um, uh, most of Australia's um, you know, gas uh, supplies uh, already go into export markets through uh, through the significant LNG. Uh, they're of course commercial contracts and most of that gas is, uh, is um, uh, already commercially contracted. Um, there may be some scope for some producers to be able to uh, scale up production or, uh, or uh, under their contracts divert certain production if, uh, if necessary. Um, uh, but uh, but you know, we're also clearly looking at quite um, um, long, far, far greater distances for the type of countries you're talking about um, uh, as to whether uh, it would be viable uh, for Australian supply and also uh, um, commodity that requires different type of infrastructure uh, that, uh, that most of Europe receives its gas supplies through um, and natural gas pipelines, uh, not, uh, not LNG that, uh, that then requires um, uh, I can't port, remember the technical name of the port infrastructure and so on, but I was trying to remember the uh, the technical name for what you have to do to uh, essentially deliquify it at the other end. But so, so are you suggesting that in actual fact we won't end up with a situation where that very limited supply of Australian gas, noting uh, much of it is tied up in fixed, in fixed contracts, will end up going to Europe? I, I, my concern is uh, what the government is doing to make sure that if there is an invasion, um, that we don't end up with our manufacturers paying exorbitant price prices and our consumers mm. paying exorbitant prices for for our own gas. Okay. So um, I mean, the uh, commitments and engagements governments had over uh, a number of years now to uh, to try to provide um, security of gas supply in Australia and uh, and uh, to uh, to have downward pressure on uh, on prices uh, in Australia. Uh, probably means that we are better prepared than might otherwise be the case. If we hadn't faced some of these questions over recent years, um, you would simply have a, a full market environment uh, in operation that hadn't had the type of engagements to, uh, to secure those commitments uh, from Australian domestic gas producers uh, to supply the Australian um, gas market. Uh, our full expectation is that uh, the producers have made commitments uh, to Prime Ministers and Treasurers and to Government uh, over the years continue to honour those commitments first and foremost to, uh, to security of supply in the Australian market. Um, obviously there's then the medium to longer term picture which the Government has, uh, has pursued in terms of bringing further supply uh, uh, on through, uh, through uh, support for um, other uh, gas reservations and projects around Australia and, uh, and they um, become ever more important uh, if we are looking at a situation where there are potentially long-standing sanctions in place against Russia uh, that, uh, that cuts uh, Russian gas supply off from parts of the world, uh, that you're then not just looking at the 
short-term consideration of, uh, of whether Australia's current production can be scaled up or diverted elsewhere, uh, but the possibility uh, that, uh, that um, uh, Australian uh, reservations and growth in, uh, in production in Australia could um, my, my um, concern here is in the short term, the market elsewhere. We, we could have a situation where there's conflict next week, sadly. Yeah. Um, uh, the ADGSM under the legislation really can't be dealt with until January next year. So that's, that's our one mechanism for uh, pulling the trigger on exports. You haven't implemented a, a, a reservation policy, which was something that the, uh, the um, Minister Taylor announced in 2019. Um, are there force majeure options available to the government in the circumstances where, the, we get, where there is a conflict uh, and there's a tightening of supply and Australian companies end up suffering because, uh, you know, be, because of the, the, you know, the, the conflict? Uh, well, Senator, there, there may always be those sorts of extreme options available. They would need to be weighed against um, you know, constitutional advice around uh, confiscation of property and, uh, and those sorts of considerations uh, uh, as well. Um, but uh, I think the gas actually think belongs. And, I think the gas foremost, belongs to the Australian public. Actually, first, I think those first reserves. And, first and foremost, the. Gas does, but obviously licences are held for its extraction. Those licences are contracted in different ways. First, before we, you know, I don't envisage a situation uh, where we would be getting to that type of extreme outcome, given the commitments uh, and cooperation government has managed to have with Australia's gas producers uh, over the last few years uh, to uh, address the concerns that uh, that um, you know, were more manifest a couple of years ago uh, about potential shortages in, uh, in the Australian domestic market uh, and to, uh, to ensure that there's been that increase in production in the domestic market. Now, I don't have um, the statistics in front of me about how, the gas, uh, um, uh, how gas production for domestic purposes has changed in that time, um, but uh, we've developed some of those um, break glass policy mechanisms if, uh, if they became necessary, but they have not become necessary on the basis that, uh, that Australia's gas producers have worked uh, with government and industry, uh, and our full expectation would be they would continue to do that and to give uh, priority uh, to their domestic obligations. Okay, so again, I'm not worried about supply. That's We, we saw in 2013-14 when the ADGSM was introduced that supply was fixed, but because supply is tight, the price still remains high. I'll move on just to one last, uh, just a, a final uh, area I wanted to just understand in relation to our response. Has the government given any thought and ha has the government got any plans in relation to a potential refugee situation in the Ukraine? Uh, so, um Certainly, um, Mr. Brazier went through situations involving Australian residents, uh, sorry, Australian citizens um, in the Ukraine. Um, there has been some consideration to uh, other um, humanitarian or uh, migration factors that could flow. Um, uh, I don't, uh, I don't know, Senator Patrick, that I can say there is a. Um, um, widespread um, undertaking in relation to uh, refugee circumstances and the like of which you, uh, you raise, um, but, uh, but I have no doubt that uh, were that to become the case, uh, we would engage with you know, obviously our European counterparts um, on, uh, on those issues. They clearly would, uh, would be um, at the forefront of any policy responses there. I'm just thinking of you know, looking forward rather than mm. being in a situation where this sort of event arises and there's a sort of mass exodus of people across, across borders with Australia being able to proactively step up with a plan to at least assist in an international context. Yeah, and um, I mean, we, uh, we have done that in a range of conflict situations in terms of creating um, in some cases, dedicated places uh, within our existing humanitarian intake and in some circumstances providing 
uh, additional places over and above that humanitarian intake, um, uh, we would obviously consider uh, any requests or demands to do so, um, dependent upon the circumstances as, uh, as they evolved. Um, our, our focus and our preference is, uh, is um, for um, diplomacy to prevail and for conflict to be avoided and to apply maximum pressure in, uh, in that regard. Um, but uh, Mr Brazier, it looks like you may have something to add to my comments. Thank you, uh, Minister. The, of course, whatever uh, refugee uh, crisis is caused by possible Russian action will, will depend on uh, will depend on events. Uh, and some of the high side uh, forecasts are, are very sobering in, in the millions of people that could be uh, affected. Uh, typically, Australia, um, over many decades now, has worked very closely with the uh, United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees and intergovernmental organisations like the uh, IOM. Uh, once there are uh, refugees uh, gathering in uh, neighbouring countries, uh, there is a process of registration, assessment of uh, refugee status, and then uh, resettlement uh, to uh, Australia uh, within parameters decided on by government. But that is usually something uh, that is conducted in uh, very close consultation with other refugee uh, receiving uh, countries, depending on the, on the numbers uh, involved, Senator. Right, thank you very much, Chair. I do have more questions, but not for international division. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Waters, you have been waiting there very patiently. I have been, but I don't have questions for international. That's all right, because I understand no other senators have right. questions for right. international, so you are thank good you. to thank go on with much. another topic. Does, does, does that mean, Senator Chandler, that we can let Mr Dewar go to bed? Uh, certainly he can have certainly 12 early right minutes in that regard. <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Mr Dewar. Thanks. Thank you, committee. Appreciate it. Hi there. Thanks, everyone. I've got some questions about uh, PMC's involvement in the waiver of the overpayment to uh, Mr Chris Jose. And I will be taking um, this up with finance tomorrow also. Uh, hopefully we've got the right people here in the room. Thank you. It was recently reported that the Ombudsman had been critical of the Department of Finance's decision in 2020 to waive the $41,000 debt owed by Mr Chris Jose after he was paid for both his role with ACMA and the National Competition Council simultaneously. Uh, the report indicates that the National Competition Council raised the issue with PM&C in May of 2020 and that a teleconference was subsequently held between PMC, Finance and Treasury. And I understand that um, Minister Morton later signed a legal instrument confirming that the matter was a matter for Finance to determine. And obviously Finance later agreed to waive the debt, which is uh, quite a different approach to that taken with robo-debt. Uh, can I ask why the decision was made to delegate responsibility to Finance? Uh, Senator. John Reid, First Assistant Secretary, Government Division. Um, Senator, we were involved in the decision about who should be the appropriate decision maker mm -hmm. in, in this case, and the options uh, appeared to be either the Secretary of the Treasury um, or the Department and senior officials in, in finance. Because of the potential conflict, um, PM&C's view was that it was appropriate that the matter be handled by the Department of Finance. Okay, and was PM&C consulted again uh, by finance before finance decided to waive the debt? We were aware finance was intending to waive the debt, um, but we weren't involved in the decision making. Okay, and how were you made aware? Uh, in writing, Senator. Okay, so they informed you, but did you provide any response to that? No, Senator. Okay. Has there been any audit undertaken to ensure that no other government appointed members have been overpaid? Uh, Senator, we have gone through a process with uh, appointments processes generally to ensure that this sort of thing won't happen again. Okay, sorry, you've gone through a general process to ensure this generally won't happen again. Can you give me a little more detail? So we've been working with our Cabinet Division colleagues, Senator, who sort of oversight some of these appointments processes or at least appointments that go through Cabinet um, to make sure that um, the appropriate questions are asked um, 
to make sure that if there are people for whom this issue might arise, that is picked up in the mm. process. Mm. Okay. All right, I'll probably ask more on notice about that. Um, can I move now to the bevy of Electoral Act amendments um, that we've seen? Since September last year, we've now seen 10 separate bills amending the Electoral Act. And this obviously is a very piecemeal approach. It's led to the debate um, being very fragmented and it's made it very hard to assess the cumulative effect of the changes. And of course, it's exhausted the limited resources of uh, academics and experts, submitters and advocates to review the changes. Um, why has the government adopted a piecemeal approach rather than a comprehensive review of our electoral laws? Uh, Senator Waters, I'd um, contest the, uh, the premise and the implications you suggest from the approach taken um, that actually uh, what we've done by virtue of taking each of these issues through an individual bill through the parliament is make sure it's been crystal clear uh, what, uh, what each of those um, reforms, uh, most of them uh, relatively minor or granular in, uh, in nature, or many of them certainly are. Uh, some of them, of course, also particularly responding to the unique circumstances around COVID. Um, but uh, uh, had we done so as an omnibus bill of, uh, of lots of different moving parts. No doubt we would then have been criticised for the fact that it was an omnibus bill of lots of different moving parts and it was hard to understand exactly what the bill was seeking to achieve, uh, whereas the quite precise approach that, uh, that Minister Morton has taken uh, of uh, limiting each bill uh, to only uh, quite specific uh, reforms uh, has, uh, has at least enabled um, each of those to, uh, to be clear. Um, and of course, for uh, for individual parties to uh, to reflect a position on them one by one, rather than having uh, having the uh, position on an omnibus bill conflated uh, amongst the various moving parts that would be within it. Mm. Can you confirm that we won't see voter ID laws reintroduced? Uh, yes, Senator. Okay, have you told Senator McGrath that? Um, so Senator McGrath, like uh, like anybody, is uh, is entitled to introduce. Uh, private senator's bills. Um, I believe that he may have done so on, uh, on that matter, um, uh, but uh, but it is not the government's intention to uh, to uh, pursue uh, um, that matter before this election. Okay, yeah. so you rule out bring... disappointingly, we would say, mm -hmm. Senator Waters, yeah. uh, we do think that uh, uh, the principle around voter ID and the uh, and the models um, uh, developed. Um, provided a high degree of confidence that uh, uh, that um, participation uh, would be easy for individuals, uh, but confidence in our electoral system would be enhanced. Uh, however, uh, we're not proceeding uh, with uh, with those laws before the election. Okay, so you're ruling out bringing that private members' bill on or any other government bill on for the purpose of voter ID before are, the election. We are not proceeding with uh, with reforms on that before the okay. election. Okay, and after the election. Uh, well, well, Hopefully, you won't be in a position to do so, but uh, you know that's a bit of pardon my commentary. Um, well, um, um, Senator, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in, <laughs> indeed, uh, indeed, Senator Patterson, um, uh, an astute observation there. Um, uh, look, the government, as I just stated, the government's um, um, belief uh, that uh, that um, voter identification um, can be done in a way that does not disenfranchise. Uh, but does enhance uh, confidence in the electoral system. Um, and, uh, and if after the election there were uh, an opportunity to, uh, to look at those sorts of reforms, which have been recommended by multiple reports of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, uh, then, uh, then I am sure uh, we would do so. Mm. Okay. Is anyone in the department working on laws to implement donations reform? or truth in political advertising or election spending caps or any of the other big reforms that I believe the community actually wants to clean up our system? Um, well, um, I, I suspect the answer for PMNC would be no because PMNC doesn't uh, um, have uh, a lead carriage of, uh, of electoral policy. That's a Department of Finance matter. That's correct, Senator. Okay, would you normally have any involvement in a sort of high level system reform like that? Only, I would assume I you'd have some oversight. Policy briefings to the PM. Yes, Senator. Um, okay. And have you been engaged in any such oversight? 
Is there any work being done, to your knowledge, on any of those electoral reform bigger issues? Mm. Not to my knowledge, Senator. I'm just looking at Mr Reid. Sorry, Senator, I missed the list of issues. I, I apologise. Uh, electoral right. spending, uh, donations and truth in political advertising. But, but you, you, you directed the question, sort of, has the department been undertaken any, undertaking any? And that's why the answer was, no, this department wouldn't be. But you know, more generally, uh, Senator Waters, the, uh, the areas of um, Electoral Act reform um, that um, have been undertaken uh, are reflected of those that have come to the parliament. Uh, so um, people can have their own views around um, you know, what is uh, big, little or otherwise in terms of, uh, of reforms. That's a matter of uh, political debate or conjecture. Uh, but in terms of, the, uh, in terms of um, where the government has focused its attention, uh, it's been around those matters um, of um, response to COVID for, uh, for necessary electoral purposes, um, uh, different operational elements of the Electoral Act, including some of the different integrity measures, which I think have included um, uh, some elements of, uh, of uh, disclosures as well as, uh, as part of clarification around some of those. Mm. Thanks, Minister. Uh, moving now uh, to an integrity commission. <laughs> Unfortunately, we still don't have one. Um, was, the, was either PM&C or the PMO consulted by the Attorney-General before she announced last week that the Commonwealth Integrity Commission bill would not be introduced before the election? Uh, Senator, uh, discussions around um, Commonwealth Integrity Commission have, uh, have been had uh, right across um, government and particularly amongst, uh, uh, amongst um, um, senior ministers. Uh, we've been uh, very clear that, uh, that the government has finalised a model uh, around the Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Um, that model um, seeks to, uh, to provide an umbrella framework uh, that, uh, that addresses the different roles of the many existing entities uh, across the Commonwealth that are responsible for anti-corruption uh, activities. Uh, it, uh, it does so through the creation of uh, uh, of a Law Enforcement Integrity Division under a proposed CIC and a Public Sector Integrity Division under a proposed CIC. We've also been clear that, uh, that we don't believe and, uh, and think it would be um, worse than the existing framework were Australia to end up uh, with an Integrity Commission uh, that took on some of the negative aspects uh, of entities such as the New South Wales ICAC uh, in terms of its operation as a, as a public star chamber. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we've finalised preparation of a bill, several hundred pages attached to it. I understand the Prime Minister uh, tabled that in the House of Representatives some time ago, uh, and the Attorney-General's position is reflective of the fact that uh, uh, if um, the opposition, or indeed I can invite the Greens to, uh, to make the same commitment, uh, we're willing to commit to pass uh, the model of CIC that the government has designed, and well, then we would work cooperatively to pass that as quickly as we can. Uh, but it's, uh, it has been clear from the public statements of, uh, of the opposition and others uh, that, uh, that that would not be the case, uh, and therefore uh, the government's not, uh, not um, progressing with it at this, uh, at this stage. Well, the government well knows the criticism that the bill has been subjected to, um, and a very good bill, I might add, that happens to have my name on it, passed two years ago, that's got some strong features and that experts said was the gold standard. So it's not like you can't get this done if you really want to. So I'm afraid I won't take the suggestion that it's anybody no, else's well, we, fault we, we, or responsibility. We, we, we don't support your bill your and government. you don't support ours. That's, uh, that's, that's clear. Um, but but you know, we've been very clear in terms of the model of integrity commission. The legislation is drafted. It was tabled in the House of Reps some time ago. Um, and if there were the parliamentary support for its passage, well, it would pass and come into law. Can I come back to my actual question, which was, was the P, uh, PMO or PMNC consulted by the attorney before she announced that the government's bill would not be introduced before the election? Well, I don't, I don't think it would be ordinary for, uh, for the attorney to consult PMNC about statements like, uh, like that. The legislative program is, uh, is a matter uh, for government. Um, but uh, the attorney was simply reflecting that reality that, uh, that I've outlined, which is um, barring any change in position from uh, the Labor Party uh, or your party, Senator Waters, uh, um, there is uh, not a pathway for its passage before the election. Was the Attorney-General um, 
Uh, did she consult with the Prime Minister before announcing that it wouldn't be introduced before the election? I don't know, Senator, but I'm not sure that that's necessary, given she was reflective of the position um, of the government, including the Prime Minister. Now, if, uh, if I say, if, if other parties want to change their position, um, well, then uh, that bill could potentially have, uh, have potential for introduction and passage. But uh, uh, based on the stated public positions of Labor's two or three page flyer that, uh, that is their model, uh, and their public comments uh, um, about the several hundred pages of legislation in, uh, in our model, uh, that doesn't appear to be a pathway. Did PM&C make submissions in relation to the latest iteration of the government's version of the bill? No, sir. Okay. Um, and given that there was reporting about yeah. suggestions it would of... Be, it would be unusual for a government department to make a submission to a public consultation process uh, of that... Yes, uh, well, that everything about this is unusual, so forgive me for asking questions in estimates. Um, given the suggestions that a stronger version, um, perhaps uh, similar to the one that independent uh, member for Indi, Helen Haynes, proposes, which I might add is also very similar to the one that has actually passed the Senate two years ago, very similar indeed. Given suggestions that this uh, was potentially proposed in a cabinet meeting by none other than a desperate prime minister, um, is that a model that the department has been advocating for? Or is the prime minister just well, clearly very desperate and freelancing? Senator, you're... Uh uh, you're asking uh, the government to, uh, to uh, the department to provide comment on policy advice that it may or may not give uh, to, uh, to the PM. The department provides uh, uh, briefings and information um, routinely in preparation for cabinet discussions and the like, but uh, uh, the government has finalised the model of Commonwealth Integrity Commission that, uh, that we support, and that model is reflected in the legislation the Prime Minister tabled in the House of Representatives. Mm. So the department didn't provide any advice about alternative models to the Prime Minister? Senator, right. we've been keeping the Prime Minister's office up to date with the range of alternative models through live issue briefings and things like that. And when was the last time you gave one of those briefings? Uh, so the nature of those briefing system, that briefing system centre is it's a dynamic briefing system. I'm not sure when we last amended it. I don't know what that means. I've, I've not familiar with that terminology. It's a, it's a live system, um, so it's iterative. I could take on notice when we last updated the system. Okay. And so you just put information into something that the Prime Minister accesses at his whim? Is that... No, we usually, it? It, it, it's the method by which we generally keep the Prime Minister's office um, briefed through question time briefs and things like that. Okay. I, I'll take on notice when we last amended. Okay, thank you. Um, Chair, I might leave it there for the time being. Thank, thank you very you. much, Senator Waters. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you. I've got questions regarding the digital task force and the digital uh, economy strategy. and G20 Sherpa, and well, like my colleague Michelle Dado, who heads the Digital okay. Technology Task Force, Perfect. to join us. Sorry, I just can't quite. Dado, thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, yes, yeah, so I have questions about the task force and the uh, digital economy strategy. Uh, firstly, can you tell me what issues the TAF task force are examining as part of its work to ensure that Australia is leading a digital economy? Um, Michelle Dowdle, First Assistant Secretary, Digital Technology Task Force. Senator, we've been continuing to work with stakeholders um, on the range of the pillars that were set out under the Digital Economy Strategy. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So in relation to uh, what are the right foundations to support a digital economy in relation to emerging technologies uh, and in relation to the growth priorities around small business adoption, um, fintech sector, establishing a dynamic and emerging sector, uh, tech sector. Um, so we've worked within our departments as well. Uh, so the announcement of the quantum commercialisation hub in my EFO last year and the development of a quantum strategy, as well as how do we continue to lift digital skills, inclusion uh, and the take up of technology across the economy. And, uh, and who's on the task force? Not, not necessarily names or, or particular businesses, but what sort of skill sets are uh, uh, represented on that uh, task force? 
So the task force is based in Prime Minister and Cabinet. We have seven PMNC staff and five secondees from across um, a range of agencies. We also have a, a coordination uh, committee that works with all of the departments across government uh, and how they can contribute to the digital economy strategy. Uh, we also have an expert advisory committee uh, which involves a range of representatives from business um, and academia who are active in this field, uh, who can provide advice on uh, the developments in the, the digital economy and how we can support them. Okay, yeah, so I wanted to ask how you are engaging with industry. So is it, is it through that uh, committee, uh, so advisory that committee? Way. We have regular meetings of our advisory committee. We also have a range of stakeholder engagements bilaterally with industry associations, academia, uh, individual businesses. Um, when we're able to travel, we're able, we, we get sure. to Sydney and other places to meet with um, businesses and those working in the sector. And how are you ensuring that those uh, the policies that are developed are, are well designed? Uh, so through that uh, engagement from those who are working in the sector to make, and more broadly in the digital economy uh, to make sure that they're meeting the needs. Uh, also through our regular policy processes, um, broad consultation and engagement uh, and, and drawing on input and ideas from a broad range of sectors. And so the task force was established several years ago, I think it was 2019, you might correct me there. That's but right. uh, then, uh, and then the out of that came the the strategy, the digital economy strategy. Um, so the task force was involved, was established in November 2019, and it worked to coordinate and deliver the digital business plan in October 2020, and then the digital economy strategy in May last year. Uh, and then we've continued to work with agencies on the implementation of those measures and on the ongoing developments, uh, and as I said, those measures that were announced in my info. And uh, what, what are the elements of the digital economy strategy, I think you said there were six pillars. So, so there's three pillars. Um, the foundations, that looks at uh, the infrastructure, so connectivity infrastructure and other infrastructure that's needed for a digital economy, um, skills and inclusion, uh, cyber security, safety and trust, systems and regulation and trade are the sort of core elements of our foundational focus. Uh, then there's ensuring we have um, development and adoption of emerging technologies, mm. uh, so that's supported by the blockchain roadmap, the AI action plan, and the will be the quantum strategy, as well as the data strategy that was released at the end of last year. And then we have our uh, growth priorities, so small business adoption, digital government, uh, modern industry sectors, and a dynamic and emerging tech sector. Okay. And so why do we need this strategy? So the strategy uh, aims to bring together not only those uh, targeted investments to um, support the development of the digital economy and unlock investment in the private sector, uh, but also to give a guiding framework for how a range of policies and actions across government contribute to Australia becoming a leading digital economy. Uh, digital technologies have the opportunity, as we've seen over the last few years, mm. to really transform how business works, how our lives run, and deliver significant benefits to Australians. And so the strategy is aiming to ensure that all of the actions the government takes is working towards that objective. And is it vital to Australia's recovery uh, out of the COVID pandemic and uh, the economic impacts of that? Uh, and what's it doing to create jobs uh, and improve the lives of uh, everyday Australians? It is, and I think as we've seen, as we've lived experience, that um, it's been essential for both the survival through pan the pandemic, the number of people who are now working from home, yeah. the number of businesses that were able to transform what they operated when lockdowns happened. We've seen a significant change there. Um, so it's both in that phase and then the recovery uh, and the growth of the, of the tech sector and tech in uh, our broader range of uh, economic activity is really critical to take, making the most of those opportunities, as well as opening up new markets. So digital trade means that you know, the barriers to entry for small businesses are much less to be able to reach new markets within Australia and around the world. And what's the size of the Australian yeah, government's investment in into... Um, I've sat through 10 minutes of this absorption of Time now. This is an opposition forum. I, I think I've been sitting here since nine o'clock. I don't. It, it is an opposition forum, essentially estimates. Uh, um, uh, and no, and and one of the advantages of being a uh, of a government 
Senator, is you can always get a briefing from the department if you're really interested in this kind of thing. Um, Opposition you, senators get those briefings all I'm just, the time. I'm just yes. hoping, Chair, that this will come to a close shortly. I will note your concern, Senator S. I will also say that um, government senators have only had uh, 12 minutes of time questioning this morning. Mm. Um, what time so did start? <laughs> we did start at 9am. Oh, yeah. um, so I will let Senator uh, O'Sullivan keep going with his questions, recognising that there are other senators who would like to seek the call and we'll all try and be as economical as possible. Senator O'Sullivan, you have the call. Uh, thank you. I was just asking about uh, the quantum, the, the amount of money that's been invested into this uh, strategy. So since uh, 2020, $2.3 billion under the, specifically under the strategy, but there have been a range of other investments through the cybersecurity strategy and the investment in the NBN and a range of other initiatives that also contribute to the digital economy. And, and so uh, how is the strategy and the, the investment uh, supporting small businesses? And in particular, what impact uh, is it having or likely to have, uh, particularly in regional Australia? So the focus on um, connectivity and uh, enabling uh, systems to uh, build and uh, develop businesses means that those business that activity can un be undertaken anywhere. I think, as we've seen from the working from home uh, and the m movement of population that has been enabled by digital technology, that has really given some focus to to regional and remote areas where people have been able to relocate and, and then also establish businesses in those areas. So we've got a very strong focus on business, small business adoption. Um, and we've seen, I think we've seen that through the pandemic at the rates at which that can be taken up. Uh, and, and initiatives like the instant asset write-off has also allowed okay. businesses to, to invest in that capital to undertake the transformation. And how do we compare internationally with regards to and digital transformation, and what's this strategy doing to help uh, the government's goal for Australia to be a world-leading digital economy by 2030? So there's a number of um, indicators, I don't have them with me, that the, that's set out in the strategy about where Australia currently ranks. We do rank quite highly in terms of uh, use of e-commerce, um, which has only accelerated through the pandemic. Um, we also, the government has a commitment to be a top three uh, digital government by 2025, uh, and we're on track there. So there are a range of indicators where Australia uh, does show existing strength, um, but the strategy is also there to ensure that not only do we sustain that, but build on that uh, to reach, uh, to rank higher in coming years. And uh, previously you mentioned that uh, the strategy was developed in consultation with industry. Uh, what's been their reaction? Uh, so it's been very positively received, uh, but we continue to work with them to ensure that uh, future investments meet those needs. It obviously was a, a starting point and will be a, a living strategy that will evolve over time. So while positively received, there are always areas that they're keen for the government to invest further in. Okay, and just one more. Um, Probably more curious question for me. Uh, just going on your uh, on the website uh, or looking at the actual strategy, um, you lay out some uh, points with regards to uh, uh, measuring the success of the strategy. And there was uh, one point there: all businesses are born digital. I'm familiar with the, the term, but but how would you actually measure that? What's the uh, maybe you could just explain what it actually means? I suppose first. But. So from a government perspective, that means that you can undertake all of your activities to establish a business digitally. So can you register your business? Can you obtain a licence? Uh, all of those steps that you would need to do. Uh, it's also one we're working with uh, business on to ensure that other things like establishing a bank account or other connections you might need, that you can do all of that digitally uh, and you don't need to provide either hard copy papers. So it's not just for, for government entities, it's, it's, it, you're talking about we are looking small businesses broader. and other... Yep. Other entities. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Watt, who has been waiting patiently. Thanks, Chair. Um, I've just got some st uh, questions about the statement of ministerial standards. So that might be Ms. Foster's area. Yes, I think. Yes, yep. Senator. Um, Ms. Foster, you'll recall, I'm sure, the circumstances relating to the resignation of Mr. Porter last year, and that obviously arose from his blind trust. Um, Am I correct that it was ultimately Mr Porter's inability to rule out a conflict of interest 
due to the blind nature of that trust that triggered his resignation? Mr Porter put a fairly comprehensive statement on the record um, from his perspective around his resignation and, uh, and of course the Prime Minister um, responded to that in his uh, public remarks. Um, as, uh, as the Prime Minister said, um, the inability for him to practically provide further information because of the nature of those arrangements um, uh, was, uh, was um, a factor there. I'm just trying to glance down the transcript to highlight the relevant parts rather than reading the whole statement to you, uh, uh, Senator Watt. But I think that it, I was actually going to take you to that statement, Minister, so I think that is the, probably the relevant part of the Prime Minister's uh, transcript the day that he announced Minister Porter's resignation. He, and again, what he said was it was the inability for Mr Porter to be able to practically provide further information because of the nature of those arrangements, by which I presume he meant the blind nature of those arrangements, mm. uh, that would allow Minister Porter to conclusively rule out a perceived conflict. And you'll see in the next paragraph there, Minister, the Prime Minister went on to say, it isn't just about actual conflicts, it is about, under the standards, for ministers to have an obligation to avoid any perception of conflicts of interest. So I take it then that what that means is that a minister must be able to rule out any perceptions of conflicts of interest to meet the ministerial standards. Uh, well, Senator Watt, um, Prime Minister's words there are, uh, uh, are on the transcript. Um, the Prime Minister was clear in relation to, uh, to Minister Porter's circumstances at the time and the, uh, and the uh, ability to, uh, to uh, avoid perceptions created by that structure. And, and it, was, it was the blind nature of the trust that Minister Porter had that made it, to use the Prime Minister's words, him unable to be able to practically provide further information that would uh, have allowed him to conclusively rule out a perceived conflict. Uh, well, as, uh, as the Prime Minister said earlier in that statement that, uh, that he and Minister Porter had had uh, discussions uh, around the nature of those arrangements uh, and what further information Minister Porter uh, could or was willing uh, to provide in relation to those arrangements and, uh, and that uh, they came to the conclusion uh, that um, uh, inadequate extra detail was uh, going to be provided, uh, hence Minister Porter's resignation. And this all, I mean, it's a little while ago now, so this all obviously related to the donations that certain people had made to this blind trust for Minister Porter. I don't know if you've got the full transcript of that interview with the Prime Minister with you, Minister, but at page three, he was asked about the donations and said, it's a blind trust, he cannot disclose to me who those donors are. So it would seem to me that it was the fact that Minister Porter was unable to say who the donors were because it was a blind trust, that meant he could not rule out either an actual or perceived conflict of interest. Is that a fair interpretation? Um, uh, well, look, I, I think, as the Prime Minister acknowledged at the, uh, at the top end of that transcript, and, uh, and no, I don't have all the pages of Q&A that followed um, with me, uh, but, uh, but I've got the Prime Minister's statement, and as the PM acknowledged, uh, there were a number of discussions he had with Minister Porter. Um, uh, I can only surmise that uh, from the Prime Minister's statement, uh, those conversations went to what addition additional information could, if any, be provided. Uh, clearly uh, it was um, deemed inadequate in terms of what uh, could be provided. Okay. Do any other ministers of this government hold blind trusts? Uh, so, uh, so Senator Watt um, question there um, uh, potentially moves into a, a different sphere. Um, depends upon, and you might want to clarify your question there, uh, there are blind trusts that have commonly been used uh, by 
ministers and public officials here and around the world for investment purposes over a long period of time. Um, uh, this was um, an arrangement with Minister Porter uh, that, uh, that was, um, as I understand it, a trust that had been established for the purposes of uh, providing um, funds or donations for that purpose to Minister Porter, not as an investment vehicle um, um, where a senator, member, minister or otherwise may um, put certain assets they hold outside of their immediate control to, uh, to avoid uh, the potential for any conflict in their decision making. Mm -hmm. So to take one example, Minister Robert has publicly stated that when he returned to the ministry, he transferred his large shareholdings and other assets to a blind trust. Um, what has Minister Robert done to demonstrate to the Prime Minister that he has no conflicts of interest? So, um, so uh, Minister Robert uh, would comply, I'm sure, with all of the relevant declarations to, uh, to the Prime Minister and his public declaration as a member of the House of Representatives. Um, Mr Reid has just drawn my attention, attention to section uh, 2.14 uh, of the relevant code uh, that, uh, that says uh, where a situation arises of the kind referred to in paragraph 2.13, uh, which relates to possible shareholdings uh, that could um, uh, present a, a conflict of interest or a perceived conflict um, uh, in a minister's duties, uh, that where a situation arises of the kind referred to in 2.13, the minister shall make appropriate arrangements to ensure that any conflict of interest is avoided. Those arrangements may include, uh, and it provides four relevant points of, uh, of how they may handle that. Uh, um, one may be to refer decision making elsewhere. Uh, one may be uh, to divest the shareholding. Uh, the third referred to is the establishment of a blind trust, uh, or the fourth, such other arrangement to, to the satisfaction of, um, of the Prime Minister on advice of, uh, of his secretary, etc. So, um, uh, the code um, reflects the role of, uh, of blind trusts as a potential management vehicle for um, um, interests that a senator or member uh, serving as a minister may hold. And as I said, that's long been the case and has been used uh, by um, uh, many um, ministers, I think, over a longish period of time to manage such issues. Um, I think probably some of the greatest attention to that was. Uh, it was, of course, around uh, former Prime Minister and former Minister Turnbull as to how he structured some of his holdings at the time. Mm. The, so, essentially, what you're saying is that, that the way Minister Robert has sought to avoid conflicts of interest is by establishing a blind trust? Um, uh, Senator Watt, I don't have uh, Minister Robert's declarations in front of me, but uh, um, uh, you were the one who quoted him before, so. Um, I'll take your quote at face value. I'm happy to risky though that can be. Sometimes. Well, I'm happy to provide you with copies of his declaration if that's of assistance. Um, the you're right. You read from paragraphs 2.13 and 14 of the statement of ministerial standards. I'm not sure if you've got paragraph 2.15 there as well. Um, but what it says is that. For the purposes of paragraph 2.14, a blind trust, if that is the method chosen by a minister to avoid conflicts of interest, a blind trust will require appropriate legal and accounting certification in cases where a reasonable apprehension of a conflict of interest arises based on the initial composition of the assets held by the trust. A minister must, one, declare any interest to the cabinet and to the prime minister as necessary, and two, absent themselves from cabinet consideration or make arrangements for decision making to be passed to another minister selected by the Prime Minister. What did Minister Robert do when establishing his blind trust to ensure that he complied with that requirement from the statement of ministerial standards? Uh, Senator, unless, uh, unless somebody else at the table has specifics, I'll have to take that one on notice. Well, is it helpful if I table Minister Robert's um, Register of interests. Um, I don't know whether that would be helpful or not to <laughs> Senator Watt, but you're you free to do so. I mean, it's Ms. a document Ms. Foster, that's on the public record. Ms Foster, were you or your officers involved in 
um, the processing administration, whatever the right word would be, of Minister Roberts' blind trust when he came back into the ministry? Um, Senator, we provide advice on all um, statements of ministerial interests to the Prime Minister for the consideration of the Government's Committee of Cabinet. OK, so PMNC did provide advice to the Prime Minister and the Governance Committee of Cabinet regarding Minister Roberts' blind trust arrangements? Uh, Senator, I'm being careful um, in the way I answer because um, we, because the advice that we prepare is in the context of the Governance Committee of Cabinet. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what I can say is that we provide information on all ministerial, on all statements of interest from ministers to the Prime Minister. Right. Well, as I say, I mean, Minister Robert made no secret of his establishment of a blind trust when he returned to the ministry, um, and he effectively made clear that that was how he felt that he would comply with the statement of ministerial standards. So it would be reasonable to assume that something went to the Governance Committee of Cabinet. Um, you, know, you can't disclose. So, yeah, Senator, I think you can draw that assumption. Okay. So what... And, and, and obviously, you know, Minister Robert publicly referenced that, yep. has declared it in his House of Representatives declaration, so he's been perfectly transparent about yep. those arrangements, just as, uh, just as he is about his Australian coin collection and a couple of Yamaha motorbikes, I see, that he's, uh, he's declared too. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, that's, uh, uh, I am confident that, uh, that Minister Robert has met the standards there of, uh, um, of the ministerial requirements on the basis that he's clearly gone through all of those undertakings and, uh, and in terms of his entry into the ministry has established um, uh, a blind trust as is uh, provided for under the ministerial standards. Okay, so leaving aside any advice that may have been provided to the Governance Committee of Cabinet, can you, whether now or on notice, advise us of the dates of any advice PMNC provided to the Prime Minister or his office regarding Minister Roberts' establishment of a blind trust? We can take that on notice, Senator. Thank you. And did the Prime Minister or his office discuss this matter with PMNC? Senator, again, I, I'd have to take that on notice um, in the course of preparing our advice, um, which obviously canvasses um, uh, all um, ministers. Um, it would be not unusual for us to have a process where we ask questions, seek more information. Um, so it's not unusual for there to be an iterative process. OK. And, Minister, could you please take on notice whether Minister Robert discussed this matter with either the Prime Minister or his office prior to Cabinet consideration of the matter? Sorry, prior to Cabinet consideration of... Of the establishment of his blind trust. What I'm asking uh, is whether whether the Minister Robert discussed well, this with the PM well, or yeah, his office. There's, um, so, I mean, Ms Foster's been clear there are, I mean, there are certain things that would be prepared in the routine course of, uh, of business um, for the Governance Committee of Cabinet to um, ensure um, compliance uh, with the statement of uh, um, expectations for ministers and, uh, and in terms of those declarations that are made. Let's not conflate that into there was a discussion of Cabinet about Minister Robert's blind trust, which is, uh, which is what your question seeks to do, Senator Watt. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, if, uh, if Minister Robert uh, has followed, as I'm confident he has, uh, all of the relevant requirements and expectations um, in terms of what he's declared, as he has to the House of Reps, as he's made clear publicly, uh, then, uh, then there would likely have been no need for such a discussion. But insofar as were there any discussions um, with the PM or otherwise, well, if there's some information to provide there, I'll happily provide it. Senator, what you're free to obviously put on notice whatever questions you want. Sure. Um, Ms Foster, at any point uh, did Minister Robert disclose the name of his trust, this blind trust? Uh, Senator, I'd have to take that level of detail on notice. And at any point did he disclose the identity of his trustee? Again, Senator, I'd have to take that on notice. The reason I ask about that is that the way Minister Robert has declared, disclosed his trust is quite different to how other members who have trusts disclose theirs. You referred to former Prime Minister Mr Turnbull, um, Minister Dutton, 
just as two examples, they hold family trusts which are disclosed in their register of interest with the name of the trust and the identity of the trustee. But in contrast, if you look at Minister Roberts' disclosure, in the section labelled where, where you disclose trusts, he says not applicable. And the only area in which he discloses the existence of this trust is in the item regarding, regarding other income. So I'm curious as to why other members of parliament who hold trusts disclose the name of the trust and the identity of the trustee, but Minister Robert appears to have hidden this. So my question again is whether well, Minister I Robert has disclosed the name or identity, name of the trust or the identity of his trustee. Um, well, I, I think just firstly there, Senator Watt, in terms of uh, the public um, House of Reps declaration, which I've been able to um, um, pull up. Uh, he does disclose it both as an asset and as a source of additional income. Mm -hmm. It's not only disclosed in relation well, to the additional income uh, section, it is disclosed as an asset. Um, uh, obviously it's a matter for um, the House of Reps in terms of, uh, in terms of whether um, they require additional levels of detail around, uh, around such uh, disclosures, but I'm not aware that that's been raised um, in the House of Reps committees at all. Um, I'm sure Minister Robert would respond if it has. Um, the other matters that you've raised, if officials have anything to, to add, they can do so, but I, I don't want it to stand suggesting that he's only declared it as a source of income. He's definitely declared it as an asset as well. Well, he hasn't declared the, the name of the trust or the identity of the trustee as an asset. And that is different and, to what other members have done. Um, uh, and Senator Watt, as I said, that's a matter for the House of Reps uh, relevant committee there as to whether they uh, require uh, further information. But to my knowledge, they've not requested any further information. So, OK, again, my question is, at which you'll take on notice, is whether Minister Robert has disclosed the name of his trust or the identity of his trustee. That's correct, Senator. Thank we you. have that. Minister, just going back to the statement of ministerial standards, and you referred to paragraph 2.14, which says that where an, in, where an initial composition of interests held by a trust give rise to a conflict, additional steps must be taken by the Prime Minister and a minister. Did Minister Robert declare the initial composition of his trust? Sorry, Senator, were you quoting from 2.14? Yep. Sorry, 2.15. Right. Sorry. That's where I was. So, that, so again, 2.14 deals with uh, potential conflicts of interest of ministers and instructs ministers to make appropriate arrangements to avoid conflicts, and they may include a range of things, including the establishment of a blind trust. 2.15 deal specifically with situations where a minister chooses a blind trust to avoid those conflicts of interest and says that in cases where a reasonable apprehension of a conflict of interest arises based on the initial composition of the assets held by the trust, then mm. a minister must do certain things. Okay. So, so my understanding is that uh, the Minister Roberts met all requirements of the ministerial code um, and uh, uh, if there's uh, um, anything to add to that. Um, I'll uh, bring that back to the committee. Well, I know that you say you're confident that he's complied with the ministerial code, but I'm interested in getting an answer to my question, which is whether Minister Robert did declare the initial composition of his trust, um, as would seem to be required under the Statement of Ministerial Standards. I understand the question, Senator Watt. My understanding is he's complied with all requirements. If there's anything to, to add to that, I'll bring it back. And what additional steps did Minister Robert take to avoid conflicts arising by virtue of his blind trust? Um, well, that, uh, that would be... Um, that's a potentially hypothetical question, 
Well, it is a well, it's not. Vehicle. It's a, well, he either took additional steps or he didn't. Well, well no, because um, the composition of it may mean that there is no area for conflict in uh, uh, in his duties, particularly the uh, dependent upon what the initial composition of it was and uh, and discussions that uh, that ensue from there. And of course, once established, the point of a blind trust is he doesn't have um, line of sight over uh, over decisions that are made. Uh, around his investments? Well, the reason this matters is that at the time of the creation of his blind trust, Minister Robert and family investments, family trusts that he held had significant shareholdings in property companies, mining companies, health companies, biotechnology companies, transport companies. So I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to realise that, depending what he did with those interests, that would potentially generate conflicts of interest if those shareholdings were simply transferred to a trust. Um, well, Senator Watt, um, uh, Minister Robert is, uh, is the uh, Minister for Employment and Skills. Um, he's been acting in, uh, in the education portfolio. Um, if there were specific decisions that, uh, that he was undertaking, uh, then of course there would be a responsibility uh, to be mindful of any of those potential conflicts. Um, uh, there are the general deliberations of, uh, of Cabinet. Um, uh, every member of our Cabinet, as with every member of your Shadow Cabinet, uh, will have, um, uh, will have um, shareholdings through superannuation investments and otherwise in resources company and in a range of telecommunications and banking and financial and, uh, and other sectors. So um, uh, I think we need to be cautious about where you seek to draw the line in, uh, in those regards. Uh, but in terms of the specific questions you've asked, obviously, as I've said, if, there are, uh, if there's further particular issues to bring uh, back to the committee, I'll bring them back in, uh, in terms of his uh, establishment and handling of that. I mean, to help you out, the Statement of Ministerial Standards at paragraph 2.15 actually says what a minister must do if there is a reasonable apprehension of a conflict of interest arising from their blind trust. And what they must do to comply with the standards is firstly, declare any interest to the Cabinet and to the Prime Minister as necessary, and secondly, absent themselves from Cabinet to consideration or make arrangements for decision making to be passed to another minister selected by the Prime Minister. So has Minister Robert done either of those things that are required under the standards? Oh, Sen Senator Watt, um, you're now leaping to, uh, to suggest that, uh, that there is some area of conflict in regards to any decision making that the Minister's engaged in um, without actually um, prescribing what you think that may be. Well, I'll tell you, immediately before Minister Robert established his blind trust. His declaration of interests in October 2018 listed extensive shareholdings, property holdings, family trusts, other assets. His next declar declaration of interests, when he became a minister, said that it had all been transferred to a blind trust. Mm -hmm. So if in accordance with the ministerial correct, standards? Correct. So if the day before he sets up his blind trust, he has all sorts of shares, either directly owned or through trusts, and simply transfers them into a blind trust, I guess my first question is, how, does that, how is that a blind trust if he knows what's in it? And secondly, and more importantly, what has he done to manage the conflicts of interest that would arise from that? If he knows that he holds shares in XYZ company or ABC company and he puts them in a blind trust, has he, as is required by the Statement of Ministerial Standards, has he declared those interests to the Cabinet and the Prime Minister as necessary and has he absented himself from Cabinet consideration or make arrangements for decision making to be passed to another Minister? Because if he hasn't, it would seem to me that he's in breach of the statement of ministerial standards. So the, the part that you're missing amongst uh, amongst that uh, that stream of, uh, of thought there, Senator Watt, uh, is of course the element of 
what it is you're alleging he has made any decision on uh, in which uh, there, uh, there is uh, a conflict. Uh, now, uh, if, uh, if Minister Robert has, as, uh, as I understand, complied with all of his responsibilities under the, uh, the ministerial standards, then he will have addressed um, all of the different issues on the way through there, including, as you put it, the transfer of those assets and, uh, and the initial holdings of a blind trust and, uh, and making sure there's sufficient confidence there uh, in those arrangements. But Minister Robert, uh, uh, as I indicated before, you haven't, you know, you haven't cited um, you know, particular shareholdings in particular training providers that he may have made decisions about uh, in his role as, uh, as Minister for Skills or, uh, or uh, any, uh, any such suggestion in that regard. Um, uh, and I note there's no such suggestion in that regard. Um, we'll take the points you've raised. If there's concerns in relation to any of those points, I'll bring it back to the committee. But uh, It's partly about decisions that he might have made as an individual minister. And I note that he did hold health stocks, biotech stocks. He held, I mean, he was the Minister for Government Services, which manages contracts across government around IT, all sorts of services. So it's partly about decisions that he made as an individual minister, but it's also about decisions made by Cabinet that he was party to, which were of benefit to property companies, mining companies, health companies, biotech companies and transport companies, in which he, it would seem that he held shares. Um, yeah. And, and, and Senator Watt, and I'm asking, there, did there, he absent there, himself from those decisions? Well, well Senator Watt, there, there is a tipping point in relation to those breadth of shareholdings that, as I said before, uh, every member of any cabinet structured um, um, in the modern era um, holds interests across that sort of suite of, uh, of areas of the economy um, uh, by virtue of uh, different superannuation holdings and the like. Well, so there, there's specific provisions there's, for superannuation you know, holdings are, in the Statement of Ministerial Standards. There, there, there are, Senator Watt, um, and of That's course... Different. Well, they are listed clearly in, uh, in terms of what is declared. Um, the point I'm making is when you start to get to the generalisations of is a minister a participant in decisions around economic policy settings, well, yes, uh, you know, we are all participants in, uh, in relation to different economic policy settings. Those different economic policy settings impact upon all of our investments as they do the investments of all Australians. Um, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not practical to exclude you know, universally across that sphere. Um, but uh, the specifics in relation to um, direct conflicts as, uh, as they relate uh, to what impacts directly upon different companies or different investments that individuals have, they're clearly set out. Um, uh, I'm confident and, uh, and don't have any suggestion of any particular instance from you uh, where uh, Minister Robert uh, may not have been in compliance with those. I'm confident he has been. OK. Has Minister Robert or his trustee, whoever that might be, updated PM&C or the Governance Committee on his investments since the time he established his blind trust? Well, it would probably defeat the purpose of the blind trust if Minister Robert were updating on the investments I would, of the blind I trust. I think you're right. So, so does that mean that he hasn't updated the PM&C or the Governance Committee when he was appointed Minister for Government Services or the NDIS or when he took on the acting role as Minister for Education or when he changed portfolios to Minister for Skills, Small Business and other portfolios? Uh, well, again, if, there's, if there is, I mean, there may be other things outside of the Blind Trust that have prompted an update to, uh, to his statement of interest in terms of uh, gifts, other assets, uh, uh, employment uh, practices of uh, family members or the like. So um, if, there's, uh, if there's anything relevant to, uh, to the Blind Trust arrangements, um, we can uh, bring that back to the committee. So how can the Prime Minister be sure that any changes that have occurred to Minister Roberts' investments through his blind trust don't put him in conflict with his ministerial duties? Oh, Senator Watt, that comes back to then the fundamental point of having the option for blind trusts. Um, that, uh, that, that option is there um, so that ministers can um, dispose of direct knowledge and responsibility and handling of assets they may own um, and vest those in another um, uh, such that they um, do not have line of sight, do not have knowledge, um, and, uh, uh, and that's the whole reason that 
those provisions have long existed um, and and been utilised uh, um, on all sides of politics at different times. But isn't this exactly the situation that triggered Mr Porter's resignation? What the Prime Minister said... No, Senator well, no, no, no. What the Prime Minister said was that because donations were made to a blind trust and Minister Porter could not say who those donors were, it was, to use the Prime Minister's words, the inability for Mr Porter to be able to practically provide further information because of the blind nature of those arrangements. That is what prevented Minister Porter from conclusively ruling out a perceived conflict. So Minister Porter can't say who the donors are, can't rule out conflicts, has to resign because of potential conflicts of interest. Minister Robert sets up a blind trust that he doesn't disclose the name of, that he doesn't disclose the identity of the trustee for, doesn't know what's going on inside it, can't rule out conflicts of interest. How is that different? So, so Senator Watt, are you proposing that, uh, that a future Labor government, uh, if there were one, would remove the ability for blind trusts to be used uh, for the holding of uh, I haven't of said that at all, assets? but what I've said is well, that, that so ministers you, you, should, should... You seem to be arguing that that should no, be no, the No, no, no. What I'm now. arguing is the, that the ministers point, I mean, should comply they, with the I mean, standards, they, uh, which the requires and, and them... the minister does comply with the standards well, you, to but all but the advice... you don't know that. You haven't been able to assure me that Minister Robert complies with paragraph 2.15, which goes specifically to blind trusts and requires ministers uh, to declare any interest to the Cabinet and the Prime Minister, even if they're in a blind trust, and absent themselves from Cabinet consideration or make arrangements for decision-making to be passed to another minister selected by the Prime Minister. And, you, and, 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 you and you're just seeking to happened. engage in a, in, a, in a general slur there without actually suggesting there is a single decision that you're actually bringing into question. So there's no decision of Cabinet um, that benefits mining companies, senators. property companies, oh, health well, companies, well, biotech well, companies, well, transport well, companies? Well, companies. Let's, let's not talk over each other. That's, that's where I'll take you back to that general point about issues that government makes decisions on for the benefit of the economy overall, um, benefit all ministers, but of course benefit all Australians. And, uh, and it's impractical to suggest ministers would be absenting themselves from all of those different types of, uh, of deliberations or discussions, regardless of the, uh, of the um, um, political origins of, uh, of those ministers. I'd say the same for uh, Labor ministers as I would for coalition ministers. Mm -hmm. Fundamental difference in relation to uh, the scenarios you're issuing there uh, is that one is a matter of gifts and uh, gifts made um, from, uh, from a range of uh, unknown purposes for which, I guess, the, uh, for which the ministerial standards don't provide such clear steps uh, for, uh, for how they are handled. The other is a matter of investments for which there are long-standing practices of which the ministerial standards do provide a process for how they are handled. Uh, and my advice is that Minister Robert has followed that process. Senator yeah, Patterson, I, yeah, I was you. just about to say sorry, I think you had a supplementary on I, this matter. I do on, on this topic. Um, Minister, I'm not sure if you're aware, um, an article published uh, in the Sydney Morning Herald on the 24th of June 2007 was entitled, Rudd's Blind Trusts Take Control of Share Trades, and it went on to report, Labor leader Kevin Rudd has set up a blind trust for his family's prolific share tradings six months after pledging to do so. A spokesperson told the Sun Herald Mr Rudd had finalised the trust last week and it will be registered on his parliamentary pecuniary interest file this week. The trust will control the share dealings of Mr Rudd, his multi-millionaire wife Therese Rain and adult children Jessica and Nicholas. The family will have no say in buying and selling and will not be about, uh, told about any transactions. The move follows questions raised about the potential for conflicts of interest to arise between the Rudd family's share dealings and the then Labor leader's position. The potential would be greater if he were to become Prime Minister. Last month, Mr Rudd divested himself of shares in the investment company AMCIL, which owns stakes in some of the country's biggest companies. Ms Rain's multi-million dollar portfolio is on Mr Rudd's pecuniary interest register. Her PBL shares were soar if Labor in government implemented its $4.7 billion national broadband rollout promise. Um, doesn't that article highlight, Minister, that it is a long-standing practice of uh, governments of both political persuasions to use blind trust to manage conflicts of interest? It, it does highlight that, Senator Patterson, as, as I indicated on the way through, and it is useful to, uh, to have um, that example of, uh, of Mr Rudd's uh, holdings, uh, for which um, I think we can say with some confidence, given the, uh, the breadth of those holdings, that uh, um, in terms of 
the generalisations Senator Watt has raised about holdings in uh, resources or financial or technology companies, mm. uh, that as, uh, as Prime Minister it would have been impractical for Mr Rudd or Mr Turnbull uh, at a later point uh, to absent themselves from every area of policy consideration that may have an impact upon those sectors more generally or the economy more generally. Um, but of course, um, it, is, uh, it is an obligation if a minister is making a decision in relation to a specific company um, that, uh, that will provide particular benefits to, uh, to that company, uh, that if they are aware um, of having investments or holdings there, then they need to, uh, to manage those appropriately. But the distinction needs to be drawn between general policy settings that, uh, that people like Mr Rudd and Mr Turnbull have had to manage and that other ministers uh, who have such uh, trust arrangements need to manage uh, versus those of um, uh, those um, um, specific decisions that ministers make. Just, just Thank to, you, uh, Chair. Just to wrap up, Chair, mm -hmm. I'm not asserting that the creation of a blind trust is a problem in itself. You're right, there are numerous members of parliament from all sides who have done that. What I'm trying to get answers to is whether Minister Robert complied with the statement of ministerial standards when he did establish a blind trust. And with respect, Minister, you've several times said you're confident he did, you've been assured he did, but you haven't been able to tell me in any way what Minister Robert specifically has done to make sure that he complies with the requirements of the standards. So, I mean, obviously you'll need to come back once you get some answers on that. But it, it's not, I'm not trying to say that the creation of a blind trust in itself is a problem. Yeah. It's, it's thank, thank do, you follow the, do you follow the rules? Thank you for that clarification then, Senator Watt, because it, it seemed like from your um, um, penultimate question that, uh, that you were trying to create that insinuation. But, but, but no, no, but, but it does, but the, the fundamental point that I'm trying to understand is why, what that is the no difference? your penultimate question well, what, now, what is the difference between Minister Porter, former Minister Porter, and Minister Robert. Minister, then Minister Porter had donations made to a blind trust. He couldn't tell the Prime Minister who they were from. He therefore could not conclusively rule out a perceived conflict, to use the Prime Minister's words. But we've got Minister Robert, who says that he doesn't know what's in his blind trust. For all we know, it contains all the shares that he held immediately before he established the blind trust. How are we to know that he can conclusively rule out a perceived conflict? What's no. the difference between Minister Porter and Minister Robert? No. Because, as I said before, the processes uh, for um, management of investments uh, through blind trusts uh, are long-standing, as, uh, as Senator Patterson's question uh, gives proof to, uh, are well documented in the ministerial standards uh, and, uh, uh, and um, provide uh, for that reassurance. Uh, there is no such equivalence in, uh, in such ministerial standards, uh, history or processes for the receipt of gifts through such arrangements. Okay, well, I look forward to seeing your answers. Thank you, Senator Watt. Um, Senator Patrick, I'll give you the call, but you have only got five minutes before we're due to break for lunch. Sure. So please too, be too economical. Um, maybe I can come back just after. Um, uh, just uh, th thank you very much, Chair. The, um, I note that the department issued a new a guidance on caretaking conventions. Just wondering, is that as, 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 is that as a result of a review that's taken place at all? Senator, that's something we do um, each um, prior to each election. We review the caretaker guidance to make sure that it's current. Okay, so how do you decide what to change? I mean, is someone looking back on what happened last time around? and adding in uh, a change? Um, Senator, I'll let Mr Reid go through the process. It's his area that actually yeah. um, goes through this. So, for example, we have the, sport, the, uh, the car parks a report from the Auditor General, which might you know, otherwise require some tidying up, I don't know. Um, Senator, thanks. Uh, John Reid, First Assistant Secretary, Government Division. Um, as Ms Foster has said, it's a usual process ahead of, ahead of an election period to, to as you say, tidy up 
mm. um, the convention or the guidance on the convention. In this case, uh, we made some uh, amendments for accessibility um, and, to, and formatting and, and things like that. Um, the only substantive change that was made related to the ability for ministers to claim travel expenses. The reason that change was made was because uh, the Parliamentary Business Resources Act and regulations have come into being, so obviously 2017, and created a potential lack of clarity um, between a provision that existed in the, in the old caretaker conventions, which provided that ministers not claim travel expenses between the time of the uh, launch uh, of a campaign and polling day, and the requirements in the PBR framework. So in order that ministers only had one place to look um, for their travel, uh, for the framework around travel expenses, we simply removed it from the conventions. Um, and that was as a result of a request by the then Special Minister of State and Shadow Special Minister of State. Okay. Um, during the caretaker period, who's actually, is there someone in PMNC who's like responsible for um, observing conduct and making sure that the conventions are complied with? So, Senator, um, we have an advisory role, um, and so um, Mr. Reid's area um, uh, provides, in effect, a service that departments can call on to seek advice on how they should interpret. Um, the so, so if a minister makes a decision that's a rogue decision, it's, it's not in accordance with the convention, is it the case the department doesn't implement it or is it a case that the um, that PMNC do something else? So, Senator, um, it's a matter for each departmental secretary to manage that um, process um, with their minister during the caretaker process. As I said, we will provide them with advice on, on how we believe the convention should apply. So if a major binding decision was made by a minister, um, if, if the secretary is okay with it, then in effect nothing goes beyond that. Is that right? So Senator, the secretary um, would have, account, have account mm. um, of the caretaker convention, um, of the guidance, um, and if they were uncertain about the appropriateness of the action, then they would seek advice. And if it came to the attention of PMNC that there had been a breach, would the opposition leader be, br be briefed on it? Senator, um, I, th I think the, the guidance, as I said, op the guidance is there to provide support um, to ministers and to their departments. Mm. Um, the role of PMNC is to obviously make sure the guidance is um, clear and up to date and to provide support to departments. Um, how, how the secretary... So you set the framework, and but, but you don't do the and enforcing. That's left with the and, secretaries. And I think, Senator Patrick, there, there is a, a step before um, a minister making a decision, which is probably the primary vehicle by which, from my experience, departments manage the caretaker arrangements, and that is that um, departments don't put to ministers matters for decision during the caretaker period uh, that, uh, that should not be, that are either not necessary uh, or should not be undertaken during the caretaker period. Uh, if they are necessary, then from my experience, they will come with very explicit advice around what is necessary uh, in terms of engagement with, uh, uh, with uh, the opposition um, on, uh, on the next steps. Okay, another topic, but do you want me to wait till I after think that lunch? would be best, Senator okay. Patrick. The committee will now suspend for lunch. We'll reconvene at 2.30 p.m. Uh, and, Senator Patrick, I will give you the call yeah, back I'll after lunch. Yeah, I'll only go another five minutes. Thank you. Then you'll rid yourself of me. For the whole day? Yeah, I know. This examination of the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, just for those listening along at home uh, and others who may be interested, I will go to Senator Patrick to continue for another five minutes. Then I understand Ms Foster has some answers to some questions um, that she will provide to the committee and will then go to Labor senators for further questions. Uh, so, Senator Patrick, you thank, have the Thank call. you very much. And this could be very, very short. Um, uh, Ms Foster, um, does the Governor-General receive copies of Cabinet Ministers' minutes? Uh, no, Senator. When did that practice change? So let me just 
um, seek some advice from our cabinet area. Yeah. I've got a 1969 minute from your department. So, so Ms McGuire is saying we have not provided cabinet minutes since she's been in the role for the last two or three years. Yeah. Um, so we'd have to take on notice if that was formerly the practice when it changed. So I, I'll just direct you. There's a minute back in, on the 29th of July 1969. I don't expect you've read it. But it basically states the, the reasoning behind why this should occur. Um, the Governor-General represents the Crown in Australia, whilst undoubtedly his status uh, is that of the Regent for a constitutional monarch. There is, there's still a mo there is still a monarch and his or her representative needs to be in touch with the developments of the body politic. goes into suggesting that it is ca the, the Cabinet that makes the most important of those decisions. Um, and uh, so it's, it's clearly been the case in the past that Governor-Generals are informed or are provided with Cabinet sorry. minutes. So sorry, Senator Patrick, that was 1969. I don't think our yeah. constitution monarchy has changed much since then. Um, no well, it, um, um, uh, whilst the constitutional monarchy itself has, uh, has not Senator Patrick, there have been changes such as the Australia Acts that, uh, that have mm. passed since then um, that do change some nature of, uh, of the engagement between uh, Australia and, uh, and uh, the UK. Um, uh, I can't speak for when between 1969 and, uh, uh, and today uh, the practice um, of sharing cabinet minutes, if, uh, if that was the case, um, with Governors General changed. Um, if we can ascertain that, uh, then happy to do so. Um, um, there would also be uh, you know, possibly a question as to what practice occurs elsewhere, not least of which in the UK sure. itself, as to uh, as to whether there's been any change to uh, to practice in those timelines that I couldn't speak of offhand. Um, and Senator, people have been scurrying around trying to see <laughs> if there is anything at the moment. Um, and certainly, it would appear that the Governor General gets access to um, appointments, um, so decisions around appointments. Um, and there may be some other material that's made available. So we'll um, see if we can clarify what that is. So in the exercise of his prerogative power, how does he become informed? Is it just the newspapers? And God help us. Um, All right, maybe might, might, might more rightly okay. be a question for the sure. office of uh, the Secretary to the Governor-General. Um, um, but... Uh, well, obviously, the executive council process is a, is a formal briefing process of, uh, of ministers, but, um, but the governor general does have access to other briefings and information of, uh, of government to uh, um, to keep them abreast of, uh, of different issues. Mm. Okay, maybe maybe I'll notice if you could explore that uh, issue for me a, a little bit uh, better. For the minute I'm referring to is one between um, uh, Sir John Bunting, who was the secretary of the prime minister in cabinet, and. Uh, 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 Mr. Bunting, who was the uh, Secretary of Cabinet, Secretary to Cabinet back in uh, between 1959 and 1968. So, um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm happy to do that. Actually, I just I might get you a clean copy because I scribbled yeah, all over sure. this one. I will do that for you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jen. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Ms. Foster, responses to those questions. Okay. So the first was um, the date of the creation of the Naval Shipbuilding Enterprise Governance Committee. Uh, that was November 2020. Uh, the second was the question about um, whether Don Winters uh, was employed by any other government. Um, he does make a full declaration of all other employment. Uh, he had formally had a contract with the United States government, but he has no current contracts with other foreign governments. And finally, uh, Mr. Reid took on notice when uh, the PM was last briefed on the Integrity Commission bill, and he advises that that was on the 10th of February this year. Thank you very much, Ms. Foster. Uh, Labor senators. Thank Senator you. Gallagher. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Senator Birmingham, was it you that sent a text message to Gladys Berejiklian during the 2020 bushfires describing the Prime Minister as a desperate, a fraud and a complete psycho? 
Uh, as I've already said publicly, no. If it wasn't you, do you know who it was? No. Does the Prime Minister know who uh, it was? Uh, not to my knowledge, um, and, uh, and I note that the only information in relation to such claims is, uh, is what's been provided by, uh, um, by journalists. Ms Berejiklian told your Cabinet colleague that during the, deadlock, uh, the, the bushfires, the Prime Minister was actively spreading lies about her, and with lies, lives at stake, he is just obsessed with petty political point scoring. Isn't it bad enough that the Prime Minister went on holidays to Hawaii during the bushfires? Why did he behave like this when he got back? Uh, well, I reject um, the uh, um, scenario painted there and the uh, and the accusations made. So um, but uh, but, certainly, but certainly the, but certainly the, certainly the question sounds like a, an attempt at petty political point scoring. So, Ms. Berejiklian, in this question is not telling the truth then, is that what you're saying? Oh, I'm not taking uh, any of these statements as, uh, as fact, Senator Gallagher. So you don't believe the text messages were actual text I, messages? I, I have nothing other than public and media reporting on the matter. Have you ever sent a text message disparaging the Prime Minister? No, Senator Gallagher. On the 22nd of March, Last year, the Deputy Prime Minister sent a message to Ms Brittany Higgins via a third party saying, I and Scott don't get along. He is a hypocrite and a liar from my observations, and that is over a long time. I have never trusted him, and I dislike how he earnestly rearranges the truth to a lie. What does it say about the Prime Minister that two people who know him very well, the Deputy Prime Minister and Ms Berejiklian, both describe him as a liar? Senator, uh, I don't accept character appraisal. The Deputy Prime Minister has, uh, has addressed those matters. Um, I was quite hoping that I might get asked about this in the Senate last week because I was thinking that perhaps with, uh, for example, Senators O'Neill and Keneally in the room together, it would be entertaining to understand what text messages they've exchanged about one another. And the same could be said about any number of different relationships the uh, across Minister the building. The Deputy Prime um, Minister. Are you suggesting to me that uh, none of the Labor caucus have ever had a bad word to say about uh, Mr Albanese I'm suggesting uh, to you in that their a text lot of people think the because Prime I'm Minister sure is they a liar. Have. And, That's what I'm and, suggesting And no to doubt, you. no doubt, Senator Gallagher, that the high, uplifting, positive uh, ad campaign you will run in, uh, in the election campaign will focus on such personal slurs. Well, these aren't slurs from, from Labor. They're from the Deputy Prime Minister and a former New South Wales Liberal Premier who worked closely with the Prime Minister. And there is an important reason to ask about this because it goes to the character of the Prime Minister. And we have a number of people, including former Prime Minister Turnbull, who said that Scott has a, always had a reputation for telling lies. So uh, Mr Water Joyce, Ms Be Berejiklian yes. and Mr uh, Turnbull order, all wrong. Senator Gallagher, Senator Patterson on a point of order. Uh, thank you. I know Senator Gallagher has to get a, a YouTube video or a Facebook video for, out of today as a KPI, but I'm just wondering how this relates to the estimates of agencies or departments appearing before us. I don't think the Prime Minister's character, to use Senator Gallagher's framing, is uh, a budget item. I do. On the point I, yes, Senator Gallagher, on the point on of, the point of order. order. This is the Prime Minister's department. They are questions that go to the character of the Prime Minister. It also, the division and disunity and, and leaking that is going on goes to the heart of operations of this government right at this point in time. Uh, so it is relevant to the uh, portfolio department we are before. Um, the character of the Prime Minister and the way this government is functioning at the moment is relevant to this committee. Uh, Senator Gallagher, you might want to consider framing your questions um, a little more relevantly to the budget papers in that instance. Thank you. Thank you. So, Senator Birmingham, are Mr Joyce, Ms Berejiklian and Mr Turnbull all wrong? Are they the ones telling lies? Uh, well, Senator, as I said, I don't accept um, every anonymous leak that is made on the, uh, on the public record. Um, but uh, in my working career with the Prime Minister, uh, I have found him to be very determined, very hardworking, very focused on the issues before him as Prime Minister and the issues before the nation, uh, and very forthright and honest in his dealings. So why then do we have a number of people that have worked closely with him 
openly calling him a liar. Uh, Senator, uh, uh, the questions for individuals, as uh, insofar as, uh, as any of them are confirmed, um, as I said, the Deputy Prime Minister's addressed uh, those matters publicly, uh, but uh, I'm sure you wouldn't be suggesting that every member of the Labor caucus has only ever had nice things to say about Mr Albanese or indeed many of their other colleagues. Uh, I've got no doubt there are probably some colleagues who've had some mean things to say about me at different times. I'm broad enough to uh, uh, shoulders to, to take that on and, uh, uh, and know that, of course, you know, that is part of public life and public office, and uh, that occurs within all political parties, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as, of course, across the cesspit of social media and elsewhere. So uh, the Deputy Prime Minister's, or the now Deputy Prime Minister's message to Ms Higgins was sent just after the Four Corners uh, program, which aired into the Brittany Higgins matter, was aired on 22nd of March last year. Was there a connection between his description of Mr Morrison as a serial liar and Mr Morrison's claim that he didn't know about the assault for two years? Senator, uh, uh, I can't um, mind read uh, what um, Mr Joyce, who was uh, then on the back bench, was thinking. Uh, Mr Joyce has addressed um, those issues. Uh, he's apologised for them and he's spoken very clearly uh, about the positive relationship that he has with the Prime Minister and the way they work constructively together. So it's just a coincidence then, do you think, that it, it was sent as soon as that program finished where I, the Prime Minister was saying he didn't know? I don't seek to try to read anybody's minds, Senator, least of all that of Mr Joyce. In the story by Mr Masola about the text message with Ms Higgins, uh, it says, um, referring to the Prime Minister, Barnaby approached me this week to inform me of these text messages. Yet there's only been one text message printed. Were there other text messages that Barnaby had sent? Um, or Mr. Mr Joyce, sorry? Senator... Uh, um, Are you aware of any more? Uh, no, Senator, I'm not aware of, uh, of Mr Joyce's uh, uh, text messages. Um, he's addressed the issues publicly. Um, as I said before, if, uh, if we want to go on some grand text message expose across, uh, across the parliament, I suspect it would be unedifying for your the side Prime of Minister politics and allegations he's a liar. I think it's in its own category, on its own, isn't it, really? Oh, well... Uh, Senator, Senator Gallagher, you can, you can seek to run the personal politics of, uh, of these matters. Um, you know, we'll do our best enjoy, to try to seek to focus on issues for the this. nation. This is your colleague saying this about their Prime Minister. No, you're, well, you're, make, you're making the decision to ask about these yeah, matters. Yeah, because nobody's, it goes nobody's, to the nobody's heart of this government you, nobody's forcing and the you running to of ask, this government Senator, and the dysfunction. Um, nobody's, nobody's forcing you to ask about, uh, about these issues, Senator. Um, uh, and I don't think you are so naive as to think that all of your colleagues are pure and nice about one another in their text messages. I'm asking because it's, it relates to the functioning of government and the fact that this government is leaking so openly against each other and seemingly wanting the whole country to know that the Prime Minister is a liar. And it is therefore affecting how this government or whether this government is actually in a position to govern at the moment. I can tell you, Senator, that uh, the only part of my days I spend uh, dealing on such issues uh, are when I'm forced to respond to questions from you or from members of the Fourth Estate Yeah, Council. right. I, somehow I don't think that is uh, a fair assessment. I'm sure in the last few weeks you have been dealing with the fallout of this um, and not just in answering questions um, that I might have Very asked. Very hypothetical. Well, um, no, there are. There I are, cannot uh, there, believe. There may be other Labor colleagues, I and there are definitely there are definitely questions from journalists. Desk. But uh, it has not that crossed it hasn't, my desk. Right. Um, did the Prime Minister or his office ask Mr. Joyce to hold mm -hmm. a press conference and apologise to the Prime Minister? As uh, as Mr. Joyce has uh, has made plain in his remarks. He offered his resignation uh, to the Prime Minister, uh, which the Prime Minister declined to accept. Uh, I think it is safe to say from that that Mr Joyce um, was pretty upfront in relation to, uh, to um, his, uh, his um, 
response to the issue and, uh, and of course he's addressed that publicly in terms of uh, the nature of the working relationship, a positive one that he says he has with the Prime Minister. Okay. And it's positive in terms of all my observations of their engagements with each other too. Senator Birmingham, when I asked whether you were aware of other text messages, you are not aware of there being any other text messages. Is that your evidence? Senator, I am only aware of that which I have uh, seen in the public domain um, reported and which Mr Joyce has addressed through his public remarks. Okay. Is the Prime Minister aware of other text messages? I imagine not, Senator. Have you, have you talked about the text messages but, with the Prime Minister? Um, no, I don't believe so, Senator, or at least not, not beyond making sure that in addressing this sorts of fora, um, <coughs> I'm aware of the discussions uh, you know, that have been had, but those discussions have been revealed pretty well publicly anyway through Mr Joyce's statement. So as a member of the senior leadership team of the government, there hasn't been any discussion of these terribly no. damaging text messages. Is that your evidence? Uh, um, uh, Senator, uh, correct. I can assure you that uh, um, whether it be focus on matters of the Ukraine, where you started questioning today, which was a much more serious point for you to question than where you're at now, uh, whether it be other matters of national security, whether it be elements of COVID response, whether it be our national economic plan, um, that, uh, that they have uh, certainly focused discussions not these matters. Can you um, please try to um, come back to the committee on whether there are other text messages that mm. the Prime Minister is aware of? It's his language. In, it's, yeah. it's his office commenting to the journalist saying, um, Barnaby, quote, approached me this week to inform me of these text messages. Senator, I am pretty confident you're splitting hairs in regards to uh, the language used there. Okay. So it should have said the text message, not these text well, messages. Well, I, I, I think, Senator, if, you, if my recollection of the media stories are correct, uh, there was the suggestion that there was a message from Mr Joyce to an intermediary and from the intermediary to Ms Higgins. Um, that would constitute, by my reckoning, a plural uh, in terms of the number of text messages. Okay, so we take that on notice? No. You're not going to find out whether there was more messages? No, you're being ridiculous with the line of questioning, Senator. I'm not being ridiculous. There are, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars tied up in this government governing, supposedly. They are all matters relevant to this committee. And I don't see why you are refusing to take something on notice. Or, or I, I think if, the minister had answered the question, Senator Gallagher. If, if you want to ask any questions about hundreds of millions of dollars of government expenditure, then that's well and truly what I'm well, here for, Senator. Well, there's plenty that Senator. goes to supporting this dysfunctional um, government. Then that's well and truly what I'm here to yeah, address. there is. There's um, a lot. Ministerial staffers, all of the support you get, and, there's plenty and, of it. And, all relates and, to the and, budget. And, Senator, as I said before, I know you're not so naive as to think that there uh, wouldn't be uh, messages with unfavourable character assessments between members of the Labor caucus, including about Mr Albanese at different times in the past. Um, so it's all about Labor? Is no, that your defence? No, Senator, that is, that is not. Yeah. Um, but I'm just highlighting the hypocrisy of your um, focus on this issue. Well, as I said, it is your colleagues that have made it a focus. It's not anyone on this side of the table. No, you're, it's, you're it's, it's the Deputy Prime Minister, nobody, former Prime Ministers, New South Wales former Premier, all who have worked with the Prime Minister, all no, saying the same thing. And you're sitting here going, oh, nothing no, to see here. No, nobody forces you to come in here and ask hypocritical questions, Senator Gallagher. I'm not asking you, hypocritical. You, you make that choice yourself. Uh, there is nothing hypocritical about this. This is, it is three Senator. colleagues calling yeah, the know, Prime Minister of this country a and, liar and, and, on and, top of the French President calling him a liar, on top of books being written about Senator how many Gallagher, times he lies. Question? There's nothing hypocritical about this. And, uh, and Senator, I'm sure the last thing you would want to see uh, are the character assessments and performance appraisals of Mr Albanese over the last few oh. years 
um, you know, of your different colleagues flushed out in the public arena. You could at least try and defend the Prime Minister rather than just say it's all Mr Albanese's fault. Senator Gallagher, on what not day, a I'm saying, on and, uh, what and day I think did I the address Deputy pretty well Prime... up front my relationship with okay. the Prime Minister and, uh, and the trust in him. On what day did the Deputy Prime Minister offer his resignation to the Prime Minister? I think that was the day before his public statement, Senator. I think he made that clear in his statement. So on the 4th of February? I don't have the exact timelines, Senator. I didn't, uh, didn't bring does, the details of such petty matters with me, but I'll does, take your word for it on the date. Does Mr Morrison have the power to remove Mr Joyce as Deputy Prime Minister? Uh, as Deputy Prime Minister, uh, yes, uh, Senator, the Governor-General uh, makes such appointments on recommendation of, uh, of the Prime Minister. But doesn't, wouldn't it actually be a matter for the National Party who holds that office, not... Well, the National Party um, determines who the leader of the National Party is, mm. um, but the Governor-General makes appointments to such offices on the recommendation of the Prime Minister. So the Prime Minister could have sacked Mr Joyce without reference to the National Party room, is that correct? Well, my understanding is that Mr Joyce offered his resignation. It's, that's a different question, a different a an answer to a different well, question. It's, My it's, question it's, is, well, does it's, it's it, a statement is of it fact, within, actually, it's a is statement it within, of fact, Senator. well, that's fine. Is it within the power of the Prime Minister to sack the Deputy Prime Minister, a member of the, the leader of the National Party, under the coalition's power sharing arrangements? It's a, it's a genuine question. Uh, well, Senator, uh, uh, the it's a different question to the one you asked before. Uh, so the Prime Minister, as I said, makes recommendations uh, to the Governor-General around appointments to the Ministry, and, uh, and that includes holding the office of Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, matters in relation to um, the leadership of the National Party are matters for the National Party. Um, what happened on this occasion is Mr Joyce uh, offered to resign. So uh, Mr Joyce, of course, is free to resign um, if he wishes, and that would have consequential impacts. So the answer to my question, which is, does the Prime Minister have the power to sack the National Deputy Prime Minister under your coalition agreement? Does that exist? If, uh, if the Prime Minister felt there was a need to remove the Deputy Prime Minister, he has that power in, uh, in his uh, commission uh, from the from the Governor General uh, as Prime Minister. So he could technically do it without reference to the National Party Room. Technically, Senator, such things are hypothetically possible. Um, uh, in this regard, uh, the Prime Minister, as Mr. Joyce made public, had a conversation with the leader of the National Party, who offered his resignation. So the hypothetical is uh, is not the case in this regard. So just sticking with um, the text... hypothetical? No, no with text hypothetical. messages. Um, on the 2nd of November last year, the Daily Telegraph published a text message from the President of France to the Australian Prime Minister on the 16th of September, that was sent on the 16th of September, two days before the AUKUS announcement. How did a newspaper get a text message sent to Mr Morrison from President Macron? I think those issues have already been uh, addressed, Senator, including, I don't think so. uh, including through uh, through the last round of mm. estimates. If my memory is correct. That's on the So, well, I, I didn't ask them, and I'm here to ask them again. How how did a newspaper get a text message sent to Mr. Morrison from President Macron? Uh, well, Senator, <coughs> I refer you to the previous hand side on those matters. Well, we will. If someone can provide me with that, I'll come back to it. Um, it seems to me the only way that the newspaper could have got access to that text message was if the Prime Minister authorised the leak himself. Or is there another explanation? I would refer you to the previous Hansard on those matters. So you don't want to talk about it? You don't want to answer a pretty straightforward question? I think they were all uh, all addressed previously, Senator, and uh, and I think um, the most 
effective way to deal with those questions is to refer you to the previous Hansard. So in the previous Hansard, did you, an uh, did you answer that specific question? Well, I'd refer did, you to that Hansard. Did Mr Senator. Morrison authorise the leak of a private text message to him from the President of France? Well, Senator, I'd, uh, I would refer you to the Hansard of, uh, of those previous discussions. OK, well, we'll keep going and you can keep not defending this. When did the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet become aware of the leak? Senator, I'd refer you to the Hansard of, uh, of uh, uh, those previous discussions. When did Mr Gaitchens become aware of the leak? Oh, I think that would be almost identical to the previous question. Did the Foreign Minister, Senator Payne, know Mr Morrison planned to leak President Macron's message? Uh, at that point, I think I'd broaden it out and refer you to the uh, answers in, uh, in the DFAT estimates that, uh, that the Foreign Minister would have provided. The unauthorised publications of so, messages... So, so, sorry, Senator Gallagher. So, are you saying, Minister, that you've already... That this has already been dealt with in estimates and you're referring us back to... Really? Is my recollection, I think, Senator Evans, well, yes. Well, well, the G20 was after Senate estimates. Yeah. So what are you talking about? Well, Senator Evans, I'll double check the, uh, the scheduling. I seem to recall there being a fair bit of questioning around these matters previously. There hasn't been. Just making it up as you go along. The G20 was on the 30th of October, estimates was before that, and I sit in this committee and I have never heard anyone answer those questions. <coughs> so, could we start again? Or are you just refusing to answer? Or the government could provide me with the Hansard where these questions have been examined. Well, I'll double check, Senator. It may be yeah. that, uh, maybe that what I, uh, what I remember answering questions of in the chamber, of which I do a lot, was, uh, was what I was thinking of in terms of this committee, but uh, uh, I seem to think that, uh, that there had been some deliberations here before. Well, considering the leak happened on the 2nd of November, which was after supplementary estimates, I think you'll have to re check your evidence because you may have misled the Senate with some of your answers, and I will start again. How did a newspaper get a text message sent to Mr Morrison from President Macron? You must have an answer. Oh. Senator, uh, uh, I don't have an answer for, uh, for uh, particular newspapers and, uh, and their publications. OK. So somehow, without the government knowing, is this your evidence, this private text message lands in the Daily Telegraph two days after the Prime Minister is called a liar by the French, French president, and you don't have an answer as to how that happened or how it appeared in that paper. Senator, uh, uh, there can be many different uh, uh, potential responses in terms of these matters as to, uh, as to with whom messages were shared at different points in time or who else was party to anything. Um, I think the Prime Minister addressed the issues raised by, uh, by President Macron fairly extensively, uh, especially when he uh, arrived in the UK uh, and made clear that in terms of the discussions they had had uh, about uh, the cancellation of the diesel-powered submarine contract uh, and the decision to embark upon the AUKUS arrangement, uh, the nature of discussions that uh, the PM had had with President Macron about the changing strategic environment in our region uh, the changing threat profile and the impacts on, uh, on Australian defence capability decisions. Yeah. So how did a newspaper get a text message, a private text message from the Prime Minister to the French President? How did that happen? Well, Who leaked it? Well, Senator, uh, Senator I, don't, uh, I don't know in terms of newspaper sources. OK, so they may have just wrote it on a vibe of something. It seemed pretty accurate description, including what was said by the French president. Presumably, if it's a text message to the Australian Prime Minister, then 
what, are, are we suggesting that News Limited journalists have access to the Prime Minister's text messages without authority? Is that, where, is that the land we're in? No, Senator, but, uh, okay. but as we were just talking about uh, on other matters, um, uh, dependent upon uh, others who may be party to such messages or the like, uh, I don't have uh, any conclusive knowledge uh, of how um, a newspaper uh, came to have such statements. Um, what, uh, what I think has been clearly addressed uh, by the PM uh, are, of course, uh, the response to uh, what President Macron had to say, uh, where the PM was quite clear uh, in relation to um, uh, the nature of conversations he had with, uh, with President Macron uh, around that changing uh, strategic environment in our region and, uh, and the different capability equations for the Navy that flow from that. <coughs> so if we accept that News Limited aren't hacking the Prime Minister's phone and getting access to his text messages, how then would a private text message from the Prime Minister, the leader of our country, received from the leader of the French, come to appear word for word in a News Corp paper, if it wasn't authorised by the Prime Minister himself? Oh, as I said, Senator, I can't, uh, can't speak for the sources uh, of newspapers. Um, uh, obviously, uh, dependent upon who else was party to, uh, to different discussions or knowledge of them, uh, can impact upon what those uh, potential sources might be. So your first answers to my questions were, you've answered all these before. Now your answer is, you can't answer. I mean, it's a pretty serious uh, set of circumstances, isn't it, where you've got uh, private communication between two world leaders suddenly appearing two days after the French president has said Mr Morrison lied to him in a widely read paper in Australia. I mean, it's a pretty serious set of circumstances, isn't it? Because all you can take from well, it is that the Prime Minister himself or an agent of the Prime Minister leaked... Well, Senator... ..correspondence yeah, I mean, between two world leaders into the press well, to, to try and and um, take the political heat off him. Well, well Senator, um, I think there are a number of serious sets of circumstances at the heart here. Perhaps you know, the most serious being the policy issues that were being discussed, uh, which were you know, Australia's naval military requirements and capabilities for the future. Um, uh, President Macron sought to uh, suggest that, uh, that uh, he had perhaps not been aware of or not had certain discussions uh, with uh, Australia or the Australian Prime Minister about the different issues that, uh, that were being faced. Prime Minister Morrison uh, made clear and outlined uh, in his statements that he made upon landing in the UK after President Macron's observations the tone and nature of those discussions uh, in which Australia and the Prime Minister have raised uh, the issues around the changing strategic environment in our region, the impact that has in terms of, uh, of the defence capabilities uh, that we need. Uh, now, we went through uh, some of the details around AUKUS early today. Happy to go over that and the need for that, again, if required, uh, and the fact that you know, we took a decision that was in the public interest. Now, was it an easy decision? No, it wasn't easy because of the issues that Senator Ayres raised earlier about the fact that significant sums had been spent on the diesel-powered uh, submarine option, but we made the decision that it would be reckless to continue with that project and not take the alternative. It wasn't an easy decision because we knew that Naval Group and the French government would be upset uh, by the decision that was taken. But again, it would have been negligent to not make that decision, notwithstanding uh, those uh, concerns uh, that, uh, that the French government had as a result of that. Um, the decision was taken firmly, squarely in the national interest, regardless of, uh, of those difficulties, cognizant of them, uh, but ultimately believing uh, that as hard as a decision it might be, and as difficult as it might be on those different fronts, 
it was the right decision to make for Australia. Mm. Look, I, I understand the issues that are, um, you know, are being examined here around the, the broader point or that you are speaking on. My questions are about the leak of the text message because, again, like we've just gone through how the Prime Minister's own colleagues think he's a liar, an absolute psycho, a fraud, a person that puts politics above people. And the only explanation that I can see, and you're not, you're not correcting me here, is that the Prime Minister authorised a leak of his private communication with another world leader. And it again goes to the Prime Minister's character. And unless there's another explanation, that is all that we're left with, that the Prime oh. Minister leaked something because he, he was playing the domestic politics, trying to get a bit of heat off him after being called a liar Question by President Senator Macron, Governor. and it appears in the Daily Telegraph oh. two days later. Or is that just a, a, just a happy coincidence? Well, Senator, again, I'm not going to try to speculate on newspaper sources. The, well, again, how the, did the, the it get in the, there? the Prime Minister addressed the substantive issues raised by President Macron's comments when he landed in the UK yeah. went through very clearly, uh, quite publicly, uh, the fact that there had been exchanges uh, through different formats between the Prime Minister and President Macron um, about the different issues that led to the AUKUS decision. Um, nobody pretends that there weren't hard feelings and hurt feelings as, uh, as a result of that difficult decision. But we absolutely stand by the decision, and as the Prime Minister has made clear, some of the factors that led to that decision, particularly around the type of naval capability Australia um, would or wouldn't have under different scenarios in the future, uh, was part of the ongoing dialogue uh, between nations. So, um, Senator Gallagher, you've had the call for yeah, a little over half an hour now, and I do want to um, I've got ask more, a couple I've of got questions. A lot more questions on this. Okay. So it's whether you want me to finish that or we come back to it. How much time do you more do you think you will require on Well, it depends on the topic. answers, but I've probably got another 10 or so questions. Okay. Yes. If you could okay. continue with those as economically okay. as possible, so as we, I always request, that would you. be appreciated. So we've got a journalist who's on the travelling party with the Prime Minister and other colleagues who just gets a scoop, is he? Like, how does this text message get in the Daily Telegraph? What is your explanation for it? What is the go like? Presumably, the government is concerned if text messages between world leaders are suddenly appearing in in the paper. So, what has happened? Has there been a police investigation into this? Not to my knowledge, Senator. Okay. One of uh, Mr. Gaitchen's special has he been called in to investigate? Not to my knowledge, Senator. OK, so the government's just like, oh, well, Prime Minister's phone records appear in the Daily Telegraph. Well, Senator, the government squarely focused on the substantive issues oh, at play on God. this, which were the rationale for the AUKUS decision, the rationale for not proceeding with the diesel-powered submarines uh, through the French company Naval Group, and the rationale for instead proceeding with a nuclear-powered nuclear submarine alternative. Uh, and yes, the government and the Prime Minister firmly, squarely responded to President Macron um, and outlined... And then leaked a text message. And outlined the nature of discussions that had been had uh, between the two of them, given the comments that President Macron had made publicly. So was the text message leaked by the Prime Minister because he had hurt feelings, you used that term just a little while ago, about being called a liar? Was it a retaliation text leak? Well, Senator, I'm not accepting the premise of the question. When I talk about the Prime Minister's response, I'm talking very clearly about the extensive statement he made upon landing in the UK subsequent to President Macron's uh, public comments uh, in which the Prime Minister responded quite clearly outlining the nature of dialogue that had occurred. And then the text message just mysteriously pops up two days later. Senator, I, I, I can't speak to the sources of different media companies. Ms Foster, was Prime Minister and Cabinet asked to undertake any investigation into this leak? Not to my knowledge, Senator. 
Well, you would know, wouldn't you? I would expect to know, Senator. You would expect to know. And you weren't requested by the PMO or uh, Department of Foreign Affairs or any, any of the other security agencies who might be concerned about the Prime Minister's phone records suddenly appearing in a, a daily newspaper? No, I was not, Senator. So the whole of the APS isn't worried about this at all? No one in the APS thinks, oh, the Prime Minister's text messages are, are, are appearing in an Australian paper. There's a bit of a worry about that. No, nothing? So you do know it was from the Prime... In, in that case, you must all know that it's from the Prime Minister and his office. Senator... Because otherwise, Senator you would imagine every security agency across the APS would come crashing down wanting to examine how the Prime Minister's private communications ends up in a newspaper. Well, Senator, as I said before, uh, I can't speak to the source of papers um, as to uh, other parties uh, who may have had knowledge around content or otherwise of messages. Uh, what, uh, what is clear uh, is that a statement was made um, by the French President. The Prime Minister responded publicly on the record quite comprehensively to that statement uh, around the nature of engagements that he and the Australian government had had uh, with, uh, with President Macron and the French government. And in addition to that, a private text message appears in the paper. Yes, he did those things, but then his phone records or records of a communication appear in the paper and the indifference from the public service speaks volumes, honestly. Has, did any agency come to PM&C and say, how did this happen? And, and if so, what did PM&C say? Are we led to believe that ASIO wasn't worried or any of the, the agencies offering advice to government, cyber security, anything like that? No one came to you. So, Senator, I said not to my knowledge. Um, were there something which had come through the secretary or to my government division that I would expect to know. Um, I may not know, Senator, if there was some security-related concern. But weren't you surprised, Ms Foster, to see private communication from the Prime Minister in the Daily Telegraph when that raised alarm bells for you? Well, that's asking Ms Foster for an opinion, Senator. Well, she's a senior official, sure, Deputy Secretary of the Prime Minister as, and Cabinet, you know, and the Prime Minister's private communications are in the paper. Questions for opinions are not, uh, are not matters for estimates. Okay. You didn't seek an explanation, Ms Foster? I think, I think Ms Foster's already addressed that question. No. Which, no. To which the I, answer was not. I'm asking if she sought an explanation. I didn't, Senator. Do you agree, or does the do, um, Prime Minister and Cabinet agree that the ability for leaders to correspond directly and privately with each other is, you know, an important part of trusted international relationships? Again, Senator, that's seeking an opinion. Well, what do you think, Ms. Minister Birmingham? Do you believe that ensuring that when world leaders are communicating with each other, that that communication is secure and not open to hacks or leaks? Do you think that's an important part of international diplomacy and, and fostering international relationships? Well, speaking, speaking purely uh, on the question of principle in, uh, in responding to, uh, to your question of principle there, uh, yes, and so too is the need for uh, world leaders to uh, reflect um, fully and honestly the context of, uh, of discussions they may have with one another ah. too. Ah, OK. So it was retaliation leak. Based no, on that answer, that's not Senator, what the that is said. Yes, not it, at all yes, what it I was. Said. You're trying now to blame the French that it was yes. their fault that Prime Minister had nothing, no other alternative but to leak the communication. I'm not making any such suggestion, Senator. I saw, I think, the French afterwards, um, a French newspaper saying, disclosing a text message exchange between heads of state or government is a pretty crude and unconventional tactic. 
Do you think the leaking or the release of this text message has further damaged relations between Australia and France? Uh, look, I'll, uh, I'll leave um, commentary around the status of relations to, uh, to the Foreign Minister and DFAT. Um, uh, they're clearly issues, as I acknowledged, following the cancellation um, of the uh, Naval Group contract. Uh, but, uh, but I know that the Foreign Minister has been uh, working through those issues with, uh, with French um, officials where possible, uh, along with her department. Okay. So what we've learnt so far is there's been no, no request for a police investigation. PM and C aren't at all, all phased by the fact that the Prime Minister's phone messages are appearing in the paper. No advice from security agencies raising any concerns at all. Somehow this text message uh, just appeared in the paper, conveniently with a journalist on the travelling party with the Prime Minister. Why won't you just acknowledge that the Prime Minister leaked a text message because he was angry at President Macron? It's clearly what's happened here. Well, Senator, you can, as always, uh, make uh, assertions, assertions, draw conclusions or assumptions. Oh, come um, on. Come on. Well, well if, if it wasn't the Prime Minister, there would be a police investigation. The security agencies would all be all over it. PM and C would be up in arms and, and, and working out, you know, reviews and how to manage this breach of the Prime Minister's privacy and maintaining international relationships. But nobody seems to be the slightest bit bothered. What is the other explanation then? What is the possible the other explanation, other than the Prime Minister leaked it because he had, he was angry and he felt hurt by what President Macron had said? Uh, well, yeah. Senator, Just, uh, no, Senator, as yeah. um, as I have said a few times over, um, I can't speak for either the source for a newspaper, uh, uh, but obviously those sources depend upon the range of other parties who were uh, party to or knowledge of different messages and, uh, and communications. So um, yeah, this issue played out publicly as, uh, as was clear. Uh, the Prime Minister responded um, at some length and in some detail And then leaked publicly, a text message. Uh, in relation to all, that, uh, um, uh, all of the dialogue and exchanges that, uh, that had been had. Um, uh, the government at the time of making the announcement around AUKUS uh, was uh, was at uh, pains at the time to uh, to make clear um, that our rationale for that was on the changed capability equations uh, for our navy. That uh, that um, the previous decision around the diesel-powered submarines uh, would not meet the expected capability requirements of the future, and that technological advancements and technology sharing arrangements meant that a future nuclear-powered option could meet uh, those needs of the future and that we made those decisions not as a reflection upon the work that Naval Group or the French uh, were doing, of which considerable work had been done to, uh, to address some concerns in those areas. Um, obviously, subsequent to the announcement, subsequent to us making all of those, uh, those comments, decision questions were raised about um, how much discussion there'd been around some of those contextual issues. The Prime Minister addressed that following President Macron's comments. So if it wasn't the Prime Minister who leaked the text messages, who did? Senator, I think we're going around in circles now. No, because I'm trying to get an answer and everyone in this room knows that the Prime Minister or the Prime Minister's office leaked that text message. Everyone in the public service knows, the French President knows, and yet you sit here, Miss Minister Birmingham, trying to pretend that nobody does know and that you can't speculate on sources. If it wasn't the Prime Minister, who was it? Well, Senator, what is the other Senator explanation? Senator, you've asked Senator, the Minister a question. Please listen to his yeah, response. And, and, and Senator, I think I've addressed that question multiple times now uh, in terms of um, in the source for newspapers being a matter for newspapers. Um, obviously, in relation to messages or the like, it depends upon other parties or uh, to the message or with whom it had been shared. It's, em it's embarrassing, really, that 
We have a Prime Minister who's prepared to sacrifice international relations because he's got his feelings hurt, and then you're forced to come up here and pretend not to know how that Senator text Gallagher? message got in well, in the paper. You can, you can, I mean, yes, you can you can make whatever observations uh, you like, Senator. That's the part of our free democracy. The point, Senator, uh, is that you know, a substantive policy decision was made. Uh, the government um, had uh, had um, outlined the rationale for that policy decision. It was brought into question whether or not uh, elements of that rationale had been shared uh, with other international counterparts. Uh, the Prime Minister responded very clearly in detailing the way in which it had been shared. Ms Foster, were you? Uh advised by the PMO um, not to worry about that leak of that text message? I was not, Senator. So I'm just, I'm trying to understand when you, when someone in your position or Mr Gaitchen sees an article like that in the paper, why would it not then bring on further inquiries and investigations? Senator, like, I, I don't think well, it's... No, it's a question to PMNC. No, it is a question to PMNC. Well, Senator Prime Gallagher, Minister's the Minister's allowed well, to well, respond well, to the question. Senator, I, I, I don't think PMNC's day job is, is to be responding endlessly to what they see in the newspapers. OK. A strategic leak from the Prime Minister's private phone doesn't happen every day, right? There it is. It's in the middle of an international, you know, fracas between the French and Australia. It appears in the paper, and Mr. Gaitchen's eating his cornflakes. Goes, oh well. In the morning, like that just doesn't float with me. I, I just don't buy it. So what happens? Are you told, don't worry, we don't need to investigate this. We don't need to bring in the police. Don't worry, my phone hasn't been hacked. Like something must have happened in that space, or nothing. Well, <laughs> Senator, it's, Senator, it's, it's not. It's not PMNC's job to be responding to you know, what they see daily in the newspapers. Okay. Well, answer then I, this question, and I'm almost finished, Thank Chair. You. There's an FOI request by the Guardian for communications between. You know the relate the text messages as they were leaked, and on the FOI, they were denied on the grounds that disclosure of the requested documents would or could reasonably be expected to cause damage to Australia's international relations. Was the prime was the PMNC involved in handling of that FOI? Uh, no, Senator. As you know, we provide support. Um, at an administrative level to the Prime Minister's office in the handling of FOIs, but that was a decision by a PMO decision maker. So you weren't involved? That, that, that FOI didn't cross your desk at all? It didn't cross my desk, Senator, but as okay. I said, my staff provide some administrative support, but the decisions are taken within the office. Okay. So the PMO's response to the FOI request says, the requested documents are communications between the Prime Minister and a head of state of a foreign government and were undertaken in confidence. I'm, and on these grounds, essentially, the disclosure was uh, not agreed to. So the PMO thinks they were confidential and shouldn't be disclosed. And yet somehow they find themselves on the front page of a newspaper. So it's just <laughs> like, do you think that that is a reasonable way to conduct international diplomacy and relations by essentially having our work national leader leak communications? That's very Hypothetical. I think everyone in this room knows what's going on. That is very Poor old Minister also. Birmingham's just in a position where he's not able. 
to acknowledge I, I, I the reality yeah. that everyone else accepts Israelis that we have a prime minister who had his feelings hurt, got angry, and Senator leaked Galva, a text message. Is there a I, I don't. Case I don't, closed. I don't, I don't ever look for for any uh, sympathy, Senator Gallagher. So so you don't need to run the poor old. Um, well, I do um, feel sorry for you and, occasionally, and, Minister Birmingham. Senator, occasionally, because and, you have to come in here and cop other and, people's rubbish. And and Senator and defend it. The what what unfolded were, of course, um, debates that were that arose that arose uh, about what discussions occurred uh, in terms of the contextual environment, of the cancellation of the diesel-powered submarine contract, and the decision to pursue AUKUS. Um, certain suggestions. Um, uh, about an absence of communication were made. The Prime Minister responded fulsomely in relation to text. what actually uh, occurred in relation to the nature and context of discussions about the strategic environment driving those decisions. I know. I, I know you're trying to shift it onto the bigger, broader policy discussion that was happening at the time, but the point I'm trying to make is in the middle of that, we have this retaliation from a, in a petty way that endangers our international standing because the Prime Minister was angry at something that had happened two days earlier. No. That's exactly Senator, what happened. Senator, and Senator, everyone can, knows it and it can, shows can, how can, transactional can, this guy is, doesn't whatever it? You can care less or, about or, international or like relationships. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to get into being drawn on uh, on reflecting um, on statements of President Macron or any other such thing. What I have for behaviour of have our focused, own Prime Minister. What I have focused on very clearly um, are the facts in relation to the decisions and the contextual discussions that occurred around the AUKUS decision, uh, and um, the nature of those discussions has, subsequent to President Macron's comments been addressed quite clearly by the PM. Well, the whole episode reflects incredibly poorly on the Prime Minister and, ha I have to say, on the, on the public service as well, who have just decided there's well, no issue at all with well, having Sen this. Sen yeah. Sen Senator, keep, keep the political observations for, mm -hmm. uh, for uh, those of us in the political office, please. Well, no, because it's that's fine. I'm not making a political comment about the APS. I am shocked terrible. that the APS has not, of its own volition, had a look at this. Well, like, it's an apolitical organisation, but the Prime Minister's private communications leaked into a paper. I would have thought some agencies in the APS would have raised some concerns about that. Well, and that's, that's aside from politics. That's a function of the APS's job, I would have thought, to support executive government and ensure that... Is there a question? Um, well, I'm responding to, to the comment that well, uh, Senator Birmingham not, has made. You're not here to respond to questions. Uh, Thank you very much for the instruction, but I was responding to a, an incorrect um, aspersion cast on, on my comment, which is I would have thought the APS would have done it anyway. Well, Senator, as, uh, as I said, I don't believe it's the job of PMNC to be responding to newspaper stories. Um, <laughs> Uh, of course, you know, they are there in terms of when, uh, when asked to respond in a range of different ways uh, by government. Uh, of course, you know, the main function is to provide the type of policy advice and evidence and information that helps lead us to decisions such as the AUKUS decision um, that is at the heart of what, uh, what you've been asking about, Senator. Um, uh, you know, that is the... You know, the most valued function that I, uh, I certainly find from, uh, from the public service in terms of the provision of that advice and that critical information about substantive matters of, uh, of state and the decisions that we have to make. Okay. So just to fi finish this, Ms Foster, I don't know if you have it with you, but um, a list of all the leaks that you've been asked to um, investigate across the APS. Um, I would appreciate that. Not, not specifically any details that's going to cause any harm, but just the nature of the leak and when and how many there's been. Very well, Senator. Thank you. And, Chair, I have yes, two corrections uh, to make to our evidence, if now would be convenient. That would be convenient, I think, if Senator Gallagher has finished her questions yeah, sure. on that one. Yep. So, in the, um, 
First one, uh, clearly I was misinformed about the Governor-General's access to Cabinet minutes. Uh, in fact, he receives um, all Cabinet minutes, including appointment minutes and most NSC minutes, and receives these in hard copies. They're typically batched up and provided mm -hmm. um, after the meetings. Um, and my apologies for uh, not knowing the correct answer. I hope Senator Patrick is listening. Senator Patrick <laughs> right. asked the question. I'm sure, I'm sure we can return to the issue, uh, Senator Patrick, if, um, if the response from Ms Foster <laughs> now precipitates um, something further about the Governor-General's reading habits. Indeed. Uh, the second uh, was Senator Waters' questions about Mr Jose. Um, Mr Reid was asked earlier about PMNC's role in relation to the overpayment of Mr Jose. So for clarity, PMNC's role was restricted to advising Mr Morton which entity should be responsible for pursuing or waiving the debt. We advised Mr Morton and he agreed that Treasury was the appropriate entity. Treasury subsequently sought finances agreement to waive the debt. Mr Reid was also asked whether PMNC provided any comment back to finance when we were advised of their decision to waive the debt. Um, he said we made no comment. For clarity, we did reply to finance advising them that we had no comment. Thank you, Ms Foster. Um, I have some questions for the deregulation task force if they're available to Absolutely. come in. My colleague uh, Jason McDonald, who heads the deregu deregulation task force, will join us just a moment. Thank you. Senator Jason McDonald, on the head of the DREG task force. Thank you very much. I was just waiting for the name tag to pop up, Mr. McDonald. Thank you for that. Um, Am I correct in saying that the deregulation task force has only relatively recently been within DPMNC? Uh, that's right, Senator. The task force was started, I think, in July 2019 and came over to PMNC 12 months later. Yeah. Um, sorry, where was it before it was... It was in Treasury. In Treasury. And what was the rationale for moving it into DPMNC? I think the, uh, the uh, function works better in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, given the ability for PMNC to bring... Uh, more agencies together to solve deregulatory and uh, regulatory problems. Okay. Um, and in terms of the work that has been done to date, um, and I, th I think I've asked questions about this um, at previous estimates, but um, w where are we at with our deregulation agenda? It sounds very exciting. Um, and as I don't often hear that, uh, Senator. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not being sarcastic. I think small government is good government. So I'm intrigued to know what you're up to. So there are, there are uh, four deep dives uh, running at the moment. Um, and obviously, we work uh, to Minister Morton uh, on these deep dives, and the government sets the agenda. Uh, those four are uh, looking at the excise system to see whether there are uh, impediments, regulatory barriers that are unnecessary in the way that the excise system works, particularly with alcohol and uh, fuel. We have a overlapping regulations, uh, regulatory uh, agenda as well. Now, now that deep dive was one that um, business was particularly interested mm. in looking at, and the overlapping regulatory problems are ones which range between the Commonwealth and the states, local and local governments as well, but also across agencies. Uh, and that one was taken to National Cabinet last year and was agreed by National Cabinet to work on 10 priority areas. Um, mm -hmm. I can work through those if you like, but they uh, cover issues ranging from uh, charity fundraising, um, uh, working with vulnerable children, checks, which are, uh, uh, which are uh, something that business has raised with us, M many issues that, uh, that have come from business in terms of overlapping regulations. And, the, uh, I think the groundbreaking element of that reform is the agreement of the jurisdictions to assist in working on that. So it's not just the Commonwealth and Commonwealth agencies, it's the states as well. Uh, we have the um, automatic mutual recognition of occupational licensing deep dive, which is in the, in the, in the phase of 
implementation now with, uh, I think, all jurisdictions except for Queensland and Western Australia in the scheme right now, uh, and Western Australia is expected to join on 1 July. That deep dive, again, at the direction of National Cabinet, has allowed for uh, uh, workers with legitimate licences in one jurisdiction to work across the borders in other jurisdictions. Um, uh, so we have a, a team in the, in the deregulation task force that's helping the jurisdictions in implementing um, that, uh, that as well. I think I've missed one. You have. You've only given me three. Oh, modernising business communications. Um, uh, so this is a, a deep dive which is working again with uh, business to find opportunities where uh, we may still be relying on paper parchment and vellum, I think is the term that we, we, we want to see removed from legislation and, and regulatory practices across the country. Uh, they have a particular focus uh, at the moment and uh, one that was raised again by business themselves looking at um, deeds and statute declarations and, and other forms of corporate uh, sort of agreements which are not online. Uh, again, National Cabinet's ticked off on that and we're working with the Department of Attorney Generals and the costing, the savings from that particular reform could, ra could, could range up to $400 million. Mm -hmm. um, one of the benefits of the DREG task force is the bottom-up process, the the factory floor approach, I think the minister uh, calls it, where we actually ask uh, business what are the problems that they see. Uh, and it wasn't until we actually went and asked uh, business what were some of the biggest problems that they faced that we actually realised that there was five or six million statutory declarations done every year that involved paper and going off to be witnessed uh, and the savings from those, uh, bringing those online could be up to $400 million mm -hmm. a year. When you say that you went to business to ask them what the problems are, what did that process look like? And is it still ongoing? Because I, I can't tell you the amount of times that small businesses in my um, home state come to me and say, oh, you know, this form's annoying to fill out. Why do I have to do this twice, et cetera, et cetera? It would almost be good if there was a, a continual way that businesses were able to provide that feedback to government beyond just um, through their elected representatives. Uh, exactly, Senator. The overlapping regulatory reform package, which is being prepared uh, through National Cabinet, is ongoing. And if the jurisdictions or business have other things they want to add to that, then that could be something that could be considered. Uh, Minister Morton actually wrote out to businesses, I think it was early, uh, early uh, last year or mid last year, uh, asking for any evidence or any problems. And we went, did, a, did a consultation process around businesses uh, late last year. Uh, as part of that as well. I should say each, other, each of the other deep dives has got quite uh, sophisticated stakeholder engagement strategies. Mm -hmm. So the modernising document execution um, uh, or modernising business communications, the deep dive uh, has a, has a um, group which assists them in consulting with business. Uh, the excise deep dive has, done, has conducted you know, multiple roundtables and sought the feedback from industry at, at, uh, at many times. And the automatic mutual recognition um, uh, deep dive, which is now legislation, obviously went through a process of uh, significant consultation with industry through the normal uh, parliamentary practices, but before that through uh, roundtables and consultation mm -hmm. papers as well. Mm -hmm. So with the, the, um, the, the deep dive on um, overlapping regulation. Have we actually seen any outcomes from that yet? Have we struck out any regulations that we don't think we need to comply with anymore or superfluous, or is that work still ongo ongoing? So, so part, of the, part of the task force's role is to do those deep, is to, do, is to tackle some of those issues which have been constant um, uh, problems for business, and they can be a little bit more difficult and automatic mutual recognition of occupational licensing was something which had been an objective of governments for, for well over a decade. Um, and we still took us 12 to 18 months to get to where we are now. Overlapping regulations was only committed to by the National Cabinet in December last year. 
and the fact that there are 10 priority areas now on the agenda, many of them are issues which have been issues for the community for a long time. I think that's a serious work plan that, um, and we should see, uh, and we're anticipating um, some forward movement uh, mid midway through this year to late this year as well. Okay. Um, and what, what's been the advantage to having National Cabinet as a body to deal with some of these questions? Because again, thinking about the feedback I received from my business stakeholders back home, um, the overlap between state and Commonwealth um, regulation or hoops of fire that they might have to jump through in order to just go about their work uh, is a continual problem. So has National Cabinet made that conversation any easier to have? Uh, certainly, uh, without the direction from National Cabinet with respect to automatic mutual recognition, I don't think it would have happened. And without the support of some very key state stakeholders, it wouldn't have happened either. And obviously the Commonwealth's leadership role. Mm -hmm. uh, and similar with overlapping regulatory agenda, there is not, not every one of those 10 items of reform are going to be supported by all jurisdictions, but there is not an item of reform on there that doesn't have, a, have one jurisdiction that won't be supporting it. And it, the model will, will be that demonstrated success should bring all jurisdictions hopefully along in the medium term when they feel it's when they're comfortable in doing it. Yeah. And what, what is the key KPI that we're measuring towards here? When we're talking about deregulation, what do we think is the ultimate outcome? Is it, is it a, a dollar value on productivity for our economy that you're working towards? Or um, what, what do we expect success to look like? So, so I, I'm, I'm an economist, Senator, so uh, Very good. I, I, I certainly, I'd certainly think uh, measuring the value through GDP uh, is, is, is a very key indicator. Different stakeholders obviously have different things they care about. Small business, many of them care about having more time late at night on their families rather than doing, filling out forms and, mm -hmm. and, and, and particularly multiple forms with multiple sets of information that they've already been asked for. Uh, so different, different groups have different, uh, different KPIs. But in terms of the benefit to the community, the reduction in dead weight loss from filling out red tape, both by business and government, is one indicator. But the ultimate indicator is providing more incomes to families and the community in the future. Mm -hmm. And my last question um, for you, Mr McDonald. You mentioned that the task force was initially set up in mid-2019, so before the pandemic. I'm always looking for silver linings uh, in the pandemic and the experience we've had over the last two years. Has the pandemic precipitated or, um, I guess, made it more urgent that we have these conversations around making life easier for business? I know that um, when we were talking about uh, reawakening the economy after those first lockdowns in 2020, there was a lot of conversation around um, government getting out of the way so the business can get about their work. So do you think that that, um, that sentiment from the business community has made your job easier and has uh, shed light on more areas of deregulation that we should be focusing on? Yeah, so, so part of the, one of the costs of regulation which is unnecessary is it not only makes the country poorer, it also makes it less resilient. Businesses are less able to change their exactly. behaviour according to certain circumstances. Um, and so I think that realisation that a, a more flexible economy is good for growth, but it's also good for resilience. Uh, again, automatic mutual recognition of occupational licensing is not only expected to lift incomes of Australians by $2.4 billion over 10 years, it's also expected to help get workers where they're needed uh, across the economy in response to shocks, whether it's bushfires or other natural disasters. Workers should be able to go across borders and go where they're needed. And that kind of element of resilience uh, is not only relevant for occupational licensing, it's relevant for all forms of regulation where businesses are unnecessarily restricted from changing their behaviour. Thank you very much um, for your evidence, Mr McDonald. Appreciate that. Sorry, I'm just about to give the call to Senator Patrick. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Just the, just the one question following up from before. 
Um, can I also confirm that National Cabinet, the body that you call National Cabinet, uh, their minutes don't go to the Governor General's either? So, Senator, I'll ask the Cabinet experts to help me. My understanding is that because um, the Governor General gets Cabinet minutes and, any, and oh. most NSC minutes, unless they're compartmented in some way, mm -hmm. um, because all other committees of Cabinet have the minutes wrapped up into a Cabinet minute. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, Leonie McGregor, apply. First Assistant Secretary, Cabinet Division. That's correct. So because National Cabinet minutes are endorsed by Cabinet, um, the Cabinet minutes are provided to the Governor-General, but not all of the National Cabinet minutes. That, that would be pro probably more for, for reasons of efficiency than anything sure. else. Sure. Well, I'm sorry, Chair, but before we had an answer that was no, there was no... Um, that, that was my fault, Senator. Okay, so can we start that again then, just to get the record straight for all those that, that, yeah, that might be confused? <laughs> that's why I came straight back to it, because we had incorrectly answered your question. Okay, so yes. the Governor-General does get Cabinet minutes? That's correct. Yes. Okay, but not National Cabinet? Not National Cabinet specifically, but because Cabinet minutes do endorse National Cabinet. Sure. Minutes and decisions that. gets them in that way. In in the same way as he would get an ERC minute sure. or yeah. another committee of cabinet. And the reason he gets NSC is because that they don't need endorsement by cabinet. That's yep. right. Okay, so that's very very helpful. And of course, uh, of course, we know national cabinet is not a cabinet. So I'll just put that in there once, and I'll hand it back to the chair. Um. So, 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 Senator, just <laughs> for entire clarity there of what uh, what. Um, officials have, uh, have been saying. Um, so it sounds like the Governor-General receives minutes of Cabinet, uh, not of Cabinet subcommittees established under the Cabinet structure, whatever they may be. And I know you um, uh, have a debate uh, in relation to the National Cabinet, but for the question around the Governor-General, receives minutes of Cabinet not of cabinet subcommittees, save for the exception of NSC, where NSC makes decisions that do not require the endorsement of cabinet. And those are provided in hard copy, in batches. Yeah, and I was looking back at some of the other questions. My understanding is he would return them at the point at which he has finished with them, or that he's, after he's read, read them, he'd, he returned them back to the department. That sounds reasonable. Okay. Uh, rather than chance my arm again, I will actually get uh, an answer for you. That, that was that was the, the the previous questions on notice um, going back to about two thousand and five suggested that when he had concluded, because obviously there are sensitivities around cabinet minutes, when he had concluded his or f completed his use of those cabinet minute, minutes, then then they were returned. That that would be consistent with our usual practice, but I would like to actually clarify with someone who knows the process Thank and then you. I will then um, provide that answer to the chair before we close. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Um, Minister, it's been a year since the alleged assault of Ms Higgins in a ministerial office was made public and almost a year since uh, Mr Morrison commissioned the Gaitchens review into to find out who knew what in the Prime Minister's office, which is a report that we've never seen, might not have been finalised, but we certainly haven't seen anything. Mr Gaitchens was invited to appear um, before this committee today, but has declined that request. But um, we've had the Foster Review, the Jenkins Review, the Kunkel Review, and I think the Hammond Review maybe got um, dumped at some point. But we still don't know what, who knew what um, from the Prime Minister's office. And I accept that there are proceedings underway, I understand that. But I am wondering whether there's one, an update that could be provided to the committee on the status of that um, review and whether it was complete prior to it being um, suspended. Perhaps if we start there. 
Sure. Um, so, Senator, um, the status remains the same um, as it was when the um, Secretary issued a statement on the 30th of August 2021 that, based on legal advice, he had suspended his inquiry until the conclusion of the criminal trial. Um, we also have very clear um, advice that um, the Secretary um, should not comment um, any further on that um, inquiry or its progress. And in fact, um, I think today, Mr Reid? Saturday. Saturday um, the ACT Director of Public Prosecutions has um, come out publicly saying, I discourage all public commentary um, on active cases. So I, yeah, I, I saw those. I saw those comments. So I am, am trying to be careful. Um, the advice you got about suspending it. Correct me if I'm wrong. That was from uh, it, federal police. I think. No, it was from AGS um, Senator. So we had had a number of. Um, oh, the government solicitor was it? So there have been a number of stages, Senator, um, and there was a point um, earlier on in the inquiry where the AFP um, strongly advised that Mr Gaitchen should put it on pause. And this was at the stage where the AFP was essentially preparing a brief of evidence. They then advised that um, from their perspective, there was no barrier to Mr Gaitchen's recommencing. Um, he recommenced and then the um, ACT DPP um, advised that any participant, it was in the context of Ms Higgins' participation in Mr Gaitchen's inquiry, he advised that any participation could be um, severely prejudicial to the conduct of the trial. On the basis of those public comments, we sought advice from AGS on what Mr Gaitchen's response should be. And the AGS, because of course the ACT BP, okay. DPP can't advise the Commonwealth. Yes, that's and so I AGS it was advised the us that we, at that okay. point we should cease. And when was that? Can you give me the date of that? I can. So um, the advice from AGS to us was the 27th of August, 2021. Okay. And Mr. Gaitchen's public statement was the following Monday. The 30th. Yeah, it was the 30th, I think. So. So the report was commissioned by the Prime Minister on the 17th of the 2nd, 2021, and then was suspended on, or you got advice, presumably it was suspended on receipt of that advice on the, between the 27th and the 30th, perhaps the 27th. So there's 110 days between that, those two dates. Like why could not, why did it take 110 days and still nobody knew what the Prime Minister's office knew? Just um, Mr Gaitchens, when he appeared here in May last year, said, when asked about that, the time frame, he said it would be a matter of weeks, not months, to conclude the inquiry. And yet, by the time it was suspended, it had been going on for 110 days. As I indicated, Senator, there was also a suspension um, at the advice of the AFP earlier in the course of the inquiry. So with, okay, so it was suspended briefly, was it? And uh, then resumed or was actually suspended earlier than we thought? It was suspended, resumed, and then suspended again. Okay. So it was and just So do you have that, you must have those dates when it was suspended and resumed? So um, it was the 9th of March, Senator, that um, the AFP Commissioner advised the Secretary to hold off finalising the review. Yep, um, finalising it. Uh, and finalising any records. Um, and then on the 10th of May, the Commissioner wrote to the Secretary saying 
he was of the view that the criminal investigation is sufficiently advanced so as there to be no problematic intersection between the Gaetjens inquiry and the current, current criminal investigation. <coughs> and that was, of course, then um, uh, suspended again following the ACT DPP's comments and our AGS advice. Okay, so just to be clear, it commenced on the 17th of the 2nd, it was suspended on the 9th of the 3rd, it resumed after the 10th of the 5th or on the 10th of the 5th and then was suspended on the 30th of the 8th or thereabouts. That's correct, Senator. Okay. Um, and in your earlier evidence, you just said that um, the police commissioner warned, said he shouldn't finalise the report. That was in March. So was the report at that point then, was it in the matter of being finalised in early March? So, uh, Senator, until the report was final, Mr Gaitchens wasn't in a position to um, indicate uh, how close to finality it was or when it would be finalised, as you're conscious in any such inquiry, um, any witness could provide information that then requires further investigation. So. Uh I think your answer there is you're not sure if it was finalised, that he hadn't indicated whether it was finalised or not. I'm, I'm just saying that until it is actually finalised, it's not possible to say it will be finalised okay. whenever because one can't know where any witness might lead the inquiry. Mm. Mm. Um, okay. Minister, why, I mean, why couldn't the Prime Minister just ask his office what they knew? I mean, it's on the record a number of times that a number of staff were told, including the head of um, the Chief of Staff to Minister Reynolds, that they'd had a meeting with the PMO and, and other um, representatives from Minister Hawke's office. Like, there's enough on the record to know that there were staff that knew. Why couldn't the Prime Minister just go and ask them? And so we could actually deal with this issue of what the PMO knew and when, you know, quickly. Well... Like, Senator he could have done that at the time. Well, Senator Ray, some statements were made at the time. I, my, I don't believe that those statements satisfied um, the opposition or others. And so this process was initiated in good faith in an attempt to address those questions. Obviously, its intersection with the legal processes underway uh, has become challenging and challenging to the point where acting on AGS advice following statements of the ACT DBP, which he has further emphasised in recent days, um, the uh, suspension of, uh, of proceedings uh, was undertaken. It just seems, <clears throat> it seems like an issue that's going to, you know, the Higgins matter is a, is a, a defining issue of this parliament and we're going to get to the end of it without out knowing what the Prime Minister's knew and, and his office knew about it, it would seem, because we've got this well, complicated process when the PM could have just asked. Well, as, as I said, I think the Prime Minister was quite clear that, uh, that he had not been informed and he's been, was quite public in that regard. Uh, there were subsequent questions around knowledge across his office. While some of that was addressed, there were questions asked and so he sought to, uh, to provide uh, a process to resolve those questions. The legal consequences of what, uh, what is of course critically important to see justice served have, uh, have stymied that process. Did any and staff, and I am being careful with my questions here, did any staff seek legal representation during the course of the Gaitchen's review and, and were taxpayers paying for any of that legal advice? Um, Senator, I really let me separate that question into, into two parts. Um, uh, we have some processes in place uh, in relation for reporting on 
uh, legal advice and assistance provided to um, staff under uh, under the legal services determination uh, that uh, that finance reports on. Um, it does so in a way that doesn't seek to identify um, individuals uh, or risk the identification of those individuals. Of course, we can go through current expenses in uh, in relation to those matters um, of support for staff um, over the period that finance reports it, over the time frame they report it uh, tomorrow. In terms of this individual issue, uh, I don't think it would be helpful for us to, uh, to get into the details of, uh, of the processes with individuals um, who may have been um, uh, interviewed or had discussions with Mr Gaitchens uh, given the fact that, uh, that there is the possibility that there's an intersection there with um, individuals who might end up providing evidence in criminal proceedings or other matters that, uh, that no doubt are driving the ACT DPP's advice to, uh, mm. to everyone to, uh, to be mindful of the comments they provide in, uh, in regard to this matter. Yeah, and I, I am trying to be mindful and I, I, I hear what you're saying. Mine is a general question around whether any staff member involved with the Gaitchen's review is being legally represented. I'm not asking for the names of people. I'm not asking for how many. I'm just wanting to know whether there are staff that are being legally represented through this. Senator, um, the matter of legal representation is a personal matter for individual staff. The matter of whether it is uh, provided in any yep. circumstances under the uh, legal services mm -hmm. uh, direct That's direction yep. um, is something where finance have established protocols for addressing those questions and, uh, and updates on that can be provided tomorrow. Okay. Um, so if I ask if, if the government is meeting any legal costs in connection with the trial for the person accused of assaulting Miss Higgins? Um, I think that question has been addressed, Senator, but I right. will double check before we get to tomorrow okay. before providing any response to it. Okay. And in terms of whether any of the Prime Minister's current or former staff are in receipt of financial assistance from taxpayers in connection with the matter, that is also a matter for tomorrow, is it? Um, yes, Senator, noting, as, uh, uh, as I said, that um, finance has established protocols around how they report that and so that it's reported in a manner that, uh, that um, doesn't risk identifying uh, individuals. Okay. Um, in terms of um, Ms Higgins, she attended the parliament last Tuesday for the statement at, at, of acknowledgement. Um, are you aware whether Mr Morrison reached out to Ms Higgins about the terms of the apology he gave to her? Uh, in terms of um, the, the Prime Minister's was. statement, so uh, you know... Um, Senator, the process around the acknowledgement delivered by the presiding officers yeah. uh, and that there was um, um, you know, quite an exchange between parties as part of that uh, acknowledgement by presiding officers uh, and, um, uh, and consultation with uh, the Sex Discrimination Commissioner um, as part of that process as well. Um, in terms of the Prime Minister's response to that acknowledgement, um, I'm not aware that that was consulted on other than, uh, than um, the Prime Minister and those, uh, those he may have uh, asked to, uh, to help with the drafting. Okay. Um, so you're not, and essentially you're not sure, you don't think so, that he, he reached out? whether the, the, or someone from his office reached out about the form with which the apology would ma be, you know, take? Not, uh, not to my knowledge, uh, Senator. Okay. As far as I'm aware, that was uh, um, uh, drafted and prepared as a sincere reflection of the Prime Minister's uh, uh, wish to give acknowledgement, as Commissioner Jenkins had recommended, but, uh, but also to 
uh, provide uh, the apology and the call to action that, uh, that was consistent uh, with what was said in the uh, overall acknowledgement delivered by the presiding officers. Okay. Did, um, considering the nature of the contribution he made and um, the comments directly to Ms Higgins, did the Prime Minister request the attendance of Ms Higgins in the public gallery? Uh, Senator, um, again, I think you might recall that some of the earlier discussions um, leading up around the statement of acknowledgement, uh, uh, I had indicated uh, that I would be making clear uh, to the AHRC that I would, uh, would ask them to uh, inform all uh, participants in Commissioner Jenkins's review that the acknowledgement was going to be made. Um, I wanted them to make that clear, um, uh, mindful that uh, the parliament is essentially closed to the public um, for, uh, for this couple of weeks, um, uh, but to make it possible for people to be able to, uh, to know that it was happening and have the chance to uh, view that through the normal procedures. Um, as it got closer to Tuesday, um, I became aware of the fact that there were a limited number of exemptions being given, which I think um, the President went through earlier today for some other circumstances. And, uh, and um, uh, at that time, uh, I know presiding officers made efforts with, uh, with MPs to ensure that uh, those who had expressed an interest in attending uh, in person were um, provided with the assistance to do so. There were media reports on the weekend that, that said Mr Morrison wasn't intending to speak at all in response to the statement. Um, I'm not sure if you saw those media reports, but uh, were those media reports correct? Uh, no, Senator. The Prime Minister was always going to be guided by um, the decision and, uh, and deliberations between parties on the cross-party leadership task force about the best way. Uh, to, uh, uh, to be able to uh, ensure the acknowledgement was delivered um, in a sincere and meaningful way, uh, free of any partisanship. Okay, so the decision to speak was made, for the Prime Minister to speak, was made on the, on the Monday or the Tuesday? Do you recall? Can I think, uh, I think our discussions in that cross-party leadership task force uh, in terms of the iterative exchanges and otherwise had settled on the fact that, uh, that um, notwithstanding um, some of the um, concerns expressed by some members, uh, and I don't want to go into you know, what, what we are trying to establish as a discussion of uh, uh, that is undertaken in, in confidence, but I think it was um, following feedback from different members uh, with different perspectives. The decision was made um, on, the, on the Sunday or Monday that leaders would add to the leaders, add to the statements of the presiding officers. Okay, so it was, I think the reports in the media say that it was only after um, Mr Albanese's office insisted that they that the Labor leader would speak, that Mr Morrison chose to do so. Um, uh, Senator, uh, I know Mr Morrison and his office were preparing his remarks um, uh, over uh, a period of, uh, of days. Um, uh, they, uh, they were cognizant of the importance of the occasion, uh, the decision around whether uh, it would simply be statements by the presiding officers or statements added to um, by others uh, was one that, uh, that the leadership task force was discussing in good faith with uh, um, different perspectives across different party lines and representatives. But, uh, but ultimately, um, and the PM was, uh, was always willing to participate in whichever way that cross-party task force um, uh, felt would be um, most befitting of the occasion to achieve a statement of acknowledgement um, that, uh, uh, that genuinely reflected the views of the parliament. Has Mr Morrison spoken to Ms Higgins at all since the Jenkins uh, report w has been completed? Not to 
my knowledge, no. Not to your knowledge. And does he plan to consult Ms Higgins on the implementation of Ms Jenkins' recommendations? Look, is there any involvement from Ms Higgins? Um, so the, so um, the Prime Minister's made clear the government wants to see action taken across all of the recommendations. Uh, the recommendations, as you know, Senator, involve yep. some notionally for government, some for the parliament, uh, some for party leaders, some for the presiding officers and, uh, and parliamentary departments. Um, uh, the chair of the uh, leadership task force that's been appointed, uh, Ms Hartland, uh, has, I understand, uh, engaged uh, with Ms Higgins. Um, uh, uh, I know that, of course, in, uh, in finalising um, the report, but more particularly in the public release of Commissioner Jenkins's report, um, uh, that, uh, that um, the government uh, agreed with Commissioner Jenkins and the AHRC that it was important um, uh, for Ms Higgins to be briefed before that report was publicly relieved, released on its, uh, on its contents mm. and, uh, and facilitated that to occur um, uh, along with possibly some other targeted briefings or communications. Yeah, so, so will he, will he or his office have contact with Ms Higgins? I mean, I guess I know all the other things that are being done and welcome them and are happy to be involved. But as the Prime Minister and in charge of a lot of staff that work in this building, um, does he see any merit in uh, speaking or consulting with Ms Higgins as we implement? the review's recommendations? Um, Senator, I'm sure if there was um, a wish to do so, um, then, then I'm sure he would. Um, I think Prime Minister, I'm sure, uh, I know, heard the message from Ms Higgins at the press club last week as loudly and clearly as I did, which was that she wants to see us act on those recommendations and, uh, and that is um, what the government is seeking to do in concert with all of the other stakeholders um, from other parties uh, uh, to deliver upon it. Okay, but that's, so you're saying if, if Ms Higgins is, is wanting to, to discuss it with him, that, that would be fine, but in terms of a proactive sort of reaching out, um, that hasn't, that's not on the agenda or hasn't been part of the thinking of the PMO? Um, Senator, uh, the government's cognizant of, um, of what Ms Higgins has said publicly, um, um, not just at the press club, but indeed at the time Commissioner Jenkins's report was released, um, as we indicated, following its conclusion and handing to government, but before its public release, um, we, uh, we agreed and encouraged the AHRC to provide briefings to her. Um, the, my understanding in terms of the, uh, all of the public comments and feedback that's been provided is get on with it. Um, get on with it and act on these recommendations. Now there may be junctures um, either for the government or for the leadership task force as we implement some of the recommendations such as around the establishment of the OPSC that we might want to engage in a targeted way with uh, with individuals who participated in the, in the Jenkins review. So mm. I think that's certainly open to us as we move through um, uh, each of those recommendations to uh, to consider and to consider the uh, right engagement mechanism where necessary. Ms Foster, did PMNC draft the um, speech for the Prime Minister on the statement of acknowledgement? No, Senator. You didn't? No. Did you see it beforehand? I certainly didn't, Senator. Um, I'll have to take on notice whether anyone else in the department did. In the ministerial sort of liaison, is that what you're talking about, whether anyone in that unit saw it? Yes, Senator, or in fact, um, you know, anyone in, in our social policy area. Um, uh, I just, I can only answer on behalf of myself. Yeah. I don't so know is, that, is that normal for speeches given by the Prime Minister for you not to have, not to be involved in drafting them? Um, there's a real range of approaches to speeches, Senator. Okay. Sometimes we, we draft it and it's delivered almost as drafted. Sometimes we have 
nothing to do with speeches and other times it's a more collaborative approach. Mm. So if you didn't have anything anything to see, there wouldn't have been any sort of legal advice taken around it either? Uh, Presuming, Senator, I know you've just both all been very cautious about what can and can't be said. I'm just wondering whether there was any advice provided about that for the speech. Um, Senator, I guess that would be dependent on what I find about whether anyone else um, in the department saw the speech. Um, but of course the PMO has access um, uh, to legal advice. Um, Inside the PMO? That doesn't need to go through the department or, okay. or external advice. But you, the P, for, as far as you know, and you'd know, wouldn't you, if, if you're writing a speech for the Prime Minister, you would know if it was being it's, done inside the department? Uh, I wouldn't necessarily know, Senator. Um, I know that okay. I wasn't personally involved, but um, I know that the folks this thing will be checking for me now to see if anyone else had involvement. Okay. Um, I'm, Chair, I'm just going to keep going. Is that okay? Um, well, Senator O'Sullivan does have a few questions, so if you're breaking topics, um, well, I'm sort of, I'm still, uh, I've got a couple more, and then I, I'll give enough time because we break at four thirty. Ah, uh, four forty-five. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No worries. Thank you, um, Minister. After the National Press Club speech, um, where Ms. Tame raised a concern around um, a phone call that she'd received uh, and that she she took to be warning her about um, her behaviour around the Prime Minister. Following that, Senator Rustin on that afternoon said, and I quote, my understanding is that subsequent to hearing about it, action has already been taken to investigate the circumstance around the accusation that Ms Tame made. Can you just explain to the committee what that investigation is, or if there is an investigation? Because I think the next day it was less clear whether there was an investigation. Um, so, uh, so, Senator, I understand that um, uh, inquiries um, were made um, in terms of whether Ms. Tame, who obviously publicly declined to uh, to add further to her comments, uh, were, was willing to do so, um, and that inquiries um, uh, were also made, um, um, at least in terms of awareness of uh, of agencies um, uh, in relation to uh, to the matter. Um, I'm not aware that anybody has identified. Uh, um, any individual who has um, either been nominated by Ms Tame or um, nominated themselves as having said any such thing. Uh, the Prime Minister uh, and government ministers have been very clear that, uh, that Ms Tame should uh, be free to speak her mind. Mm. Um, and uh, um, uh, both previously during her time as, uh, as Australian of the Year uh, and, uh, and of course um, uh, now that uh, that 12 month period is over, uh, that she continues to be free to speak her mind uh, on the very important issues, particularly around child sexual abuse that she, uh, that she has championed, but also mm. on um, other areas of uh, discrimination and abuse that she has championed. Okay, so when um, Minister Rustin said action's been taken to investigate the circumstance, and I note Ms Tame herself has said she's not keen on an investigation, but Minister Rustin said that, action's been taken to investigate, and then the Prime Minister the next day said, inquiries can only be made when we can be directed. So but there isn't an act, there's not an investigation underway. There's been some inquiries made. Is that your evidence? That's right, Senator. Okay. And those inquiries have have been done, and nobody can answer. At this stage, that's my understanding, Senator. Okay. Um, I have a couple more just on the uh, on the Mops Act review. 
I might come back, I've got some more questions, but just in the interest of finishing this. Um, Senator Birmingham, you issued a press release, I think on the 4th of February, uh, just before Parliament resumed, stating that you commissioned the um, part, uh, Prime Minister and Cabinet, Department of Prime Minister, to undertake a MOPS Act review in line with the Jenkins report. Can you tell me when the review was commissioned, or maybe Ms Foster can? The terms of reference, can they be tabled? Um, and any consultation plan you've got in place for the review? Um, so, yes, I'm sure officials can talk through um, terms of reference and, uh, and processes there. I, I know there have been, um, just for transparency, some discussions as well between um, um, the Special Minister of State and, uh, and um, Senator Farrell as the Shadow Special Minister of State um, um, about and prior to those arrangements and, uh, and again that um, the, uh, whilst appreciate there was a lot of documentation which we noted in the meeting provided to the Leadership Task Force that in terms of the status of um, yeah. actions against different recommendations um, that review was uh, was part of that status. Yeah, update. but it's not that's not public. No, is no, it? No, like no. I'm, I'm trying yes, to get appreciate, some. Appreciate that. Yeah. So yes, there is. Um, I'm trying to get uh, there some is a, um, a timeline and a consultation process and all of those different aspects that uh, the department can speak to. Yeah, and and if we could table the terms of reference as well. Um, certainly, Senator. I I actually don't have them with me. I'm sorry, but okay. I'll, I'll see if I can get them. Yep. Um, and uh, the, the short answer, Senator, is that we have just begun developing the plan for how we will approach the review. So um, certainly we're planning um, on a consultation phase. Um, I'm planning to second some expertise into the department okay. uh, to assist with the review. Um, from from another department or um, so senator um, more than sort of specific departments what we're doing at the moment is saying what are the specific areas of expertise we need um, and where would we best find those so it may be from other departments um, it may be from the private sector um, we're just scoping that out at the okay. moment and I think senator. Who's undertaking the review? Do you have that decided yet? So um, I've been formally tasked to lead it. Okay. Um, but I will obviously bring foster, in... Another foster review. I will bring in expertise to... Mark um, two. ..to do that. We've probably had more of them. Yeah, okay. So you, you're going to lead the review, but you'll bring in additional resources? That's correct. And is there a consultation plan that you're able to provide or is that still being developed? We're just developing that, um, Senator. And um, I presume that um, staff and their representatives will be involved in that? Absolutely, Senator. And do you have any timeline for decisions on that? Uh, for the plan? For it to kick off, for information to be made available? Uh, yeah, Senator, I think we're, we're literally days away from finalising that. Um, the, so the, the team that's been supporting me with the Jenkins-related um, implementation issues um, has had a pretty strong focus in the last week or so on helping get the leadership task force up and running and get the legislation into parliament. Um, but this review is our kind of next big okay. focus. And recommendation 18 of the... Jenkins' report, which deals with this, comprehensive review of the Members of Parliament Staff Act, um, it recommended that the review address... Um, a comprehensive review of the MOPS Act employment framework, including but not limited to governance and institutional arrangements, staffing allocations, accountability, recruitment and employment security. Are you confident that the terms of reference cover off all of those, including employment security? All of those issues? Uh, I am Senator. Um, the, terms of re review, the terms of reference are fairly broad in their scope um, and so we'll be able to consider um, 
uh, the range of issues. I've also had a couple of conversations with Commissioner Jenkins um, because the amount of material in the Jenkins report on this was, I think, pretty much limited to what you just read out. Um, and so we've been working with her to get a little bit more context and background um, on where those issues came from, what was the driver for them, so that we can make sure that we're responding um, to what she heard. But of course, we'll do our own consultation process. Okay. So you are confident that it'll be able to incorporate that? Because I think there was some concerns around whether employment security was fitted into and under the terms of reference? Uh, yes, I am, Senator. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I've got more questions, but that'll, that's a, an appropriate break. Okay. Thank you very much, Senator Gallagher. Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you. I've got questions about skills reform. Certainly, Senator. Um, Ms. Frame will just come in from the sure. other room. Yeah, we'll give her a, um, a quick moment. And um, I can confirm that the department was not involved in the preparation of the speech. Mm. Chair. Thank you. Thank of you, the Ms. Prime Minister. Minister's speech. Senator, um, we're not obviously the that topic can come from a number of different angles. Okay. Perhaps if you start asking the questions, sure. and we'll work out if we've sure. got the appropriate. So I'm going to be asking about the job trainer fund and uh, uh, wage subsidies, uh, apprentice wage subsidies, and other subs uh, incentives for employers. My, my colleague and I, sorry, Alison Frame, Deputy Secretary, Social Policy Group. My colleague and I, Mr. Duggan from Economic Group, will. Work out as you ask your question, Senator, who okay. might take the lead in these sure. responses. Thank you. No problems at all. Uh, just by way of context, uh, particularly in my home state of Western Australia, and I'm sure it's, it's similar elsewhere, maybe it's possibly exaggerated a little bit more there because of the border situation uh, being, uh, being closed off uh, to the rest of the country, indeed the world, and uh, employers are screaming out for people that have the skills that are necessary for the opportunities and the jobs that are available. I'm uh, curious to know uh, how the Job Trainer Fund program uh, is going and, and I guess the, the uh, in particular, you know, what's the rationale behind that particular initiative? Senator Simon Duggan, Deputy Secretary of Economic uh, Industry and G20 Sherpa. So, uh, Senator, you're right that um, through the, through the course of the pandemic, um, demand for, for labour has remained very strong um, across most sectors of the economy. And one of the, the key focuses has been ensuring that we're able, the government is in a position to, as efficiently as possible, link uh, the available labour to its highest and most productive uses. In the context of the Job Trainer Fund, that was um, an investment by the government in uh, rapidly providing uh, additional training places for people to be able to undertake skills training to ready them for the demand uh, for labour uh, in the economy. Um, Senator, I don't have the, the latest statistics in front of me, but we do know that the most, if not all, of those places have been taken up, which tells you that people are taking advantage of uh, the opportunity to get the training and businesses are then taking advantage of, of those trained uh, employees to be able to, you know, to meet their, their workforce needs. So what was the target then? Have you got that number? Uh, Senator, I don't have that in front of me, no. The Department of Employment um, would have that yeah, number. Yeah, sure. Um, and what role does the, uh, the Skills National Cabinet Reform Committee have with this program? So the subcommittee of uh, the National Cabinet. Uh, so, Senator, uh, the NATCAB Reform Committee is uh, involved in the negotiations around the new skills agreement. Uh -huh. um, so that's led, as my colleague said, led by um, our colleagues in DESI, um, leading those discussions with the relevant minister. And they are working through negotiations with states and territories around skills reform. And that includes additional job trainer 
funding, as you know, that was allocated in last year's budget. So they're having those specific conversations with all states and territories about their, um, their preferences and, and seeking to negotiate reforms, key reforms from the Commonwealth in the skills space, including the, the job trainer um, additional funds. Okay, and uh, do we know have, uh, where we're up to with those negotiations? Have all the states signed up yet? Or is that still ongoing? I'm just checking on some current information, Senator. As I said, our colleagues in DESI are leading sure. on this, so they would have all the up-to-the-minute information. Uh, as at 27 January, Senator, um, this year, all states bar the Northern Territory have signed on to the job trainer extension. All states and, and currently negotiations are, are ongoing with the Northern Territory. Okay, and uh, so just next question is in relation to wage subsidies and incentives for employers to, to hire people, in particular for uh, apprentices and trainees. Uh, and of course, that's uh, part of a longer term goal of addressing the skill shortages that exist. Uh, how has the government supported wage subsidies for small businesses, in particular during COVID? Senator, the, the government has introduced a number of apprenticeship support packages through, through this period. Um, one of the concerns uh, when you're going through a, a crisis, an economic crisis such as this, was whether or not businesses were going to be in a position to be able to retain their apprentices through this period. So the government has provided a range of supports, um, providing direct wage subsidies to businesses that retain their apprenticeships, their apprentices through this period. The government's also provided programs um, building on the existing programs around wage subsidies to encourage businesses to take on a new apprentice during this period. Uh, we know that early on in the pandemic in particular that uh, it was younger people who were most affected um, by uh, the, I guess, businesses going into hibernation during the early phase oh. of, of the COVID crisis. And so the government uh, took a, an active decision to try and ensure that those young people had uh, opportunities to enter the workforce through, uh, whether it be a training, through a job trainer type process or, whether, or through an apprenticeship. Um, scheme. So, uh, a lot of a lot of apprenticeship places were made available through that time. And so, d during previous uh, interruptions to the labour market, you know, in particular, say that, for example, in the the GFC in, in 08 uh, and around that period, uh, there there was a significant downturn in. Uh, I think you know, the point is, is that mm. when the labour market's really um, put under pressure, those sort of jobs are the ones that are, are let go. Uh, business having to make tough decisions and uh, um, sadly sometimes uh, that's a, an easier decision to make uh, with regards to letting go people that maybe don't have all the skills that are required to make their business profitable at that particular time because uh, they're potentially lean time. So have we been able to, you know, broadly across the economy, been able to ward off that uh, you know, mass sort of letting go of apprentices and trainees uh, because of the the supports that have been provided uh, by way of subsidies and incentives for employers to hang on to staff and maybe even recruit new ones? Uh, yes, Senator, that, that has been the experience. So I think the, the analogy going back to the GFC is a good one. So one of the things that uh, is common between these two episodes is that we entered these crises with levels of unemployment that we hadn't seen for many years. And so businesses went into it with a mindset of trying to retain as many of their qualified, skilled staff as they possibly could because the challenge that they were having just prior to the GFC and just prior to COVID was acting, was accessing highly qualified staff. So you're right that when business then faces a, a demand downturn, it's the staff that mm. you know, are perhaps less qualified, those more at the margins of employment, who tend to, to be those that, um, that you know, they will look to stand down in the first instance. So there, there's a real emphasis on, through the apprenticeship programs, in particular, ensuring that we were providing uh, incentives for business to retain those workers through that period. And of course, that was supplemented by, by JobKeeper, which of course was a big job retention uh, mm. related scheme, which you know, the combination of those two things meant that we didn't see the loss of particularly young people from the labour market that we might have seen. And then I guess the, the key piece of evidence for, for the success of that is that we're now down at an unemployment rate that's a full percentage point lower than it was before we headed into the COVID pandemic, which tells you, and in fact, one of the more difficult challenges now 
is around labour supply and skills needs. So we're having now labour mm. has become more scarce. It's become a very valuable commodity to businesses. And so that is, you know, of course, the focus then around, as you were asking Ms Frame, around the skills agreement, trying to ensure that we're skilling up as many Australians as possible to participate in the labour market. And so there was an initial commitment, and I think it was in the 2021 budget, uh, uh, announced uh, $2.8 billion for apprentices and trainees' uh, wage subsidies. Has the government expanded upon that? Has there been further expansion of that, beyond that? Uh, Senator, you said it's fully subscribed, and so has it gone on to create more opportunities? Yeah, Senator, there have been several phases of support, and so yes, I think my recollection is that there have been a couple of phases of that apprenticeship support. Um, again, I don't have the details in front of me, but I think you're correct in that. Okay, that's all. Thanks, Jane. Thank you very much, Senator Thank Sullivan. Um, Labor senators, we are due to break, or all senators are really relevant to this, um, we're due to break at 4.45. Um, do you have... Six minutes worth of questions. Yeah. Happy to take us through, Chair. Um, or, or, or Senator O'Sullivan is happy to take us through. Yeah, well, I did ask some questions about apprenticeship completion rates halving over the last six years, I noticed. But I've got a small straight. section. I can do. Okay. Ms. Foster, the caretaker um, guidelines, I think they were reviewed last year, were they? Um, that's correct. So, caretaker guidelines 2021. Um, I seem you you undertook um, the work, didn't you? That was that did that post the twenty nine election. I seem to recall us in another committee having a discussion, and you were reviewing the caretaker guidelines, or is that just normal so, business? Um, we we tend to reissue the guidelines um, prior to each election. Um, typically, um, I think we did these. Was it in December? Um, 2021, uh, typically uh, a little way out from um, when an election is called, if we can estimate that so that um, people can start preparing. Yeah, okay, so you've done that. And was uh, were some of the issues like uh, that uh, from the 2019 election, did, were there any changes that were made? So there was really only one change of substance. Mr Reid took the committee through that um, a little bit earlier today, but we oh, can, right. okay. Sorry, we can do that been... again if you would like to, because it's a fairly straightforward answer, Senator. Yeah, just the change that was made. So, Senator John Reid, First Assistant Secretary, Government Division. Um, we removed a part of the guidance which related to the ability of ministers to claim travel expenses between, ah, I did hear that, yeah. uh, between the party launch, uh, sorry, between the campaign launch and polling day. It was just in order so that there wasn't any perceived overlap between the Parliamentary okay. Business Resources Act and framework. Okay. And I think for complete clarity, it's important to again recall that the conventions there have applied to shadow ministers as equally as they've applied yeah. to ministers. Yeah. But obviously, in, the caretaker principles that might have been more expressly reserved for ministers. So these go out to the departments. Um, they then have nominated a couple of officers at senior level, presumably, that are responsible for providing advice on caretaker to uh, their own department, but presumably in liaison with ministers' offices as well. Is that correct? Um, so each department typically um, will set up a little unit of some sort to provide support and advice within the department um, on caretaker issues. We have a, a unit within PMC each time um, where we have um, various ways of accessing yeah. um, that unit. And so if departments aren't sure um, in, internally, um, they will come to PMC yeah. um, for advice. Okay. So Minister, last election in 2019, um, there was quite a bit of expenditure that was approved after the caretaker uh, guidelines were in place and after the parliament had been prorogued. Is the government um, committing to not do that this time round? Um, well, Senator, the government will, uh, will certainly adhere to um, caretaker conventions and... Well, you uh, didn't and, last time. Um, ..and um, uh, be cognizant of advice that we receive from departments in relation to them. Okay, so there was um, millions of dollars approved after the parliament was prorogued last time around. 
Is the government going to do that again? Um, Senator, uh, I'm not it's going pretty to... pretty easy. <laughs> like, are you going to spend money the... after the caretaker can, um, Sen kicks in? Sen Senator, Senator, we will uh, adhere to and be, uh, be cognizant of advice from departments in relation to caretaker last time. conventions. Um, uh, you can make assertions if uh, if you like in uh, in that regard. It's not assertions. Um, the, it's in the audit office reporting the, to sports grants. The they were signed off after caretaker period started. Are you going to do that again, or can you give a commitment here today that you won't be doing that? Well, Senator, I'm giving the commitment uh, that uh, that we will adhere to caretaker conventions. But you um, didn't last time, so it means nothing. Cognizant of advice we receive from departments in uh, in doing so. So you'll con you'll do what you did last time then, Senator. Senator, well, I'm trying to give you. you I'm say, trying to give you a. Uh, why can't you just a, say a commitment about? Uh, no, about we the will not expend millions of dollars of public funds after the Parliament's prorogued. Well, I'm giving a commitment in relation to the caretaker conventions, um, and that we will be cognizant of the advice from the departments and adhere uh, adhere to the conventions. So, Minister, on the eve of the election, I think the night um, before the parliament was prorogued, hundreds of millions of dollars were approved by the Prime Minister. I think you signed off the letters as well into um, the car park rort program. Is that going to be a thing you do again? The night of the long pen, signing off hundreds of millions of dollars well. of taxpayer funds for, for election policy announcements. That's what it was. Uh, well, uh, Senator, there's, there's a lot of commentary in your question there, much of which, well, I, uh, much of which I dispute. Um, it's true. Uh, in, including the observation that I signed off on anything, but I'm sure my predecessor, if he had functions to, uh, oh, yes. uh, to Sorry, do so, would have. Oh, sorry, it would have been the Minister of Finance. It would have been um, Matthias, yep. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, Senator, um, you know, the process the government went through um, going into the last election uh, was uh, to hand down a budget. Uh, and to make sure that the types of commitments we were making in the campaign um, were fully budgeted and reflected in uh, the budget that, uh, that we took through. But the, there were announcements made in the budget available to supposedly all Australian taxpayers and then the night before the election were signed off into just certain seats. That's the problem I have with it. What was started as a, a program for everyone turned into a program for some and it was the night before the election was called. Is there going to be a night like that where you do the same thing, considering the budget's uh, scheduled just a few days before the election's called? And as we've gone around in, uh, in the chamber on other occasions previously, there were plenty of projects in, uh, in the realm of commuter car parks or the like that, uh, that your party was committing to no. around the country too. Yeah, we were not government. We did not, on budget night, announce a program for well, all of Australia, well, if we, well, if that we didn't budget for our promises, you'd be the first the to criticise us. Own electorate. It's super dodgy. If, you, if we you've didn't budget for our promises, it, you'd be the first to criticise us. Why can't Senator? you give a commitment that the money that is Mate. appropriated in the budget is not going to just be spent in targeted or marginal seats like you did last time? Well, That's the thing people don't like. Well, well Senator, um, I give the commitment uh, that. Uh, we will budget for our promises and the policies we take to the election, um, as is the consistent approach of our side of politics. I'm not going to take lectures about individual projects when, if you want me to return after the break with a list of the various swimming pools and parks and other localised programs that Mr Albanese has already promised for the next election, has already promised in terms of going out there, they're overwhelmingly in what one might describe as Labor or Labor target seats. Uh, so you know, you're clearly pursuing the strategy there yourself. So I'm not going to take lectures in we that regard. We are being upfront we before the election about as our were commitments. We, no, Senator. no, you were not. As were we. You no, know, you were not. And this is the difference. Well, you you can't started. Have it both ways, you started Senator. a car park. No, listen. You started a car park fund that you announced on budget night. And when you announced it, you said so. People all around Australia will get this improvement. And then what you did was you went 
Before the election. The night before the election. When you are in government, no, no, you no, went no. and allocated before the, that. Before the election was even into, called. Into so Australians your had five weeks of certainty about seats. where the no, money was going to be No, you pretended it was something Senators, else. I can't And then you used it to uh, sandbag so, in marginal seats. That's what you did. So, so, so you so seem, so you seem to be proposing, Order. Senator, that you would rather we had gone through the entire election <laughs> campaign <laughs> pretending that we were somehow going to give this money to everybody rather than actually making it clear who we were going to give it to, and if so, who was also going to miss out, which well, we made quite if you'd transparent been honest in about the campaign. That fund, which you weren't. We were. You were not that, honest you about it. You are criticising us, Senator, no, for we having made honest. the decisions because to you didn't the tell anybody people on Monday night when you election. established the fund that it was going to end up with four car parks in the Treasurer's electorate. None of that was told, but you all, all knew what was going to happen with it. That's all of the those difference. promises That's were what made makes it dodgy. before people voted. Okay, we are so over to Senator Ayres. Yeah, Senator, okay, well, I'll bring, the, I'll bring the list of all that you're promising, if you like, Senator Ayres. This is all why people, this is why people want a national integrity and commission. And everywhere where Mr Albanese this is okay. This is why Senators people want a national integrity order. commission. Because uh, you don't can, understand the uh, caretaker conventions and you don't understand Senator the responsibility of the government. You, you, you just apply a double standard. That's all. There's um, no double okay. standard. Thank you, Senators. We are overdue for our afternoon tea break, so I will uh, suspend the committee now and we'll reconvene at five past five. Reconvene, um, and I will give the call to Labor. Thank you. Um, right, I have some questions around the investigation into uh, Ms Miller and Minister Tudge. Um, on the morning of the 2nd of December, Ms Miller made a statement to the media um, containing some pretty shocking allegations about Mr Tudge's behaviour in the course of the Minister's relationship with his staffer. How did Ms Miller's statement come to the attention of the Prime Minister? Um, um, Senator, I'll take that on notice. Um, but, I mean, there was fairly significant and quick media coverage, um, but uh, uh, who okay. or how that was brought to the PM's attention, I'll find out for you. Okay. Was he aware of the alleged conduct before the 2nd of December? Uh, no, Senator, I don't believe he was. Was any member of the Prime Minister's staff aware before the 2nd of September? Not to my knowledge, Senator. Okay. Um, so in the Prime Minister's statement, uh, to the House of Representatives, he said, the minister has agreed to my request to stand aside. Can you confirm that despite Ms Miller accusing the minister of physically assaulting her, the minister did not offer to stand aside? He had to be asked by the Prime Minister. Uh, well, Senator, again, I'll, uh, for accuracy, I will uh, seek to take that on notice, um, given the seriousness of the claims made. The Prime Minister responded swiftly. Um, uh, Mr Tudge uh, stood aside uh, following their conversation uh, and, uh, uh, and the Prime Minister commissioned the independent inquiry to be undertaken by Dr Vivian Tong. Okay. So do you have a, a brief that perhaps you can tell, like I presume you came with a brief on, on the allegations around M Minister Tudge. Are you able to give me any information of um, how, like, who the Prime Minister and Minister Tudge discussed the allegations? That certainly was included in the Prime Minister's statement in the House. Do you know when that discussion took place? Was it following Ms Miller's media uh, statement and presumably before... The it, House it, of Reps statement. It, it would have been following the media statement, uh, uh, Senator. Yes. Okay. So it didn't happen prior to the the media statement. Um, I think we just went through um, the line of events there, and um, I um, don't believe the Prime Minister uh, or his office were aware of the allegations before uh, they were aired publicly. 
if I need to correct any of that, I will, but uh, my understanding is that um, they learned um, from that public process and, uh, and from that uh, the Prime Minister acted in regard to establishing the independent inquiry and having uh, Mr Tudge stand aside. Um, I think all of that transpired in the course of a day, so um, we're not talking about a prolonged timeline uh, around these matters. Okay, can you confirm that Mr Morrison's Chief of Staff, Dr Kunkel, contacted Ms Miller before question time on the 2nd of December and what was the purpose of that call? Um, I can't, uh, Senator Gallagher, I'm happy to provide any um, additional information there, but it was I, reported would, in the media I, would, I would imagine um, that it would have been to advise her um, of, uh, of what the Prime Minister was about to say in the House when, uh, when, um, uh, when he had to make a public statement on the matter. Okay, will you come back on that? Because it it's been reported yeah. in the media, yeah. so someone's yeah, yeah, told... Yes, I'm happy to, I'm happy to clarify um, that that is the case, or, uh, or if it's not, to, uh, to come back on it. But, uh, but as I say, I would imagine that, uh, that it was a courtesy of, uh, of seeking to inform, um, inform her of... Uh, uh, or inform Ms Miller of what was about to be said in the, in the House in response to the issues she'd raised publicly. Okay. Um, Ms Foster, did the Prime Minister seek any advice from the Department before his discussion with Minister Tudge? Senator, um, the Prime Minister's office certainly um, called to advise that the Prime Minister wished to have an inquiry. Okay. Um, I don't know the exact timing of that phone call in relation to when the Prime Minister Do you have a brief on this, Ms Foster? Surely it would be in that. You've... So, Senator, what I'm saying is um, I don't know the exact timing of when the Prime Minister spoke to Mr Tudge. What I do know is that the office called me before the Prime Minister spoke in um, question time that day about the inquiry. Okay, so that that is on the 2nd of December. That's correct. You were advised that there would needed to, to, to be an inquiry and presumably the Prime Minister would take advice around how that was conducted. Is that, that right? So you would then Senator. brief, yep. Um, and who recommended Ms Tom as the person to do the review? I did, Senator. Okay. And why was that, Ms Foster? Uh, so there are a number of reasons, Senator, um, in setting up the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service. Um, I had recently looked at the sort of um, eminent reviewers um, available to us, um, and Dr Tom was one of those um, eminent reviewers that we set up. Um, to assist the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service in any inquiries it might undertake. Um, it was on the basis of her experience um, and her reputation for thoroughness and integrity, Senator. Okay, she is used by the government a fair, lot, a fair bit, isn't she, for um, various inquiries and investigations? To my knowledge, it's the first time that I've contracted her to do an inquiry. Really? Um, She's done a number of inquiries, certainly, for, for other agencies. She was, um, uh, she was obviously asked to, by the High Court to undertake their work um, in relation to former Justice uh, Dyson Hayden um, and, uh, and undertook a significant piece of work in, uh, in that regard um, and I think has you know, well established credentials in uh, in that yeah. respect for um, independence and integrity in, uh, in handling such matters. Um, but uh, as Ms. Foster said, she was um, not you know, not suggested from within inside the government in uh, in that sense, but uh, but by um, by Ms. Foster. Okay, so you approached Ms. Tom directly, did you? I did send. Okay. 
And that was before uh, question time on the second? It was, Senator. So that must have happened fairly quickly, was it? Um, it so did. there had been a, a media appearance by Ms Miller, there had been a discussion with the Prime Minister and the Minister, there had been a phone call from the Prime Minister to office to you, saying what you needed, you'd recommended Ms Tom, they'd accepted that, you'd then contacted Ms Tom and that all happened before question time. That's correct, Senator. Okay. Um, the contract notice published on the 11th of January shows that the department contracted Ms Tom between the 14th of December and the 31st of January at a cost of $44,325. Can you confirm that that's the contract, I've got the contract number if you need it, relates to Ms Tom's work on the Tudge investigation? It does, Senator, and, and that price will have been a, a, a cap to the contract, uh -huh. um, not necessarily the actual price of the contract. Do you know what the actual price of the contract is? Uh, I don't yet, Senator. Sorry? I don't yet have the total um, price. But the contract has concluded? That's Set correct, Senator. 31st of January. So the investigation is done? I don't know what it actually cost. Sorry, Senator? And so her work is complete? For the, for the report that we tasked her to, to undertake, yeah. Senator. So you yes. have the report? Yes, Senator. Okay, and how long have you had the report? I received the report from Dr Tom on Thursday the 27th of January. Thursday the 27th of January. Um, okay, it's the date today, the 14th of February. So when did it get provided to the Prime Minister? On um, Friday the 28th of January. Okay, Senator. so it went to the Prime Minister's office? Uh, it went um, as a formal brief from the Secretary to the Prime Minister. So Mr Gaitchen sent it directly to the Prime Minister? Uh, well, just in the normal um, uh, as, as, as an attachment to a, a brief, Senator. So the way we would normally provide advice to the Prime Minister would be through a brief. Yeah, yeah. So it had a covering brief. And, and then the Dr. Report, Thomas report, but it went from the secretary to the PM, but that that was just normal. It, it didn't. It wasn't just a direct transfer to him individually. It could have gone through staff. Uh, Senator, in fact, um, from memory, we hand delivered the brief and the report um, to the relevant advisor in the Prime Minister's office. And was that a senior advisor or a chief of staff, or uh, presumably so? It was a senior advisor from memory, Senator Gallag Gallagher. Okay, so it was in hand delivered. Is that that's not normally the way? Was that around limiting access to the report, or uh, we would do that, Senator? Sometimes when matters are particularly sensitive. Yeah. To um, senior advisor. Okay. So that was on the 28th, so the government's had the report now for um, 16, 17 days. Has Ms. Minister Tudge had the report? No, Senator, and that um, um, probably um, leads to um, an update that Ms Foster should probably provide in terms of what um, work is being undertaken to uh, provide for the sharing of the report with Ms Miller and Mr Tudge, um, uh, which, uh, which requires um, a process uh, with the participants in, uh, in that inquiry. But I'll let Ms Foster detail that. Sorry, so what's, what's happening? So the Prime Minister's Office have had it for 17 days, but Minister Tudge hasn't had access to it, neither has Ms Miller. So, um, Senator, as... Um part of the uh, advice to the Prime Minister, we indicated that um, should the government wish to provide the report to the two parties, to Ms Miller and Mr Tudge, uh, then we should go through a process of consultation with those participants to the inquiry who provided 
confidential information to Dr. Tom. And so... Um, okay, so the last 17 days has been spent contacting the people who were, in, who were interviewed as part of the inquiry to say to them, look, this report might be handed to both uh, Minister Tudge and Ms Miller. Uh, so, Senator, um, I was asked to um, take those steps of consultation with a view to being able to provide it to the two parties on the 7th of February. Um, I sought uh, some legal advice. We worked through the most appropriate way to do that and we sent it to the parties who had provided information on Friday last week. On Friday and, and, last and sorry, week. I think for clarity there, Senator, Ms Foster, when you say we sent it to the parties. Uh, sorry, I should be precise, Senator. Um, we sent to each person who had Who'd contributed been involved. information okay. an extract of yeah. the information that the relevant they themselves had component. provided, not, not the entire report. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. So... How many, how many is that? How many people are involved in that consultation process? I, I think... Um, I don't want names or anything. I, in I, 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 I know you don't, Senator, but I, I think it is also, um, I believe, might be a relatively small number that... Uh, that Could identify them. I think that would be a, a reasonable risk. OK. So... What is the plan going forward? You've got pe people who participated in the um, investigation currently considering the parts of the report that related to them. What's they have, and did you say, until? They have until um, our close of business Wednesday this week, Senator, to respond. Um, of course, should anyone feel uncomfortable with that time frame, um, then we would uh, take that on board. Um, but assuming that um, I receive comments um, as planned, then I'll need to consider any arguments that they put forward um, for any material not to be provided mm. and then make a decision about um, whether or not uh, that is in the public interest. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then, so once you've gone through that, like I understand Ms Miller did not take part in the Tom inquiry, is that correct? That's correct, Senator. Um, did Minister Tudge? Um. Uh, I'm kind of conscious of, uh, of having limited disclosing the numbers or otherwise, um, but I, I think Mr Tudge has made public that he has cooperated with the processes, so I'll, I'll rely on that public indication, Senator, and, uh, and if I need to clarify that at all, I'll do so, but I think you can take it that he has cooperated and engaged. And and how um, I mean, how is it that the allegations raised by the inquiry was commissioned because of allegations raised by Ms. Miller, not you know be well? How could it be concluded without Ms. Miller's involvement satisfactorily? So, Senator, obviously, um, Dr. Tom had available to her the statement that Ms. Miller had made in Parliament, um, which contained a number um, of uh, a, an amount of detail um, that Dr Tom could draw on. Um, uh, both Dr Tom and the Commonwealth made a number of um, uh, attempts to... Um, encourage Ms Miller to participate, um, but as um, she has indicated publicly, um, she did not feel in a position to do so. Okay, and and 
Um, did she make suggestions on ways that she would feel able to participate that were unable to be accommodated? Is, is that where the impasse became? Or? Uh, so, Senator, there were, there were two issues which, again, Ms Miller has raised publicly. Um, uh, one related to the provision of a full report to her um, and uh, essentially um, it's, so, okay. it, it's possible that um, Dr Tom could have been provided with information that was critical to her decision making that participants would not give her permission to release. And so um, we were, the um, Commonwealth was able to advise Ms Miller that to the extent that it was within the Commonwealth's power to release the report, it would, but that we had to be um, uh, conscious that there may be third party um, concerns to take into account. Um, uh, the second issue related to the capacity of Dr Tom to inquire into allegations of potentially criminal activity. That, and Ms Miller was unhappy with both of those? That's correct, Senator. Okay. So people have till close of business Wednesday to respond and then what is the plan after that? So as I said, Senator, I will need to consider um, whatever information I get back from those participants and then um, uh, come to a, a decision on uh, okay. whether or not their concerns, if, if any concerns are raised about confidentiality, if they're outweighed by the public interest for which the report was in initially commissioned. Okay. okay. Uh, but as is... Um self-evident from this process, Senator, um, it's the expectation that um, uh, subject to the privacy or legal provision considerations of the individuals who participated, um, the report will otherwise, including any conclusions or findings drawn by Dr Tom, uh, be provided to both Ms Miller and Mr Tudge. Yeah, but we're not sure when. It depends on the feedback. Yeah, so we're working as expeditiously as we can, yeah, Senator, we Yeah, because understand. you've got Minister Tudge, who's been stood aside now for, what, 74 or 75 days. Um, you know, I would imagine this is something the government wants to conclude satisfactorily well, soon. Well, <laughs> in the yeah, 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 yes, Senator, and uh, in the interests of all parties, uh, Ms Foster. Um, uh, uh, so um, we... Uh, it's, why the Prime Minister moved quickly in terms of, uh, of um, having Mr Tudge stand aside, in terms of commissioning an inquiry and accepting the recommendation of Dr Tom as an appropriate individual um, and seeking to at least put in place these um, sorts of processes to try to give uh, as much procedural fairness for participation of all parties um, and, uh, and um, also ensuring that um, given um, some of the lessons from the Jenkins review uh, about, uh, and from indeed um, Ms Foster's work about the importance of a report being provided to um, uh, complainants, um, that uh, that actually occurs as the new PWSS um, would be undertaking in terms of their processes. Um, can you, um, what's the security around this report? I mean, is there, if you've handed it to the Prime Minister's office, um, could there be a situation where Minister Tudge has had access to that report? What, can, what, what safeguards are there well, around I think, that? Well, I think, the I, think Ms, I think Ms Foster spoke of the way the document was transmitted, that although it um, was transmitted in, um, in the formal processes of, uh, of a brief, um, it, uh, it was um, handled uh, in a manner to, uh, to limit the numbers of individuals involved. Mm. Um, I can say Mr Tudge has not had 
access uh, to the report other than the same process uh, that has applied uh, to any others who gave information to Dr Tom. And how can you, how can you say that? How can you guarantee that? Well, that is the way in which the process has been handled uh, to, uh, to ensure um, the integrity and, uh, and proper process around this. OK, well, two days ago, um, Minister Tudge said he announced he will recontest his seat. Um, are you saying there's no chance that he could have been advised even verbally around the contents of, of the report? Because it would seem to me if he's made a decision about his future, he's feeling pretty confident about what that report might find. Uh, well. As I said, uh, Senator, um, uh, Mr Tudge has not had access to the report. Um, I can't, uh, can't speak for uh, his response to media inquiries on, uh, on those sorts of questions, um, other than you know, that's obviously the response that he has given and, uh, and their matters um, for him. OK, so um, have you been involved in this Senator Birmingham, because you're speaking no. with quite a bit of authority about knowing what's going on, so... No, um, no, no, Senator, I haven't, um, only that... You're very um, confident. I, I, only that I have asked some of these questions essentially today um, in expectation that, that you might be pursuing this issue. OK. So you're confident that he has not been physically seen a, a copy of the report or verbally been briefed on its contents? Uh, I'm confident of that. I will, uh, as I often do, undertake to update the committee if, uh, okay. if there's anything extra that needs to be provided. Has the there. Prime Minister read the report? Um, Senator, the Prime Minister certainly had access to the report. It's my understanding that he's read it, but I would have to... So you've been told that he's read it? You've been advised? If, if you have an understanding... That must have come from somewhere. Uh, Senator, I think that would be something that Senator Birmingham would have to, to check. Um, but where did you get your understanding that he'd, he'd read it? Senator, that's why I'm, I'm hesitating as I answer. It's my understanding from his office that he's been briefed on the report and that he's had the report available to him. OK. Um, the previous investigation into a similar matter um, by the law firm Spark Hillmore costs taxpayers $40,000. And then the Tom inquiry has an upper limit of $44,000. $84,000 on the conduct of one minister is a fair bit of cash, isn't it, Minister Birmingham? Um, yes, uh, Senator, um, but uh, uh, the government um, understands the need to provide for independent and proper processes around such allegations uh, when they're made. Uh, the uh, former inquiry was undertaken um, by my department um, uh, as part of their normal processes um, under the previous architecture of responding to uh, workplace complaints. Um, uh, Obviously, a new architecture has since been put in place moving forward for, um, uh, for, uh, 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 for complaints across the parliament through the PWSS. Uh, uh, the latter review um, was initiated as, uh, as you've worked through here uh, following the additional um, uh, statement made um, uh, back on the uh, 2nd of December. Uh, by Ms Miller. Are you, aware, are you aware of any other conduct issues relating to Minister Tudge? Like, aside from these, have any other reports of concerning behaviour been made around Ms. Minister Tudge, to your knowledge? Um, uh, no, I don't believe so, Senator. OK. And if the Prime Minister is aware or has read the report, has he made a I, I, should, I should, sorry, Senator, is it always important if finance were here, they'd pull me up at that point that, that you know, staff matters that go to finance um, are not brought to my attention. 
So just to put that caveat there that no more than I would be aware of if it was uh, in relation to any other senator or member's uh, office. Okay, and is your evidence today um, that there is, that Mr Morrison has not spoken to Minister Tudge about the report that he's in receipt of? Um, uh, Senator, um, my understanding is that, uh, that the contents of the report have not been shared with Mr Tudge other than um, the process that Ms Foster has, uh, has advised in relation to uh, all participants in, um, in the review uh, being, uh, being treated on equal terms. Um, okay, I think that almost answered the question, but I'm really, I want an answer on whether Mr Morrison has discussed the Tom inquiry with Mr. Tudge. Don't. Since the 28th of January when he got given a copy, can you confidently tell the committee that there has not been a single discussion between the two of them? Because I think many people would find that pretty hard to believe, frankly, um, over the last 17 days. Uh, so, Senator, I will double check in relation to um, procedural matters. Uh, I'm confident in terms of the advice I've received that there's not been uh, a discussion in relation to content uh, or a sharing of content. Um, uh, I'm, Ms Foster may have information in terms of um, procedural matters. Well, there, there has obviously been engagement with Mr Tudge or his lawyers in terms of the checking process around content and uh, whether that has entailed any other uh, advice about procedure, I, uh, I'll leave for Ms Foster. So, Senator, the only contact um, I'm aware of is the formal process that we have gone through to provide Mr Tudge as a participant with information. Okay, so he's got bits of the report that he, he where he contributed. That he provided. Um, and in the brief to the Prime Minister's office or the Prime Minister, did you make it clear that this report should not be uh, shared ahead of time? Like what, once you were finalising. I mean, in, in a sense, you've provided it to the Prime Minister while it's not yet finalised, which is unusual in itself, isn't it? Like there was a there was a final report, except you had to undertake this further consultations. Why wouldn't you have briefed the Prime Minister once those were complete with the finalised copy of the report? What was the need to get it to him before that was finished? So, Senator, Dr Tom, as I said, had completed the report that we had asked her to do. Um, which was to um, inquire into the allegations made by Ms Miller on the 2nd of December. Um, the provision of that report to the participants is a further step. Right, so it's not as if the report, what your evidence there is, it's not gonna change the report. That's correct, Senator. So the report still stands. Dr Tom has provided her report. Um, uh, and uh, we are now going through a process of um, consultation um, to enable us to provide that report to the two parties. Okay, so the report to the Prime Minister is finalised, but then there might be an amended report that goes to, or a, a, a doctored report or a, you know, a, um, what do you call it, redacted, where parts of redacted report that might end up in the hands of Mr Tudge and Ms Miller. And Senator, um, that obviously depends on the responses we get from participants, um, <clears throat> uh, whether or not the, the full report can be provided, which is um, clearly um, the preference in a case like this. Okay. Now, just as I finish here, um, just a clear answer on whether the Prime Minister or his office are aware of any other allegations around Minister Tudge, allegations or complaints about Mr Tudge's behaviour? Not, not to my knowledge, Senator. And not to my knowledge, Senator. Okay. Um, Senator, I have a, a total figure for Dr Tom's bill. Okay. $40,047.93. So it's 80,000 all up for the two inquiries into 
Minister Tudge's conduct with Ms Miller? It's a lot of money to spend on it, Minister's conduct. It, um, well, Senator, and um, I mean, finance uh, has undertaken a number of such investigations over the years um, in response to allegations by staff. That function will now occur through the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service at, uh, at arm's length from, uh, from uh, finance or a Department of State in, uh, in that regard. Um, you know, the thorough and independent investigation of such allegations is, uh, is um, a necessary uh, but not free uh, exercise no. of trying to uh, trying to provide uh, for proper uh, proper process and uh, and due consideration of those allegations. Okay, and his you mentioned um, Minister Tudge's legal representatives being, you know, consulted over the contributions, etc. So presumably they are being paid for by the Commonwealth. Um, I'm actually not. I'll have to take that on. Well, I'd suggest, Senator, that Attorney-General's department will be the best place to answer that question. Um, I'm actually not sure that I have a briefing on that and uh, an AGD handle matters in relation to um, legal payments around ministers, um, members of parliament, um, all, Senator, have, uh, have access to certain um, insurance arrangements as well through the Department of Finance, um, but they're handled more directly by the insurer. So I'd suggest that AGD is the best place to respond on that. Okay, I'll ask AGD. I have one more section um, at least. I've um, got a few more, but I'm conscious you do want to get to the Attorney General's at 10 past six. Oh, and in light of the fact that um, Senator Waters isn't here yet for the OPSC, it might be best to crack on with this okay. and then we'll move on when we can. Okay. Um, just finally on the touch matter, is it is it envisaged that there will be an answer about his um, ministerial duties? I mean, the Department of Education has had an acting minister now for uh, two and a half months. Is is it envisaged that the government will resolve this this side of the election? Um. Senator, I'm sure that is the hope of the Prime Minister and Minister Tudge, um, but uh, um, I wouldn't want to preempt that. Um, obviously, that depends upon the content of the report and the consideration of that by the Prime Minister. Okay, and um, pres presumably it's not a report that would necessarily be released in full, but um, the findings of the report, is there any view that around making those public? Um, well, I think uh, uh, the report's been undertaken with the intent that as much of it as possible is provided to Ms Miller and Mr Tudge. Um, uh, obviously, uh, when a decision is made uh, around Mr Tudge and his return to the Ministry, um, a statement will presumably have to be made at that stage uh, about uh, the circumstances of that decision. Um, and, uh, and I would imagine that statement will at least draw upon the findings, um, but uh, the report itself is, uh, is um, one for um, Ms Miller and Mr Tudge in terms of the procedural fairness. Okay, so it's... Remains to be seen what happens, but no commitment to deal with it this side of the election. So, Senator, I'm obviously progressing the work as expeditiously um, as I as I can. Okay. Okay, Minister. Last week in the Senate, the vo the government voted not to exempt the religious discrimination so, bill. So, so sorry, Senator. Can I just give one update if you're changing topics? Yep. Um, just to confirm. Uh, as I indicated that the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Dr Kunkel, contacted Ms Miller on 2 December, as you asked about, and that I'm advised the phone call was made to indicate to her that the Prime Minister would shortly make a statement on the matters that she had raised publicly. 
Okay, thank you. So on the moving topics, um, on the religious discrimination bill, the government voted not to exempt uh, the bills from the cutoff and made no attempt to delist those bills for de debate. Why didn't the government want to debate the bills in the Senate last Thursday? Um, Senator, the first part of your statement there is incorrect. The government uh, didn't seek to call the division. On you didn't the motion, vote at all. Um, regarding I was watching. Uh, well, the government actually moved the motion, Senator. I um, know. Oh, uh, it's almost worse, though, isn't it? You move the motion and then go, and oh, we well, we we're didn't. not calling the vote. We'll just let that one go away and look like we were supporting it when we weren't. Well, we didn't seek to call a division on that. Um, I think the Prime Minister has uh, publicly uh, addressed the fact that, uh, that the government um, uh, is, uh, is um, not um, in a position where it wishes to progress with and that legislative package um, as amended by the House. And uh, there's been differing statements around the future of those bills. What is the government's position on the religious discrimination bills? Will they be dealt with in this parliamentary term or will they not? Uh, well, um, I think the position that, uh, that has been outlined that uh, the government um, uh, doesn't wish to proceed with the bills uh, uh, as they've been amended uh, will stand through the remaining couple of sitting days, Senator. Okay, so that's a, you will, that's a we will not proceed with the bills. Can you explain to me why the Prime Minister won't accept a majority position of the House of Representatives, including five members of his own party, and accept the amendment so that all children can be protected from discrimination? Um, uh, well, Senator, uh, it's for the government, uh, in terms of government business, to prioritise uh, legislation and, uh, and to consider uh, the impacts of any amendments um, in either chamber. Um, uh, I believe the, um, uh, the PM and the AG have, uh, have uh, identified uh, concerns about um, uh, uh, unintended consequences from um, uh, some of those amendments um, and, uh, and that's the basis upon which um, uh, the government is, uh, is um, proceeding with caution from here. Okay, so the government's position as it is today is that those bills as amended will not be proceeded with um, during this parliamentary term? That would be my expectation, Senator your expectation, but has there been a decision of the government that, uh, you know, is well, that? We, Senator, we, all, we always um, review the sitting program and the, and the legislative program for each sittings as, uh, as we work through uh, those, uh, those timelines. Um, obviously, uh, the government didn't proceed with the bills on Thursday. Uh, I don't expect that we will in the Senate. Uh, when the Senate returns in the budget week, uh, there will be other priorities associated with the budget uh, for us to get on with. Okay. So in relation to, um, there was a, an extraordinary um, cabinet leak published um, in The Australian um, by Mr, um, well, PBO, everybody calls him, Mr Onzelin. Um, you were there. In that piece, you were mentioned, Senator Birmingham. It's where... Um, have you seen the story? It's where um, it's alleged that... Sorry? I wasn't sure if there was a question there, Senator Gale. No, I, I, I was sort of waiting for Okay. The... Well, you were, you were mentioned in that piece. It's where the Prime Minister's plan to secure votes for the Religious Discrimination Bill were... Uh, by linking it to a new anti-corruption bill. And it said in the piece that uh, you were supportive of that approach. Is that a correct assessment of, of your role in that meeting? Well, in, uh, in earth-shattering news, Senator, I'm not going to go into what I or other colleagues say in Cabinet discussions. Um, in relation to the Commonwealth Integrity Commission bill, 
Um, you know, the responses remain the same as they were when, uh, when I was discussing this with Senator Waters earlier today, which I think you were in the room for, so I'll try, and try to restrain myself from repeating those responses right now. Okay, so, um, and this is where Ms Foster meant, I think your evidence was that the last time you briefed the Prime Minister on, the, on an anti-corruption commission was on the 10th of the 2nd this year, I think was the, the date you gave. I think that's correct, Senator. And was that at a, a request from the Prime Minister's office or was a, a brief that you had prepared on your own uh, initiative? Um, no, Senator, that was just in order to update the Prime Minister ahead of the sittings, in, in the usual way, updating. Oh, okay, so a every sitting you, you probably have briefed him about an anti-corruption commission and where it might be heading. We, we, have, a, we have a brief um, that we maintain and we update. Okay. Um, Minister, in the article that was, um, was leaked or the, the information about the Cabinet, it says, Minister Fletcher was a strong opponent of the Prime Minister's plan and was particularly concerned about retrospectivity. Why would that be? Um, Is there anything to do with Leffington Triangle? Um, so, again, I'll, I'll dissect your question, Senator. Um, uh, on part one in relation to Minister Fletcher or any other member of the Cabinet, uh, I'm not going to comment on deliberations that might occur within the Cabinet. Uh, on part two, in relation to uh, the insinuation you make about uh, Leppington Triangle and those matters, uh, I think they have been very thoroughly addressed, uh, including making quite clear uh, the role of um, departments in relation to, uh, to those decisions uh, and, uh, and the fact that uh, there has been um, no suggestion of any um, wrongdoing by Minister Fletcher in that regard. In relation to the Cabinet leak, is there an investigation underway? Um, or is this another one of the leaks that nobody that nobody thinks is an issue? Uh, well, Senator, again, much is uh, much is written by newspapers speculating about who said what, where, when. Okay, so um, it was pretty uh, detailed uh, and to be made up. I think everybody um, would accept. I'm just saying, Senator, that uh, that in terms of. Uh, the job of focusing on serious matters of state. Uh, there's uh, more to be done than, uh, than worrying about um, uh, the odd story in a newspaper. So there, that's, that answer is there is no investigation into the leak from Cabinet? Um, not to my knowledge, Senator. Why not? Because there are better things to do with our time, Senator. Then find out who's, who's inside the tent leaking out. Uh, than uh, then, um, responding to, uh, to uh, anonymous comments in newspaper stories. I think Australians would, uh, would so rather, would rather that we focused on our economic plan, on, on jobs growth, on the national security challenges faced in our region and, uh, and of course, in the Ukraine, on the continued COVID uh, recovery, on mm. the range of issues that uh, are at the top of the government's priorities. I'd love uh, to believe that priorities. was true. Minister Birmingham, but after the last few months of You're this You're the one who seems to be spending a lot of day not, focusing cannot, on other issues, Senator. I cannot believe that that is actually what's front of mind of this government. But so why is there not an investigation into the, a cabinet leak? Is it lawful to leak cabinet information? Ms Foster, is it lawful to leak cabinet information? Senator. It's not, is it? Senator, um, you're talking about um, a newspaper story uh, so that, tell us it didn't that happen sought then. to... Well, on the one hand, Senator, you're trying to suggest that people shouldn't be talking about Cabinet discussions, and on the next, you're trying to invite me to talk about Cabinet no, discussions. I, no, uh, I'm just... I have been clear throughout this, these, uh, this line of questioning, I'm not going to go into what was said in Cabinet. That means not confirming or denying stories like that. Um, uh, the fact that there are stories that seek to report what Cabinet might or might not have talked about, what Ministers might or might not have said, uh, is as old as the existence of this Federation and indeed older than that, Senator. So it's, uh, it's nothing 
new. So it's a that, free for all now, is it? No, Senator. Yeah. Basically, anyone can say anything, and nobody's going to. Just gonna... pointing out, Senator, uh, that again, if you want me to go away and find stories about you know what was allegedly said in cabinet uh, during Prime Minister's Rudd or Gillard or Hawke or Keating, or why don't we go back and have a look at you know well, Prime I'm Minister Watson or Reid or Barton? I'm asking about um, this government and the dysfunction sure. that grips you. Ugh. Like you've got leaks. You've got okay. leaked text messages. Okay. Do we have a question, you've got, Senator? Senator? You've got people crossing the floor. We've got cabinet leaks. And your okay. position is, oh, well, whatever. Okay. If we've got the YouTube so, clip, do we have a question now? Senator So Garner. has Mr Gaitchens been asked to take any action in relation to the cabinet leak? Any action at all, even if it's not an investigation? Anything? Not, not to my knowledge, Senator. Ms Foster, are your officials able to leak information? without consequence? Senator, it sounds like a hypothetical question to me. Incredibly so. I would imagine people get trained in the public service about what they can and can't do when they are privy to cabinet discussions. It seems that ministers have a rule for themselves, which is, feel free, leak away. There'll be no consequence for this. And Senator, as I said before, if you want me to, uh, to go back over the archives of, uh, of newspaper stories that reference um, what may or may not have been said in, uh, in Cabinet discussions, I think you'll find they exist for every Cabinet throughout probably the nation's entire history of Federation and for most other Cabinets in, uh, in democratic systems too. Senators, I'm just going to interrupt here. We are quite over time for finishing up with DPM and C, and I know Senator Waters has 10 minutes worth of questions for the APSC, um, so I would like to move to them Yeah, Yep, sure. I'll, I'll just finish later. up this. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Ms Foster, I mean, because this is not a hypothetical point, but are there laws against leaking Cabinet information? Senator, I'm, I'm hesitating um, and I just ask for some advice on um, uh, what particular laws might be um, in play in the context of cabinet material. So you're not aware if there are? Well, I'm just I'm wanting to make sure that my answer is accurate, Senator. M Mr Reid, can you illuminate us? Um, Senator, I'm loathe to try and address it from the table. Um, we'd be happy to... I can to understand why. Yep. Take that on notice. Okay. As is your right. All right. So um, my final question is, why was the Prime Minister prepared to back an anti-corruption commission in exchange for passage of the Religious Discrimination Bill, but he won't back one on its own? Uh, Senator, as, um, uh, as I outlined uh, in response to Senator Waters earlier today, uh, the government's view uh, is that you know, we have developed a comprehensive model for a Commonwealth Integrity Commission. Several hundred pages of legislation, umbrella structure uh, that, uh, that seeks to fold into that structure the many different entities that already exist Minister across the Fletcher Commonwealth approved. to tackle and to tackle corruption issues. Uh, that that structure uh, entails a Law Enforcement Integrity Division, a Public Service uh, Sector uh, Integrity Division, um, uh, that uh, we would welcome the opportunity to pass that legislation which the Prime Minister has tabled in the House of Representatives previously. Um, however, uh, we're aware of the fact that on the couple of pages of dot points the Labor Party has as, a, as an alternate model, or the views of the Greens, which is a little bit more developed, to give Senator Waters her credit, uh, they all seek to try to turn that into something more akin to a New South Wales-style um, Star Chamber or Kangaroo Court of... Uh, um, uh, of their ICAC. The government does not believe that would be a positive outcome for the nation. That's why uh, we're not seeking to proceed uh, with putting the legislation through the parliament at present because we're not willing uh, to have um, that potential consequence. We would welcome the opportunity uh, to yeah. put the model as uh, we've thoughtfully designed <laughs> with, sub with, uh, with extensive the consultation Fletcher -Taylor through McKenzie the parliament. Approved model. Thank you. Thank um, you, Minister. Sorry, my final... Your just, actual final yeah, question? Yeah, my actual final... 
Uh, Dr Kunkel must have reached out to you around uh, the information you provided on uh, the conversation with Ms Miller. If you have him on a hotline, are you able to tell us if the Prime Minister or PMO are aware of any other complaints about Mr Tudge's behaviour? Um, if we could get an answer on that before we adjourn. Well, as I, as, you as I you said, get some pretty quick information when you need to. I'd like as, an answer to that. As, as I said before, not to my knowledge. And, I know, uh, and Dr if Kunkel might know I'm something sure, different. I'm sure if something needs updating, then, uh, then I'll be provided with it to update uh, the inquiry. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, Ms Foster, I understand you have a couple of responses to I provide the committee before we move to the APSC. Just one, uh, Senator. Uh, Mr um, Brazier undertook before to update the number of Australians uh, in the Ukraine um, who have registered for consular assistance. Obviously, the number's changing rapidly in response to the situation mm -hmm. on the ground fluctuates daily depending on travel and departures and new registrations. Um, the figure um, that he provided this morning had been updated, uh, had been uh, overtaken, and um, the figure as true as at 10 a.m. this morning is 198. Thank you very much, Ms Foster. So that, 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 sorry, that's a that's a bigger number yeah, than this morning. So does that more, mean more people have registered? Is that? Yeah, as I said, there's a there's a number of factors which yeah. are influencing the figure. Um, registrations are clearly increasing as the situation becomes more complex. On notice, would the department be able to provide a breakdown of the last few weeks and the number of registrations, the number of people departing? There must be a probably best placed with DFAT. Um, yes, yeah, so, yeah, no, I accept Senator okay, who can sure, probably sure, sure. Yep, take yep. you through some of that no, when they you. actually I appear think, on Wednesday. Right. Yep. Thank you very much to the Department of Prime Minister <clears> and Cabinet <throat> and those officials who have appeared relevant to the first outcomes that we've traversed today. Um, we'll now move to the Australian Public Service Commission. I think so. I welcome Mr Peter Walcott AO, Australian Public Service Commissioner and other officers of the Australian Public Service Commission. Um, Mr Walcott, if you have an opening statement, we might ask that you table it um, in the interests of time because we know we're a little late this evening. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The good news is I don't. Wonderful. That is very good. Um, and we just have Senator Waters with a few questions for you this evening. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks, Mr Walcott, and to all of your uh, team members. I've got two tranches of questions. The second chunk are actually for the PWSS, which I understood were uh, potentially appearing under this current section, but I'll seek advice. If I can clarify that. for you, um, Senator, I'm here, in, I, I'm here today, at, well, this afternoon, as the uh, parliamentary, as the, um, the uh, Public Service Commissioner. Mm -hmm. which is one of the independent statutory officers that I hold. I also hold the role of the Parliamentary Services Commissioner, mm -hmm. which is the accountable authority for the PWSS. I see. And so that you is, can take that questions is another about independent that? Uh, hat that I wear. So I'm happy to take okay. questions on that, but it needs to be compartmentalised very much yes. for my role as the, um, as the Public Service Commissioner. And, and yes, thank you. I can manage that. For management of that as well, can I just uh, flag that uh, um, uh, while Working with Mr Walcott as, uh, as the Public Service Commissioner, I'll stay at the table. 
um, if we're transitioning to the Parliamentary Services Commissioner, uh, I'll exit, uh, which, uh, which I would need to do um, when the uh, uh, Official Secretary to the GG comes on board anyway, um, uh, so that uh, um, uh, the independence of the Parliamentary Services Commissioner is not tainted by my presence. All right, I shall give you full warning. Thank you. Well, we'll start off, uh, Mr Wilcott, with your chief uh, duties as APSC. Uh, have you had the chance to review the Senate Committee's report into the current capabilities of the APS? I understand some other members of this committee were also uh, participating in that inquiry. Um, obviously, I'm familiar with that report. Okay. Uh, I've read that report. Um, um, I think our response, the government's response, is due on the 25th of February, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And I, I would, as I say, it's under act, our, the government's response is under active consideration, and obviously the, um, we are the APSC is doing a lot of work on that in, on areas that are relevant, um, are relevant to us. Okay. Um, are, are the findings and recommendations consistent with the earlier Thode review, in your opinion? Are they consistent with the third year review? Um, they run. Um, they run to many different areas. Uh, the um, uh, the um, and uh, I, there are, as you, as you would know, Senator, there is, is a dissenting report to that from uh, co um, coalition members of that uh, of that committee. Um, there are. It's a, it got a heavy focus, of course, on capability. Uh, so did Thody, mm. but. Uh, the government has been um, very active in pursuing the 30 agenda. As you know, that um, uh, the 30 the 30 rep report was reviewed by government and on the advice of secretary's board, and the government accepted a great majority, either in full or part of the 30 uh, the 30 review recommendations. And the APSC has a responsibility for about 14 of those, which we are actively pursuing. Many of them do go to capability. But uh, I wouldn't want to um, prejudge the government's response to the, um, mm. to the uh, committee's uh, report. Fair call, thank you. Um, have you met with the minister to discuss the most recent Senate committee report? Uh, no. Okay, and have any actions been taken in response to the Senate committee's recommendations to date? So to date? No, as I say, we'll, we'll be waiting for a, a whole of government response okay. to, um, to the committee's report. Okay, what action, if any, is being taken to prioritise in-house capacity building over external labour hire? We, we have... Be it's a process. I mean, clearly, to remain uh, competitive uh, for talent, to remain a capable public service for the future and to be able to deliver for Australians and for the government of the day, that is, that is a huge uh, focus of our attention. So you can look at any range of things that we're doing as the APSC. I, I'm happy to table a, uh, table a report on exactly what, uh, what we are doing. But it goes to the development of a workforce strategy. Mm -hmm. It goes to the establishment of the APS Academy, which is one part of a much larger piece of work around a learning and development strategy and an action plan for that and the establishment of a learning board. It goes to the establishment of the APS professions model. Mm -hmm. uh, so how do you get your digital talent? How do you get your data talent? How, you de how do you develop strategic HR resources to be able to, to um, maintain a public service which is going to work into the future? There's a whole range of things we are doing, which we've commenced. Mm -hmm. They take time, but we are very cognizant of, of the need to be a public service which is able to adjust and, and have the capability for the future. Mm. It's a fast moving environment out there. And it is, it is like I have to say, um, one of the things we're finding around digital data, for example, is just how, how fiercely competitive it is for talent with, with the private sector. Mm. Are you able to provide us today with the latest figures on the amount spent on external consultancies in 2021? either uh, as a total or a, a percentage I of I don't have that information, Senator. We are, we're responsible for the Australian Public Service. Um, the Department of Finance is responsible under the PGP Act for, um, for contractors and labour hire. So those are questions best put to the Department of Finance. Okay. Do you have any... Um... All right. Okay. Maybe I will just take it up with them if you can't add anything to that about the diminishing numbers, sadly, of the... Um... 
public service. Uh, the 2022 intake of graduates has recently commenced. Based on current figures, uh, do this year's intake have greater or lesser prospects of long-term job security within APS than graduates five or ten years ago, in your opinion? You are the only participant in the I don't conference. think we, well, look, I might ask... I'm not sure about a question that kind of concludes with yeah. give your opinion, but uh, um, well, we'll, we'll, we'll take it as, 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 as is the claim you've made a, a, a fact or not, which... Yeah. Uh, I, I might ask sure I my first assistant commissioner of Indonesia to respond to that question as best she can. It's a bit speculative. I'm not sure we have data about that. Yeah, but I don't think we've got longitudinal data um, that could answer that question. Is that because it's been hollowed out so much you don't have the people to keep the data? <laughs> no, no. So we, we would have... Sorry, Rena Bruns, my first assistant commissioner. Um, we have data on uh, the, the, the intakes uh, of the graduates, but we don't actually track the graduates... Uh, in their various different agencies across their careers. Oh, OK. Does, does no other body track that either? Individual agencies are likely to track their own agency, okay. um, but there's no whole of government tracking um, on individual graduates. Okay. And that's not your role to look at the long-term job security of public servants? It's a genuine question. I, 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 I don't it's know the answer. Senator, to distinguish between job security and um, length of tenure, yeah. the two are uh, not one in the same. Um, I mean, across modern workforces, people are more mobile today in terms of uh, um, uh, their jobs and the length of tenure they stay in any job um, than they were you know, in past. I'm talking about. Within generations. The public service. Pardon yeah. me for interrupting. No, no, sure, but I just within the public service, given the vast yes, numbers of sackings that have occurred in the last decade. Oh, well, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't accept that um, term or appraisal, and I'm just making the point. There's you know, people are more mobile today than they used to be, Senator, in uh, in uh, in jobs, and um, and uh, I don't think we should assume that uh, people attracted to um, graduate positions in the Australian public service are going to be. Um, exempt from that um, you know, global trend towards increased mobility. What I can say, Senator, is we're doing an awful lot of work at the moment around uh, how, how to uh, focus on attraction of, of the talent as graduates. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've, we've also, a lot of that, we've got big brand, name, big brand names like Department of Defence, Prime Minister and Cabinet, Foreign Affairs, Treasury. But at the same time, we're looking to centralise recruitment on an opt-in basis wherever it makes sense. So, for example, the Australian Bureau of Statistics now recruits for the whole Commonwealth on, uh, on an opt-in basis for data graduates. Um, uh, DTA does, and now APSC, manages that for digital graduates and also uh, for new starters as well. So we're also looking at Treasury to do the same for economists. We're looking for tax to do the same thing for HR specialists. There's a whole range of areas that we're looking to start to centralise in terms of um, bringing in talent. Um, on behalf of the, of the whole Commonwealth. Uh, I'll take on notice, I do recall seeing data somewhere about how long people stay, traditionally stay in the public service. I don't have that information at, at, at the tip of my fingers, but I'll take that one on notice. But I, I'd nice. just like to say, to reinforce what the Minister says, I think the future of the public service is a more porous public service, where people do move in and out. They might go to not-for-profits, they might go to the private sector, and I actually think that's a positive thing. Uh, because they're going to learn new skills and they're going to bring that back into the public service. The important thing is to have that mobility backwards and forwards. Um, that's not something we've been particularly good at in the past and it's something that we are giving a lot of thought, um, thought to. Uh, we recently established, uh, at the direction of the Secretary's Board, a future work subcommittee of the Secretary's Board, which is looking at all these issues from flexible work to recruitment to, uh, to ha a a how do we attract, how do, how do we retain, um, re retain uh, staff that we need. Mm -hmm. And as I say, it's a pretty fluid uh, world out there and it's pretty competitive for staff. You see what the unemployment rate is at the moment. And for talent, we've just got to be competitive. It's a fast-moving environment and the issues are becoming more complex and more demanding right across the board. So it, it is a challenge for us and it'll be a challenge for any future government as well. Okay, thank you. Um, the Thode review identified the relationship between APS and ministerial staff as an issue. 
And I note that last week, Brittany Higgins also said that the upstairs-downstairs arrangements where young, inexperienced ministerial advisers had more influence than long-term departmental staff was problematic. Um, I agree with that um, assessment. Is this an issue that um, you've discussed with uh, the Prime Minister's office or PM&C as an area for reform, or with anyone for that matter? Uh, it, it is, uh, it's a very real issue. I think the relationship between the Australian Public Service and ministers and their officers is in, in, any, is in a part uh, a, a, an unfinished piece of business for us. Uh, the relationship, when it works well, when a minister, his office and his department or agency work well together, it's when you see government governance at its best. When it doesn't work so well, it's when you see problems emerge. We've set up a reference panel in the APSC, which I think has been a very interesting innovation. And the reference panel includes uh, Tony Nutt, who will be well known to the, the coalition members of this, uh, of this committee, um, Ben Hubbard, who will be well known to the Labor members of this committee, former Chief of Staff to Julia Gillard, Wayne Eagleston, the Chief of Staff to um, two Prime Ministers in New Zealand for a long period of time, both Bill Keyes and John English, uh, Rachel Thompson, uh, the Minister's Chief of Staff, and Stephanie Foster, who is here before me. And this, this committee is looking at the whole question of how do you best both the um, develop material, educative material, which will help the public service deal with ministers' offices. And that includes training courses, which we're now starting to run in the APS Academy, about how to work with a ministerial office, what the operational environment is like in a minister's office, what the pressures are like in a minister's office, and where, what the lines are. And we now plan to flip this uh, after the election to actually also look to train MOP staff both uh, government staff and opposition staff in how to work with the public service, how to get the best out of the public service and where the lines are. So I agree with you completely and I agree with Thody. This is an important piece of work, but it's, it's still in its infancy. But I, I'm really encouraged by the quality of the reference panel and the quality of the work that we're starting to do here. Thank you. I've just got one final question, but I'm interested in when that reference panel was established. Ah, um, I might take the date on notice, but it's been over a year. Oh, it's, a um, it's been there for a while now. Okay. And we've also been, as I say, the panel's also been working on a whole lot of reference material around um, DLOs, how they should work, uh, transition to, both transition to a new minister, but also transition to a new government. And there's a lot of material that will eventually be produced, which will come up on our website. I was going to. I was tempted, at least, to make the point, and now you've asked for the timeline that, uh, that in terms of Mr. Walcott's reference to, uh, to my uh, outstanding chief of staff, Ms. Thompson, that uh, um, that yes, um, she was asked onto that panel, not with any um, engagement via me, and asked onto uh, onto that uh, by Mr. Walcott or others, um, uh, whilst I was still the trade minister. So reflective of her experience as. A MOPS Act employee and a uh, and a government chief of staff with engagement with the uh, public service, not because now she happens to be the chief of staff to the minister for finance. So. And I should probably add for clarity that um, the reference panel was put together by me, uh, not by anyone else. Okay, thank you, Senator Pat Edmonton, uh, Deputy Public Service Commissioner. The reference panel was established in September of 2020. If that helps to not yeah, take it on notice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just one last question on this issue before we move to the um, Parliamentary Workplace Support Service. Um, the 30 review uh, recommended a legislative code of conduct for ministerial staff. So I'm interested, and obviously there's some work being done on that code of conduct in a, in a different context at the minute, but is seeking and having regard to the advice of the APS something that could be included in that code um, for ministers and ministerial staff coming out of the Set the Standards review. Is that is that on anybody's well, radar? Is that being com contemplated? Uh, that would be a matter for government. I might leave that to, um, to Minister Birmingham to comment on. Um, uh, Senator, I think work around um, codes of conduct and uh, processes around those now is going to be intrinsically linked to um, the Joint Select Committee that the Senate agreed to establish last week and that I trust the House will agree to establish this week if it hasn't already. Uh, and um, uh, uh, and as part of that response, I think we would expect, given that um, Ms Jenkins, Commissioner Jenkins, you know, outlined the need not just for a code of conduct for members of parliament, but a series of codes that there's an overlap there with uh, 30 work and that 
that should be considered as part of that, uh, that process. Thank you. I want to ask just some overall questions about the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service. So, Minister, I think you wanted to absent yourself for this part so of the program. I ask uh, Mick Brighton to join us. Yes, she's in please. the other room and she's head of the PWSS. Thank you. <laughs> and sorry, sorry, Chair, this is taking a little longer than I anticipated, but I, I'm confident this next part will be brief. It is, Senator Waters. The one thing that I did want to check um, was that, um, because obviously, as Mr Walcott's identified, he sort of wears two hats, and yes. we know that Minister Birmingham is currently on his way out thank you, to you thank you, um, indicative of those two hats, whether or not we need to have the President right. of the Senate here for, <laughs> um, for the, um, the Public Service Commissioner to sit here in his capacity as Parliamentary Service Commissioner. I'm not sure. I don't have any questions for the Pres in his capacity as the Pres, and I'm hopeful that the officers will be able to either answer or take the questions on notice, but okay. I'm in the hands of, of others in terms let, of the procedure that's appropriate. Let, let's carry on with you um, asking those questions, Senator Waters, and okay. if we find ourselves in a tricky situation, we need we'll to, come back to call it. for the president, All then right. we will. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, joining us, Ms Brighton. Um, I'm interested, obviously, without going into anyone's identity or in any way impeding the process, I'm interested in how um, the PWSS is operating and how many people are using it. Has it been well received? Has it been um, embraced, if you like? I might, I might ask Ms Brighton, who is um, across all the details, to speak to that. Thank you, Senator, for the question. Uh, Meg Brighton, I'm the head of the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service. Um, Senator, the, the service, um, like any new service, in as, is still in its early days. Um, overall, the reception has been incredibly positive in the engagement we have been doing across both parliamentarians, their officers, as well as with the MOPS employees themselves, be it through staff forums or consultative groups. Um, the numbers... Um, I'm conscious of one of the things about the PWSS is that we've got this very strong commitment to confidentiality and service. And in order to instill confidence in the PWSS, we are um, not in a position to share any detail about the detail of the numbers. But what I can say is that there ha I have seen an incremental increase over time since we started. Um, the numbers are reasonably consistent with what I would expect for an early service, and we are finding a strong number of referrals from clients who have had an experience with the service, told their story to other, um, other staff members um, in Parliament House, including parliamentarians, and then we've had further referrals from that. Good. Well, that, that sounds like the service is working and instilling confidence in people who then um, are using it. Um, perhaps I'll ask it in a different way then. Do, do you have the resources that you need in order to deal with the number of people who are reaching out for your help. Yeah, um, Senator, we uh, we do have the resources we need. One of the things that's really important about this service is we run a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week mm -hmm. service, and um, it means that we have our trauma informed counsellors and social workers and others from related disciplines available on the phone um, whenever someone needs to talk to us. I think that. Um, as we, we will need to do a review of the service about how we're tracking and how the resources are going, but at the moment we've got what we need. Okay. And is that a regular review? Um, I keep a very close eye on what our rostering looks like, what our intake looks like, um, and then as things develop and as we do the work around um, the set the standard of the report and consideration that Parliament will give to its implementation, mm -hmm. then that will be another opportunity for us to revisit those um, issues of resourcing and capacity. Okay, thank you. Senator, there's no doubt that the Jenkins Set the Standards Report has plans to grow the PWSS. Now, that's obviously a matter yes. for, for the Parliament how that happens. Yes, thank but you. There will, be, there will be resourcing questions to, to, at that point. At yes, that thank point. you. Thank you. I was just about to go there. Um, so, will PWSS be involved in the development um, of a code of conduct for parliamentarians, which is, of course, also recommended under Set the Standard? Um, I, I think that would be a matter for the Parliament itself. Um, the PWSS plays a role in a number of the working groups around the, the, the independent complaints mechanism, but the wider policy issues uh, are, will need to be addressed by the Parliament. Okay. Um, all right. Well, 
think on that as a joint select committee of folk to inquire into that. Um, and lastly, just a clarity about scope. Elections obviously attract a whole lot of volunteers who want to deliver a better future for all of us. Um, will PWSS have scope to take calls from volunteers or is it limited just to MOPS staff? Senator, what we have found um, as a trauma-informed service, um, when someone calls us for help, we're not exercising our trauma-informed capability if we'd say, you've come to the wrong place. Mm. So what we are doing is, technically the service was set up to support MOPS Act employees and parliamentarians. After but a certain date. After 18th of May 2019. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Um, but when we have calls from people who maybe don't fit that definition, our social workers and counsellors will talk through with a person, um, provide them immediate supports, and then look to what is the best place that we need to help them land. Okay. Yeah. All right, I'm pleased to hear that. Thank you for your time. I would ask more, but I feel like I'm getting the hurry along, so you I'll are call it. You are well identified. Thank you, Senator Thank you. Waters. Um, Thanks, that concludes Senator. our examination of the APSC. Thank you very much for coming along this Thank evening. Um, and then we will uh, deal with the Office of the Official Secretary to the Governor-General as quickly as possible before dinner. Indeed. I welcome Mr Paul Singer, Official Secretary to the Governor-General and Officers of the Office of the Official Secretary to the Governor-General. Um, Mr Singer, in the interest of time, I might ask you to table your opening statement if you so have one. So, Chair, and, and in doing so very briefly, I'd just like to put on the public record my appreciation and admiration for the staff at the office who have done an outstanding job in supporting Your Excellencies over the last two and a half years. So, I just, uh, on indulgence, put that on the Thank public you. record. Thank you very much. Um, I will hand over to Senator Ayres. Thanks, Chair. Uh, welcome. And we'll try and do these questions as quickly as possible. Welcome, Mr Singer. We've opted to, to deal with your office um, as scheduled before the lunch break rather than uh, keep you here. Um, uh, into the evening, um, so I'm going to try and just shorten my line of um, questions. If um, and let's let's see how we go. I I saw today that um, that there has been a uh, six-figure settlement that the Morrison government's reached with three of the six women who had made complaints about uh, former justice. Uh, Dyson Hayden. I think uh, Her Honour Justice Kiefel said about 18 months ago, so it's been a long process, uh, we're ashamed that this could have happened at the High Court of Australia. We have made a sincere apology to the six women whose complaints were borne out. We know it would have been difficult to come forward. Their accounts of their experiences at the time have been believed. Um, does Mr Hayden retain the award of Companion of the Order of Australia? Uh, well, Senator, as you're aware, he was appointed a Companion of the Order, I think, in 2004. Yes. Um, I'm aware of a, a statement that's been released by the Attorney General earlier today in relation to this matter. Uh, and, of course, I would like to, to uh, ensure that the Council has the opportunity to fully consider this in the context of its terminations and cancellations, and I expect that um, when it next meets, uh, it will be on the agenda of items to consider. So it's on the agenda next. I mean, we've traversed some of these uh, similar matters before in previous hearings. The Prime Minister said on the 23rd of June in 2020, so around about the same time, I think, as... Um, her Honour issued the statement that I just read to you. Um, 
He said, as you know, people's awards and honours, if those processes end in a place where people have, where those allegations have been upheld, then there's a normal process for honours to be dealt with at that time. Uh, there should be a proper process to deal with this. There will be. And he goes on. And on that basis, I would expect those processes to do their job. Um, so the statement by Her Honour 18 months ago wasn't sufficient to have the matter listed before the council. Is that right? Well, I think as we've discussed previously, Senator, um, the council seeks to consider, keeps a very close eye on all of these uh, events as they, they unfold. Uh, the fact that there's been a, a, an announcement of a settlement today, I think is uh, important in terms of the milestone around these processes. Uh, and as we've discussed previously, Senator, there are a number of provisions available within the constitution for the council to consider a recommendation for either a cancellation of a termination. Uh, and whilst I, I can't speak to the specifics of, of this circumstance or preempt the council's decision, I think it's important that the council has the opportunity to, to fully consider it in light of today's uh, settlement. Those matters that we've discussed at previous estimates where there have been either convictions or findings in that Child Sexual Abuse Royal Commission about individuals who'd received honours, have, have any of those people had their honours removed um, by the council? Uh, th there's one particular example that you and I have spoken about a number of occasions in relation to Mr Howe, uh, who is deceased, and yes. the constitution... No, I remember we went around in circles about whether or not somebody who was deceased held an honour or not. And, and to, to the point, to assist you, Senator, the point where we came out on that is that the Constitution is quite clear under uh, Section 25.2a that a person ceases to be a member of the order upon their death. Uh, there is a principle of natural justice that applies here, and notwithstanding some of these circumstances being very difficult, very complex, uh, a, a key tenant of the uh, Order of Australia is to recognise those principles of natural justice that apply uh, when a termination or a cancellation is being considered. And as it currently stands, the Constitution doesn't allow for a termination or cancellation of a deceased member. So we'll come to deceased members in a moment, but have others, whether they're, they're ones that I've raised with you in previous estimates, or, um, or, uh, um, or others who've been uh, identified in the Child Sexual Abuse Royal Commission, have, have any of the living persons who've been identified in that manner had their honour removed? Uh, well, what I can say, Senator, over the last five years, there's been six terminations or cancellations, and they apply to a number of different reasons as to, to why they've been either cancelled or terminated, uh, and that if there were to be a finding where an individual, a living individual, were convicted or charged or found guilty of an offence, then that of course would be reason for the council to consider uh, in line with the processes outlined in the constitution for termination or cancellation. Yes, that's what I don't understand. So the Prime Minister's tried to create the impression in 2020 that these matters would be dealt with by the council. You've and, and said you've said um, a moment ago that um, you would effectively have it on the agenda for the next council meeting. I, I, I took it from what you said. Um, Well, where, where's the threshold for well, for, the thresh for removal? I, I, is 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 it? I mean, I, I don't want to participate in a hearing where the prospect of removal is held out as a serious prospect, but subsequently is not delivered upon. Is there a false hope being held out here about what's going to happen to Mr. Hayden's um, award? 
Well, I, th I think as we've discussed previously, Senator, one of the key aspects uh, that the, the council uh, considers is that the legal process needs to have concluded before the council would make a recommendation. And I think that's an important part of the process to maintain in relation to the principle of natural justice. So the, the legal process is that in relation to a number of these complaints, a confidential settlement has been reached by, belatedly, by the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that the, does that reach the threshold of conclusion of the process as far as you're concerned? Well, I, I wouldn't wish to preempt the recommendations or the mm. consideration by the Council, but as Secretary of the Council for the Audit of Australia, I would certainly expect that today's announcement and settlement is sufficient grounds for it to be put forward to the Council for recommendation. Now, just on termination of honours, um, members who have died, can't lose their membership, as you say, because the, um, the Constitution doesn't permit that. Has the Prime Minister or Mr Morton um, or yourself made any representations uh, to the Council about changing the Constitution to resolve this issue? Thank you for the question, Senator, because I think it provides a, an important and a timely opportunity to make very clear that the Constitution uh, makes it clear under that provision that I just quoted that a person's membership ceases with their death. But importantly, neither the Council or my office are responsible or able to change the Constitution. A recommendation must come from government via the Governor-General to the Queen in order to make any changes to either the constitution or the ordinances of the order. Yes, I, so, so, I, so, I, 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 so thank you. I can see that there's a process that has to be undertaken, but people have done terrible things to children uh, and they are recipients of awards that are supposed to be an indication of the esteem that people are held with in the community. Um, and, and nothing has happened to change this problem, has it? Has a, has, has a recommendation been provided from the government to the Governor-General? Has the Governor-General made representations to Her Majesty about this issue? What, 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 what has actually happened to fix this problem? Well, I think to, to pick up on a couple of the, the points you make there, Senator, uh, it, it's not for the Governor-General to act unilaterally and make recommendations to the Queen without advice. So there's nothing from the... Sorry to cut across you, I'm just conscious of the time. There's been no advice from government to the Governor-General that this change should occur. That's correct. No representations at all. That's correct. And it's been going on for years and years, uh, not, just, not just in these estimates hearings, but it's been a matter of public controversy for years and years and years. No representations from Mr Morton or Mr Morrison. I, and that's I, where it would come from, presumably, the, the Prime Minister or from Minister Morton's office. So you'll appreciate, Senator, I can't speak definitively going back in, in, in time. I can speak authoritatively for my time as the Secretary for the Order and as Official Secretary at the office. But there's been no such representation in that time. OK, thank you. That's all I have, Chair. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Senator Ayres. Nothing more from you, Senator Gallagher. Very good. Um, in that case, thank you very much, Mr Singer, for coming along this evening and we will uh, send you off with our thanks for your responses to our questions. Um, the committee will now suspend for dinner and we will reconvene at 8.10pm. The Finance and Public Administration Committee will now recommence its hearing and I welcome Senator the Honourable Maurice Payne, Minister for Women, uh, Ms Alison Frame, Deputy Secretary, Social Policy at PMNC, uh, Ms Zakharov, First Assistant Secretary and other officers. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? Uh, no, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Ms Frame or Ms Zakharov, do you wish to make opening statements? No, very good. Or Ms Stratford, for that matter. I'll ask everyone. Uh, very good. Senator McAllister, you have the call. Thanks, Chair. Um, 
Minister, you and I were both at the National Press Club last week, um, listening to Ms. Tick and Ms. Higgins and Ms. Tame. Um, Ms. Tame made three key asks to better the nation, and she asked that the government take abuse seriously, that you provide adequate funding for prevention education, and that you deliver nationally consistent legislation related to child abuse and sexual assault. Will you support Ms Thames' three asks? Thanks, Senator, and uh, thanks, uh, uh, colleagues, for uh, the opportunity to discuss some of these issues tonight. Let me start with national legislative um, consistency uh, and acknowledge um, Ms Thames' uh, extraordinary uh, commitment to addressing the question of child sexual abuse and the experience that she brings uh, to this discussion is, uh, frankly, I think for most of us, uh, something that it is barely possible for us to imagine. So on national legislative uh, consistency, I can say that um, through the meeting of attorneys general, uh, the uh, state, uh, the Commonwealth and State and Territories uh, Committee, uh, the Attorney General has been working with Ms Tame uh, to ensure that uh, she's been able to raise those important issues uh, of different, differing state and territory laws to work towards harmonisation. That includes definitions of consent, of sexual assault, of age of consent and of grooming. Um, we have passed some reforms in recent years to ensure that our Commonwealth laws are using appropriate terminology. So we've replaced, for example, child pornography with child abuse material. Um, we have, uh, through the leadership of the Commonwealth, supported the progression of considerable work by each jurisdiction on uh, improving the criminal justice response to sexual assault and on developing national principles on uh, coercive control. Um, the AG has also, through the funding that we committed through the Women's Budget Statement in 2021-22, uh, been supporting a joint program of work about strengthening that justice response. So this is work that is underway and we support um, the, the development of national legislative, legislatively consistent uh, provisions uh, to address these issues, and that's evidenced by uh, that uh, engagement. Uh, in terms of uh, funding for implementation, um, as this committee knows, uh, the Women's Budget Statement of 2021-22 uh, had an investment of over $1.1 billion to prevent and to respond to violence against women and their children over the next four years. Uh, that brings our investment in women's safety to over $2 billion since 2013. Uh, we described the funding in last year's budget as a down payment on the next national plan, and you know the next national plan is uh, currently uh, out for consultation. Uh, once that national plan is agreed between the states and territories, uh, then the Commonwealth will re release its first five-year action plan under that, uh, and that will be, uh, of course, funded. Uh, I think that the work that we have done through uh, COVID as well um, is uh, an indication that uh, we're very cognisant of the challenges that, uh, that exist in this area. We've also invested over $70 million to, de to deliver nat national prevention campaigns uh, since 2016. Uh, and given the uh, role of the Stop It at the Start campaign, that is about knowing that disrespect is central to all abuse and violence. And that's why the Stop It at the Start is focused on changing attitudes and behaviours around respect and consent and ingrained gender inequality. So the prevention aspect that uh, um, uh, Ms Tame uh, speaks to. All of those go to the uh, request uh, and the view that as a government um, we must take abuse seriously uh, and that is absolutely my view. Mm. We are acting to support women's safety in their homes, in, communi in communities, in workplaces, in online, uh, in online spaces. Uh, we are working to implement all of the recommendations, as you know, Senator, of the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's report to set the standard. Uh, our Women's Safety Summit last year, which has been part of this over 18-month consultation period on the next national plan, was also an important opportunity to bring lived experience together. 
uh, and inform the next national plan to end violence against women and their children. I don't have all the material here this evening in relation to child sexual abuse, which is also, as you know, core to Ms Tame's concerns. And she emphasised that on multiple occasions in her remarks last week. Um, I don't have all of that here, <clears throat> all of that here, but we are also taking significant steps uh, in, uh, in that area as well. Uh, so I know there will always be differences uh, and uh, differences of opinion, self-evidently. Uh, that, uh, that has been the case in the past, uh, but this government is taking these steps uh, to ensure that we take it seriously, to ensure that we are committed to the funding uh, that is required and to ensure that we are moving on national legislative consistency with the states and territories. Mm. Um, uh, particularly on the question of adequate funding for <coughs> prevention education, do you think that the funding levels at the moment across the Federation are adequate for prevention education? I the beginning of your question. In relation to prevention education, which is the second of Ms Thames' asks, uh, she asks that you provide adequate funding for prevention education. Do you think that the funding levels at the moment across the Federation for prevention education are adequate? Senator, I don't have um, all of the uh, state and territory funding arrangements with me. Uh, this evening. I think that um, in these circumstances there is, a, there is an opportunity, or opportunity is perhaps the wrong word, the, the funding question uh, is an ongoing one and it has to be reviewed. Uh, in relation to uh, meeting demand of, uh, of, um, of the sector, uh, of the preponderance of, of the abuse, of what is working, what is not working, uh, all of those actions. Ms Frame tells me she has more information here this evening on the child sexual abuse aspect. Uh, but we do keep that under review all the time, as you would expect a government to do. And that's why when we did produce, um, uh, when we did uh, present the women's budget statement last year, that included that over $1 billion uh, to prevent and respond to violence against women and their children <clears throat> over the next four years. Mm. Uh, as I imagine you know, the quality of prevention education varies significantly across states and territories and school systems. Is that a proposition that the Commonwealth accepts and is willing to take leadership on to raise the standard of education across the system? Well, these are conversations that uh, we have been having uh, right through this, uh, this consultation uh, process and uh, through the development of the, of the national plan. Uh, they are conversations which have, <coughs> I have also had myself with attorneys general uh, from uh, other states and from the states and territories uh, and other uh, relevant ministers. Uh, and I think that it is uh, important that we work together. This is a federation. Uh, it is important that we work together. One of the reasons that the Women's Safety Task Force, as disparate as it is uh, in terms of its, uh, of its makeup across the states and territories and the, and the Commonwealth, one of the reasons that it is an important um, <clears throat> component of this and why it is one of only two National Federation uh, Reform Councils uh, is because we do recognise the importance of that uh, coordination and that leadership. Mm. Um, I want to come back to the plan, but just before I do that, this morning uh, the Treasurer has made a series of remarks about the benefits to women arising from the government's tax policy settings. Was the Office for Women involved in reviewing the analysis that the Treasurer based his remarks on? I understand it to be Treasury data, Senator, but I'll ask Ms Zakharov if she has anything, or maybe even ATO data, actually, to be precise, but I'll ask Ms Zakharov if she wants to add any more. Chantal Stratford, Assistant oh, Secretary sorry, for Women. <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, we weren't consulted prior to the analysis being released. Thanks. Um. I should have said, Senator, also just in relation to your previous question, um, I do uh, particularly welcome the agreement at the uh, Education Minister's meeting in just the last uh, week or so on consent education. Um, that obviously is, uh, is a component of the sorts of issues that you're talking about. 
Just a few more questions about the plan. Um, you indicated that when the plan was finalised, you intend to release a draft action, an action plan or a draft action plan? Uh, the, uh, well, as you know, the plans are underpinned by implementation or, or action plans, and uh, that will be uh, produced after the plan is finalised. Can you step me through the timetable for that? Um, I suppose I'm interested, just as you do so, I'm interested in the expected date for finalising the plan and whether or not you intend to consult on the action plans final prior to confirming them. Uh, the um, uh, commentary on the draft plan period will close on the 25th of February, uh, and then I'll ask Ms Zakharov or Ms Stratford to take you through the next step, Senator. Ta. Oh, thank you. Kayleen Zakharov, First Assistant Secretary, Office for Women. Um, so, um, Senator, if I can explain it, I guess, in a, um, a temporal um, way, the next national plan is due to come into effect on the 1st of July 2022. So working back from there, uh, we obviously need to finalise the national plan. And as the minister said, that's currently out for consultation, closing on the 25th of February. Um, uh, this is obviously subject to the decisions of ministers, but our expected next step is that it will go to the Women's Safety Task Force, which is um, all jurisdictions with the Minister for Women and the Minister for Women's Safety chairing that task force, um, to um, get agreement on the draft plan as it then is. Um, we, the Commonwealth, will certainly then work through um, the details of the action plan with obviously states and territories. I would note that states and territories have quite rightly flagged that they will also go through their own sort of internal approval and budget processes in that time. So there are a number of steps, um, but we have until sort of that 1 July 2022 period. Is it your intention to publicly consult on the draft action plans or on the action plans at all? It's not actually something I am aware of. If I can, I'll take the, I'll, I'd like to consult with my DSS colleagues, who we work quite closely with in the development of the um, national plan and the action plans, and I'll come back to you, Senator. Okay. Is that something we could do this evening? Potentially, yes. Okay. Minister, do you have a view? Reflecting on uh, the um, development of the last action plan, Senator, um, my understanding is that went through state and territory processes and the Women's Safety Task Force processes. I don't recall it being um, consulted um, in the same way uh, as the national plan itself. But as I said, we'll clarify that. As Ms Zakharov said, we'll clarify that. Okay. Is it your expectation, Minister, that the draft plans will be made available to the public prior to an election? We obviously have a very limited window in which an election could take place. Which this plan, year. Senator? The draft. Uh, my apologies. The action plans. Well, the, as as Ms. Zakharov said, the action plans uh, are to be uh, uh, to sit under the national plan itself, um, and I would expect that that first five-year action plan will be released in the first half of this year. But given that the expiry of the uh, next national plan is uh, in the middle of the year. Um, I'm not sure what the exact timing on that will be at this stage. So it's un it, for clarity, as far as we can be clear, it's uncertain whether or not the public will see the action plans prior to the election. Senator, I don't know what the election date is, uh, and we have to finalise the the commentary process on the national plan, uh, and then. Uh, Make and then pro progress that through the Women's Safety Task Force, uh, as um, uh, as Ms. Zakharov said, uh, for its uh, finalisation. And then the action plan sits under that. So it is a matter of those timeframes, uh, and we will endeavour to make it public as soon as we can. Okay. So we're uncertain about at this stage whether or not there's going to be consultation on the action plans and uncertain about whether people will see them before they go to an election? No, Senator. I think that uh, the action plans development process, and I'm, I stand to be corrected um, if, uh, if I have um, misremembered this, but the uh, development of the action plan on the last occasion uh, was, consult, was 
uh, undertaken through the Women's Safety Task Force process and agreed through that process. Uh, I don't recall it being broadly consulted uh, in the same way as the national plan itself. I don't think that that has been the, uh, the, the purpose of the, of the action plan, uh, but we will take that on notice and come back to you. Okay. Um, look, as you know, almost certainly, there is an open letter was released on Wednesday. 45 quite prominent women expressed disappointment in the draft national plan and aspects of that plan. Can I take you through some of the propositions that they've put and get your response to those? Um, the letter states that in the absence of targets, we do not believe that the draft is credible and believe it should be withdrawn and rewritten to reflect these concerns. Will the government set specific targets to reduce violence against women and children as part of the plan? Senator, the, the draft plan includes key indicators and we are considering those stakeholder views, including those to which uh, you have referred on the draft national plan, including potential targets against um, those indicators. All, any targets would have to be agreed by the Women's Safety Task Force, which as you know, uh, comprises all of the states and territories uh, and, uh, and the Commonwealth. Um, the national plan itself does include um, uh, target 13 of the National Agreement on Closing the Gap, uh, which is uh, aiming to reduce all forms of family violence and abuse against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls by at least 50% by 2031 as progress uh, towards zero. Uh, but as I said, we will continue to consider those stakeholder views. Will, you, will the Commonwealth be taking a proposal for targets against some of those indicators into that meeting of the Women's Safety Ministers? I said we would continue to consider those stakeholder views, Senator. Okay, so no decision on that question as yet? No, Senator. Um, Senator McAllister, we only had 20 minutes set aside for the Office of Women tonight, and I know Senator Waters would like to ask some questions as well. So. Um, do you have too much longer left? I have three questions of fact, really, okay. uh, about this same matter, and then I'm happy to pull up. Thank you very much, um, Senator McAllister. So, this, uh, the signatories to the open letter also considered that the government should undertake a more robust analysis of how and why the national plan, the first national plan, failed to meet its aspiration. Is that something that the government is willing to do? Sorry, Senator, can you say that again? Signatories to the open letter argued that the government should undertake a more robust analysis of how and why the first national plan failed to meet its aspiration of significant and sustained reduction in violence. Is that something that the government is planning to do? Uh, Senator, as, as I recall the um, inception of the first national plan as, uh, as it was by the Gillard government, I think, uh, at the time, um, with uh, bipartisan, in fact, non-partisan, um, multi-partisan support, I should say. Um, the, uh, the work of bringing that plan together was considerable, as is the work for, uh, for this uh, next draft national plan. Uh, there are a range of stakeholder views, and uh, that process uh, remains open, and the government will continue to consider those stakeholder views on the draft national plan, including uh, raising um, those uh, aspects which need to be agreed by all members of the Women's Safety Task Force with them. Sure. I, I think what stakeholders are looking for is some commitment that the government's willing to reflect on why things didn't produce the results as expected. Senator, we wouldn't be producing the next national plan um, if we were not uh, willing to do that and not committed to uh, this task and not committed on these issues. Uh, okay. That is absolutely the case and I can assure uh, you and all stakeholders of that. Uh, and I welcome the, the comments and the uh, submissions which are, which are being made. But as you would imagine, given the process is still open and underway, uh, those matters are still being considered. Okay. Uh, two more questions of fact. Will the government be releasing the consultation reports that were prepared by Monash University that underpin the draft plan, uh, a request that's been made by very many experts uh, in the public discussion? Senator, I think um, that matter is uh, in the hands of Minister Rustin, given those um, the, that process was commissioned through through DSS. But I will check. Okay. 
I wonder if you could check this evening. I mean, I... I'm not sure if I can check this evening, Senator. I said I'll check. OK, so you don't know yourself? I said it's in the, it's in the hands of DSS okay, and Minister but not Rustin. in your knowledge, not something that's been communicated to you. Not that I'm aware of. Thank you. Um, and has the government re released all of the evaluation reports of the previous national action plans um, so the public can judge what issues might be relevant for the next one? Uh, the those matters also, Senator, in terms of the management of those uh, reports, again in the hands of, uh, of DSS. But let me check. Okay. And finally, there have been a number of requests um, for a dedicated standalone national plan to eliminate fam family violence in First Nations communities. Um, does the government intend to deliver a standalone national plan to eliminate violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women? Senator, we have, uh, we have said that uh, uh, we have agreed to a dedicated Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander action plan. We are working with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Advisory Council on the development of that uh, dedicated action plan, and that reflects our absolute commitment to addressing the unacceptable rates of family violence against Ab Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and children. Uh, and that is a subject that uh, I have discussed myself with uh, leading advocates like June Oscar, uh, for example, as have a uh, range of cabinet ministers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator McAllister. Uh, Senator Waters, we are running quite over time, so if you can be as economical as possible, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, tonight. Uh, starting off with the budget process, last year a member for Office of Women was seconded to Treasury to help coordinate the women's budget statement. Uh, is the same arrangement in place for the upcoming budget? Yes, it is, Senator. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, will that simply be an analysis produced post-budget, as it was last year, or will it be any semblance of a gender lens on the decisions taken prior to them being included in the budget? But what you're asking about the women's budget statement this year and the proposed... I'm just asking plan. about the role of the Office for Women in putting what I hope to be a gender lens on the budget, which is not what happened last year. It was a sort of post-document summary of the implications of the budget. Will that be the same this year or will you have some input on decisions prior to them being made, which would be a true gender lens on the budget, on the creation of the budget. Uh, Senator, we work closely with Treasury, who lead the women's budget statement, as you know, who prepare the women's budget statement from Treasury. Um, and it's, it's a glossy document produced it is very from glossy, the department. Yes. Well, that's, what, that's the terminology, actually, that they it's use very for it. Um, and, and for other budget papers as well. So we work closely with them in the preparation of measures that go into that statement and on the analysis um, and, and worked extensively with them on the women's economic security analysis that was in the statement last year. DSS obviously lead strongly on the women's safety elements in that package. Mm. Um, so, and I, I anticipate we would be taking, or we are already taking a similar approach this year, Minister, uh, sorry, Senator, where we work closely with colleagues across the government consider which measures are going to be included in the package, which is obviously dependent on decisions from the government, um, and then input the analysis, and, and as, as well as uh, providing gender analysis on other measures that get considered outside of the women's budget statement. Okay, gender analysis of the budget as it's produced, as opposed to decisions taken on the way in to formulating the budget? Uh, there's elements of both, Senator. Okay, can you take on notice to provide the exact scope and role of the Office for Women in providing that analysis on the way into budget decisions? Because if that is in fact happening, that's the first time I've heard that in the eight years I've been asking this question. So I'm keen for some more information if that is in fact the case, or perhaps as a Perhaps I'm using the wrong words given the lateness of the hour. So yeah, you could no take problem, that on Senator. For me. If I could just clarify, the gender analysis is typically done by departments with their own measures, so they undertake that analysis. Yes, yes. I'm not interested not in the it. Office well, for Women. It's not that I'm not interested. Behalf. My question goes to the decisions before they're taken and then included in the budget. You keep nodding, so I think you know what I'm um, on about. Well, well, as think... opposed to just working out what it means for women after the decision has yeah. been made by mostly a bunch of dudes. 
part and so, part. So increasingly, the Office for Women is working more proactively. We had some resources, additional resources provided in last year's budget, so that's given us some capacity, additional capacity, uh -huh. to increase our engagement with uh, departments and agencies to, um, uh, as Ms Frame said, we don't prepare uh, their budget measures, but we provide advice and ask questions that might help illuminate and illustrate uh, the gender impacts of the proposal so that as decision makers are considering proposals, it's a more fulsome piece of information. So okay. we're definitely um, starting doing, to do that. that. All right, yes. well, thank you. Can you provide on notice a bit more about the scope and the um, level of resourcing that you've had to do that? Sure. That, in my view, should have been the role of Office for Women all along, and I welcome that it sounds like you're starting to do some of that work. Um, there was a recently an announcement by the New South Wales State Government where they've adopted an expert panel on women's economic security to help develop the New South Wales state budget. Um, has the Office for Women briefed the Minister for Women's Economic Security on that arrangement? No, Senator. Okay. Um, Minister Payne, um, that's your home state. I'm sure you're aware of that arrangement. I'm aware, Senator, and uh, also aware of the work that um, the National Cabinet uh, has been doing in relation to, uh, to women's economic security. Uh, and uh, the uh, agreement on uh, and determining a nationally consistent framework for measuring progress on women's economic security uh, that enables um, the jurisdictions to identify their uh, or to, um, uh, to state their existing measures to identify where the gaps are uh, and to plan future investments on that basis to improve uh, women's economic security. We also have um, a Women's Economic Security Senior Officials Meeting, uh, which underpins uh, the National Cabinet activities, which is also meeting uh, to progress that work as well. Okay, thank you. Can I move briefly back to the National Plan, um, uh, noting uh, Senator McAllister's uh, questions already on that matter. Can I ask first about the change of time frame um, from 12 years to 10? Was, um, did the Office of Women provide any input into that? Maybe that's more of a DSS issue, but does anybody at the table know about that, uh, the reasoning behind changing the time frame there? And did you provide advice on the, on the wisdom of doing so? I'm certainly not aware of um, any advice, but it potentially precedes me. I'm certainly happy to take that on notice to okay. see whether there was any advice. Thank you. I'm just interested in the policy rationale behind the change from 12 to 10. Yeah. Um, but I've also got my eye on the clock. Um, the other issue that I wanted to ask about, Minister, perhaps while you're reflecting on that question of the change of time frame, is also the... I don't have any information for you on that. Oh, subject. no? OK. Uh, is that a Minister Rustin question? Um, well, I think the, the time frame in terms of... Uh, of, uh, of the change, Senator, was agreed uh, and, I, and includes two, the two five-year action plans sitting underneath yes. it, um, but I don't have anything further for Okay, you. I'll take that up with um, DSS, by its hands. Senator, can I just add that uh, part of the um, rationale behind the two by five mm -hmm. plans rather than four by three, mm -hmm. which doesn't go directly from 12 years to 10, but the mm -hmm. rationale for the change in action plan mm -hmm. goes to Senator McAllister's earlier questions about evaluation. Yes. Um, and it, it was considered part, part of the thinking was that two by five year action plans would enable more time for evaluation of the effectiveness mm. of measures mm. um, rather than the four by three mm. um, action plans in which it was very, they were very quickly rolled over without mm. allowing that time for really um, rigorous evaluation, which we yes. think will increase the, the effectiveness of the spend. Has there been a, uh, a guideline for what shape that evaluation will take or has that been decided yet? Uh, I have to or take that on notice and there will be a lot of thinking point. about that with DSS and there, there will be work on that, but we'll take that on notice. And yeah, you thank you, because obviously that was a key criticism of the first national plan that it lacked evaluation, as, as has been covered already um, in earlier questions. Uh, the, there is a recognition of the importance of gender equality in the draft plan, but again, it lacks any sort of specificity or any measures designed to address gender equality, um, uh, Minister or, or folk from the Office of Women, is that work to be expected in the draft action plan or is that not 
forthcoming? Um, it, I, I think Senator Hart, so there's definitely a recognition um, that gender equality is um, a very important element. Mm. Um, it's not intended or designed to be a plan that um, captures everything, including women's economic security. There are references, mm. um, but it, it may well be something that um, comes up prominently in the feedback that we, we may need to look at. Um, but yeah, it, it, I mean, there's the, the priority is trying to capture it in terms of um, women's safety. Yes, measures. okay, but given that the plan itself acknowledges that the lack yeah. of gender equality is a key driver for violence, uh, we all know that. Gender violence, it would yes. make sense to put some, I don't want to say meat around the bones, but to put some delivery items around trying to achieve gender equality. That's not in the draft plan. Is it being worked on it to may be well, in the I mean, action the plan? Elements or? might might appear in the action plan, and there are certainly other measures across government that go to, you know, we're going to hear from um, Ms Woolridge in, in a minute from Wajia, mm. that go to um, measures and initiatives to address gender equality. Okay, so it yep. might be in the upcoming action plan that we're not sure whether we will see before the election and we don't know whether that will be consulted on with experts or the community. Well, just on, on the point around experts, we've certainly um, had the benefit of advisory groups mm -hmm. um, supporting the development of the national plan. Mm. Um, and it's obviously a matter for ministers, but I anticipate that their advice and support might be continued for development of action plans as mm. well. I hope so. Last question from me, um, and I will take this issue up with Wajir as well, but what is the time frame um, for a report into the Wajir review and any legislative reform that might flow from that, in particular the extension of Wajir's remit to the public sector? Is there a time frame on that? So, Senator, the, um, the Wajia review uh, was uh, provided to government, I think, on the 27th of December, uh, from or the review report, I should say, 27th of December, um, and uh, has been. Uh, I have had had a look at the the review, spoken with uh, senior officials and uh, other cabinet ministers in relation to the review, uh, and intend to release that. Um, very shortly. Okay, and the expansion of uh, Wajia to the public sector, is there a time frame around that? We're expecting to report in the 22-23 financial year. Sorry, what does that mean, you're expecting to report? So there's a pilot underway at the moment with yep. Wajia and a small number of agencies, and following the results of that pilot, we'll expand the reporting more broadly across the public service as well um, at National Cabinet on the 10th of December last year, there was an agreement that states and territories would also publicly report to Wajia. And so we're just working with our jurisdictional partners now around the timing, but they okay. are committed to do that as soon as possible. And Ms Woodridge can probably speak to some of the conversations she's had around that with Thank the jurisdictions. You. What was that date that you mentioned? Just the 10th of uh, December. Prior to that, you're um, the, the end 20, of the 22, 23 oh, financial 20, year. 23, 23. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Senator Waters, if we have no further questions for the Office of Women, we will let them go and thank them very much for coming along this evening. Um, and we will check that we have on the line, yes, Ms Waldridge. Um, and we'll move swiftly through to Wajia. I welcome the Director of the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, Ms Mary Waldridge, who is obviously appearing via teleconference, and other officers. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement at this point? No, Chair. Ms Wildridge, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, thanks. Wonderful. Uh, Senator, Mc uh, Senator Ayres, I'm giving you the call. Just short question and then, um, uh, then, then I'll stop. Ms, Ms Wildridge, I see there's an event on um, tomorrow. Uh, I see you're, you're a guest speaker uh, and the Right Honourable Theresa May is a... Is the, you're both keynote speakers. Um, it looks like a very good event. Uh, is that, I um, just wanted to know, is that hosted by the agency? Are there speaker fees involved or is, or is that hosted by KPMG and, and, and they're dealing with all of that? Can, can you just tell me what the arrangements are? Certainly, Senator. Um, Wajia and Chief Executive Women are jointly organising the event. 
uh, and KPMG, uh, at the request of Chief Executive Women, agreed to host it. Uh, and Theresa May is appearing, um, uh, you know, with, with no fee. Um, and she will be uh, the facilitator is Annabelle Crabb, and there is a small fee for Annabelle Crabb. Okay, thank you. That's all I had. Thank you, Senator Rose. Senator McAllister? Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. Um, when should we expect the review of the Workplace Gender Equality Act to make their report to government? I just said, Senator, in response to Senator Waters. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. That I received the report on the 27th of December, I think. Uh, right, and I assume you gave an indication of when that would be made public? I said shortly, Senator. OK. Um, I noted your comment to Senator Waters uh, and the officials' remarks around the timing of the new reporting arrangements for public sector agencies. Uh, a legislative change is required to implement that commitment. Is that correct? I'm going to ask Ms Waldridge to take that question, Senator. So, I, as I understand it, for the APS, uh, public sector agencies, it can be done on the direction of the public sector commissioner. Um, if it is to expand to broader non-APS public sector agencies, such as the government business enterprises, that would then require a change in the legislation. Minister, is the government's commitment to expand it to those broader agencies or simply to uh, extend this obligation to the APS? Uh, Senator, I think as, uh, as the official said uh, earlier, there is a pilot or a trial underway, if you like, in terms of the, the reporting process. That will be evaluated and will determine the extent of its application through that process. Um, the timing around this, like so many things, is tight. Uh, if the reporting is to commence in the 2022 uh, financial year, that legislation would need to progress quite rapidly through the parliament, given that an election is imminent. Has the legislation been drafted or any preliminary drafting instructions been commenced? So, Senator, as, as Ms Woolridge said, um, legislation is required for agencies outside the, the APS core, uh, but for the APS core, it's able to proceed on the direction of the Public Service Commissioner. I've previously uh, corresponded with the Public Service Commissioner uh, about this uh, in strong support, uh, and uh, the, the processes for the extension or otherwise will be determined, as I said, uh, based on the outcome of the pilot. All right, so uh, from a process perspective, the government doesn't intend to start drafting legislation until it's received the outcomes of the pilot. Well, that process is already in train, Senator, so it would seem logical to receive the outcomes of the pilot, yes. That's OK. I'm, uh, uh, yeah. I'm offering criticism. I'm yeah. just trying no, no, to no. understand the sequence. So but you that intend seems to wait until you receive the results of the pilot and then determine whether or not you'll extend it to these broader agencies and hence whether to commence Whether drafting. legislation's required, yes. All right. The IPS um, Commissioner is an independent statutory role, uh, they have no obligation to... Is it correct that ultimately the decision about whether or not to extend these reporting requirements to the APS would be a matter for that person rather than for you, Minister, or for the Cabinet, for that matter? Well, as I said, Senator, um, I think we prefer to take a, a cooperative and collaborative approach uh, on this. That's why we've. Um, that's why the pilot is progressing, uh, so that that we are working together with the system, with the agencies, with the public sector, um, here at least at the Commonwealth level, uh, to uh, to work towards that implementation. Okay, that doesn't really answer my question. I appreciate your commitment to collaborating with the APS commissioner, but um, the commissioner. The decision whether or not to make such a direction is ultimately up to the Commissioner, not to the Cabinet. Is that correct? I'm not sure that that's actually correct, Senator. I think uh, the decision um, to uh, to seek the uh, seek the APS Commissioner to exercise a, a direction uh, would work in consultation with Government, but 
Uh, we're not at that point, and so we will conclude the pilot process, as was outlined to Senator Waters, uh, and go from there. Thanks, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator McAllister. Senator Waters. Thank you, Chair. Um, just sticking with data issues before going on to gender pay gap specifically, is there any work being done? Um, I should say hello first, Ms Woodridge, and oh, thank you for the work that you and your organisation do. Is there any work being done um, to improve data regarding government procurement from female-led businesses? And if so, how, how is this measured? Thanks, Senator. Uh, not specifically. The, the agency has uh, more broadly published guidance to companies about procurement policies and their capacity to help drive gender equality. Uh, but uh, digging down into female-led businesses and, and such uh, has not been, been a focus of the work. Okay, thank you. Um, hopefully you'll have some more staff in future years and you can collect all of the useful data that then helps fix the issues. Uh, the latest data shows fractional improvement in the gender pay gap, but it remains persistently around 23 per cent. Have you met with the Minister for Women's Economic Security to discuss the latest snapshot, Ms Wildridge? Um, I have talked with the Minister for Economic Security and the Minister for Women um, in relation to uh, the latest data. Um, and we provide a briefing um, on the on the data and, and have the opportunity to have some discussions both with the ministers and, and in detail with their officers. Okay, roughly when was that? Uh, certainly in the couple of weeks leading up, uh, as you'll know, last week we released our scorecard over the course of the week and in the, in the couple of weeks beforehand leading up uh, to uh, that release of the data, those conversations become an ongoing discussion. It's not just a one-off, it's an it's a ongoing conversation that we have, particularly with the officers and then um, as the opportunity arises individually with the ministers. Okay. Has Wujie have been asked to input any recommendations for the upcoming budget in relation to women's economic security and reducing the gender pay gap? So we've certainly taken the opportunity um, in discussions uh, with the Minister and, and with the Office for Women in relation to um, funding uh, for our agency and the capacity, we believe, uh, to have a, a greater impact on driving uh, gender equality in workplaces, including, of course, uh, addressing the gender pay gap. Um, the review of the Act is an important part of that and, uh, and the potential to further drive change. Um, and also, of course, the uh, investment and the expansion of our reporting through to state and territories. So um, we, we continue to have those discussions. Okay, so um, my question really went to policy solutions, but um, you've mentioned that it, it would behove you, you'd be more effective, I think, were your words, if you had additional resources. Um, uh, what sort of additional resources have you sought? What quantum? Are you looking at a doubling or a trebling? What, what do you need to do the task properly, um, given your expanded remit? Not that you're not doing it properly already, but to do it amply and well with great result. Well, I think uh, the, the review of the Act, which we've been consulted on um, in detail and, and put a comprehensive submission into as well, um, has outlined ways that the workplace gender equality can be um, more effective and, and have a greater impact in terms of driving change beyond what we currently do with our uh, very significant world leading data set. Um, and so we've put forward some proposals um, and, and I think uh, to be fair, it's probably part of internal budget discussions um, at this stage uh, in relation to the quantum and it's for discussion about um, also the, the uh, comprehensiveness of the implementation of the review of the Act uh, as to where that will land. Okay. Um, the Treasurer has been out today talking up the benefit of tax cuts for young women, but the most recent gender pay gap data, which we've just discussed, shows very marginal gains, and most analysis of the stage three tax cuts, which will predominantly benefit men, are that that would far outstrip um, any such so-called benefits the Treasurer referred to this morning. Um, what, what measures are actually needed to support closing the gender pay gap, the systemic drivers? 
Well, we've done some fabulous research over the years that ident with KPMG that identified the sources of the uh, gender pay gap and, and the contribution of different issues. Um, some of it is occupational segregation, some of it is industrial segregation that uh, contributes about 17% of the uh, value of the gender pay gap. Um, so different roles are valued at different levels and, and the fact that women often tend to go into uh, lower paying jobs. Uh, the issue of women taking time out of the workforce um, for caring responsibilities particularly contributes about 40% of the value of the gender pay gap. And the other 40% is, is in the order of uh, issues about bias and discrimination. Um, so there's a range of issues, uh, but, uh, you know, issues in relation to um, workforce participation particularly uh, contribute about 40% of that gender pay gap. Mm. Okay, so in answering the question of what measures are needed to support closing the gender pay gap, presumably you would go to issues of how to increase workforce participation, value, unpaid domestic labour and care work. Um, so I'm interested, not, not so much in the description of the problem, although that was a, a good summary, um, but in your policy prescriptions to fix it. Well, and it's fair to say that the agency hasn't um, spent a lot of time on policy in the past, and we're doing more work on that into the future. We've, we've uh, traditionally, as you know, um, has been very much about collecting the data and working with companies in relation to their policies and practices. Um, so we, we obviously um, continue to do that in great detail, but um, so our focus is on, on working with the companies rather than the government policy solutions. Um, but obviously things that enable uh, women to participate, um, their assistance, you know, policies that, that companies can have about uh, both equal recruitment and retention, not having a gender pay gap on graduation, which we currently see, mm. um, having women into line roles and CFO roles that enable them to progress through organisations and enable them to um, take the most uh, senior positions within an organisation uh, make a difference as well. Uh, policies that enable caring and childcare uh, and support that enable women to return to work uh, after childcare. And of course, um, something we've talked about a lot in the last week is men taking parental leave, uh, enabling to work, uh, return to work as mm. well. So there's some of the policies um, that we see and work very closely with companies in relation to facilitating the economic participation of women. And Senator, Thank I you. think it's important to note that the um, the gender pay gap data that uh, WGIA publishes and the data that the ABS publishes are also different uh, in terms of the approach that the two entities yes. take. Um, in terms of the, uh, the gender pay gap through the ABS statistics, uh, that sits at 14.2, uh, at which we acknowledge is too wide. Uh, we had driven that um, or it had been driven down to uh, its lowest level on record, which was 13.4% in the six months to November 2020. But um, the reality is that COVID has, has, of course, impacted that as well. This is a, a longer conversation. I think it's a conversation worth having. It's a challenge when the committee allocates 25 mi minutes for Wajia and 20 minutes for Office for Women um, to, uh, to do that. But I appreciate your interest and we can perhaps provide further information as well. Thank you, Minister. Yes, I'm across the different um, scopes for collecting mm. the data and hence the different figures, although I would like to see personally the scope of Wajia expanded further to companies of smaller size, but that's not a matter for Ms Wildridge um, tonight. Uh, hopefully it might be in future though. Uh, just a few remaining, uh, hopefully quick questions, Chair, and then I'm finished. Um, Ms Wildridge, just in relation to the development of the draft national plan, given that gender inequality and financial insecurity are um, drivers and often exacerbators of violence against women. Has Wajia been consulted in the uh, development of the draft national plan to end violence against women and their children? So, Senator, I was involved in the Women's Safety Summit and actually had the opportunity to speak, um, which I was very pleased to be able to do and, and participate. Mm -hmm. um, but, but that is the extent of our involvement in okay. the Women's Safety Summit. Okay. Are you um, but it's been... Sorry, you go. I was just going to say, you know, the, the drivers of um, uh, gender stereotypes and inequality for women and lack of respect un underpin 
a lot of work that all the agencies do. So mm. whether it's, you know, our watch or um, ANROS or, you know, we all end up uh, coming back to the same principles in terms of what we need to change fundamentally uh, in order to, um, to, to make a difference uh, for vulnerable women. Indeed. Um, are you anticipating providing feedback on any specific indicators that might be drafted uh, to measure progress on gender equality under the plan? There was some speculation that if there is an indicator that it might be in a, a draft action plan or maybe there won't be an indicator. Would that be something that you would seek to have some input on? So I'd very much welcome that. And in fact, the National Cabinet decision in December, um, coming out of some discussions around the, the plan and also the implementation of a nationally consistent framework, um, included the in principle agreement for state and territories report to report to which which will enable us to actually then have a, a mechanism to compare comprehensively um, what would then cover 60 percent of the workforce mm. so um, I, I see that as a very positive step and we've obviously been very engaged in that discussion um, in, in terms of the benchmarks great now given the undervalued care work um, underpins at least a large proportion of the gender pay gap. Has Wajia made a submission to the Fair Work Commission's review of the aged care sector award? No, we haven't. Okay. And that would traditionally not be something that, that we would uh, um, contribute to. We, okay. we engage in other reviews. Okay, and just lastly, um, at previous estimates, we discussed the interaction of recommendations in the Respect at Work report to develop good practice indicators for monitoring sexual harassment. Um, and for those indicators to ideally be included in the um, Workplace Gender Equality Act. Has any further work been done on that recommendation? So this is a two-step recommendation process. So recommendation 46, the Attorney General's Department is leading the determination and development of what those indicators will be, and they're consulting with us and many others through that process. Mm -hmm. uh, when that work's concluded, uh, we then take the initiative under recommendation 42 about how they then may be applied in workplaces um, and how we would go about embedding that into our data capture on our annual census. Do you have a time frame for that work, Ms. Wildridge? Your, your portion of the so, work once the first step's completed? Well, the, our legislation actually requires that there's a period of time that there's a, at least a year's notice of any new capturing of information um, from employers uh, because employers need some time to change their systems and processes to capture the information and frankly to even be educated on what's now expected mm. and how to do that mm. appropriately. Um, so, you know, we would hope we can collect that data voluntarily um, and in parallel run an education campaign, um, but it would require that the legislative instrument is changed in order to require employers to provide that information um, and then have that period of notice uh, for them to do that formally. So it will take a little bit of time, but, but there's work and education that happens in parallel. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Waters, and I must um, echo the Minister's sentiments that this um, section of the program always seems to run over time and always is a little bit rushed, and we really should um, remember as a committee to set aside more time for it um, at future estimates. But thank you very much, Ms Wildridge and Minister Payne, for coming along this evening. Um, and we now have uh, 10 minutes in which I will unless Labor senators disagree. I think we call the NRRA in and get them started in the interest of time. Um, so we will switch over to the National Recovery and Resilience Agency. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, I'm happy to do that. I can't guarantee I'll be finished in 10 minutes. Oh, we will break at quarter past regardless. No. Sorry, that wasn't a... No, no, I assume. Not, not to say let's get it done in 10 no. minutes, but let's... Thanks very much. Look at the triumvirate there. Madam Chair. Minister. Je dois, what? The rat pack. The rat pack. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's very St Elmo's fire. <laughs> and Claire, you and Matt, you will have no idea what we're talking about. You're too young. Are we broadcasting? Yes, Sorry. we are. Thank you very much, Bridget. Thank you. 
Thank you. Managed to pay all my gases. Wonderful. Yes. I know it's like it. I just didn't know if I pressed things. Um, we might get underway, given that we are due to break for uh, tea in seven minutes. Um, I welcome Senator the Honourable Bridget McKenzie, Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Mr Shane Stone, Coordinator of the National Recovery and Resilience Agency and other officers. Minister, do you wish to make an opening statement? I don't, Madam Chair, in the interest of time. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, Mr Stone, I think you've tabled your opening statement for the committee, is that correct? Well, I was proposing um, to read it, um, Chair, but if I was assured by Senator Watt and Ayres that they'll actually read it, then I'll table it. I'm, I'm sure, of course, they Did will. Did you read the last one? <laughs> Studies it at night, I suspect, <laughs> Mr Stone. Because um, we publish it. Very I'm good. Sure we'll publish this one too. So if you want to raise issues about it, it would be good to do that while I'm here. Certainly. I, unfortunately, I've only got half an hour, so I'll cover as much as I possibly can. And you have. Uh, seven minutes now, Senator before Watts, we, before so the tea that break. is before we go for tea, so I will give you the call. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming along. Um, can we start with the Emergency Response Fund? Um, and I just want to clarify a couple of things to begin with. The One of the questions on notice, I think, arising from the last estimates, which you've since answered, said that it was a question on notice F069 um, that as of the 7th of December 2021, $50 million had been dispersed from the Emergency Response Fund to, I've forgotten the name of the account, it's a COAG account, I think. Yeah. Is that, that's still, that's still the only disbursement that's been made from the ERF to that COAG fund? Well, when you say disbursement, there's been commitment of another yeah. 50 and another 50 after that. Yep. So the accurate picture is that 150 million has been committed, mm -hmm. including an announcement that the minister made on Saturday at Batemans Bay. Well, no, including an announcement she made today about. No, some, so so uh, the bushfire recovery grants were Saturday. That's right. Um, and outlining that um, the next tranche of the 50 million dollars will be going to. Um, coastal and estrine yep. resilience projects as a result of um, discussions with the states. That's yep. where they want the money and to And that was Sunday. Yeah, and Sunday. I, will, I will have some questions yep. about that. But of course. The, so, yeah, you're right. So far, there have been three commitments of $50 million from the ERF, mm -hmm. being two rounds of the flood mitigation program and the new announcement about coastal erosion. You can't describe the first 50 as a commitment. The money has started to go out. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I announced the first 9.4 million for the uh, Levy Bank in Catherine, yep. and I did that towards the latter part of last year. Yep. So it's not just an announcement; it's we work in conjunction with the states and the territories to yep. actually progress the expenditure of the funds. Yep. So, so sorry, just to be clear, the first 50 is out the door in early December. The second 50, um, and Viv, you'll be able to go to the details of this, is in. Stages of discussions with states. Yep. Um, and um, well, the third 50, we're um, opening guidelines shortly, and yep. that'll. Okay, so let's just step through it. So, round one of the flood mitigation program, $50 million, was announced. Applications were received, decisions were made, commitments were made yep. for that $50 million. $50 million was dispersed from the Emergency Response Fund to the COAG Fund which would then be distributed to the successful recipients. How much has all of that 50 now been given to recipients? Because I think the last time we talked about this, or well, the last figures I've seen were that, were that 17 million had been um, distributed to recipients. So I'm interested to know an update on that. Senator Viv Johnson, Executive Manager of Policies and Programs. 
Um, so yes, Senator, by December the 7th, the full 50 million was dispersed from the Coag Reform Fund through to jurisdictions. And how much of that money has then found its way to the successful applicants rather than maybe sitting with states and territories while they... So states Isn't and that? territories are currently finalising their implementation plans and they will be provided to us within the next uh, couple of months. And uh, to date, three projects have already commenced, two in South Australia and one in Victoria. Okay. Do you remember, I think it was partly in response to statements that the opposition had made about the ERF that I think, Minister, you wrote a letter to Mr Albanese which said that $17 million of the ERF funding had been distributed to, I'm not sure if it was to states and territories or to the recipients. No, it had gone out to different states and territories because we're in a sort of a, it sits in that fund yep. and then we go and have um, contractual negotiations and conversations with states yep. and territories. So at that point, um, some states we landed, others were we were still waiting. It wasn't until the 7th of December that mm -hmm. we were able to say, right, um, we've got all of them. And my understanding is we've got 22 projects across the country. Yep. And that money is now sitting out there with states and territories. Yep. And what you're saying is that in November or whenever it was, that 17 million had been distributed to the states and territories. Now it's 50. Yep. Um, being all out of the, the round, round one. Yeah, being yep. all of the round one funding. Mm -hmm. And do you have a dollar figure? You said that three of those projects have now commenced. Yes, Senator. Um, was there something about two projects, or, or was it yeah, two so, in South Australia? So sorry, and one two in, in South Australia. Yep. Uh, that total 3.18 million. Yep. Um, and one in Victoria has commenced, which is a 1.2 million dollar project. Okay. So of the 50 million that has been distributed to the states and territories now, how much has then been? Um, passed on by them to the successful applicant? So I, I think, Senator, it's probably fair to say that most of the projects um, are working through the implementation plan stage. Uh, what that means is that they need to provide us with the implementation plan within the next couple of months. Uh, the ones that I've referred to that have commenced it has it means that they've started the preliminary phase, so they're pre-construction activities. Uh, and, and as the states obviously finalise, finalise the implementation plans and the contracts to put in place their projects, um, then the money will flow from the jurisdictions to those proponents. OK. And I think you said it was 22 successful applicants in round one? Yes, 22 projects. And three of those projects have commenced? Yes. Uh, how many projects do you expect to have commenced by the end of this financial year? Uh, I think, Senator, we would have expected all of them to have commenced by the end of this financial year, pending obviously trade, um, trade shortages and, and any contractual sort of uh, issues that, that states might have. Um, they obviously need to go through their own proper tender evaluation processes uh, and, and run through those projects. And I, I take it that uh, none of those projects have been completed yet, if only three have commenced? N no, Senator. Yeah. They haven't been completed. I'm happy to wait until after the break to resume. Thank you very much, Senator Watt. Um, we'll break for tea now and the committee will suspend and we'll be back here at 9.30 continuing with NRAA. Thanks all. get going again. The committee will reconvene. Um, and Senator Watt, you have the call. Thanks, Chair. Um, so just where we were going through the emergency response fund. So round one of the flood mitigation program was announced, I think it was the 1st of December 2020. Um, and what you've said is that more than 12 months later, here in February 2022, three projects of the 22 announced have commenced. Is that correct? Yes, Senator. It is. Um, does that seem a bit slow to you? Um, Senator, I think uh, previous experience in, in construction projects uh, that I have, I actually don't think it is particularly slow. It takes quite a long time um, to, to work through all the tender processes. 
um, and and have projects that are uh, quite um, complex yeah, in their build uh, work through in, in the way that the, I'm sure the jurisdictions are working through. So, Minister, I appreciate it was before you were in the role, but round one of the flood mitigation program was announced at the start of the 2020 disaster season. Um, that came and went. We've just, we're, we're nearly at the end of the 2021 22 disaster season, mm. and only three of these projects have commenced. Surely it would have been better to get this moving more quickly and start earlier, so that these communities could actually have these projects built to protect them from disaster seasons? Well, Senator, um, this government's taken the unprecedented step to actually set up an agency like the NRRA uh, to, for the first time in our nation's history, uh, get the droughts and flooding rains cyclical nature of the way this country runs, uh, have a federal agency wholly and solely focused on dealing with that. That's the first time. Uh, so you go to how, how long the first ever tranche of um, resilience focused money uh, is rolled out, um, taking too long. Uh, I wouldn't agree. I would obviously say that uh, it's taken the time it's taken, and anyone that's tried to wrangle seven states and territories uh, on the page understands that that doesn't happen quickly. And bearing in mind this was the first time uh, this type of project and program had been commenced. I'm confident that whilst that may have been uh, the first round, I'm very confident, having come to the portfolio in the last six months, that we've got round two out the door, uh, guidelines for round three, are going to be uh, commencing very, very quickly. And um, we've done that level of consultation. We now have those relationships with state and territory uh, governments so that uh, this is now a process they well understand uh, that this will happen in a much more timely manner, which I think is really exciting for generations to come. Shane, did you have anything else? Oh, round to round add? two, I think you said that round two, you've got that out the door. That's not correct. You've only just closed applications for round two and you haven't announced the successful applicants for round two yet. So let's come back to round one. 9.4 million for the Catherine Levy. Money paid sitting in Northern Territory Treasury. Do I have the authority to go to the Northern Territory and crack the whip? No, I don't. That is responsibility of that government. And that's how this works. So what are we to do, Senator? We fulfil all our obligations. We track it through. We try to progress it as quickly as we can. Still no levy wall, hmm. but the money's sitting in Northern Territory Treasury. My, my, Mr. Mr Stone, I don't think you need to feel defensive about this. My criticism is of the government and the last I knew, you were not an elected representative of this government. That's correct, isn't it? I'm defensive because of the hard work that my officers put into trying to progress these projects. And sometimes it's a step forward and a step back, and we get as frustrated as you might. But we do our bit. And when we deliver money to state and territory governments and they then don't perform, I ask the question again, what are we to do? Do we abandon the program? Do we tell them that we will take the money back? I mean, I, I'm all ears. Um, what are, how do you get some of these jurisdictions to get on with it? Well, I suppose that's why you paid the big buck, Mr Stone, to work that out. <laughs> Ms Johnson, did you, you, I think you said that three projects had commenced. Um, did you also say that they're in pre-construction phase or was that other projects? That's correct, Senator. So, so those three projects are in pre-construction pre phase. phase? So they actually haven't commenced in the sense of things being dug or built? Well, so in the sense of all of these projects, Senator, have the different phases, pre-construction and then obviously construction phase and completion, um, they'll all work through those milestones. So how many jobs have been created from these projects so far if they're only a pre-construction phase? I don't have that information, Senator. I'll have to take that on notice. OK, thanks. Now, dealing with round two, um, when, as I said, Minister, 
round two applications have just closed, mm. when are you expecting to make, or, or what process is there for deciding who will be successful? Yeah, well, I think I'll throw to the agency for the actual process. They're the ones in direct negotiation. Mm -hmm. um, so, Senator, the process uh, is that uh, next week uh, we have a technical advisory panel uh, meeting and then a program review panel that will make an assessment of uh, all the applications that we've received. Um, the panel's deliberations then will be summarised by, uh, by us and consolidated into recommendations for the Coordinator General to consider. Um, and those recommendations will then uh, be passed to the Minister for her consideration and approval as the decision maker. So ultimately it will be the Minister's decision? Yes, Senator. Um, based on recommendations from the department? That's correct, Senator. Or from the agency. Um, how many applications have been received for the second round of funding? Uh, 37 applications. For, and what's the total value sort of those 37? I'm assuming that goes beyond the 50 million that's available. It's 80 million, Senator. 80 million. Um, but if I could just clarify that uh, in terms of past experience, we've certainly seen that some applications we receive are actually not eligible for mm. guidelines. So until we work through the assessment process next week, um, uh, I think we won't know that. Um, because that I think might be a better question on notice once the assessment mm. process yep. has been so, completed. To yep. get, uh, because to, to assume that all of those projects and therefore all of that money is um, eligible under the guidelines. Yep. Um, could you please table a list of the applications you've received? That, uh, that information was previously provided by EMA when it had carriage of round one. Well, we'll take that on notice, yep. Senator. Um, as I say, EMA did yep. provide that so information. So we'll have a look at that and we'll take it on notice. Thank you. Turning to yesterday's announcement about the coastal erosion, coastal and estuarine risk mitigation program. Um, so to be clear, that is a, that's allocating the 2022-23 lump of $50 million available for mitigation. For projects, um, and that, that, that decision was arrived at from talking to states and territories. What, what, where do you want this resilience funding to go? What sort of projects? And you would appreciate um, being the shadow that local councils are often responsible for a lot of this stuff. So when we're looking at the coastal inundation, it's about building seawalls. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're looking at estuarine environments, it's more nature-based solutions such as planting trees um, or landscaping. Right. So that was the sort of consensus of the states and territories, was it, that that's what they wanted the money that's for? That's my advice. Right. Yep. Because I think, I think Minister Littleproud, when he was in the portfolio, said that the, um, the real pressure from states and territories was for flood mitigation in general. So has something changed there in terms of what the well, states and territories We've put $100 million dollars towards flood mitigation to partner with states and territories. Um, one of the changes I've made within this space is to actually ensure that uh, future rounds of the Emergency Management Fund will actually require uh, states and territories to actually go out to local councils because they're often on the ground dealing dealing with these issues specifically. Mm -hmm. um, Viv, did you have anything to add to that? So, and do you, is it answers by the, this will be an application based program as well? Yeah, same process. Yep. Yeah. But I would expect, given we're talking about funding that's not available till the next financial year, applications won't be called for until that financial year starts. Guidelines will be um, opening in, well, a week, a little March. over a week, yeah. uh, start of March. Um, and then closing, and obviously we'll be looking at assessing those applications uh, June, July, mm. August. Right. So you will be calling for applications before the end of this financial year. Yes, the guidelines will to be spend released. money in the next financial year. Yes. Right. Um, but you don't anticipate that the assessment of those applications will happen this financial year. Well, not on based on past experience. No. No. We okay. hope it'll be quicker given that we're all um, a little more au fait with the process. Mm -hmm. the, um, 
So that obviously uses all of the next financial year's mitigation allocations. So there won't be any other money available from the ERF for bushfire mitigation or for flood mitigation. Well, this and this, I would actually point you to the um, Coordinator General's opening statement. I'd actually point you to the Coordinator General's opening statement to make the assumption that there's no money available for further um, bushfire recovery or resilience from the government because the $50 million of the ERF has been allocated in partnership with states um, really sends a, a message, I think, to particularly vulnerable communities and individuals uh, that we, we don't have an, um, a plethora of options available. And we've, I think, demonstrated as a government and in conjunction with state governments, a willingness to stand and fund a range of projects through a range of programs. I mean, the, the bushfire recovery grants, which were announced um, on Saturday, go to that mid to long term planning. So we stood with a, quite an extensive response, uh, $2.9 billion, is it? Um, 2.5 of which has been um, uh, committed uh, with these communities in the re early response phase, and now we're getting into that longer term recovery and building long term resilience uh, through the program um, re released on Saturday. And we're going to continue to do that. Okay. The, um, just turning to, uh, so am I right then also that at this point in time, the emergency response fund has not released anything for disaster recovery? It's, it's for resilience projects. Well, no, the ERF is structured to fund both disaster recovery up to 150 million a year and resilience up to 50 million a year. So my question is about the recovery aspect. Am I right that at this point in time, no funds have been expended from the ERF for disaster recovery. Shane? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Senator Nick Padavan, Chief Operating Officer. <coughs> so the emergency response fund, as we discussed, the last estimates is the fund of last resort. Yep. DRFA, a range of other mechanisms are available. Um, so there's several billion dollars that have gone out through other programs, and at this stage there has been no identified requirement to call upon the recovery component of the emergency response fund. Yeah. So to put it simply, and I understand the reasoning. Yeah. Um, but to put it simply, at this point in time, no money has been allocated from the or spent from the, the emergency response fund for disaster recovery. So let me give you an example. Well, it's a yes or no question. No, it's not. Well, the answer is yes. No money has been expended. No, no, no. You're not understanding. I mean, money. So I mean, well, sorry, Senator. With respect. Monies are allocated for different weather events. You take the example of North Queensland, <coughs> where a certain amount of money was set aside and it wasn't all taken up, which meant that we were able to repurpose monies, which we've been doing, and the Minister has supported the repurposing of that money in other areas, mainly in North Queensland. So mm. if you're able to repurpose and shuffle money around, you don't need to go to that other fund. It is a fund of last resort. I understand the argument, but the, it is a factual statement that at this point in time, Mr Padavan, no money has been expended from the ERF for disaster recovery. That is correct. Uh, that is correct, sir. No requirement Thank you. has been identified to spend money. Thank you. And at this point in time, while money has been committed and announced for mitigation projects, no projects have been completed and there are three projects only that are in pre-construction phase. That, that is a factual statement. Ms Johnson, based on what you said? Yes, Senator. Thank you. But it's also correct, isn't it, based on the figures that were on the Finance Department website the other day, that as of the 31st of December 2021, the ERF has earned the government $836 million in investment returns. That, that is a fact. Mm -hmm. Yes, is, Senator. Thank you. Right. So this fund has been in operation for three years, not a cent spent on disaster recovery. I know you say you give reasons for that. 
Not a single disaster mitigation project completed, but we're now up to over $800 million that it's earned for the government. So, Minister, isn't it clear that all this fund is doing is actually racking up money for your government rather than helping disaster victims? Well, our government has stood shoulder to shoulder with affected communities, whether it's cyclonic activity, whether it's floods, whether it's bushfires, you wh whether indeed it's project. COVID. This fund has earned well, Senator, $800 the, the million. The officers dollars. have actually walked you through the process of how long it has taken to get jurisdiction. It's taken three years and we haven't got a single project to show for it. So, Not Senator, a single Senator, dollar spent Senator on recovery. Watt, the Minister's Senator, answering you've your been question. walked through the process. It is not for a lack of will on this government's uh, behalf or indeed the agency to actually seek to get these projects up and running. And I'm confident that the more rounds we're running out of the uh, ERF, the quicker they are going to land in projects. Um, because we've never done this before. We've never done this before. And as the Labor Party knows, because you voted for this legislation, we didn't vote for it this, to do nothing. this fund is working exactly as it was designed no, no, to do. No, no. And you did not no, no. move amendments on the floor that is not, well, we to actually change did. the way no, no, that it was is, designed Sorry, Minister, you're wrong. Work. You, you are actually wrong. The, fund. the reason there is mitigation funding available is because of amendments that we moved. I moved the, re the reason this fund has been set up and designed, it's working the way it's meant to be working, and we have supported communities affected by dis disasters to the tune of you know, t over $12 billion in DAFRA alone in partnership with states. Senators, I'm just going to jump in here. Senator Watt, you've been going for almost 20 minutes, and I know Senator McMahon has a very short tranche of questions. Yep, happy to wait. So, uh, you're happy to pass the call to Senator McMahon? Well, I've got, I, have, I was going to ask some questions about the bushfire recovery grants, but I'm happy if Senator McMahon okay. wants to... Senator McMahon? Yes. Um, I'll give the call to you um, and then we'll come back to Senator Watt. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I know we're short on time. Thank you. Um, can I ask, uh, how has the government supported individuals, businesses and entire communities to recover from the black summer bushfires? The, um, the first rollout was the local economic recovery grants. Um, the precise amount for them... 350 million. 350 million. <coughs> Thereafter, there were the grants that were recently announced and they are across a range of uh, organisations, local governments and the like. Um, when you round up the total amount that's been committed to um, bushfire recovery, it has now gone to 2.2 billion, Senator. And there is still money to come from New South Wales and also Victoria, but it's at their prerogative. They will decide when that money rolls out in Victoria. It's, um, Four point. Um, three, what's the number, Three point three million. Three point three in Victoria yeah. and in New South Wales. Uh, Twenty-eight point four, which will also. Twenty-eight point four. So those will have a comment. That will be in addition to what's already um, been rolled out. Uh, thank you. And can, can you give me an um, an outline of timeline of this process? Say again. Can you give me an outline of the the timeline? of the grants process and rollout? Well, in terms of the local economic recovery grants, um, I inherited that um, from the Bushfire Agency. Um, they had the courage at the beginning, I forget when that was uh, out there, but uh, we completed it. And that was uh, part way into, uh, we've been going seven months and it was about three or four months in, we got that done. And then, more recently, the uh, bushfire grants that were announced by Minister McKenzie on Saturday. And um, when did they open? It was, um, do you have that date, Pooh, the date yes, they opened? Yes, the, um, Senator, they opened on the 22nd of July in 2021. Um, and the original closing date was the 2nd of September, and, uh, and there was an extension. Uh, provided to communities, and so applications closed on the 6th of October 2021. Uh, can I just 
I know those were the original grants, not the ones that were just announced. Is that correct? I missed that. What you say? Sorry, Senator. Could you repeat the question for the officials? Yes. Yeah, so, can I just get a clarification? That timeline that was just given, that original grants, not the ones that were just announced on Saturday. No, Senator, they, that's the timeline for the Black Summer bushfire grants that were announced on Saturday. Um, so, sorry, are you saying that the grants that were announced on Saturday closed on the 6th of October last year? That's correct, Senator. Right. So, it's the amount that's been increased, not the timeline. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Over $100 million extra. Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I heard $2.2 billion in funding. Is that the original amount or is that the total amount including the extra $110 million announced on Saturday? That's everything from the very beginning, including the clean-ups, the additional support. Um, I mean, I, I do have a chronology which... Uh, I can provide um, uh, to you if that would assist, but not something to read out no, here. No, no, that's fine. No, that's fine. I think I've got a, a, a good handle on it. The extra 110 million that um, Minister McKenzie announced on Saturday, um, that, that will provide extra support um, and allow extra funding of people that had already applied for grants. Is that correct? That is correct, because the original program had an allocation of $280 million in total, and the minister through ERC was able to negotiate an additional $110 million in additional funding, and that delivered 524 projects, totalling $390,893,000 and 782 in funding for approval by the Minister, which was announced on, on Saturday. Uh, thank you, and I know we're short on time, but could you very quickly tell me about broader recovery and resilience support for other types of disasters? I'm sorry, Senator, I didn't follow that. I think Senator McMahon was... Sorry, I, I, she said broader types of, um, yeah, for other types of disasters outside of bushfire. Right. So, for Correct. example, um, the floods in North Queensland, they attracted their own suite of, um, of grants and supports. Um, more recently, you would have noticed that the floods from Moree up to the Queensland border at Gundawindi um, was DRFA funded. And then, of course, we had the other floods around Maryborough out to Gamere and Tansy. Um, and of course, in, in your patch, the washout of the Stewart Highway and of the road and the rail, that also attracted DRFA funding in different categories. And we've been dealing with similar um, disasters in, south, in um, other parts of South Australia, Western Australia, bushfires, and also interruption um, to the road network um, going across to Perth, which has caused major supply chain disruption. So the, the flexibility in the system, Senator, is such that we have a team of people who look to see what's required. We rely on the states and the territories to uh, work with us and our regional support officers, recovery support officers, who are also on the ground. And based on that, the Premier or Chief Minister of the Jurisdiction of the Day will write to the Prime Minister, requests will be made, that will be considered by Minister McKenzie, signed off and actioned. And I'm pleased to be able to say that more recently over Christmas, the flood issue um, around uh, Maryborough, Gamere, Tansy was all actioned within five days. So a uh, real testament to the officers who work right through Christmas and New Year to get that done. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Mr Stone. Um, that, uh, that's pretty good news for parts that are, are often affected by uh, natural disasters. So I'm very, very, very pleased to hear that. Um, 
Thank you, Chair. That, that covers all my questions. Thank you very much, Senator McMahon. Um, and I will give the call back to Senator Watt. And I'm sure he's very cognizant of the fact that we are running behind time quite badly. Senator, Senator before we start, can you just on the flood, on the, the RF, the money, the interest earned, doesn't go to consolidated revenue. No, I know that. No, well, no, well, this, this is where it just people are, up, It builds up in the It builds ERF. up to be used. And I think well, people. That, that's what you say, but it hasn't really been used so well, far. I mean, we've been using all these other, let me call them buckets of money, and we repurpose money. And I mean, we, let me tell you the disruption of the supply chain into the Northern Territory and also into Western Australia. We thought that might have been an opportunity, but uh, we were defeated by certain criteria not being met. Um, and there were some major economic casualties um, around trucking companies who were not able to operate. One particular company had 600 workers off work throughout all of this. So um, it's not as though it just sits idly and we don't turn our mind to it. Um, we do. But, it just, but you just don't spend it. Well, we. It, you it's turn an your easy. Mind to it, yeah, but it's an easy statement it, to make. You ruminate on it, and it's still. No, sits no, there. no, 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 no. We. This was a, a, a fund set up, as you well know, as a, a fund of last resort when all other I challenge sources you to find of funding, that in any of the legislation, uh, sources of funding, or... were actually unable to be accessed. And when you look at whether it's our response to the COVID disaster, billions and billions and billions of dollars um, the agencies got through the, out the door with the COVID disaster payment and the pandemic leave payment. The bushfire recovery, whether it's the DAFRA piece, whether it's the bushfire recovery grants, a raft of funding sources have gone to support individuals, communities and businesses, uh, not just in the immediate response, but to build that resilience over the longer term. All right. So I'm that the fund remains there, Senator Watt. But let's, let's take the example... For a catastrophic Chair, event. can you note I haven't asked a single question since right. you've given me the call? Yes. Thank Senator you. Watt, you um, ask a question. Uh, Senator, you. good call. The, um, I'll have to put a lot of my questions on notice uh, on a lot of the important programs like Preparing Australia and mm. other things. But mm. with the Black Summer bushfire grants, I don't think Senator McMahon covered this. Obviously now 524 successful applications have been selected and you have made announcements of the individual projects, Minister, have you? Uh, not announcements of individual projects. I, um, when I made the announcement in Wodonga yeah. on Saturday, I did announce the $1.9 million to the showgrounds there to house yeah. people. Um, but um, that list has become public today so on the NRRA website. The Grants Hub has a responsibility to make the contact and start negotiating the paper trail. Okay. Yeah. So there's Great. a reason for this. So there's a process that uh, the Grants Hub's going through. I just wanted to check before I said too much about it, that's all. Yes. So how many applications did the program receive? Uh, what's One, it, um, 1,187. Say so, so again? 1,187? One, yeah. 80. 80. And of which 524 were successful? Correct, Senator. Um, and what was the total amount of funding that was requested by those 1,180? Oh, I don't have that uh, with me, Senator. Okay, if you could take that on notice for us, yeah. please. But can I quickly tell you that the grants have determined eligibility. So if they didn't, if they weren't eligible, yep. they weren't then up for consideration on sure. merit and need. So some of those 1,180 might not have been eligible. They weren't. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Um, maybe if you could come back to us on notice mm -hmm. as to how many were eligible. Sure. Um, when was the list of successful applicants finalised? Uh, I signed the brief, uh, I think it was Friday morning last week. So the brief, um, and sent, uh, Shane can go, sorry, the coordinator general can go to the process of assessment mm. of those applications. Um, a brief arrived in my office Thursday mm -hmm. uh, with recommendations and I made my decisions and signed off on that on Friday morning. Senator McMahon sort of touched on this. When Minister Littleproud initially announced this grants program in April last year, he said that funding would be dispersed from, the, from December 2021. It's taken an extra two months for that to happen. What's the reason for the delay there? Yeah, I'll let Shane answer that. Um, the Minister was successful in negotiating an extra 100 million. So 
we were dealing with a finite number, all of a sudden we had substantially more, which was another reason why we wouldn't have to go to that fund that you keep cross-referencing, because the RC and Cabinet took the view, yes, there is an unmet need, and uh, consequently the workload blew out for the panel that was considering the applications on merit and need. So even, even though extra funding was allocated to top up the Black Summer grants, clearly there have been several hundred applicants who were eligible who have missed out. So there are 1,180 applicants. Well, I think that's a applicants. false assumption, yeah. actually. Well, I, I'm assuming that 600 of them weren't ineligible. There was a very large number that were not eligible. We'll give you that on... Yeah. We'll take that on notice. We, we have the figures. We, there's no secret about who was eligible, not eligible. And then it then came to the panel, and the panel considered them on the basis of whether it was a strong application, a good application, or marginal. Sure. And we went through them. Could you, could you on notice, come back to us with what the criteria were and how you scored them? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. We did have a or scoring the, the system. the Grants Hub might have done that. No, no, no. You we, did that? Our okay. panel, which comprised independent members, also had a, a scoring system, as did the Grants Hub. OK. So... It was a very robust post okay. process. OK. But assuming, and I am only assuming, that there were projects that were eligible that missed out on funding, even with the extra funding that was provided, why wouldn't you use the money that's available in the ERF for recovery to support those projects? It's sitting there available. Except that, I, I, look, my, my view would be, based on having sat and read every application, that some of them were so marginal, you would question whether the taxpayer had an expectation as to their, whether that was a, a, pro, a good use of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we do expect people to have a, a project management plan we do expect them to demonstrate capacity to be able to deliver on the project and achieve within a timely fashion the completion of the project. So we tried to err on the side of accommodating as many people as we could and organisations. OK. Um, as I say, I am going to need to put a few other questions on notice, but just to wrap up, um, Mr Stone, do you consider yourself to be an independent public servant or a political player? I am an independent public servant who is very passionate about the team of people I lead. OK. Is, that, is the team of people you lead, do you mean in the NRRA yes. or in the LNP or CLP? No, no, no. In the agency. Right. People who work 24-7, people who work right through Christmas and New Year. And I've got to tell you, Senator, when they see some of the statements, and it's in my opening statement there, some of the statements that are made, they get quite depressed about it. But you know what's even more important? It's the survivors, because they believe what they see on TV or hear on the radio or read in newspapers, and they start to lose hope because they think they're being dudded. Mm. Well, Senator, they're not being dudded. Well, well, you and I will continue to disagree about that. All right, that. well... The, but you, you're saying that you consider yourself to be an independent public servant, not a political player. I, I'm, not, I'm not a political player, Senator. Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm not only asking about that about because of your political background, but I noticed in an article in The Australian on February the 6th this year, so only about a week ago, you mm. were quoted as saying that Prime Minister Scott Morrison is one of the most authentic public figures I have ever worked with. Correct. Is that, is that appropriate for an independent public servant to be Correct. making those kind of partisan statements? Well, I don't consider that partisan. I consider that a statement of fact, because the reality is that I can go to this Prime Minister on every range of disaster confronting this country, and he acts. And I want to acknowledge that and tell my fellow Australians that we are responding in a way that puts the survivor first. Can you point me to any other independent public servants in this who work for this government who have made public statements describing the Prime Minister or any minister or any politician as the most or one of the most authentic public figures I've ever worked with? Well, Is there any other public servant who makes comments like that? I did like ask the question of a couple of very experienced secretaries, and they said there is a group of people like you 
whether it's Rod Sims or it's the commissioner of the ATO, and they reeled off the names and said, they all make public comments because that's part and parcel of the advocacy for their agencies. Well, they make public comments, but I'm not sure they make public comments uh, political in nature like this one. I mean, this article goes on to say, Mr Stone told The Australian that after the leaking of the text from National's leader and Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce, written when he was a backbencher and describing Morrison as a hypocrite and liar, he, you, thought he would, quote, join the fray. Is it appropriate, Minister, for an independent public servant like Minister Stone to join the political fray? I didn't say I'd join the fray. Well, that's the quote. The journalist says I joined the fray. No, 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 this is a direct quote from you, and I'm happy to table the article if you'd like to see it. Minister, is it appropriate for an independent public servant to be joining the fray? Well, I think um, the Coordinator General's made uh, his views very, very clear. Um, when, and I think that part of that experience and the passion that you've seen here tonight uh, was forged during uh, the Northern Queensland floods. Not when during his 30 odd years of service to the country, the Liberal Party and the Liberal Party. Senator when he and the Prime Minister flew question. over thousands of hectares full of carcasses of animals and beasts that have uh, been washed through the flood, went and actually met with community members affected in, in that terrible aftermath of that particular event. And I know that the Coordinator General feels very deeply about having, similarly to the Prime Minister, a, a local approach uh, driven by local need and local concern. And that's what he's been able to bring to his role and what I think he appreciates about the Prime Minister's uh, role in this space that we Chair, look Chair, after together. I might, I might be experiencing a sort of episode of cognitive dissonance here, but the, the minister's answer bore absolutely no relationship to Senator Watt's question. I'll give you um, another. And, and you should direct it or answer the question. I, I disagree with your assessment there, Senator Ayres, but we might give the call back to Senator Watt to wrap up. Well, I'll um, give you another one, Minister. So again, in, further down in this article, Mr Stone describes the Prime Minister as, quote, the real deal. Again. Minister, do you consider that it's appropriate for an independent public servant to refer to a Prime Minister or any politician as the real deal as he joins the fray? Can you think of any other public servant who has made public statements of that kind? Uh, not, it doesn't come to mind, no. no I I'll can't. take that on notice, Senator Watt. And I noticed, Minister, uh, Mr Stone, you were present for Minister's the Minister's announcement on the weekend? I was. Yeah. Is it common, Minister, in your experience for independent public servants, public servants to stand with Ministers to make those sorts of announcements? My experience is that politicians make announcements and public servants don't because of the political nature of those announcements. But Mr Stone was front and centre well, of that I'm announcement. Is that, is that normal practice for independent public servants in this government? Well, I think when we've made uh, announcements in this particular portfolio area, of course, uh, the Coordinator General would be sensible to have him there uh, to answer the detailed questions. Um, we've got a suite of um, officers right around the country who often join us for these announcements. So, you know, I don't see anything wrong I've with never that. Seen, it's been a long I've time. never seen the Secretary of the Prime Minister's Department stand next to Mr Morrison as, he ma as he's making a funding announcement or the Secretary of the Infrastructure Department. That's normally what ministers do. Well, in this case, uh, Coordinator General Stone's been out and about on the ground, has a wealth of lived experience in this space, and it was highly appropriate for him to be at the announcement. Front and centre. Absolutely. And can I tell you, you haven't acknowledged my eulogising of the former Premier Anna Bly in two oh, drought like forums one, Senator Watch, where I have spoken very highly of the role that she played in forging QRA and QRIDA into existence in Queensland on a bipartisan basis with then opposition leader um, Lawrence Springborg. So both sides. They're, they're, they are an agency, not a department, which is why you wouldn't see the secretary. And I think um, it, I personally think it's great when 
people get out of Canberra and get on the ground out in the regions. So I might just, just, just follow up. Very quickly, Senator Ayres. I mean, you may think it's great, Minister, but I was listening carefully to what Mr Stone was saying about the disappointment that some of the staff of the NRA feel about uh, how these matters are canvassed in the public. I, I've read Mr Stone's opening statement carefully, as promised, and it's a case in point. Um, I sh should indicate there's no page seven. It may be, Minister, that you've pulled it out. It, it might have been even hotter than some of the other pages, but... <coughs> But Sorry, what are you page suggesting, there is no, there is no what are you page suggesting? seven. I'm suggesting that there's no page seven, and that the rhetoric in the rest of it is Sorry, hyper. Page, is, what are you talking about? There is no page seven in the document. There is a page six and a page eight. No, there's a seven. Well, not not in the document oh. that's been provided to us. Oh, I've got a seven. You want and, my seven? And it. We might and, get you. And they the, want your page seven, seven photo. And, and the rhetoric. The there political rhetoric. Excuse me, Brooke, can you come and get the, page yes. seven? The political rhetoric in here is extraordinary for a public servant. It, it talks about repeated false claims. It says claims that have, that have been made by uh, uh, opposition spokespeople, including, I assume, Senator Watt and probably me, are completely untrue. It says. $150 million is available each year for emergency response if existing arrangements are not enough. And Mr. Shane, Mr. Stone, in his judgment, says in his statement, as a supposedly independent agency head, to date they have been enough. It goes on. Which is true. And it goes on and on and on. Is there it a talks question, about Senator misinformation, Ayers, going on and on? political point scoring, and one upmanship. It's not sustainable for Mr Stone to continue uh, if he doesn't understand his independent role. They're the kind of comments you expect to see from ministers and elected politicians, not from independent public servants. I'm it's out just, there fighting for survivors, Senator. Well, fighting for survivors. But, and perhaps in the political fray. No, out in the broader community, whether it's floods, cyclones, fires, I will give them my best. And that includes making sure the misinformation stops. Including sticking up for the Prime Minister in the, in the national broadsheet. Well, why wouldn't I? He is authentic. That'll do us. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Senator Ayres. And You've got me marked anyway, haven't you? No. Yes, you have. Order. What are you talking about? Order. Yeah, um, and let the record show that, um, or the Hansard <laughs> show, I should say, I'll get my terminology correct here, that um, there was a page seven missing in the version of your opening statement that was circulated to senators, but we now have Mr. Stone, oh, sorry, Coordinator General has passed it to the Secretariat, and that will be that missing page seven will be provided to other senators. Thank you very much to the NRA for attending this evening, and we will now swiftly move on to the Australian National Audit Office. Oh, I. And thank you, thank you Minister so McKenzie. Madam Chair and Committee. We might just suspend, um, given we're swapping ministers this time. Get something. <laughs> Don't say that, Matt. Right, the committee will now um, reconvene with the Australian National Audit Office. Uh, I welcome Senator the Honourable Jonathan Dunningham, Assistant Minister for Industry Development, Mr Grant here, Auditor General of Australia and Officers of the Australian National Audit Office. Uh, Auditor General, do you wish to make an opening statement? No, thank you, Senator. Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, Senator Ayres, I will give you the call. Thank you. I have a few questions, firstly, about the... Um the Home Affairs Safer Communities Program. I think a report was tabled today uh, in the parliament. Um, just not sure who. Thank you, Mr Boyd. So can, can you confirm that across all of the relevant funding rounds, I think, I think the officers said 
applications were not assessed fully in accordance with the guidelines and funding decisions were not appropriately informed by departmental briefings and for the majority of decisions, the basis for the decisions was not clearly recorded. Uh, Brian Boyd, Executive Director, Performance Audit Services Group, Australian National Audit Office. That's Thanks, Mr Boyd. Reasonable summary, Senator, probably on the last point, 54%, so just over half. So more than half of funding decisions could be characterised in the way that I've just read out. Indeed, Senator. And this, uh, this uh, fund was overseen by Minister Dutton at the time. That's right, isn't it? Uh, no, Minister Dutton was one of the decision makers. There were five rounds, eight selection processes. If I take you to a table at the end of, I guess, chapter two in the Thank audit you. report, we actually outline there who was the decision maker for each round. So it's table 2.2 .2 in the audit report on page 32. So there's, the audit report raises an issue around, in some cases, the minister who actually made the funding decisions wasn't mm. necessarily the minister identified in the guidelines, but putting that to one side in respect... Well, so, sorry to interrupt you. It's pretty hard to put that to one side, isn't it? Oh, I wasn't suggesting it was irrelevant. I was saying in terms yes. of your question about who made sorry, the decisions, continue. I'm saying yes. in terms of who made the decisions for round one, it was the Minister for Justice, which was Minister Keenan at the time. For round two, it was the Assistant Minister for Home Affairs. For round three, of which there were two streams, an early intervention stream, which was for PCYCs and the like, and an infrastructure stream, that was Minister for Home Affairs on both occasions, which is Minister Dutton, who you're referring to. Round four was the Assistant Minister for Home Affairs, and there were five streams in round five, each of which the decision was made by Minister Wood. It's true that... Um that Minister Dutton made sure that two projects in his own electorate were funded, even though the experts didn't recommend them, isn't it? No, I don't, not in, I, I believe what you're referring to, Senator, is in the report we talk about the two Tasmanian projects which were announced during a by-election campaign and then yes. subsequently applied through this program. It's not in the Minister's own electorate, which of course is in... No, I was gonna, I'll come to the Braddon ones. So, well, let's just go straight to those then, given the time. Um, Minister Dutton announced funding for two projects in the lead up to the Braddon by-election with a then Liberal candidate, despite the grant guidelines not being written and without expert safety advice from his department. That's a reasonable summary of what happened? Um, probably an incomplete summary, Senator. As we set out in the audit report, the department went through an exercise after that happened of presenting options to the minister in terms of do you wish to, um, if you like, separately carve out an arrangement for these two to receive funding without any competition, or should they be invited to apply and compete with all other applicants through a competitive process, and the minister elected to go with the latter approach, which is how they were actually yes. then asked to apply and assessed. It was then through the assessment process. They didn't come up as being those assessed as the most meritorious, but they were selected for funding in any event. Minister, did you meet Minister Dutton um, after he took a $36,000 flight on a RAF jet to Tasmania to announce these grants? Yes. Uh, I don't believe so, no. Yes. Um, you tell uh, Mr Boyd, what I think you said before, what percentage of funding decisions weren't appropriately informed by departmental briefings? No, that was in respect of which percentage of the decisions the the basis for those decisions wasn't adequately recorded, if at all, that was 54 per cent. So okay. the, the issue in terms of being informed by departmental advice, in round one we were quite content with the advice in that ministers were actually told you know, this is how they compare against the actual selection criteria and given advice in that respect. Yes. From round two onwards they were given, they weren't given information against the actual published criteria, they were given a strengths and weaknesses broad discussion which the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines don't permit that approach. They say that the decision maker needs to be given advice which is specific to the grant guidelines and in particular mentions that has to be against the assessment criteria. And what about the percentage of funding decisions that didn't have a basis for the decision? I say that's the 54 per cent. That didn't have a recorded basis and that's another obligation under the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines that the basis for the decision be recorded, and it's not just any basis, it must be the basis against the program guidelines, which again comes back to the eligibility requirements and the assessment criteria. Senator, I think it's important, the point about 
a, about it being recorded. We can't make a statement or, about whether the decisions were made against the guidelines or not. All we can yes. go to is that there isn't there isn't a record of how the decisions were made. But but th but that in itself is appropriate record unacceptable. keeping is important for decision making. Yes, and there's a specific requirement in the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines which says that the decision maker must record the basis and that basis must address the program guidelines being the criteria. So there's an actual, and this was, this was actually specifically introduced when the grants framework came into being on top of the usual PGPA Act or FMA Act as it then was requirement for records to be made, there was an additional requirement put in for grants decision making to actually record that basis against the guidelines. Uh, I think we know from previous estimates rounds that at least during round three, which I think Minister Dutton was responsible for, I think that's, that's right, correct, isn't it? Senator, yes. Um, Ninety-one per cent of funding ended up in government-held, independent or marginal labour seats. That's correct, isn't it? Uh, y yes, Senator. If, we, if you look the, to the distri distribution section, which is in Chapter 4, we say if you, mm. if you put all the selection processes together, which means just aggregating them all across the various rounds, and there's eight selection processes, five rounds, nothing really stands out except for a, you know, a, number, a small number of those. One of those is Round 3, where certainly the extent to which you know, coalition projects and coalition seats did better than their, they rep were represented in the application popula population, as we point out, because that's the starting point here is if you, if you don't have an application, yeah. it's pretty hard to be successful. And, and if there's... So the, the round that Minister Dutton supervised, or one of them, 91% in seats that suited the coalition's political interest, that's not a figure from our report, Senator. That's, I'm saying from previous estimates, there's a, at least in, on your evidence so far this evening, there's a distribution that favours the kind of seats yep. that I described. So, so but the 91% is not our figure. No, I understand. I'm not sorry. Senator, I'm not, I think in our report, we, as Mr. Boyd said, we look. We've, our analysis is largely on the aggregate basis, and we look to see whether across the programs there was any uh, distributional bias. And set out in the report, we did. We find that the allocation is largely consistent with applications, as Mr. Wood said. In the other rounds, yes. So okay. if you go to paragraph 4.39, the first dot point talks about round three, where we say projects located solely in a coalition held marginal electorates and to a lesser extent coalition held fairly safe electorates represented a higher proportion of approved applications in both numerical and dollar terms than they represented in the application population. And the converse of that was funding awarded to projects located in safe electorates and fairly safe electorates held by the ALP was lower in comparison to the application population. And there's a footnote off that which gives you the actual percentages, but I say the 91% is not a figure we looked at, because where, because if you look at, I'm just trying not to bore you, Senator, but things such as the 91%, if you like, that's, that's analysis which is done based on, here's the decision, but from our perspective, the key thing in grants, decision making, as I said earlier, you have to have applications to make a decision maker decision on. So the key thing we do in our audit reports, which people can't do based on public data, is we look at what does the application population look like, what's recommended and what's decided to see whether there's any differences. Because of course, if all the applications you receive only have one political colour to them, if so facto everything, all the funding has to go there. So the key thing for us is to see if you like yeah, those, there's a, Yes, yeah. if you follow that through. And if that's the case and there's no reasons recorded for making funding decisions, and some of them are ineligible, well, it's pretty hard not to join the dots, isn't it? Well, that's, well, that's where we talk about the Commonwealth Grant Rules and Guidelines was designed to try and guard against <coughs> grant programs being in that sort yeah. of scenario, because you, you're required to have a set of program guidelines, they're required to have criteria departments, are required to do an assessment, they're required to brief on the merits as an outcome of that assessment, and decision makers either agree with that or if they disagree with that, they have to record the basis for why they disagree with that, again, against the guidelines. Yes. So you should have a closed loop which explains everything in a transparent way. Yeah, Minister, it's not a surprise that the government's knocked off an independent integrity commission, given this kind of evidence. Can I take... If uh, Labor can, would like to support the bill on the table, we'd happily have... The can I take you to another to. rorted... Um, Morrison Government Fund, um, the Urban Congestion Fund, 
Um, Mr Boyd, th this committee, or the references, Finance References Committee, conducted an inquiry into that matter last year, which reported late last year, and I think um, I, th I think you said um, that um, uh, people weren't asked to just bring forward their car park projects, they are asked to bring forward their UCF projects, which included car parks. The focus of our work after Chapter 2 of the report, which was on design more broadly, was on the car park component. Um, and I think uh, that the committee recommended that uh, the ANEO complete an audit of the entire UCF program as part of its 2022-23 audit program. Has, has there been any consideration, Mr Hare, of whether or not um, the ANAO will take that proposal under consideration as part of its forward work program? We've certainly been considering our forward work program and trying to put together a draft to circulate to the JCPAA in the next couple of weeks. So. And you're just not in a position to indicate what, what, what's on that list, is that right? I'd, I'd prefer to finalise the list before saying yes. what's on it. And we're, we're hoping to circulate it in with this month, I think, yes. by the end of this month. Can, can you tell, there was a, a question on notice, um, I think 0323, for the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, where they confirmed for us that they had not seen a top 20 marginals list related to the car parks program. Can, can you remind me, Mr Boyd, who, who did have visibility of that list? Was it just the Prime Minister's office and the Minister's office? So the list was, was um, prepared and within the Portfolio Minister's office. The um, evidence we saw that there were, there were discussions and engagement about that, but we didn't see, this isn't like, um, we didn't see examples of this list being sent back and forth, for example. So the Prime Minister and Cabinet say they didn't see it, but you're saying you can't, you couldn't see where, who, to whom it had been distributed? I have no evidence that it was distributed to PMO. I know it was prepared within the Portfolio Minister's office and was being used within our office to coordinate the, the canvassing process that went on. Do you know... Um, where this colour-coded spreadsheet went, Minister? The colour-coded spreadsheet? If um, you've been paying attention, the... Um, sorry, Senator, the, there's, no, the, there's no colour-coded the, spreadsheet yes, on... Well, the, the list so, of marginal... So your creative interpretation the, the, of what's been said here has backfired well, on you, Senator. Andy. The list of um, uh, projects and marginal seats that was prepared. So where did it go to? Yes. Well, not having been a part of this process, I don't know. Senator Ayres. I just want to ask you about some other reports. There's a ATO performance audit, I think, addressing superannuation guarantee non-compliance. Is that still on track? D d delivered mid-February, I think, was the... Jago Group Executive Director, Performance Audit Services Group. Um, that audit is expected to be tabled later in March. Later in March? Yeah, in late March. Um, I think the website indicated uh, last we looked in February. Is there, is there a reason for the delay? Just our team needing to finalise the, the audit. It, we are expecting to table it in March. Okay, and does the we do bulk updates of the website every few weeks, so I'll probably just yeah, 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 sure. And does the does the potential dissolution of the parliament coming up have any impact on the timing of the release of um, reports? The Auditor General Act requires audit reports to be tabled as soon as practical after they're completed. As long as it's not a double dissolution, we can still table reports. Oh, I see, because election. yes, okay. I have some questions for you about um, the Auditor General Report number 37, the Canstruct. Um, 
I think it's in, in relation to the procurement of garrison support and welfare services on Nauru. Um, so just for context, Cairns Drug International is a company run by a group of major Liberal donors who made at least 11 secret donations to the LNP, including personal fundraisers for Minister Dutton. And it was, of course, Minister Dutton who awarded Canstruck this contract, which is now worth over $1.8 billion. Um, when the contract was awarded, the company had no employees, it generated no revenue, held no assets, had no experience in delivering the kind of services that it was um, supposed to perform. Uh, and the department's own technical evaluation team concluded that Canstruct had, it said, not demonstrated sufficient technical understanding to provide the required services just a year before the company was finally awarded the contract. Um, I'm not asking you to comment on that background, but I think we had some discussion in the last estimates um, the, the department had engaged KPMG to conduct a financial strength assessment in relation to Canstruct International Proprietary Limited. You're aware of that? Yes, Senator. And, and the title of that document is Financial Strength Assessment of Canstruct International Proprietary Limited. And I think when the audit office reviewed that final financial strength assessment as part of its audit, it it understood that the assessment related to Canstruct International Proprietary Limited. That's correct, isn't it? That's correct. Um, but, but in fact, the assessment related to an entirely different entity, Canstruct Proprietary Limited. That, that's correct, isn't it? That's correct. And that company has nothing at all to do with the commercial arrangement between the department and Canstruct International Proprietary Limited? Um. I'm not certain that that's completely correct. Um, my recollection is, but it is just my recollection, that the, the company which the financial analysis was done on had provided some um, comfort to the department on um, the finances of Canstruct, but it, it wasn't a documented thing. So they, they were related parties. I think they provided entities, a financial guarantee. Or yeah. yeah. I think. I think. Um, I think that's right. I think in a question on notice following the last Senate estimates hearing, because we did go yes. backwards and forwards about this issue, the office said that the document entitled "Financial Strength Assessment of Canstruct International Proprietary Limited" was misleading. That's correct, isn't it? Um, it, it wasn't, from our point of view, the, the document appeared to, uh, we took it to relating to it, relating to an entity that, which it didn't relate to. That's yeah. I think, I think the office said, the department acknowledged that the evaluation documentation did not clearly identify the actual contracting entity yep. and stated yes. that would in future ensure that its documentation fully reflects all relevant yes. considerations. Yes. Um, but it's not just that the evaluation didn't clearly identify the actual contracting entity, is it? It's, it didn't identify the contracting entity at all. Like it's quite a serious problem. Um, it, the, it's hard for me to comment on things which we didn't audit. Um, yes. And you, you were provided with, with that documentation, which purported to be... And we didn't audit the documentation, so all we were doing yes. as part of the audit was looking at their due diligence, and there was four contracts that we audited, audited and we looked to see what the... Uh, comment on the fact that they, were, they purported to do financial due diligence on four entities. In the report, we point out that one of those entities, the due diligence wasn't done on the entity... Um, but, but so, sorry to interrupt, Mr. Head. That that was the only due diligence that was done. Wasn't that's, it? that's my understanding. Yes. My so, so a contract, for friends of the minister, 
donors to the minister that, that eventually turns into a $1.8 billion contract, the only due diligence that was done was for a company that you are not in a position to say bore any relationship to the to the entity that actually did that actually was contracted for the work. No competitive tender process. It's pretty hard to explain. We've set out. I'm not saying you did it. I'm saying you 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 have relied upon the material that the department's provided you, and that is a reasonable yep. thing yep. to do. Not a criticism of you. I don't. I don't understand how um, something that is so obviously improper has been allowed to come into being. It's a question, Senator Ayres. Well, it, it, you know, had a rising inflection at the end. I think, <laughs> I think it was. We might need a bit more than that. Um, um, I, I, I'm just going to jump in here. Um, we have 20 minutes to go. Senator Patrick has five minutes of questions for the ANAO and Senator Roberts has a ten minute block for the Digital Transformation Agency. So can you wrap this up in the next five minutes, please, Senator? Yeah, I think I think I can. Thank you. I know you can. The um, you so you've said that it, it, it's misleading. Was the was the financial strength assessment or information about the financial strength assessment. How, how, how was that provided to you? Was there an oath or affirmation? What, what, how, how do you... We access the documents. You just, in a search, you access the documents? Yes. Most, most of our auditing is done by cooperative processes, so the department gives us access to their systems and we access all of their documents. Are you satisfied that no offence has been committed here in the provision of the document? The not within the provision of the document. They gave us the document that existed. Um, subsequent conversations with them, they purport that they were aware of who, what the assessment was of at the time. Um, so you, you're saying in is, subsequent discussions that... The, but, the, that's, but we haven't audited any of this, so they're really more questions for Home Affairs than... But, but are they saying to you they were aware that it was... Uh, the incorrect unrelated entity or that they weren't aware? Sorry, I'll just have to check that. They were aware when it evaluated the request for quotation response that a construct related entity was the respondent. However, they acknowledged that their evaluation documentation did not clearly identify the actual contracting entity and that they'd work to ensure that that documentation fully reflects that in the future. So I'll tell you what it looks like, and, and I'm a bit mystified, I have to say, by the, given, given the answer to the question on notice, Mr Hare, I, I don't understand why the audit office hasn't gone back to this, because this is what it looks like to me. But, Minister Dutton and the Department of Home Affairs decided to award a contract that ultimately became a $1.8 billion contract to a company that had no staff, generated no revenue and held no assets without a competitive tender. So that decision was made before there was any due diligence of the company that was going to be provided this Rivers of Gold Commonwealth contract. After the decision was made, the department conducted a due diligence process, but there were no contingency plans put in place at all. And the due diligence process was of the wrong company. Um, and on the basis of that misleading assessment, the department gave Canstruct International a contract that was worth $1.8 billion worth of taxpayers' money. Um, and as I understand it, there's no security, no guarantees. The whole financial strength assessment process was a charade. Um, what, 
What, what steps has the audit office taken given the, the, the office has conducted the investigation and then had to sort of circle back and say, well, actually, this important aspect of the information that was provided to us was misleading. What steps have you undertaken to um, satisfy yourself that the way I've described this Last is not question, correct? Senator is. What um, we've done after the last hearing is engage with the, the department to get clear what the, um, what the financial assessment was and get the facts there. And we've put a note on to our audit report to point the reader to the fact that, that the um, financial strength assessment, which we believe did relate to Canstruct International, didn't, so that, that we provided clarity in our report on that, so the reader wouldn't, a reader wouldn't be misled on that. Our conclusion in the audit was um, about whether the department appropriately managed the procurement process for the garrison support on the basis of that particular piece of evidence changing, I don't believe it materially goes to the conclusion of um, our audit report. It's, um, it's not an unusual circumstance for a company to, to construct, to establish a, a separate contracting entity to enter into a contract. It's, it happens in contracting arrangements. Um, the due diligence wasn't, wasn't appropriate, but our finding with respect to the, the procurements for those four contracts that we looked at was, was that the department's approach was largely appropriate, and I think I'm still comfortable with that conclusion. Um. Okay. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Patrick, you have the call. I will be keeping you strictly to five minutes. Thank you. Auditor General, um, have you seen the letter that has been uh, uh, submitted to the JCPWA on the Leppington Triangle by the person who was investigated by the AFP over the acquisitions? I've, um, I've seen a, the submission was brought to our attention by the JCPWA. I'm not certain who it, came, so it comes from. Yeah, OK, so it's, it's redacted, uh, but it is the person who ended up getting investigated by the AFP. Uh, he or she, raises some very uh, concerning remarks. So I'll just read a couple of them. Uh, the Auditor General mistakenly placed the Leppington Triangle in an agricultural precinct, which would mistakenly infer a lower value for the property. The Auditor General mistakenly overlooked the differences in valuation standards as they apply to fair value and market value, and the Auditor General did not seek or have access to additional land valuation advice and therefore the Auditor General had no evidence that the land price was inflated. He, he goes on to say that, um, uh, he, he says that all public officials exercise due care. It is apparent that the Auditor General did not exercise a reasonable degree of care and diligence in publishing a conclusion without, without evidence that the Leppington Triangle price was inflated. This unreasonable contact, conduct may constitute negligence. So it's pretty strong uh, words. Yes. I wonder, have you, I mean, I, I don't want to ambush you with this. Have you, have you um, sort of looked at this and uh, thinking about going to have a re-look at this? What, what's your response to this going to be? Um, the JCPAA has asked us to um, put in a submission if we wished in response to uh, that submission that they uh, published on their website today, I think. Yep, which um, is where I got it from. Yep, and we're going to... So you are going to respond to this? Well, uh, my feeling at the moment is that we'll put in a submission to the JCPAA in response to, mm. to that. Be because it's not... You know, it, it, uh, evidence has been provided that supports his or her claims in relation to you know, what, um, what the office did. Some of it does, in my quick reading, um, some... As you know, our, when, when we do an audit, we go in and, and when we're auditing something like whether a department appropriately carried out an arrangement, mm. 
what we look at is what the department's records are for the arrangement. We, we don't go in and redo their work and test to see whether their work sure. was done. Um, we didn't do any valuations for this because all we did was publish what valuations had been done on the land, for example. So um, there's, there's a, there are issues like that which um, we can only go on the evidence that sits in the department at the time. So that, mm. we'll go through it all. And, sure. Um, I just wonder, in the original audit, noting this person is anonymised by way of the committee, but I'm sure you know who the person is because you know you made some. You, you, at the end of your audit, you raised concerns that were then referred, I think, to the police. Um, in your audit, did you actually? interview or contact or engage with the person involved or, or the, the, you know, that has made this submission? Last question. Yeah, no, it's not. Um, that's a really difficult question to answer because to answer it, I might go towards giving a view about who I think it might be, which may or may not be correct. Mm -hmm. um, our audit is carried out on the department mm -hmm. and uh, we work off the records predominantly whenever we do an, an audit and we engage with the department and whoever the department puts in front of us. We usually only go to the point of interviewing people and doing that if there is some gap in the record which we think is inappropriate because as you know in our legislation sort of the interview process tends to become a very formal one and we don't go there very often. And particularly in this one where I formed a view during the course of the audit that I couldn't understand things and we're not an investigatory body, so um, maybe the police should do it. I, I didn't want to go down that sort of formal route of interviewing people because that's... If the police were going to could do have that, prejudiced that, the, the, their, their investigation. But, <clears throat> I understand the difficult balance. All right, so... so okay. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Patrick, and thank you to the Audit Office for coming in this evening. Um, I'm sure other questions will be placed on notice for you. Um, and we will move very, very, very quickly on to the Digital Transformation Agency. Thanks, Rex. See you tomorrow. I welcome Mr Chris Fechner, Chief Executive Officer at the Digital Transformation Agency and other officers. Mr Fechner, given the late hour, if you have an opening statement, I might ask you to table it. <laughs> I'm happy, no opening statement. All good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Senator Roberts, you have the call until 11pm. Thank you, Chair. I'll cut you off. The Digital Transformation Agency has concluded an enterprise deal with Google in respect of Google Analytics 360. The Digital Transformation Agency charges Australian government agency websites for their Google data, which I assume is a cost recovery exercise. How much are you paying Google for this service? Either 2021 actual or 2022 projected, please. Uh, thank you for the question, Senator. So uh, the Google Analytics service is actually um, put in place to ensure that we actually have good information on the utilisation and feedback of government services. So it provides for the continuous improvement of our government activities. Uh, I will need so what, to... what does it cost? Uh, so uh, we have our head of procurement here, uh, Michelle Huck. Can we uh, take that number to find out what the actual costs are for Google Analytics? Take it on notice? Senator will take it on notice. Okay, thank, thank you. Google can obviously see all the data that you can see. After all, they just sell it back to you. 
On a normal private website, Google would be able to see identifying information for the website visitor or entity being IP address, device identification, sign in if they are logged into Chrome, etc. Google would then store that data in the data file they already maintain for that entity. Google's data file does not include names, but it does include locality, age, gender, employment, purchases, interests, travel, search and web history and much, much more. A Google adding data about private citizens who use a government website to Google's own data, data records? Uh, Senator, um, I'm happy to, to seek advice on that, but um, the, the actions of Google and those particular activities would be uh, subject to Google and any uh, prevailing laws. So it's quite easy for them to harvest the data because nothing precludes it, precludes them from doing so. Uh, Senator, uh, there, there are aspects of data. So the DTA generally refers to the digital components of these. There are some specific uh, data areas and they're subject to PM&C. So potentially that question could be referred to PM&C. Are we able to get them on notice from you? Uh, if it's an issue for PM&C, Senator, I'd, I'd, I'd say it would have to go on notice okay. for them. Thank you. Now let's change topics to uh, the Federal Government's Style Guide. This is of interest to the Chair. Recently, the Senate rejected the use of gendered language and sent the style guide back for review. Who instructed the Digital Transformation Agency to de-gender language in the style guide? Uh, Senator, the style guides have actually moved to be the responsible of the uh, Public Service Commission, Australian Public Service Commission. You need to refer those questions about the use of the style guide to them. Thank you. So I'd have to ask them for a copy of the hard copy of it. Uh, they're, they're responsible for the okay. management of the style guides. Okay. Okay, so let's turn to cloud.gov.au. This was an attempt, as I understand it, to create a single standard for cloud storage of data, including websites across the whole of federal government. Did I get that right? Uh, that was the original intention. Okay. Original. Okay, this project was shut in 2021. And the source code for this web standard was put into GitHub, which as I understand it is a repository for code, uh, freely accessible, where anyone can download it. Could a hacker learn anything about what could be in use in federal government websites and data servers based on the information that they can freely obtain and contained in the GitHub files? So Senator, the uh, purpose of cloud.gov.au was to produce a safe and secure and, and freely available um, to government entities access to cloud services environments. Uh, as that uh, capability has progressed, it was clear that the market was able to provide those services and the intent behind um, the security has been largely replaced with other components that we have, such as the hosting certification framework, which accredits uh, cloud service providers to make sure that, uh, that the controls that are in place for those services sit um, with government, so we have protections about where that data is stored, how it is transit, and who has access to it. So uh, cloud.gov.au became redundant in that, from that purpose. Yeah, I understand that, but apparently the source code for the web standard was put into GitHub where anybody can access it. Uh, Senator, it's, it's my understanding right now that the services that are used at, using that function are all being decommissioned or moved onto alternative platforms. But, but they're already there on GitHub, so uh, they, GitHub, they can access. Senator, GitHub is a repository for code services. It's not necessarily the, co it's not the code service itself, it's separate. Um, it, is, it is actually the description of the language and if it's going into those GitHub repositories and it's open source, meaning it's freely available, it really is um, in public domain. Much of it of GitHub is actually contributed to by other parties other than government and it becomes a community of development services. So why was this project cancelled? Uh, simply because of the because of the transition, so the highly available public cloud services, the high security associated with those things, and the addition of additional controls, such as the hosting certification framework that added specific controls to make sure that government was clear where government data was stored, how it was actually moved, and where that data um, was being managed by others, that, including third parties, that it was safe and secure in, that, in those locations. How much did this undelivered project cost across the project life, or the ARC, I think you call it, from January 2018 to September 2021? Uh, Senator, I can take that on uh, notice. notice. Thank you. So I, I commenced uh, in October 13, so it's a bit before my time for those specifics. 
Okay, so, okay, you and I are both scared of the wrath of the chairman, so we'll move on. <laughs> this is not the only terminal outcome of one of Digital Transformation Agency's programs. May I reference the whole of government platforms program, which was retired. Once again, the source code for the six different projects under this program was put into GitHub for anyone to download, but you've explained that. So my question is the same as before. No, you've explained that, that doesn't matter. What was the cost of the whole of government platforms program across its, its project arc or life? Uh, Senator, can I take that on yeah, notice sure. again? Last We're getting there, Chairman. Roberts. Chair? Last question. Okay. MyGov is a joint venture between Services Australia and the Digital Transformation Agency. The app is proving problematic at best with a rating of 2.4 out of five, which is on this graph here. So being less than half, that's a fail by my understanding. So I'm told, you know, we can see a pattern emerging here. Any attempt to modernise and standardise federal government data formats, storage and handling runs into apparently turf wars and gets terminated. Now we have the digital identity, and this is, I'm leading into the question, Chair. Now we have the digital identity, another of the Digital Transformation Agency's projects which will be part of life for every Australian and in many ways it will enable control of many Australians in their lives. So a rating of 2.4 won't cut it. How long will it take the Digital Transformation Agency to put in place the framework necessary for the digital identity to function at 5, not 2.4? How much will that cost and what are your chances of success? Uh, Senator, I, I think I'd like to seek a clarification on that. Mm -hmm. MyGov does not currently have an app that's in the public domain. They're currently in a private beta for it. Uh, there is no MyGov app that's currently available. Okay, so come to the question then. Um, there's a history of failures going on in this area of digital transformation. How long will it take the Digital Transformation Agency to put in place the framework necessary for the digital identity to function at five, a rating of five out of five, how much will that cost and what are your chances of success? Uh, so, Senator, just again to clarify, uh, the App Store ratings generally rate the particular functions in there. So the, the digital identity is a framework and it allows multiple providers to go through. Uh, part of that framework allows um, for the government to have a digital identity and that's the MyGov ID uh, as it currently stands. That, there is an app associated with that and that app is simply about ensuring that uh, people can enrol a digital identity for the government. Uh, its actual main purpose is to provide access to safe, secure services through government via that identity in place of um, providing other digital credentials. So uh, the use... Yes, yes, so it's a part of the aspect, but also the stepping up of credentials as well that sits in that space, Senator. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Roberts. That concludes the committee's examination of agencies for today. Thank you very much to the DTA for waiting around until 10 to 11. We really appreciate it. Um, the committee will resume tomorrow to examine the finance portfolio. I would like to thank the ministers and officers who have given evidence to the committee today and like to thank Hansard and Broadcasting for their assistance. And I now declare this meeting of the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.